All right, it looks like just about everybody is here we need to have here. We will bring the meeting of the Public Health Committee to order. Good morning, I'm State Representative Jonathan Steinberg from the 136th District, uh, House Chair of the Public Health Committee. Welcome to a public hearing of the Public Health Committee. Before I get into uh, discussion of so rules and protocols, I'd like to afford my co-chair and our ranking members an opportunity to comment. Good morning, Senator Abrams. How are you this morning? I'm good, thank you, Representative. Good morning. Um, I just wanna thank everyone for being here. Uh, this is an emotionally charged topic, as many of us know, because we've had these hearings before. And sometimes people question why we would take on matters like this at this time and um, during a pandemic. But for those um, who are affected by the decisions that we make, this is timely and important, and I'm glad that we have decided to take this bill up for a public hearing. So thank you very much, Representative. Thank you, Senator. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and as uh, the, the, the co-chair said, this is a deeply emotional topic. And uh, I hope that we as uh, legislative leaders and uh, committee members will afford the courtesy, respect, and the patience uh, to those giving heartfelt testimony. I'm very eager to hear and engage in today's testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator. Senator Summers. Yes, good morning. Um, I am um, disappointed that we're hearing this again for the third time, um, uh, especially during a pandemic, but I am willing to listen to everyone. I hope that this committee will stay until the last person has had an opportunity to speak today. And um, I look forward to um, getting some questions answered that I have concerning this topic. Thank you very much. Thank you, Senator. Representative Pettit. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, concur with you and Senator uh, Abrams, uh, a contentious topic. And uh, hopefully we will have a civil and polite discussion about, about pros, and, pros and cons and see if we can uh, increase our, our knowledge uh, uh, base so that we can all try to reach the best decision for our constituents. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Without further ado, let's talk a little bit about rules and protocols. Now, this committee is probably the most seasoned in terms of public hearing experience, just based upon hours alone. But you'll humor me as I go through some basic rules, as much for the benefit of those watching as any, anybody else. Uh, I'll remind all legislators that you should maintain your microphone on mute. Uh, and that actually goes for uh, our uh, speakers as well today, people testifying. Please stay on mute until you're recognized. Uh, our committee staff will help with that. Um, I ask all legislators when they would like to ask a question or comment to use the raise hand function on Zoom. I recognize that in the past, on occasion, some of us have had some challenges with that. If it's not working for you, please alert the staff and we'll find some way to make sure that you're recognized at the appropriate time. Uh, please note that, uh, th that uh, this screen will be available to the public. I believe we are uh, being broadcast on CTN today, so be aware of that. We do not use emoticons like clapping hands or thumbs up. So if you want to get your excitement out, out of your system now, go ahead, wave your hands, and then be done with it, because we're going to uh, be pretty straightforward from here on in. We're not going to use the chat. Uh, as in, in previous uh, meetings, chat records are part of FOIA, and we don't want to uh, get ourselves in any trouble with that, making comments that we wouldn't want to see the, have the public see. Um, we will share uh, any documents we have. Actually, that doesn't come into play today. It's mostly just for meetings, so we don't really have that. Uh, if you lose your connection, please alert the staff, and we will do the best we can to get you back into the, uh, the room, as they say, as quickly as possible. And lastly, uh, you've heard a couple of our colleagues talk about how contentious this issue is. You've heard them talk about the importance of respect for everybody who has a chance to speak. And that means a couple of different things. First of all, we should not talk over one another. If you ask a question, afford the person a chance to provide the answer. And let's see if we can keep the temperature down. Let's, let, let's see if we can avoid 
uh, letting a motion to overrule our ability to really have a dialogue with the people who were here to testify. Now there are, relative to the meeting we had last week, far fewer people registered to speak uh, by I think a measure of 10, so that uh, there should be no need to invoke any sort of limit on the amount of time we have here today. But because this is a contentious subject, my guess is we'll be here for a good number of hours. And uh, it is my pleasure, and I'm sure of all of yours, to be here for virtually all of this testimony. And I will remind uh, people watching today that we are also very serious about looking at uh, submitted written testimony as well. So you have more than one means by which you can reach out to this committee and share your point of view. And we always appreciate not only your point of view, but documentation or anything else you might have that will educate us further. Uh, are there any questions or concerns coming out of that explanation? What I need to do now is find my list of who was up. Uh, actually, um, Madam Chair, could you just kick it off while I try to find that document for who's first on the list? Absolutely. First, we have Representative Fiorello. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning. Welcome. Go right ahead. I am. I'm State Representative Kimberly Fiorello of Greenwich and Stamford. And with your permission, Madam, I will be yielding my time to Dr. Charles Camosi, author and associate professor of theological and social ethics at Fordham University, who I hope can help us unpack the ethical complexities of this debate as we strive to honor individual rights and choices at the same time that we strive to be a society that values human life at every stage and in all its experiences. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is that person on, Madam Administrator? I think so, can you hear me? There you are, thank you so much, go right ahead. Thank you. Good morning, after uh, 13 years as a bioethicist, I've made a career of building bridges of dialogue across polarized differences religious and secular, life and choice, science and religion, and significantly today, red and blue. I've tried to show that once you study issues of bioethics in depth, these kinds of distinctions, which are so prominent in our toxic public discourse today, don't really hold at all. This year, I will be the founding editor of a new book series called The Magenta Project, magenta being the color between red and blue on the color wheel. And I submit that the issue before us today are some of the most magenta in all of bioethics. Notice how they don't fit at all into traditional red and blue categories. You will have progressives testifying before this committee today sounding like libertarians, arguing on the basis of individual freedom, autonomy, and government staying out of the choices of the individual. Meanwhile, you will have conservatives sounding like left-wing activists talking about nonviolence, showing true care and concern for the most vulnerable, and doing an analysis of unintended structural injustice. And most bizarrely of all, you will have the party of business and wealth doing an implicit critique of capitalism by insisting that one's value does not come from autonomy, not from productivity, and not by how much you, quote, contribute to society, but rather simply because of the fundamental equality of all. With the magenta mindset, I, I submit, it no longer becomes bizarre to see, say, right-wing pro-life activists taking the same view as left-wing di disability rights activists. Far from it. The commitment to human dignity is the same. I'm happy to go more in depth in answering your questions, but keeping my remarks to three minutes was a challenge. I'll just conclude with these three essential points. First, in Oregon, which has had uh, PAS since the 90s, Physical pain and suffering doesn't even make the top five reasons people in Oregon request it. That's very important to underline. Number one is loss of autonomy. Uh, being, a, being a burden on others is also on the list. What would it say about the state of Connecticut if you agree that these are good reasons for why someone would want to kill themselves? Second, supporters of PAS tend to be white and privileged, while people of color and economically vulnerable people tend to be deeply skeptical. Uh, an authentic focus on racial justice would instead direct us to the structural inequities in healthcare and especially palliative care. I want to underline that. And third and finally, um, I submit that if you pass this bill, you will fundamentally change the very nature of what it means to practice medicine in the state of Connecticut. 
a medical system that kills is no longer recognizable as a healer or as a carer for patients. It becomes what I and others in bioethics have called the Burger King model of medicine. Burger King, or at least it used to be, the place where you got it your way. Medicine is not whatever a customer wants it to be. It is an objective practice of healing and caring. And I submit that medicine should be focused on how best to use healing and caring to make the elderly, the sick, and disabled populations feel welcome and valued. We should absolutely not be telling these populations, hey, your life is so bad, it's so dependent and burdensome on others that we can kind of understand why you'd want to kill yourself. Again, it was hard to keep it to three minutes, but, I, but that's my testimony. I'd love to field questions if you have them. Thank you. Let me ask a question for starters. Have you actually read the bill? Are you aware of the fact that we're only talking about people who have a diagnosis of six months to live or not? Because we're not talking about people who are simply a burden to others. I just want to be clear on that point. Are you aware yeah, of that? Yeah. Have you read the bill? Yeah, I have read the bill. It seems to be very similar to the Oregon bill, which is also six months. And also, the if I just recall the data I gave you, and it's in my testimony as well, if you want to see the citation. Um, the physical pain and suffering doesn't make the top five reasons in Oregon for why they choose it. It's autonomy, fear of loss of autonomy, fear of being a burden on others, fear of loss of enjoyable activities. Those are the reasons. I'd also add that, uh, and I have a, a citation to this in my testimony as well, that uh, there have been lots of pushes in both California and Oregon to extend it beyond um, six months which of course makes good sense. If, if you're arguing from the basis of autonomy and freedom and choice, why limit it at all to six months? Um, and the reason why that it hasn't been expanded is because they were fearing events like this hearing where people could say, like me could say, listen, once you start at six months, it's gonna become 12 months. It's gonna become the Netherlands, which has it basically because you're tired of life. And there is no principled reason why it would stay at six months, except for political, um, you know, political reasons. and political strategies. And, and so I, I think it just stands to reason that if autonomy is the reason why we say this is okay, there's no reason it will stay at six months. Well, many people use slippery slope arguments for all sorts of different things. And I understand why you're making that in this case. Representative Pettit. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I was sort of headed in the right direction uh, as this was the first person testifying Many people, as we go out, are going to point to the issue of the, the slippery slope. And I wondered if our, our speaker would give a, a little more information on what he think he's seen in Oregon and California in terms of that concept of the, the concept of assisted uh, suicide. You, 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 sure. Moving on a slippery slope, if he's seen it in other states. Yeah. And to be honest with you, as as a professor of bioethics, I also get skeptical if somebody shows me or, or claims a slippery slope argument without evidence. So it's not, it's a lazy argument to just say, if X, then Y, and I can't give you a reason why it's gonna become Y, but we have evidence. So for instance, in the Netherlands, which has had assisted suicide for a while now, they've moved from these very strict regulations to um, you know, euthanasia for children. They've, they've uh, moved towards well past uh, you know, anything in the 12 month, even the 12 month range. They even have it for something called polypathology, which is just a fancy way of saying for people who are old and tired of life. Um, and we haven't got here yet in the United States, and that's a fair point to make. But again, the reason why we haven't got here in the United States is because people are worried about um, hearings like this where we can point to the slippery slope. I will mention the state of California, which only recently legalized assisted suicide, I believe it was 2015, is already feeling serious pressure to euthanize patients with Alzheimer's disease. And I have a link to that and a citation for that in my testimony as well. Um, so again, if, if the basis, and I, you'll hear uh, lots of testimony today about individual choice, freedom, autonomy, government staying out of this uh, decision between a patient and their doctor. If that's, the, if that's the basis for it, this will not stay at six months. It's, it's just simply impossible. And, uh I, I was a physician before entering the uh, legislature and our state societies and county associations have adopted a stance of engaged neutrality because when they surveyed the members they're about a certain certain percentage for this, a certain percentage against and a, a number of people on the fence. Uh, if physicians, APRNs, PAs, 
are morally against this? Have they typically been able to opt out in other states? Does it create issues in terms of uh, people's ability to practice with their own own patients if they have a disagreement with what the, the statute currently is? And Mr. Chairman, uh, I, okay, it's up. I say Senator Summers was having problems with her hand is up now. Thank you. Yeah, it's interesting you asked that. Just as luck would have it, I'm I'm finishing up a book on nursing bioethics, and I was I'm on the chapter on protecting nurse consciences, and I've been doing a lot of research on this. And it, California is also facing some pressure. I think there's a bill being pushed right now to force providers to refer for physician-assisted suicide, even if they won't do it themselves. Canada has been doing this uh, for some time. I'm a you know, I'm a bioethicist, I'm in the bioethics field. Those who hold the most power in bioethics today don't think of conscience rights as mattering all that much. They think that if it's the, the quote, standard of care, um, you should be essentially forced to participate or at the very least refer to somebody who will participate. And so we can see, I think, the writing on the wall there that once this becomes legalized, it's, it's not going to be the free choice of the provider to decide whether they want to participate or not. At the very least, they're going to have to send somebody um, their patient to somebody who will help them um, commit suicide. But I will say one, one other quick thing about the medical field. It's interesting, maybe some of you are aware that this was just fought a few years ago, maybe five years ago as well in the United Kingdom. And parliament there overwhelmingly rejected physician assisted suicide in part because of the testimony of physicians and uh, the disabled community. And so I think that's worth mentioning here too. We have a country that I would argue, unfortunately, that makes an idol out of individual freedom and choice and government staying out of the lives of people. Um, in the UK, they don't have that. And I think that's one reason why they ended up rejecting um, the autonomy argument for physician assisted suicide. Thank you. And uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll hold it at two questions because it appears there's a line of people ready to ask questions. Thank you, sir. Thank you for noticing that, Representative. Uh, Representative Dauphiné, followed by Senator Summers. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for your testimony. I um, wanted to just, I know we, we have a, a, a big problem with suicide in our country, and I think um, with the most recent um, COVID issue, we've seen an increase in that. Um, is there any evidence to show that legal, the, with the legalization or this bill, the passage of this bill, that we might be normalizing suicide in, this, in, our, in our culture? Yeah, for, for, thank you for that question. There's, there's actually in the literature been a big debate about that for the last 10 to 15 years or so, but it's, it's now starting to become clear in the literature that if you legalize assisted suicide in a particular area, you can see an uptick in other kinds of suicide in that same area. And so you're, you're quite right now to, I mean, it's common sense, but now we have the data to support it. Um, and so if it, it, it is something we need to think hard. I mean, I think about people like Anthony Bourdain and Robin Williams and how those stories just galvanize so many people, including people in my own very personal circles to, to think about how best can we accompany people in these situations? How best can we show compassion, genuine compassion for these situations, not make it easier for people in desperate situations to kill themselves. And I, I will underline also the point about palliative care. This is when people have palliative care, when they have access to good palliative care, they don't want physician assisted suicide, generally speaking. And so I, again, this is, a, this is an area of common ground. The very people who will be assisting, um, resisting this bill, I think will be your strongest advocates actually for thinking about how best to get uh, better and more accessible palliative care to those who need it. Thank you for that answer. And I think you somewhat answered my next question, which was um, with regard, I was, I was, it was specific to um, what have you and your students learned about the relationship between palliative and hospice care um, with regard to this concept of this, you know, this, this bill. Yeah, uh, so um, I've been fortunate enough to teach a lot of bioethics at Fordham and in one of the, my classes, um, we, we do service learning as part of the bioethics class. And one of the places my students did service learning was Calvary Hospice uh, Center Hospital in the Bronx. And one of the things my students learn when they go there is that when people get the pro not only the proper palliative care, but like the mission centered care that they get at a place like Calvary makes them feel genuinely um, cared for, like they matter, like we're not saying, yeah, I can kind of understand why you'd want to 
kill yourself now. No, the, op the opposite is true. We, can, we, we will be there for you. We will show you genuine compassion. We will control your pain and we will give you genuine dignity in these last moments of your life, last weeks and, and months of your life. And what's so beautiful about that is my students really get a sense of what an objective practice of medicine is, not whatever the customer asks for when they come through the door, but what it means to say, this is what we stand for in terms of care for patients. And no one, in fact, um, at Calvary Hospice Center even requests assisted suicide precisely because they feel cared for this way and because their pain is controlled. And I, I will finish my answer to this question with this. Um, and it's reiterating something I said before. One reason why this is such a problem is because we don't have access to palliative care the way we should. In fact, we have a deep distrust in communities of color when it comes to hospice centers, in part because the hospice centers aren't always great, they aren't available, and there's a terrible history of structural racism in how we uh, treat people of color, especially towards the end of life. And, and that's something, again, that there's common ground to work on here. And I really wish that would be the kind of focus rather than on uh, physician-assisted suicide. Thank you for that answer. And I had one final question, which I think you kind of already answered, but you know, it was regard to why would we trust the state to administer this life and death procedure when its record of performance and more benign functions has often been perhaps questionable? Yeah, I mean, the last year has taught us a lot about how big lumbering state-centered institutions do, especially in these kind of situations. There've been so many stories so many horrific stories during the pandemic, right? And I actually frankly worry that one direction we're gonna go in is people are gonna look more towards assisted suicide because they see these failures and they, they don't want to risk having experienced either they or their family members experience them. But yeah, I, I think we ought to be empowering families to take care of their loved ones, not using state uh, power to make it easier for them to kill themselves. And thank you for that answer. And, and um, one final question. Can you just speak to the um, issue of children and assisted suicide and how um, that plays out? I, I'm just concerned about how that may, you might foresee that becoming a part of this. Yes. One of the things we've seen in countries like the Netherlands and Belgium is that it starts very small, you know, ish with autonomy and six months to live. But once you, again, as I've said a couple of time now, times now, the slippery slope is such that autonomy gets bigger and bigger and, and, and the, the reasons for ass assisted suicide get broader and broader, even to the point in both countries now where children um, um, are killed via this procedure. And there's no really basis for saying that a child is not autonomous enough to say, you know, get a prescription drug without parent parental permission, but yet is autonomous enough to choose a life ending procedure. So it's the parents that are actually deciding here. And often it's the parents in conjunction with the medical team or the state. And so this is interesting. It, it's more and disturbingly interesting. It's morphed in those countries from this thing that individuals decide for themselves to this kind of thing where, well, if you are in this situation, we objectively think it would be better for you to die. And um, that's the only way we can really say that about children, because there's no way we can say that children are making an autonomous choice to do something like this. So, um, and again, these are things we ought to be thinking about. The bill before us is, is uh, it has the letters and the, num and the words in, that, that are on the bill, but we ought to be thinking about how this is gonna, this is what progressives do, right? They think about how values and policies function in a particular culture, in a particular society. And in a culture like ours, in a society like ours, we just have to be aware of what this will become. Thank you. Thank you so much for your answers. And thank you for the time, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Senator Summers, followed by Representative Berger Travala. Yes, uh, thank you. I can't see you for some reason, but thank you for being here today. And I, I do have a few questions. First, I want to let you know, my son went to Fordham, great school. Um, so I've been thinking about this quite quite a bit for over the past year, uh, because I've had friends that I've had um, just this past year have terminal brain cancer and seen what they've gone through. And one of the things that um, I thought about was, wouldn't you agree that we're all terminal, number one? 
we're all dying. We're just dying at different rates. No one can say, I have six months or you have a year. That's, you know, we don't get to choose when we're born. And I'm having a really hard time saying that we get to choose when we die. And assisted suicide to me is legalizing suicide. And I think it's very difficult. How would you say from a bioethics standpoint, can a clinician, a doctor advocate for both life and death? Those seem two very contrary um, you know, places is when you take an oath. And all the clinicians I've talked to have said at the end of life, and I've seen, I used to work with, with hospice that at the end of your life, we can make you comfortable. We can give you dignity um, when that time is, is near. Could you speak to how do we ask doctors to advocate for both life and death? Frankly, I don't know how we can without changing medicine in a fundamental way from what it is to something else. Like, like what I, to use a fancy word, ends-based, goal-based medicine, where it is an objective thing that we're doing, healing and caring to whatever it is patients want from us, right? In this case, assisted, um, assisted killing. Now, one of the things that I think is so interesting about um, medicine's role here too, is that there's a reason why the disability community is skeptical of um, the role of medicine and all this in general. And that's because, um, but this doesn't apply to all clinicians, obviously, the, the data is in doctors rate the quality of life of their patients lower than the patients do themselves. And so when you have the kind of vulnerable situation in which patients find themselves, that's even more reason to not have this kind of thing on the table, right? It's even more reason to say we ought to be focused on caring and curing and, and, and genuine compassion and help rather than having this as an option. Again, what we're really saying, if we pass a bill like this, what we're really saying is here are some circumstances in, when we, in which we think you can kill yourself and we, we can understand why you would kill yourself. And your point about we're all dying is very well taken. What happens with the first um, diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease? Is that person dying? From a certain perspective, they are, right? Are we going to allow that? Even if it's, I mean, what is the, what is the principled reason for not allowing that if we, if based on the, um, you know, the impulse behind this bill. Why can't somebody who's much more than six months away from their death and doesn't want to experience what they consider to be a bad, you know, um, a bad, a bad course, uh, use this well before what well, well before the six month period. Um, I I'm, I'm old enough. And I think a lot of people on this call are old enough to remember when we thought Magic Johnson was dying, right? It was when he when he was first diagnosed with um, HIV AIDS. So in what sense are, are, are we all not dying? Yeah, that's, that's an excellent point. And so when you combine that with the kind of judgments that need to be made about quality of life and you know whether certain lives, um, we can understand why you'd wanna kill yourself versus other kinds of lives, we don't think it's a good idea. We just ought to focus on the ends of medicine, which are healing, caring, and curing. And if I can um, you know, follow up with that, I'm, I'm concerned about the, and talking to clinicians also, this is not you know, necessarily my words, um, you know, we're, we're morphing to a healthcare system that measures your productivity and your, um, you know, your salary based on your output. It's all about RVUs now, you know, it's how much value, revenue value units you can generate. And if you think about, and this has been brought up to me by clinicians, if you think about their very um, stretched time because they see so many patients because they have to so quickly, are you going to spend the time? Are we going to come into a position that we are going to spend the time on you know, our less sick patients, and then those that are very sick and have lots of comorbidities and need a lot of attention, that slows you down as a doctor. You have to spend a lot of time there. So many of them are very concerned with this, that there will be a pressure to um, either refer to somebody who will write a script so that you can kill yourself or um, you know, there will be pressure to discard those patients that are of very complex issues that are costing the system a lot of money that um, drain a lot of resources, whether that be somebody who's, um, you know, a, a very sick cancer patient or, um, you know, somebody who um, is a, in the disability community that requires around the care, um, you know, clock care. 
So, so I really struggle with that. And, and I don't know if you could speak to that, but we have a different healthcare system than we had a long time ago. And, um, you know, I, I agree. My focus would be on increasing the options for palliative care and end of life. Um, that can be a very peaceful, even if you are very sick, they can keep your pain. You could stop eating. That's one way that you can choose to have autonomy over your own, own body at the end of life. Um, and I'm concerned that this bill really opens the door for something that none of us are prepared for and that we're seeing in other countries where if you sign a, uh, an, a you know, a, a, I guess a directive saying, if I get to this point with Alzheimer's, you know, I want to be um, put, you know, I want to be put to death. I want to commit suicide. But then in that moment, those Alzheimer's patients are lucid and say, don't, I don't want to do it but yet they're now sedated and injected and put to death in, in countries like Belgium. Children that are 14 can decide to kill themselves because they're depressed, because they have chronic depression. I mean, that is really, I think, a very scary um, endpoint. And, and although people will say, well, this is just six months, you know, you have to have a terminal il illness. I would say we're all terminal and it opens the door for something that I, I I think is is uh, the wrong way for us to um, embrace life and to um, and to celebrate life and to have life pass. It's it you know death is part of life. If that makes any sense, it's part of the continuum. But could you speak to um, what I just said about the the RVUs and the pressure on the physicians and um, what does that mean for the physician who does sign up to be um, the person who's going to write out the scripts? for that, uh, you know, is that person, um, you know, holding fast to preserving life and their medical oath? How, how, do, how do you see that as an ethicist? It's a classic example of what I mentioned in my opening remarks where, where I said, I predicted that a lot of people who, you know, would be opposed to this, would be doing structural analyses of like, okay, we have this law. How does this work within certain social structures? It is typically a progressive way of thinking, but is so magenta in the way we approach this. Yes, we have to think about how healthcare would react to this. To say, um, I mean, one interesting uh, factoid um, anecdote about this is what, what happened in California, I think a couple of years ago, a late stage cancer patient requested um, some experimental treatment. And she was on Medi-Cal over there. And they said, I'm sorry, we won't pay for the experimental treatment, but we will pay for your suicide, essentially. And um, that's a structural, bigger question than what actually happens in the clinic. But, uh, but that's a writ large what I think we're going to see time and time again in the clinic itself. I mean, we are already seeing it in some ways. And this is, why it's, this is very important. The people who are opposed to assisted suicide here are willing, are able, are eager to work on the kinds of structural problems you just mentioned to say, how do we change the system so that we're not incentivized, physicians are not incentivized this way because it's already happening. It's already happening with these kinds of populations. I was doing some research the other day. The, um, the number of people in nursing homes who are just sedated because, the, because of resource allocation questions, right? Essentially sedated to death, not, not assisted suicide, but just kept sedated, not not uh, lucid, not with it, because of the kinds of uh, things you made are just extraordinary. Um, also, DNRs, forced DNRs, or at least coerced DNRs, are a big part of the story. NPR did it, has been doing exposés about this throughout the pandemic on disabled people who come into clinics who are given forced DNRs for precisely the same kinds of reasons. These are structural problems, structural injustices that exist not just with regard to physician-assisted suicide. They're in our system, but physician-assisted suicide would make it dramatically worse. There'd be so much pressure um, to, to, to use this for precisely the same kinds of reasons. And I know there's other people that want to ask questions. Just my last question is, um, you know, after working with hospice for a long time, um, I was able to see some things that um, stay with me till today. And I, I guess had a good experience with the hospice that I worked with um, in, in the way that they helped families and children and the people that were actually um, you know, on their way to a different place in a way that was comforting and loving and families re reunited. And even though people um, you know, might've been 
if, if not uh, medicated experiencing pain, they could control it. They, you know, they, they talk through the death process and the death rattle and all the things that they go through. What would you do or what would you suggest that we could do as a state or a country to um, increase the accessibility of palliative care in, in a way that um, you know, certain communities would not fear it and that it could be embraced as part of the process of life in a way that was um, more readily accessible to those who are um, you know, looking at, um, at the alternative of if this bill passes, committing suicide, ending their own life. Yeah, if this bill passes, we should be no less committed. In some ways, we should be even more committed to palliative care because it's interesting. In, in countries that legalize assisted suicide, they end up having worse palliative care for reasons you might be able to imagine. Um, I, I guess I'll put my cards on the table here. I think we should have a universal healthcare system that gives everyone the best palliative care available. Um, that puts maybe some, places me, I'm a magenta thinker, but that places me somewhere on a political spectrum, I guess. Um, but then we need a specific kind of outreach. And this is where racial justice activism is so important. It's happening right now with regard to the vaccine for similar reasons. Um, communities of color are resistant to the vaccine and or the vaccines that are available. And we're, you know, finally we've, we've gotten around to working with, you know, African-American churches, Catholic churches and other local leaders and um, to help build trust and, 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 and um, have, have listening sessions and, and, and have local uh, leaders take control of these um, of these vaccine rollouts. And in a similar story, I think we we have to tell a similar story and have a similar um, approach when it comes to palliative care and hospice, because there's a bad history with regard again to how people of color have been treated at the end of their lives. And and so we'd have to have a similar kind of outreach, first access, but then a specific um, um, focus on racial justice outreach, focused on community leaders to help build um, build the kind of trust that's necessary. Well, I thank you for answering all my questions this morning, and um, I look forward to ha continuing my conversation with you. Thank you, Senator. I just want to add, for your benefit, uh, if you look at the definition section of this bill, there is a specific definition of terminal illness, which directly references six months terminal diagnosis. So let's be very clear about what's actually in this bill versus slippery slope arguments which are by themselves slippery slopes where any of us can speculate about what might be in the bill someday in the future or what some future legislature might do or might, might be happening in other countries or in other states. This is a bill before the legislature in the state of Connecticut. The definition is pretty explicit. And I think we have to be very careful about speculating about how we're all dying in some way or another. That's just not in this bill. And I want people in the public to understand that. And I invite them to actually read the bill so that people are not misled by some of the arguments made. Thank you. Representative Berger Gervalo, followed by Representative Zepkis. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, thank you, Mr. Jensen. Um, you have no referenced the top. Uh, I'm five sorry, questions. Representative. You, I think you need to increase your volume. Can you hear me? That's much better. Okay. Um, you've now referenced the top five reasons that Oregon residents have chosen to make this difficult end of life decision. Um, you've done it multiple times and you've emphasized the point that they have not listed physical pain and suffering. Um, and then you list other reasons that all seem to fall under mental distress and emotional turmoil. Um, which reference their own physical limitations and being a burden, but it comes down to emotional um, pain. So this leads me to infer that you're not putting any weight on the emotional pain and mental anguish that they experience. So I just want to clarify, is mental pain, turmoil, anguish, however you want to put that, is that not to be considered when making this decision? No, you would have to be a monster to not consider the incredible pain that comes from the kinds of things that are on this list. But as I hope I've made clear, um, the proper response of healthcare providers is not to say, we can kind of understand why you'd wanna kill yourself as a result of this. It's to try to show these populations why they're valued, why we care about them, why will we, st we will stick with them, why we will give them 
um, experimental cancer treatment and not just kind of slouch towards physician assisted suicide. And just because it was mentioned before about the six month, um, uh, which, which uh, I've acknowledged multiple times at six months, um, there's, there's lots of data from, again, Oregon to show that people who change their minds, who say, you know, who are, who are, who request this and then change their minds, which is an interesting thing of and of itself. Why would someone change their mind? Live well past six months. So it's a pretty inexact science to say when somebody is within six months of dying, that gets to the point of like, well, when is somebody dying and, and how can we evaluate that? But but yeah, I, I, I hearken back to Calvary Hospice Center where no one requests physician assisted mm -hmm. suicide and yet have all these very important uh, physical, uh, uh, psychological uh, and, and spiritual uh, sufferings, existential sufferings. They're about to die and, and they're, they're, they often have very difficult, um, uh, like you said, physical things causing this mental anguish. But there's a reason why people in Calvary Hospice Center don't request this. It's because the medics, the healthcare providers around them treat them a certain way. And, and that, so no, please do, don't misunderstand me. It does, it matters so much. And that's why we have to uh, uh, do some of the things that I've been talking about and why we can't just slouch towards saying, uh, you know, assisted suicide is, is the way out of this. So just to, just to follow up and make sure that I'm completely clear on where you stand on this and I appreciate um, your answer. Um, would, physical pain ranking in that top five would that change your stance i think uh that's an excellent question um i think it's a different kind of question to ask so if we you know if physical pain and suffering is there i think one one of the things we have to um, ask ourselves is why don't they have why don't people in these situations have access to the kind of palliative care the kind of hospice care which can control their physical pain and suffering, right? Um, as as was mentioned, uh, we're, we're we've gotten so good at this in part because we haven't slouched towards assisted suicide. We've stuck with patients and we've really developed our technology such that we're able to control in many situations, including um, through palliative sedation, which is something that's controversial. Some people think it's a it's you know the equivalent of assisted suicide. I don't think it is. Um, but we've gotten so good at this. And so if, if that did creep into the top five, and, and to be clear, it is a reason why. It's not as if nobody requests this. It's just not a top five reason. Um, but if it, if it crept in the top five, or if it was like one or two, I'd have to say even more strongly, what are we doing with palliative care? How come we don't get people the necessary palliative care? I appreciate that answer. And I, I know that this is a difficult conversation to have. And I think that, you know, the two of us talking about this really highlights that one of the major problems we have is that we kind of outrank mental illness and, and we in favor of physical illness. And, um, and that's certainly something we'll have to address. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Representative. Representative Zupkis, followed by Representative D'Amico. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I would have to agree with your comment from earlier that this bill is regarding the state of Connecticut. However, I will say we constantly ask about what's happening in other states and compare data and all of those things. So I do think it's important to hear about what other states are going through and have experience with this. Um, with that being said, one of my biggest concerns is the disabled community because um, my full-time job is working with that group of people and I've had an absorbent amount of people reach out to me regarding this. So. Um, I think that that is something we really have to look at very closely um, with that community. But my question uh, for you, sir, is um, you mentioned talking to different groups of people and you mentioned Catholics as one of them. Um, did, you wrote a book, I believe, um, called Resisting Throwaway Culture. Is that correct? That's right. That's right. And is, is that a phrase? Where did that phrase come from? Uh, Pope Francis made that phrase famous, at least in my world. <laughs> yeah, well, I'd like to ask because to me, Pope Francis um, is really a um, person that cares about social justice, right? I mean, he's a lot of people have had different views on him um, that said that he is really somebody who is in that arena and really um, concerned about social justice. 
And so my question would be is, what are his thoughts on this? It's, uh, thank you for that question. It's, it's interesting. Um, the book I wrote um, took his view and applied it to several different issues, the death penalty, state-sponsored killing in, the, in, in war, um, assisted suicide, uh, uh, and even how we treat uh, uh, immigrants and, and, this, and this asylum uh, seekers, right? Uh, sending them back to almost certain death when they're a client where they're trying to get asylum in the United States is a, is a classic example of throwaway culture. Pope Francis is, is trying to highlight how Pope throwaway culture is not just an ecological concern. He's obviously very concerned about ecological matters and climate change. It's a concern about people, how we treat people. So do we again, welcome people in a spirit of encounter and hospitality? Do we bend over backwards to make them, uh, understand that they matter? Or do we just um, participate in a capitalist structure which says you matter, not because you're made in the image and likeness of God, not because of radical equality, but because of your productivity, because of you know whether you're a productive member of society or not. And using that framework, using that lens, Pope Francis says we need to call out throwaway culture wherever we find it and stand up for the radical equality of all, especially the most vulnerable. And, and he, he definitely includes um, the elderly and those who are sick and those who are disabled in the group of people who are at risk for throwaway culture and, and argues that we need to have a culture of encounter and hospitality as a counter to the throwaway culture. Um, and I couldn't agree with him more. That's a classic, that's a cla what it's, what's going on in physician assisted suicide. Again, when we say we're not gonna give you stage four uh, cancer treatment, but we will give you assisted suicide. When we say, as they do in the Netherlands, you have um, uh, polypathology, and so you're tired of life, and we, we think you can kill yourself. Or, you know, we, again, if you just look at the numbers in in Oregon, we we you've lost autonomy. You you've you've you're dependent on others. Um, you know, th therefore, we can understand why you want to kill yourself. Um, these are not the attitudes of a culture of encounter and hospitality. These are these are the attitudes of throwaway culture. And and Pope Pope Francis would again, I think, agree that that we should be focusing on ways to welcome people to 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 show hospitality to people to care for them the way ends based medicine does, not as Burger King medicine does. Um, pretty confident about that. All right. Well, thank you because I do know he is seen as a some people. Um, you know, have seen him as a very liberal uh, pope. And so I was just curious you had mentioned that. But so thank you very much. I appreciate your remarks. Thank you, Representative. Representative D'Amico, followed by Representative Claritas Dietria. And let me remind everybody that we are expiring the entire first hour for elected officials with one, one speaker. So I, I would ask you to try to be as direct as possible with your questions. Thank you, uh, Representative D'Amico. Thank you very much, much, Mr. Chair. I, I will try to be brief. Uh, Dr. Kamosi, thank you very much. Appreciate your testimony. And I appreciate your, your thoughtful approach to, to, to this topic. So, so, so I, I'm just curious, uh, you, you, are, you, you have made several references to the person the, uh, killing themselves. Wouldn't it be more accurate to say that mother nature is killing the patient and, and, and that the pa that, that, that what this what this legislation is anticipating is a way for the 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 patient to have more autonomy over the the, the killing process that mother nature ha has initiated thank you for that question that's a good question um and sometimes we say good question don't mean it i mean that's a good question um thank you it is <laughs> it is you're welcome <laughs> it is more complicated when somebody is say you know a few days from dying like what is it to give somebody say a very large dose of pain medication, um, which we know inhibits respiration and can sometimes speed death. Like what is happening there? Um, you know, is the medication killing them? Is it hastening their death? Is it the underlying cancer or whatever is killing them? It's a complicated mix of things at that kind of stage where I say, where I, I kind of sympathetic to, to your view there. I'm less sympathetic when it's six months out and the person is in no danger of dying imminently at all. Um, they're giving somebody a very large dose of pain medication seems to be 
an example of suicide. Now, albeit somebody who is at least supposedly going to die within six months, but as again, as I pointed out, plenty of people who are within the six month threshold, according to at least two doctors, I think, um, have lived well beyond six months after not choosing to go through with it in Oregon. So again, we're just back to that point, like, well, why should it be six months? And like, are people dying well beyond six months? And why should it stop at six months? The bill, of course, says six months. But again, you use the word autonomy. If people have autonomy to do this, then, then I don't understand why we would stop at six months. You know, what, wouldn't wouldn't the, the challenge from somebody who's, who's 11 months or 12 months be next to say, wouldn't they sue in court to say, well, why can't I access this? What is, what is the... What is the, if it's just my autonomy and my autonomous rights within, you know, the healthcare system to make choices about my own body and my own life and my own death, I just don't know why we'd stop at six months. Th th thank you. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. And, and I'm sure we'll be debating that, uh, you know, or, or, or discussing that in the course of this. So I just have one other question for you. Um, so, so, so I've been on this committee for several years and we, we have taken up this topic several years now, as I'm sure you're aware. And I know you've participated. I, I believe you have in the past. Um, this is my first time to enjoy oh, it is. the questions from you folks. Yes. Oh, boy. Okay, then, then, then I'm mistaken. I apologize. No, that's right. But, but that's in right. any event, we, we've done this se several times now, and, and, and I am always struck by, by, by the people, and, and it's, it's not an insignificant number of people who have testified that they have had relatives and loved ones for whom palliative care uh, just didn't do the job, uh, the, the, and their, their loved ones went through unimaginable agony uh, at, at the end of their life. And, and what, what do you, as a professional, uh, 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 say to those people? Yeah, I, uh, well, this, this is, uh, not everyone who is in the community that opposes assisted suicide agrees with me about this, but I think, uh, I don't know if you're aware of, probably you are, of something called palliative sedation, where we can literally keep people sedated for good reasons, not because we're too busy or because the, the medical structures don't allow themselves um, to care for you properly, but because we want to keep you sedated and not feeling the kind of pain that you just described. So at, a ver at the very end, when there's no other option left, there's always palliative sedation as an option, which is not killing, in my view. Uh, another related story to that, though, is um, there, are, there are some cases where um, at, at the very extremes where you can't control the pain. That is just, that is just the case. Um, however, I just refer you back to the data from Oregon. They're, they're not even in the top five reasons why people request assisted suicide in Oregon. So while they exist, and while I think we should probably go more towards palliative sedation rather than assisted suicide, because again, it's an example of caring, of hospitality, of staying with somebody rather than abandoning them, in my view. Um, we, we should be focused on the real reasons why people, the overwhelming majority of people choose to use this. It isn't because of the very sympathetic cases that you mentioned. And I agree, they're very sympathetic. It's again, because of the top five reasons that I mentioned earlier. All right, th th other people wanna ask questions. I really appreciate it. Thank you, thank you, thank you thank Mr. You. Chair. Thank you, Representative. Representative Clarence Dietria, followed by Representative Gilchrist. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for testifying here today. I'll try and make my questions very fast. Um, at what point um, do you think palli palliative care starts with terminally ill people on average? Do you, do you have any information oh, on I don't, that? I, you mean in, like in an empirical sense or when it should start? Both. Okay, well, it should, it should start uh, when a qualified physician indicates that it's necessary and when a patient asks for it. So um, beyond that, I don't have any data on like, I, I know there are huge inequities in how uh, different populations have ac access to good palliative care. So it wouldn't surprise me if people who need it don't get access to it, if that's what you're implying. Okay, so do, so you don't, do you feel Connecticut, so you don't feel that here in Connecticut, we have enough access to palliative care? That's right. Okay, well, I, I mean, that's probably something we should work on because people need to, you know, have have more direct, a <clears throat> excuse me, access to palliative care. Uh, do you, will, with this legislation, will doctors and APRNs be able to say, no, I don't believe in right to die? It's unclear. Um, and often that's a decision for that courts end up making, whether, um, 
you know, physicians and other healthcare providers have conscience rights. I mean, it's a, it's a big debate in our country, as you probably know right now, like what, when should a healthcare provider be free to say, I don't want to provide that versus when they should be free not to even refer to somebody else when they don't want to provide it versus they should be free to just do whatever they want, or should they be forced to do it? Again, if you have the Burger King model of medicine, if I go to Burger King and say, hey, I, I want a Whopper without buns, the, 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 per, the cashier looks at you and says, well, that's weird, but I'm going to give it to you. It's that not, that's not the way medicine should work in my view. So, so I, I, I are on the side of having healthcare providers um, be able to say, I don't want to participate in that, even if it's legal. Okay, thank you. And, and I personally, I'm struggling with this on many levels, on a personal level and on a spiritual level. But do you, um, have you come across anybody in the religious community that agrees with right to die? Yeah, oh, for sure. Religious, yeah. I mean, yeah, the, the religious community, to the extent there is a single thing like that, is very diverse and has opinions all over the map on these kinds okay. of questions. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll save some questions for later. Thank you, Representative Gilchrist, followed by Representative Foster. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Hello, Dr. Comacy. Nice to see you. Um, you mentioned a patient from California who um, was denied or so you say was denied experimental cancer treatments um, by MedCal, I believe you said, which I would assume is the California Medicaid equivalent to, you know, equivalent to Connecticut's Medicaid um, and referred for medical aid in dying. Are you aware that California law explicitly prohibits an insurer from proactively offering information about medical aid in dying coverage? Yeah, I don't. I'm not familiar with what the ins and outs of California law work about that, but that was a well-documented story. If anybody wants to Google it, they can find it. And what is the name of that individual? Uh, let's see here. Miss Packer, I think. I'm just Googling right now. I don't have it totally in front of me. If you'd be able to follow up with the committee, that'd be great. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, and before I go on, I have to apologize. I should have corrected the record earlier on. Uh, this witness has stated that he do, that the uh, doctor may not uh, refuse or he doesn't know if they may refuse to administer this. Please, again, everybody, read the bell. It's quite clear a doctor can refuse to actually participate in this. It's been part of the bill for years. So I think it's really important that when people testify that uh, I'm obliged to correct a record and state something that is not in the bill. So let me just be clear on that. Can I, can I just say something very briefly about that? I think what I said, and if I didn't say it, I'll, I'll make it clear here, was that I think the courts often step in and make a judgment about that, right? So they say, even if it is this way in the bill, is it legitimate for a healthcare provider to refuse? Even if the statute says it, sometimes courts step in and say, you have a fundamental autonomous right to this kind of care, um, medical care, and overrule it. Just that's a, I just want to make that clear. I want to be clear that what you, you speculated about is not related to this bill and has not been proven that way in any other state to this point. So once again, I think you're conflating a little bit what a court may do to rule about what a doctor may do on something that's not related to this bill. I wanna be clear that we're talking about this bill, not some future bill, not some other country's bill. We're talking about the bill that's before us today. Representative Foster, verse, uh, followed by Representative Cook. Hi, Dr. Kamosi, thank you so much for joining us today. I appreciate um, you raising some citations that some of us might not be familiar with that I think are helpful in this discussion. So um, you've raised a couple of things that I was not familiar with, so I've looked up while we were talking. Um, we, the first thing, I, I'm hoping you can clarify for me because I'm not seeing the reference that you shared and perhaps you can, I, I looked at your testimony. I think I'm looking at the right document. There was a publication about suicide uh, and physician assisted, like general suicide rate and physician assisted suicide. It's published as an open research archive, not a peer reviewed publication from St. Mary's University of Twickenham, London. Is that the reference here? Um, am I correctly um, identifying it by uh, David Albert Jones and David Patton? Uh, I don't know what you're looking at there. I know David Albert Jones is a professor at Oxford and has taken an interest in this. I'm not exactly sure what is it document you have you're open? referencing about increase in suicide? His publication is titled, Does Legalization of Physician-Assisted Suicide Rate Affect Suicide Rates? Uh, 
Is that the? Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I didn't, to be honest, I didn't come into this, into this uh, hearing prepared to talk about that particular issue. So I'm sorry, I don't have my research in front of me on that. If you want me to, I can, I've written about this and I've cited it elsewhere. I can come back to the committee with it if you're interested. I don't know if this is I would is love it I if said. you would send me and the committee that citation you're referencing. So I, th I think based on um, the, the, the inference you made at just by doing a Google search, a scholar and a PubMed search, I'm pretty sure that this is the citation that you're referencing. And so I just would like to ask for a point of clarity. This is outside of my scope of expertise. You shared um, that, that, uh, allowing or permitting physician assisted suicide was, in, was related to an increased rate in suicide. Representative Dauphine and you exchanged about this a tiny bit. Um, and so from what I can see in this data, and, and, and I, perhaps I'm misunderstanding it, because as I mentioned, I'm just pulling this up while you're right here with us. It looks like there is not a differentiation between general suicide, like total suicide rate, including physician assisted suicide, and the bill, and, and so it's not like we're differentiating the form or mechanism of suicide in the data and the total numbers. So I think it's an important point of clarity that when we say that there's an increase in total suicide rate in that number, physician assisted suicide is included. So I think there was an implication from what you and Representative Dauphine said that this is increasing suicide because it's making it mentally permissible to take your life and that is not what I see in this data when I look at it, and perhaps I'm wrong, but I think the implication of what you said was that because of, like a causal implication, because of permitting medically assisted suicide, that other people feel like it is more permissible and acceptable to take their own lives. And so that this is, you know, I, 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 I'm going to never say slippery slope again for the rest of this, like shame on me for the rest of the conversation. But, but so this is, this is creating the impetus for a slippery slope. And that is not what I see in the data. So if there is data suggesting otherwise, I would love for you to send that to me so I can understand. I think that's a really important distinction for us to make because if the total number increases and it is including what you're giving a legal pathway for, that is very different than um, permitting and then the number is increasing in suicide that is different than physician-assisted suicide. Um, no, those, those are all very, I didn't mean to interrupt you, go ahead, sorry. So that was my first, so if, if there's a different, if there's different data that I'm missing that I'm not understanding, I would really appreciate you sending it um, to us. And, and we have had this conversation several times. I don't know if I've ever seen a speaker actually follow up and share the data that they promised in our public hearings. That's not happened since I've been on this committee. So please, please do send that data. I'd really appreciate it. Um, and then the other one um, that I'm going to ask. Um, so you, you have been referencing, I pulled up the Oregon report. I, I, I do the silly thing where someone referenced something and then I control F the word and the document and I just try and find the thing you're talking about really quickly. Um, and so when I look, I couldn't find top five reasons for requesting in the report. So I, I assume the terminology is a little different. So I think you're referencing something that's called the end of life concern section in the table. Is that correct? I need to go and, back and to the actual document. Autonomy, but... Less able to engage in activities. So I just want to make this important point of clarification that those topics are not mutually exclusive. That's right. So if you sum up the total number, there are many people who say loss of autonomy and financial implications of treatment and inadequate pain at control and concern about it. So there is not mutual exclusivity. It's not like they were being told that they could only select one. And you can see that if you if you tally up the N, it equals more than 100%. So um, if for those of you who are, um, are, are following along here, this is page 10, the Oregon Death with Dignity Act data summary of 2016. Um, and it is the second um, section of the table. So it is not mutually exclusive, which I think is an also you know, we can, we can, the way we present data is important, um, that it reflects the way the data was actually run and analyzed. And, and I'm not disagreeing with your, uh, your expertise is far different than mine, theologically, but I think the way that we present the data should reference the way it was actually conducted and run. So, um, so you're saying I a lot there. Could I, could I start to respond? Is that all right? Sure. Thank you. 
So uh, let me start with your second point first. If you look at my testimony, it's pretty clear that that's what exactly what I was saying because I think I included the percentages. So number one, loss of autonomy is 91.4%. And then number two, degree stability to participate in enjoyable activities, 86.7%. So I couldn't have even been implying that it wasn't, you know, that these were individual or not. not um, of course, somebody who, who, who makes a decision like this often has multiple reasons, multiple factors going into it. That doesn't change my essential point, though, which is that physical pain and suffering doesn't make the top five reasons that people offer. So that's a that's a point well taken, but it's a point I acknowledge definitely and is right there in my testimony. Um, second, uh, with regard to your first point, I am as a professor, you might imagine I'm deeply committed to data and evidence. And I was asked a question that I you know, that wasn't part of my testimony. And I just, you know, my own research on this um, is not ready to hand. So I'm more than happy to, to and eager, in fact, to share um, the data behind this. Uh, my sense was, this is just my sense, I'd have to go back and check, was that, for, as I mentioned, for a long time, we weren't totally sure about this. There was a lot of debate back and forth, but I think the data is not clear. A correlation is not causation, but um, I think we at least have established correl correlation, and then we just need to have, you know, hopefully a good faith argument about causation and what, what else could, could be responsible for the rise. But I, but I will be more than happy to do my due diligence on a question that I wasn't prepared to, to that I didn't have ready to hand here. And I will, I will give you the data. So, and, and there has to be like, so just like there, there would be a statistically possible way for us to control for the number of people whose suicide was taken, who, who, um, died by suicide, sorry, this language I feel like is really important to get right. So who died by suicide and um, to control for those who, in, 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 and remove from that total count because we would have medical record of it. So I don't think that that's an impossible analysis to do given the data the way it exists now. This is not my expertise. I wouldn't even know what data set to start on to, to run this test myself. But, um, but if you know what data set, I could certainly do that too for the committee. Um, but, but yeah, I, so, so I'm just asking, you know, I, I think that I haven't seen data that presents that separately, which makes me skeptical of it as a data source, right? So, so if it was possible to draw that, you know, that, that conclusion, then I would imagine that that would be very easy, a very easy analysis to run, but that's not what was run. So I think that that's just an important distinction, but but I'm, I'm so sorry. This is, I feel, I feel like I've taken too much of your time. So thank you very no, much. Right. No, these are important questions. Thank you, uh, Representative Cook, followed by Representative Elliott. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, doctor, could you clarify, I logged on, but I missed your introduction. Could you clarify what your doctorate is in, please? It's in moral theology and bioethics. All right, and so you have no medical um, training as a, as a doctor, correct? Uh, I don't know what you mean by medical training. If you mean like as a clinician, no, but I'm, I'm on a hospital ethics committees. I've I'm very worked very closely with cl clinicians from the time I was a graduate student. My first book was on neonatal um, bioethics and I rounded with NICU teams for two straight years and both overseas in the United States and have continued to be very close to clinicians. That is a weakness of bioethics. I will be totally upfront with you is they tend to be either clinicians who don't have much training in philosophy or theology, or people like me who have a lot of training in philosophy and theology and have these other connections to the clinic. But, but yeah, so the, the best bioethicists are ones that are both MDs and PhDs, but we just don't have a lot of those. Thank you for that. And then um, did I hear you reference that we should follow the medical, the medical path as opposed to what one's personal belief might be on whether or not they wanted to end their life? Or did you state that a little bit differently early on? I said that medicine is, uh, if it is to remain a professional field, um, is an ends based endeavor. It's objective. It's about something. Um, the, the autonomy of the patient is important, but the autonomy of the patient doesn't trump medicine's right to just say what it is and what it isn't. So if medicine were to say, we are about um, care, we are about healing, we are about accompaniment, except when a patient wants us to help them die, help them kill themselves, um, then we've, we've crossed the threshold. We've said medicine is really about whatever the patient asks of us, not about you know, some objective you know, thing that we are as professionals. 
And too much of our, I think our culture has been co-opted by the market, by a capitalistic impulse to let the market decide whatever something is. And if we let the market decide whatever medicine is, I think we're going in a very, very dangerous place. So then do you take an issue or a stance on a DNR? Oh, well, I'm not exactly sure what you mean by that, but yes, there has to be regulations around DNRs for sure. So, but if someone decides at any given time, so I can right now um, sign a piece of paper at any given time I go in for a medical procedure at a hospital or with my attorney and state that I do not want to be resuscitated. Do you believe that is something that should maintain its its existence, or is that something that should also be gone because that would be one's decision to not have any further medical care in, in one's life? Yeah, I think there's a big difference between forcing a physician to participate in something and a patient saying, I don't want you to do something to me, which is what a DNR is. So, um, but I do think we need to be careful about DNRs. One of the things I mentioned in my testimony earlier, at least in a discussion earlier, was how DNRs often don't come, or it's probably better to say too often, they don't come directly from the patients themselves, but are even coerced by doctors. Again, that's one thing I, I urge you to Google NPR and disability and forced coerced DNR, um, DNRs, because it's very often not the case that DNRs come from the autonomous decision of the patient. And in, in fact, I think we, I mean, this is me speaking as a bioethicist and as an academic, I think we need a, a whole new kind of discussion about what it means to autonomously make choices at all when one is dying, when one is um, in various contexts, which makes autonomy, quote unquote, so difficult to even talk about. That's one reason why you'll hear later from the disability community, why they don't even like the, the term autonomy as being so connected with this. Um, because that's not the case for autonomous. Autonomy is not the case, is not the stage of life for people who have disabilities, right? And so human dignity, I think, is a much better way. Human equality, fundamental human equality should be our focus, not, not autonomy. Well, I might take a little pause with the DNR, ref, like the DNR, your view on the DNR, because I know like when my father-in-law signed his, he was in his 60s and he lived to be 90. Um, and COVID actually took his life. We actually, and we took him off of the ventilator, um, given the, the situation at hand. And obviously, you know, hundreds of thousands of people have lost their lives, but they did have an ability well before COVID was even in our vernacular to sign a DNR and state, I do not want to be resuscitated. And so any medical doctor, well, whenever that happened, if they could produce that DNR, would not have been able to follow any other medical treatment. And they would have had to have abided by what that legal document stated, correct? Uh, presumably, yes. Assuming it was a legal DNR and all that, yes. So are, do you believe that that is a definition of assisted suicide? No. Okay. Um, and then my last, my last question or, um, and then statement was, somebody was speaking earlier about the fact that they believed that the definition of terminal was all of us, that once we were born, we were already into a, what we would consider to be some type of a terminal life and we were all going to die eventually. Um, did you agree to that statement? I'm just curious. I don't know who said it. I was on my phone. I didn't have a camera. Um, well, what's the song? We're all, we've all been dying, dying since the day we're born. I forget what, where, where that comes from. I mean, it's, it's kind of a, a amusing on a broader point, which I agree with, which is it's really hard to decide when somebody's dying. If you're, if by dying, you just mean we know that they're going to die. So if, if again, Back in the 90s, when, when Magic Johnson got HIV, IV, AIDS, we would have probably considered him terminally ill at the time. Now he's running one of the most successful businesses around and multiple businesses, in fact. Right. Um, he followed the science, did enormous amount of, you know, injections and vaccinations and you fill in the blank and he did all these things and he is continuous. He's still with us today. I agree with you. Yeah. So it's just notoriously difficult to decide when somebody is dying or what one even means when one, when one says somebody is dying, it's, it's easier at the final stages. And I know this from my own clinical um, experiences rounding with physicians and, and others, there is a time as probably many of you know, when the dying process starts to take place, right. But mm -hmm. that's not till, you know, weeks or probably days. Um, when you start getting into months and certainly years, it's, it becomes just so much more difficult. Would that make a difference for you in this in this conversation that if somebody was weeks 
from dying um, to allow them to make a decision on how that was for them at the end versus the six months that I've heard debated back and forth here? It would in one sense. It wouldn't in the sense that I think our, our approach should be to get better palliative care and, and show what I think is genuine compassion for people and, and not treat them as a throwaway population. But, but it, it, so it wouldn't in that sense, but in the sense of like worrying about a slippery slope, it would because there you have something objective you can kind of point to a dying process that people who work with patients at the end of their lives all kind of know people, especially in hospices know. But again, once you get to six months, I just don't see a principled reason why anybody would stop there. We, we know that people are dying at 12 months in the same way we know people are dying in six months. So I mean, I've seen end of life for a two-year-old and I've seen end of life for a nine-year-old. It is heartbreaking. And when somebody is begging you to end their life because they can't handle the pain, um, there's nothing worse than that. And I'm sure that you might've seen that as well. But I do, I do want us to be very cautious. And I'm, this is not directed to you. This is an overall statement for whatever the rest of the day holds. Um, that I want us to be very cautious of how we define and discuss terminal illness and those folks that are truly terminal. Um, I don't consider my life, although I often joke about the fact that the minute I was born, I started dying. Um, and I don't mean that in a joke kind of flippant way. It's just a matter of, yes, we are all dying. Um, but I don't ever compare my situation with my life. And I'm blessed to have it to somebody that is terminal and truly terminal um, with no end game. And is whoever said that, you know, that we are all terminal. Um, I, I really, I, I took pause at that and went and Googled the definition of terminal. And it is truly the meaning of incurable, um, which means no medication, no anything is going to change that conversation. And it would be an incurable disease with no resolve other than death. Um, so as we all move forward with our conversations, um, I would just hope that anybody that is having um, these debates and these conversations, that we are very cautious about what we say, because there are, there are millions of people with terminal illnesses, from the young to the old, um, and family members that are actually watching us display um, a dialogue on how we may or may not offer what is to them later on in life. And we need to be conscious of the pain and agony that they're all going through. And I would just hope that we do not continue to compare terminal to what anybody's angst and anxiety and pain and suffering is right now. Um, but thank you, doctor, for all of your um, time with us today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. And, and to your point, Representative, I again direct everybody to the actual bill. The definition of terminal illness is in the bill, and it puts that decision in the hands of a medical professional, not any other lay person. Representative Elliott. Thanks, um, Chairman Steinberg. So I just have really one question and I, it's, it's fair to ask you a hypothetical as a, a, a ethicist. So let's say hypothetically, in a vacuum, not looking at the slippery slope argument, which looks beyond the scope of one person dying and looks more systemically or societally. If you have a person who has, let's say three months left to live, who is riddled with cancer, who is in such pain that palliative care does nothing to relieve that person's pain. Two doctors as prescribed by this law have told this person that they have three months left to live. And that is an accurate diagnosis. This person will die if nothing else is done in three months. And again, this is a hypothetical. And a, uh, a psych doctor talks to this person and, and says that this person uh, does not have depression. There, there are, are no underlying uh, problems with this person's mental health. They are in full control of their faculties. Nobody is pressuring this person to die. And of this person's own personal willingness, they want to choose life ending medication. Under this specific set of circumstances, would you say that it's okay that this person has that option? Another excellent question pinning me down. Um, before I answer that, uh, let me say something with reference to the way I teach bioethics in my courses. We, 
explicitly disconnect questions of morality from questions of policy. We do questions of morality like you're asking right now. First, you're asking me a question about an individual moral case, the, doing a moral evaluation of individual case. Once you get into um, policy, which is what this committee's hearing is about, you, especially if you're a progressive who, who looks at social structures, you really can't look at just one case like that in the abstract. You have to look at what the policy does overall. So for instance, in a, when we look at abortion in my classes, people who are pro-life tend to be immoral and they don't necessarily think about the policy. So I challenge them to think, well, what happens if you put this policy into place and only um, abortions are done that are illegal and more women, no babies are saved and only women die more often. It, you know, so there's a hope when you, when you get into the structures, when you get into context, when you get into the reality of how we live with each other in a polity, a whole different set of questions present themselves. And that's what we've been mostly talking about today. With regard to your specific question though, which is a moral question, I would say that's one of the more sympathetic cases. Like there's just no doubt about that. Um, I would say we should do palliative sedation to control this individual's pain, like not aim, to use a fancy phrase, not aim at their death, but do everything we can to sedate them, not everything we can to sedate them so they don't feel their pain. And so they pass um, naturally without medicine having killed them. I think that's the way to go without fundamentally changing what medicine is and what it's about. Um, but I will also say it's interesting to think about based on what I already said, what is an autonomous decision in that case? Like, is it possible? Like, how can one make an autonomous decision when one is in that circumstance, right? Especially if one is um, feeling pressure from various parts of their life, their family, their, I know you've built in a scenario where maybe that's not part of the case, but I often wonder, like we, we when we default to autonomy, we have this image of somebody like you or I, like very much with it, having our morning coffee, being very attentive, having no physical or, or mental or psychological distractions and do like rationally making a choice. But that's really not the person of somebody. Um, that's not the situation of the person you just described, right? They're, they're at the very least, they're having many different forces in their life, pushing them in various different directions. So again, I just wonder if autonomy is even the right way to think about it. But anyway, I'm, I'm starting to ramble here, but let me just say, I, I think that's very sympathetic. Um, but I, I think it well, first of all, it's again, not the, in the top five reasons um, that people request it in Oregon. And also, I think we should move towards palliative sedation and less towards aiming at death. Okay, so just, just to paraphrase what you said, you said, if we don't have medication that could take away their pain, we should put them into a coma. You said that nobody can really make an independent choice because things are outside of our control. And you, that. And, and, that. and you said that we should really only ever be looking at worst case scenarios and, and we should not even be looking at best case scenarios is, is what I heard from you. I, I did not hear a yes or a no with a finite question, with, with a finite dictum about what was and was not. All I heard was everything but that. So my question to you again is in the case where somebody only has a few months to live, they're in terrible pain, nothing will take away that pain. And they've had two doctors, again, everything that I'm saying is, is verbatim prescribed by this law that we are talking about today. Two separate doctors have looked at this person and said that this person will die in three months and they are objectively correct. This person will die in three months. Nothing, again, will take away their pain. A psych doctor has looked at this person and they said, this person is not depressed. There are no underlying mental health issues. This person is making the decision of their own free will and of their own accord. And in this hypothetical, we are going to say that this person has that ability to have free will and do this of their own free accord. I, I don't think we should take this beyond that and say, do people really have free will or not? I, I think we, we ought to leave it there. My question to you stands, in that situation, should this person be allowed to take this life ending medication? I don't know if you just want me to repeat what I said before, because you basically no, repeated. I, 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 I leave my question. Thank you, Chairman. OK. I believe that is all the questions we have for this uh, speaker. Thank you for your patience. Uh, I, I don't recall in my 11 years in the legislature ever, ever having had such a broadly speculative philosophical conversation about a very specific bill. But thank you very much. Uh, we are now well past the hour for elected officials. 
And according to my calculation, if we continue at this rate, we will be here for over seven days. So unless you want to be here talking at 9 a.m. next Friday morning, I think we're gonna need to pick the pace up a little bit. So um, we will go to members of the public and then alternate with elected officials. So next up would be number nine, Joseph Pankowski. Welcome, Joseph. Thank you very much. Please continue. My name is Joe Pankowski. I'm a partner in the Stanford law firm of Wofsey, Rosen, Kweskin, and Kuriansky. I head my firm's wills, trusts, and probate practice, and I also serve as the chairman of the Commission on Aging in Darien. I am here to support House Bill 6425, which would permit terminally ill patients in certain very limited circumstances to obtain medication to pursue a peaceful death on their own terms. I am testifying solely in my individual capacity. Current Connecticut law makes a significant distinction between end of life decisions for a terminally ill patient who is on a life support system and one who is not. An advanced healthcare directive signed by the former will stop the use of artificial respiration and artificial means of providing nutrition and hydration, thereby allowing the hospitalized patient to pass away. However, if a terminally ill patient is experiencing existential suffering, but is not on a life support system, he or she must simply wait for the progression of his or her disease to reach its bitter end. House Bill 6425 addresses this situation by enabling such a patient to obtain a life-ending drug from a physician which can be self-administered. Opponents of six, House Bill 6425, as you've already heard, will testify to potential abuses which could occur if this bill becomes law. However, this legislation has significant safeguards to ensure that aid and dying prescriptions are properly dispensed. A terminally ill patient must be within six months of the date determined to be his or her likely natural death and must make three requests to his or her attending physician for aid and dying. And one of these must be in writing. The patient has to sign the requisite document in the presence of two witnesses who must affirm that he or she is of sound mind and not under any undue influence. Furthermore, two physicians must certify that the patient is competent and has voluntarily requested the medication. Back in 1998, Oregon was the first state to permit a physician to prescribe medication to hasten death for a terminally ill patient. Oregon statistics show that 2,000 518 people have received prescriptions since then, and that 66% of that group have died from taking the medications. Why did 34% of the patients who acquired a prescription not end their own lives? Dr. Charles Blank, a physician in Oregon said, it could be that just knowing that they have the option is enough. It's there if they need it, and it may, may relieve their fear of loss of control. Aid and dying legislation is making steady progress across the country. Oregon has been joined by eight other states in the District of Columbia and having such a law on their books. As in these jurisdictions, terminally ill Connecticut citizens deserve the option to die with dignity. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And I wanna uh, thank you as well for focusing on the specifics of what is actually in this bill versus what others have speculated may be in the bill. Uh, though I am concerned about one phrase you used, which was existential suffering, which does seem to get back into a more philosophical uh, argument. What do you mean by existential suffering? And in your understanding, according to this bill, who gets to decide that? The individual gets to decide it. A person who is within six months of his or her date of death as determined by her or his physician should have that opportunity to say, okay, how much am I suffering? The previous witness, uh, Professor Charles Comacy, noted that, oh, we need some just more palliative care. Perhaps if this person wasn't in so much pain, he or she wouldn't want to end his or her own life. It's not the case. The reality is they may have all kinds of reasons why they feel that suffering in this fashion is not worth it. And once again, it's extremely limited. We're not talking about someone who's 23 and is going through a very difficult time. We're not talking about individuals 
who are mentally disabled. We're not talking about people of this nature. We are talking purely about individuals who are within six months of their date of their natural death as determined by their individual physician and have decided that I am suffering way too much. And for whatever reason, we should respect their autonomy. Thank you. Uh, I take it you're an attorney? I'm a Wills Trust and Probate Attorney here in Connecticut. I have served here for over 30 years, uh, dealing with clients who have been in these situations, sadly. Now, there'll be plenty of people here today who will testify as to horrible suffering they've witnessed, so I won't go into it. It's not fair to my clients, and certainly due to rules of professional responsibility, I can't get into those. But the reality here is, yes, there are people out there who would like this option, and I understand from a person of religious background, of which I'm one. I'm a 1996 graduate of the Yale Divinity School. So I am a person of faith. However, in my denomination, Unified, Unified excuse me, United Church of Christ, we believe God is still speaking. And I wonder, and, and it's not for this group, we've been had a Connecticut constitution since 1818, which has separation of church and state. But I don't want people to take away today, this is a question of between their religion and other things. This is simply a question for legislators to determine, should an individual within six months of the date of his death or her death have the option to go and meet his or her maker if there is one? Thank you. Um, the reason I asked that question was that um, you may have heard the previous speaker allude to a judge's ruling vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, this bill being problematic. Uh, I'm just going to ask, have, have you done any study of uh, the history of such judicial rulings in any state in the United States? And, and do you share his speculation that this would be struck down? I, I have not. I'm not aware of any such legislation. Perhaps he can come back and tell the committee where he's found stuff. I'm not seeing it. With that said, I can't say it doesn't happen. But this bill is very, very specific that physicians, hospitals do not have to participate. And that's where I think he was going with this. Oh, perhaps a physician will have to be compelled to participate. This bill is very straightforward. I take this case in a heartbeat for any doctor because the legislation itself says directly, you do not have to do this. Thank you. Uh, Representative Zupkis, followed by Representative Betts. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, a quick question. So um, I'm going to wait to ask a doctor my first one, because I don't know how you know when how much time people have left. But my question to you is, so my father, um, had a heart attack, mm. went into ICU and was on life support. And so he had a living will. And I'm very grateful for that because it saved a lot of pain. But why not have a living will? Why this way? What is the difference? Great question. Fantastic question. Every single one of the clients which I've dealt with over the last 30 years as a wills, trust, and probate attorney signs three documents. A will, power of attorney, which deals with financial issues, and a living will, which is an advanced healthcare directive, which says, if I am ever in a terminal condition and a persistent vegetative state, please pull the plug, turn off artificial means of hydration and nutrition, turn off cardiopulmonary resuscitation, et cetera. The difference between what we're talking about today and that is this, it worked for seniors and perhaps even for your dad to turn off the machine. But what if your dad wasn't on a machine? What if he was at home? What if he was in a position where he was experiencing what I've termed existential suffering and would like to have the opportunity not to experience this suffering any longer? There'll be plenty of people who argue, oh, that you know, we shouldn't let him do that. That's got, that could cause all kinds of problems. I completely disagree. The reality is, is if you can have your plug pulled on a machine in a Connecticut hospital, you should have the right to have a physician give you a prescription that says at your choice of time, and as noted in Oregon, 34% of the people don't do it, okay? You have the right to take that pill yourself, take that medication yourself, whatever it turns out to be, whether it's in pill or liquid form, I don't know, I'm a lawyer, not a doctor. But at the end of the day, roughly within an hour, you will meet your maker if there is one. Well, thank you. Um, I could never, if it, I am mean, grateful he had a living will, because if it was the other case you described, I could never accept that. 
right? Fair. As my father, Absolutely. right? Sure. Because it was hard enough. Now, um, but so I guess my question is going to be later down the road that why can't this be put in a living will? If this is how you feel, and I may not know that I'm getting cancer until, you know, if I ever get it, God forbid, I hope I don't. if you ever do put it in your living will to say, this is what I want done. This um, is what I'm worried. That's actually something I'm worried about. Okay. That is where we're going down that slippery slope. The key to this legislation is you actually have to have a doctor first certify that you're within six months of your date of death before you sign this document. In other words, once again, a 28 year old could say someday if I'm determined to be whatever, but they might change their mind. I think it's really critically important that a person consider such a hard question within six months of the date of his or her death. And that six month figure based upon my research is found throughout the states and the District of Columbia, which have considered this. So this idea it's gonna be nine months, a year, could be the Netherlands, who knows what's gonna happen? It's just wrong, okay? The reality is people are sticking to this six month rule for a reason that we want to make sure that people have the right when they're within that short time period, not to experience further suffering. They'd like to have the opportunity the option to be able to take, take hmm. their own life. Okay. Thank you. I still don't understand six months, how we all know, but um, thank you. I appreciate it. That's fair. Thank you. Representative Betts. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, thank you for your testimony. And I have a, um, uh, a question. You're an attorney. Is that correct? That is correct. My question is, this is such a complex, difficult issue. It's not one size fits all. In your judgment, in your legal opinion, is it possible to write legislation that will um, address with equity and with um, compassion, both sides on this issue. In other words, I'm not, I, I really don't know that this is a role the legislature or the state government should ever participate in because we don't know the individual circumstances. And in fact, I think it's better to leave it to the individual, the doctor, the clergy, the family, we're actually going through it as opposed to our trying to write a letter, uh, write a, a law that may be well intended, but does not apply to their situation. Are we not walking into a, um, a very dangerous situation trying to legislate something that frankly, I'm not sure can be legislated? Um, I will respectfully disagree. The whole point okay. of this legislation is to give patient the autonomy to do exactly what they could do if they were in a hospital and they were terminally ill and they were about to be put on a machine. They could say, nope, doc, due to my principle of autonomy, I don't want to be on that machine. Don't resuscitate me. That's a DNR. Do not resuscitate order. Do not put me on artificial respiration. Do not put me on artificial nutrition and hydration. We respect that already. Okay. That's in the law. You can do that now. That's in a living will. Okay. This takes the next step. The next step is the person is not on a machine, not going to be on a machine. They're going to have to let the natural processes end in a potentially horrific manner. They don't want to do that. Perhaps their family doesn't want to do that. But certainly this legislation is extremely well drafted. Kudos to whoever did this, okay? It's fantastic. It's providing so many protections against exactly the same kinds of things that the previous witness testified to. It's a wonderful bill. It's a bill we really need here in Connecticut to allow people who are in this limited circumstance to be able to have the autonomy they want to be able to take the next step. So I appreciate what you're saying. Let's say we don't have the legislation and we're in the world we're in right now. Um, what is the problem or is there any circumstance that has propelled us to consider legislation uh, given the current circumstances? In other words, um, I, I know of se several circumstances where the family and the doctor and the clergy all got together and they were all on the same page, including the patient uh, to reach a common uh, 
decision that's supported by both. But when you don't have that, okay, it becomes much more complex, requires more time, and no law is going to be able to make that decision to the satisfaction of everybody involved. Is that not true? I think what you're referring to, I'm, I'm gonna take it into a hospital setting. There's something known as the principle of double effect. And that is that perhaps the patient, the family, the minister, the priest, the rabbi, all get together and, and they all say, well, you know what? Dad's in a lot of pain. Dad, are you in a lot of pain? Yeah, let's up the morphine dose, okay? We're just gonna kill the pain. But guess what, dad? That can also result in your death. Are you okay with that, okay? That is morally permissible, including by my former witness, provided that you are trying to simply treat the pain, not trying to kill the person. Now, where do you find that line? That's a really hard one, isn't it? Because the reality is that perhaps with a dose of morphine or two doses or three doses, and again, I'm a lawyer, not a doctor, okay? We're in a position where, yes, that will result in a person's death. Now, we all agree that perhaps that might be a good thing, but it's a really sticky wicket ethically as to whether that's legit. Now, let's go back. I'm suggesting that this person, an individual, should have the autonomy to do what they wish to do. And yes, I'd love for him or her to be able to consult with their family members, to consult with their clergy if they have any, Again, it's a principle of autonomy. And I'm just gonna draw very quickly over to the conservatorship procedure, which we have here in the state of Connecticut. We, we draft laws which say that a person who is deemed incapable of caring for himself or his personal affairs can be conserved by a probate court. But that must be proven by clear and convincing evidence. And it's a really high standard as, as you all know as legislators, okay? That's again, a principle of autonomy. We want an individual to be able to live in his or her own home for as long as they can. And it's only when they are determined to be incapable that we take away that right. Here, I want to extend that right to, to an individual who is competent, okay, to be in a position to decide within six months of his or her natural de death that they will in fact have that opportunity. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Representative. Uh, uh, Representative Foster. Hi, thank you so much for being here today. Just a quick question. We have had some questions about the six month um, uh, number. It's my understanding that's that's related to Medicaid, Medicare. Is that is that true? Is I that wish I knew. I'm I, I, sorry, okay. I don't. Sorry. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony today. We will now alternate back uh, Representative Meskers, followed by uh, number 10, Tim Appleton. Welcome, Representative. Thank you, um, uh, Chair Steinberg and Chair uh, Abrams. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you. Um, at this time, I'm, I'm the state representative for the 150th district in Greenwich. At this point, I'd like to cede my time to Mr. Jason Smith, who I believe is in the room. I'm not sure if he needs to be promoted. He's one of the residents. We do see him in the room. Uh, he just needs to unmute himself. Let me make, I will. I think you've done all you can, Representative. It's up to him. There we go. Okay, perfect. Please proceed, sir. Thank you, uh, co-chairs Mary Doherty Abrams and Jonathan Steinberg, Vice Chairs Saul Kushner, Gilchrist, and Ranking Members Wong, Summers, and Pettit for the opportunity to testify today in support of House Bill 6425. My name is Jason J. Smith, and I live in Greenwich, Connecticut. I'm also the president of the Completed Life Initiative, which is a nonprofit foundation that acts to champion legislative and policy efforts to advance medical aid and dying legislation across the United States, including bills like House Bill 6425. I'm here today to speak to you about an issue that deeply moves me personally, and I'm humbly asking you to approve House Bill 6425 for further consideration by the Connecticut legislature. The prospect that someone with a terminal illness would have to suffer is deeply harrowing to me. 
I have witnessed it firsthand with my late Aunt Rachel. In January of 2020, I answered the phone to receive terrible news. My dear Aunt Rachel, whom I had known and loved my entire life, had died. Worse still, she died by suicide. This is my Aunt Rachel. Aunt Rachel was a very important role model to me in my teen years and beyond. My first solo trip on an airplane was to visit my Aunt Rachel. She picked me up from the airport and we embarked on a road trip to the World's Fair in Vancouver, Canada. Along the way, she introduced me to the great city of Seattle, Washington and the beautiful scenery of coastal Washington State and British Columbia. I came to know Aunt Rachel in a whole new light on that trip. She was an independent, free thinker, a career children's librarian and grant writer, and a kind, gentle soul. She was such an interesting, compassionate, and fascinating person, and we stayed close right up until she died. After my children were born, Aunt Rachel, who again had been a children's librarian, would carefully select the perfect books to send to my children each Christmas, and we would read them together. I loved her so much, which made her death so heartbreaking for me. Throughout her later years, and especially at the end of her life, my aunt suffered from multiple sclerosis and significantly deteriorating osteoporosis. Her condition caused her spine and rib cage to collapse forward, placing debilitating pressure on her lungs, internal organs, and pelvis. Her pain became unbearable and its intensity only increasing and amplified by her clear and lucid mind. She dreaded waking up each day in so much pain. Finally, with no available alternatives to ensure that she could die with dignity, she couldn't take it anymore and took her own life by suffocating herself. With a plastic bag. To say that she had a bad death would be a tremendous understatement. She suffered the most ungracious and undignified and horrible death imaginable. And if my aunt had been able to die with dignity, she would have been able to complete her life while she still enjoyed it, when her suffering was much more manageable and she had not reached the level where it had pervaded every moment of her existence. And unfortunately, my aunt's long suffering and tragic end of life is not unusual. In states without medical aid and dying legislation, states like Connecticut, Terminally ill individuals have very few choices for entering this, ending their suffering. Those in extreme pain might be able to obtain morphine or similar opioids, gradually increasing their dosage until they lose consciousness and then die, suffering, suffering all along the way. For those on life support, such as a ventilator, they can withdraw the life support, but again, suffering horribly. Others might choose to stop eating and drinking and be forced to deal with the pain of severe dehydration and hunger. You hit your three minute mark if you wouldn't mind uh, concluding your remarks. I just wanna say uh, my esteemed panelists and, and members that for those who are terminally ill, these options are not acceptable. All they do is require that the individual suffer even longer. This legislation provides adequate safeguards so that those who know what they are doing, that they have consent, they're informed, they are terminally ill. Doctors are not required to provide medication that they have a conscientious objection to. It adequately protects all the various interests involved. I ask you please to support this bill and approve it for further consideration. Thank you. I'll be happy to answer your questions. Thank you for testifying today, uh, particularly sharing uh, such a difficult story. Uh, I imagine it will not be the, the last such story we hear today. Uh, we, we have, uh, we have the interest in hearing real life stories, though I also must caution everyone to try to keep your remarks to, to roughly three minutes. It, was, it would be very hard to interrupt you in the middle of a, such a story, but we do have a lot of people we need to speak with. Um, you may have heard uh, the first speaker today talk about how uh, a preferable option would simply be to totally anesthetize the individual, that that was a humane option to give them the ability to choose how would you react to that? I would say that that's not a humane option at all. In fact, it's, it's really no option. Um, palliative sedation, as that is referred to, um, you know, it generally means that you're just going to put someone into a coma. 
that they're going to not experience life uh, in any way that we would understand or relate to. Um, and it's what we're really doing is taking someone who is already dying, they have been confirmed to be terminally ill, and we're just going to make them wait longer to die. Um, we're going to continue their suffering. And there is no moral or uh, principled reason to force people to continue to live under those circumstances when they, if they had the option that they would choose a more humane option and they could, for instance, self-administer the medication after having a goodbye ceremony, as is often the case, as opposed to just lingering for weeks uh, in a coma in a hospital setting, uh, alone and afraid. Thank you. Representative Gilchrist. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Representative Meskers and Mr. Smith. Just a statement. Um, thank you for sharing your aunt with us. Um, she sounds like a wonderful woman. I'm sorry for your loss, and thank you for turning your tragedy into advocacy. Thank you. Representative Dauphiné. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and thank you so much for your testimony. I'm so, so very sorry for the loss of your aunt. Um, I do, just one question, was she given a terminal um, a, a six months or less to live? I, you didn't mention that, I just wanted to clarify. She was not officially certified as terminally ill. Um, she was, she lived in an area, unfortunately, where there was, uh, she was a very rural area, not very uh, many options for uh, obtaining medical care from physicians who would even discuss these options with her. Um, we did talk about what her options were um, in her state in the absence of that specific diagnosis. Um, as these committee members may be aware, when someone is deemed to be terminally ill is a matter for physicians to determine. Obviously, you generally have to be deemed to uh, be reasonably likely to die within six months of your condition. There are a lot of people like my Aunt Rachel that um, we would probably all consider to be terminal um, that doctors may not decide are. Um, and so that is uh, obviously a, a, an issue that bears further analysis. But here to have the requirement that someone be terminally ill by two, be determined terminally ill by two physicians provides a safeguard to ensure that we are uh, only providing this option for people who truly qualify for it where medicine is not going to save them that all we are doing is giving them the option to end their suffering at their own choice, on their own terms, and at the time of their choosing. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Smith, for sharing that um, testimony about your aunt. And thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative. Are there any further questions? I see none. Uh, thank you for your testimony today. We, we appreciate your, your candor and your courage in speaking before us. Uh, next up is... Um, um, let's see, that would be number 10, Tim Appleton, and then back to Representative Hughes. Uh, good morning, uh, chairs, vice chairs, ranking members, and members of the Public Health Committee. My name is Tim Appleton from South Windsor, Connecticut, and, Compa and Compassion and Choices. Thank you for your time today. I appear before you to lift up the voices of tens of thousands of Connecticut supporters um, who seek expanded options at end of life, including aid in dying. Terminally ill, mentally capable adults seeking the option to use aid in dying if their suffering becomes uh, too unbearable are not deciding to die. A disease is already taking their life. They're merely deciding to avoid the very worst, the very last part of the dying process. Something so evident to all of us since the beginning of this terrible pandemic, which has claimed so many of our friends and family. Currently, nine states in Washington, D.C. have authorized aid in dying, most recently Maine and New Jersey passing similar laws. The momentum for this issue is self-evident. As people reject the notion zip codes and, and state boundaries should define a terminally ill person's end-of-life journey. The bill is modeled, as Representative Steinberg said, after the 1994 Oregon Death with Dignity Act, and includes the same strict eligibility criteria and core safeguards that have been time tested and proven to protect patients. The dying person requests a medication multiple times, orally and in writing, and they must decide when they want to self-ingest it in charge of the process the entire way. In peer reviewed study after study, the worst case scenarios, hypotheticals and concerns opponents have raised 
that we've heard already this morning, over two decades have not been borne out in data or evidence. In other words, members of the committee, the law is working as intended for whom it's intended. Terminally ill Connecticut residents don't have the luxury of endless deliberation. They need this compassionate option right now, some of whom you'll hear testify today. The cost of inaction is immense and paid for uh, by terminally ill patients, people like friends of mine, Bradford Blanchard, Sarah Myers, Mike Mazzone, Mal Gorin, Bill Meyer, and more, all who desperately pled before this same committee for this option, each one of them dying difficult deaths without it. The debate quite simply comes down to who decides how much pain and suffering is enough? The dying person in consultation with their doctors, loved ones and faith leaders, or the government. I urge passage of the bill. Not a single additional person will die if you pass this compassionate bill, but far fewer will suffer. Thank you, and I'll be happy to take questions if you have them. Thank you, sir. Uh, and I want to thank you for mentioning Bill Meyer, uh, uh, a former constituent of mine and uh, a colleague of mine when I served on my town's representative town meeting, who first acquainted me with this entire issue eight, nine years ago, uh, and was uh, really a, a, a uh, on the forefront of trying to deal with this issue going back many years in terms of uh, how he tried to help his father uh, end life on his own terms. Uh, you've heard the testimony before uh, with regard to uh, a lot of conversations about slippery slopes and a lot of speculation about what's going to happen with this bill. Um, since you, you've been involved in this cause for some time, you know, how do you help us address the concerns about coercion, uh, particularly with the disability community, but with, with any group? Um, how, why should we be confident this bill, to the degree possible, reduces and, uh, and mitigates the concerns about family members, medical professionals, insurance companies, anybody else other than the individual making this choice for themselves. Um, uh, uh, thank you for, uh, thank you also for referencing uh, Bill Meyer. What a great guy. Um, I get, you're asking a great question. And uh, my uh, grandmother who, uh, was a teacher at West Virginia University, often said, uh, when you start evoking slippery slopes, you realize you're on the path to a losing argument. And, you know, I would really representative point to the, uh, tw uh, you know, over 20 years of experience with this legislation. And uh, without a single case of abuse, misuse, or coercion attributed to this legislation when you dig right into it. Um, if uh, what our opponents uh, who have been making the same claims for over 20 years, if what they said were true, there would be peer reviewed study after study that, that would discuss uh, how terrible this law was. But when you look into, uh, when you look into these studies and you know, examine the evidence, you'll see that because this option exists, uh, more people enter into hospice than would have before. You'll see the length of hospice stay is what uh, hospice associations say is exactly what the average is. And all, all these benefits uh, are attributed to more options existing at end of life. Uh, moreover, what happens is because, uh, you know, people are having these open and honest conversations about what they want at end of life with their doctors and their family and if faith leaders, if they have them, more and more people know exactly what this patient wants at end of life and therefore improving the journey toward uh, the end of a terminally ill, mentally capable adult. I have heard people, uh, you know, there are people I know that have established residence in, set, in, new, in another state that has authorized date and dying and they speak because they're terminally ill, they used to live here because they're terminally ill and for them, uh, they suffer less because they don't have the anxiety of the unknown and the unknown suffering at the end of life. You know, an, another way to think about it is this. Uh, you can imagine if someone had uh, a means with which to end their suffering, uh, should it get too much for them and is in, uh, they might end up, and knowing this option exists, 
they might be willing to take that next step of getting another experimental treatment for a cancer, for instance. But without this option, you know, they're faced with this terrible unknown. And, and as a result, you know, it, it can be very, very difficult. And I, I you know, I applaud the, uh, uh, you know, you're going to hear uh, from many people who testify today that this is a very lived and real experience. Uh, uh, we talk about palliative sedation. Uh, that was uh, mentioned earlier as well, if, if you'll allow me. Um, you know, the studies have shown 95% of people respond to palliative sedation should that be a, an option you want. That is an option that exists today, as rightly said, but 5% of patients don't respond to it. And imagine if you are in, you know, in one of those 5% and they're uh, attempting to uh, sedate you, but you're not responding to the medication they're, they're providing. It, uh, you know, this legislation uh, addresses a specific problem and that has existed for a long time in our state and around the country. And as a result, more and more states, as I said, are passing similar laws. And as 20% of Americans have access to this law. And uh, that okay. means that there's some that have to go to different states to get it. And that's just not right. Uh, one last question, then I'll turn it over. Uh, something the first speaker said really confused me. He suggested that the, the, the five reasons that basically the, the reason for this bill, which is really, uh, you know, uh, intolerable suffering, weren't among the, the top five reasons or not high enough on the list. And there was a bunch of other stuff that was really why people were applying for this. Do you understand this? Could you clarify? Well, uh, his statements were a little bit confusing to me as well, but, and more, more because uh, it, it suggested uh, uh, a dated view of medicine today. And what I'm talking about is kind of a patriarchal view of medicine today that says, don't worry patient, we can handle all pain and suffering for you. Don't worry patient, you know, your reasons why you might want different options uh, you know, might not be viewed uh, you know, for, uh, favorably by me and therefore uh, dismissed. Uh, we are in a place and, you know, this is the 21st century. Uh, these laws have been on the books for 20 years and it's based on fundamental autonomy and patient-centered medicine. And that's what this law is all about. And uh, should a patient uh, for, uh, who is terminally ill and um, mentally capable with less than six months to live and goes through the lengthy process in order to access uh, medical aid and dying uh, medication, uh, you know, why would I ever uh, stop that person from doing it? I might not make the decision for myself, but I certainly wouldn't want to deny the decision to someone else, given those set of circumstances and if this law existed. Thank you. Senator Abrams, followed by Representative D'Amico. Thank you, Representative Steinberg, and thank you, Mr. Appleton. Um, can you talk a little bit about, in your experience, um, with people who have chosen to participate in this, whether or not they ultimately um, use it, what that means to them and their families in terms of, I, I believe I read somewhere that like 90% uh, die at home and, um, you know, that physicians work with and encourage uh, their patients to you know, notify their families and, and come up with a plan on, on how they, if they choose to um, follow through with this, how they do that. In your experience, what has that meant to the patient and what has that meant to their families? You can imagine, thank you, Senator, for that great question. You can imagine what that means. It means uh, instead of, well, and st instead of being in a hospital ICU connected with tubes and wires in a, in a setting like that, a planned death can occur, as you say, with loved ones surrounding you. Uh, and you're able to put on your favorite music and a planned death and planning for, for some patients who seek out this medication is something that they desperately want. Uh, I have heard of stories of, uh, there's a, actually, Oh, you know what? There's a, a great video called Bob's Choice that details Bob's journey uh, through this process. And I'll be more than happy to share it with, uh, you know, members of the committee. I don't want to give anybody homework here, but it's a, a great video that 
you know, Bob is a gentleman who actually, you know, acts, wants this option, accesses the law, accesses the medication, and uh, uh, uses it. And you can see in a planned death setting, uh, for some, how beautiful it would be. And you're correct. 90% uh, of people who use this option, over 90%, do so at home. Over 91% of people who use this option are already enrolled in hospice care and achieving all the benefits of hospice. Some opponents try to uh, create a false choice between hospice, palliative care, or aid in dying. It all works together in states where it's authorized. So, and you can imagine why, uh, uh, as uh, people previously testified, when uh, you know people put together their living wills, people put together their advanced directives, uh, and are more often able to have conversations about death and dying. When they're more often able to have conversations of death and dying when aid and dying is one of those options. Thank you for that. Um, I'm also wondering if you could speak, you, you spoke a little bit about this, but focus really in on um, people's concern about concerns over those in the, in the disabled community. And that argument seems to come up a lot. And I'm just wondering, has it ever, has there ever been any reality or, or you know, like you said, Oregon's been doing this for a very long time. Um, has, has any of those fears ever been realized? I, I, I should make sure I'm clear on this, Senator, because that's a great question too. I, I might, uh, you know, be in a place where I would uh, question aid in dying had it not had over 20 years of experience without a single case of abuse, misuse, or coercion clearly attributed to the law. But when you dig into the claims that the other side have, has made uh, time and time again, uh, the, the allegations remain the same. It's just different people recycling uh, the same uh, unfounded allegations over time. And it's unfortunate, uh, but uh, the fact remains, uh, the law is working as intended for whom it is intended. And that has been the case for over 25 years. Um, if had this been a brand new piece of public policy untested anywhere in the world or the nation, uh, you know, I, I would understand some of the concerns that our opponents uh, have towards this legislation, but that's not the case. Time has uh, moved forward. Time doesn't stand still. Um, there, there's uh, study after study in the Journal of uh, Medical Ethics, the American, uh, you know, again and again has shown, and I can be happy to share them with the committee, um, that uh, the concerns, uh, those in the disability uh, community uh, have proven to be unfounded. The other thing uh, I would also add to this, Senator, is that disability alone does not qualify you for aid in dying. You must have a terminal illness. Uh, so the law is uh, uh, written very well and it protects both those who seek out aid in dying and those who do not seek out aid in dying those who wish to participate in the program as a provider and those who do not wish to participate. And that's been the case for uh, you know two decades now. I hope that answers your question. It does, thank you. And I think one of the things that I, um, in reading the legislation, the many safeguards that are built in in terms of the number of requests that have to be made, the number of conversations, and still what it all comes down to is a personal choice to the very end. Mm -hmm. So you can request, uh, you know, the two times orally, the one time in writing, you can get the prescription, you don't have to fill the prescription, you can fill the prescription, you don't have to use the prescription, it's always in the hands of the patient who is pursuing this and at any point, um, they can decide not to pursue it. So um, I think that that's really an important part of it for me, because I do believe that it gives people a great deal of peace of mind and control over their lives. Uh, thank you. And, you know, there are testifiers that will come after me that will, uh, I, I know of one in particular uh, that will discuss, um, uh, you know, a setting where uh, she was involved with, uh, of a loved one who actually used aid and dying medication. We, we have a few people uh, set to testify today that can speak directly to that experience. Um, thank you so much. I offer a little bit, uh, can I offer, uh, I, I want to let other people answer questions. Sorry. That's a good Thank plan. you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair.
Uh, Representative D'Amico. Th thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and thank you, uh, Tim, for, for coming to testify. Uh, I, I just wanted to, two brief questions. D did I uh, understand you to say that, 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 uh, that there hasn't been uh, in, 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 in 20 years, I think was a, was a time frame that you referenced, there's not been a single substantiated case of abuse or coercion. Did I hear that correctly? Uh, that's right, uh, Representative, and uh, thank you for this good question. Uh, what we found is uh, there are a lot of allegations, Representative, but when you start digging into them, they all kind of fall apart. Uh, we heard earlier today about uh, an allegation regarding uh, Stephanie Packer um, that uh, somehow uh, expensive and experimental treatments by insurance companies uh, were preventing her from uh, you know, uh, seeking out what she wanted. And you know what I you know I can send more about this to the committee, but the short answer is there's no connection between the denial of expensive or experimental treatments and the coverage of medical aid in dying, as an end of life option. Insurance providers cover treatments that are deemed effective and proven, and not those considered unnecessary, experimental, or below the standard of care. This is true in most states, regardless of whether they're authorized medical aid in dying or not. Um, you know I can share more about. Uh, uh, the allegation the previous testifier put forward. However, when you examine it fully uh, and you know, with an open mind, you'll see um, that that is yet another unproven allegation. You know, think of it this way, Representative. If what opponents are saying is true about Aiden dying, there would be arrests and convictions. <laughs> you know, uh, some of the the allegations they make are terrible, uh, and you'll probably likely hear more about them today. But you know, when you, they make a terrible allegation like that, you know, you might think, you know, was anyone arrested? Was anyone, you know, sent to prison? And those answers are no. Thank you for that. And, and Mr. Chair, if I could, just one other question. Um, so, so uh, Tim, uh, I know you know more about this than, 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 than many of us, uh, than most people. So I will, because I know you've been involved in this for a long time. So uh, is there anything uh, that we should be adding to this bill based on your knowledge of, of the laws in, in the various states who have adopted this previous to us? Is there anything in, in their laws that we should be adding to this bill? Or, or do you think, you know, are, are you satisfied with the, with the composition of this bill as it stands? That's a great question, Representative, and I thank you for asking it. Um, in my view, this legislation strikes the right balance between uh, access, people being able to use the law, and safeguards, protecting other people who, who, uh, who uh, might uh, be somehow uh, at risk uh, from the law. And you know why I said clearly, uh, the law is working as intended for whom it's intended, and I think this law strikes that right balance. Um, so. Uh, you know, for me, you know, I think as it's written, uh, we're in a place that will, uh, you know, uh, afford a, a lot of comfort to so many people you're here to testify today, um, as well as protecting those who are concerned about the law. And that would be my answer. Th th thank you. I appreciate it. Th thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative. I do not see any further questions for this uh, person. So thank you, Mr. Appleton, for your testimony today. Next up, we have Representative Hughes, and that will be followed by number 11, Jill Hammerberg. Thank you, Chairmen and esteemed colleagues of the Public Health Committee. Um, I'm Representative Hughes, and I'm supporting HB uh, 6425. Um, as a legislator, but more so as a, as, as a social worker, as a um, loved one who has attended, had the honor of attending nine deaths. And I wish that we had this, uh, this very good policy already and protections already in place. I wanted to frame dying as a natural stage of our life cycle and to be careful about criminalizing it. Um, and and, uh, and I, I appreciate um, Representative Foster trying to, you know, uh, try on the language um, to, to, to really honor this sacred stage of life. And um, what I have witnessed firsthand is when we can lower the anxiety and the, um, 
possibility of extreme suffering, then the, the person, the patient relaxes. And when we can um, support the person where they're at in preparing and giving choice over the timing and um, the capacity to celebrate and have those conversations with their loved ones. And we invest in this state of Connecticut in aging in place. Why are we not investing the same for the terminally ill to allow dying in place? And um, in, in the supports of, of celebrations of the ones that I have had the honor of attending, you know, what, what previous testifiers have talked about, having the capacity to have conversation, music, singing, prayer, clergy, family, in a place of comfort, um, that kind of timing, many, many folks may not even use if they have at least the option to prepare for that and know that they can um, avoid the extreme suffering of organs shutting down, which is what I witness because we don't have that in place. And it's usually in an ICU or um, hospital setting, um, all gowned up. And I would just very much like to see, this is one of the most important things that constituents say, please, please, please pass aid in dying. And it's aid in dying and it's not assisted suicide, which is a, a concept of criminalizing um, a natural process. So I, um, on behalf of so many constituents that have begged us to bring this good policy before the state of Connecticut as a tool, as we face our own um, natural process in the life cycle, but especially as a tool to um, offer those suffering from terminal illnesses. And I think also the six month is a really good um, time frame because doctors can't tell with precision how long you have to live. So that gives some flexibility for preparation. So I just wanted to add that. Thank you. Thank you, Representative. Uh, my impression is, has been that uh, we're talking about a pretty small group of people who would choose to avail themselves of this. Uh, given your, your non-legislative uh, experience, uh, you know, you, you use the word that many people have asked for this. How many, can you, uh, without going too far in speculation, give us a, a sort of a broad side of the barn frame of reference as to really how many people would, would fall, would be eligible for taking advantage of this option? Well, it's small because like you say, it has to have all these criteria, but um, for those that um, are facing especially severe cancer diagnosis, you know, like, like extreme cancer diagnosis, that kind of thing, um, and, and really want to have the choice and the preparation and the timing around their goodbyes, this, this, would, be, this would be extraordinary because what we see often in the, in the absence of this type of policy is very very violent deaths of suffering with those organs shutting down and struggling to breathe. And it is really, really traumatizing to family members that, sur that survive it, you know, that are on the other end of their loved one dying. And they're the ones that are begging us to pass this legislation. It's the survivors of those violent suffering deaths. It's a very small percentage. And, uh, and I also said to Representative Steinberg, um, when I was so pleased that you were bringing this forth again, is that, and uh, Senator Abrams, you said this too, once people have that option and they've been qualified, very specifically vetted, they may not use it because they may be able to um, release on their own. And that's what I've witnessed as well, is people just, once people have all, uh, said their goodbyes, they just, they just die sometimes. And um, they might be able to be freer to do that once they have this prop, you know, proper vetting and preparation and may not even use it. Thank you, Representative. Representative Dauphiné. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, um, Representative, for your testimony. I'm uh, just uh, I'm curious, do you think that 
the six month window is too restrictive and it should be um, longer. For example, if you know someone's terminally ill and the, the time be 12 months versus six months versus eight months. I just wondered what your thoughts were on that. Yeah, that's a great question, Representative, because, but the folks that I have been like basically a case manager for as a social worker, they, they really, the doctors can't really tell that it's, you know, it, it, it's for sure going to be, you know, they'll say often it could be a year, it could be six months, it could be three months, but, but six months seems like a, a little bit of a middle of a road opportunity. Like maybe it should be longer, but it's really hard for medical um, physicians to tell, especially with cancer patients. And I've seen some people be given a lot longer, but uh, they die quicker. And that's the problem with um, hospice. They're often not in hospice care soon enough. And, and then suddenly we have extreme suffering. They go to the hospital and you know, th then it becomes incredibly clinical and there's no choice at that point. So this gives a, a little bit more, um, I, I don't think doctors have a really clear idea of certainty because it's so individual, like what, what, the death process and the dying process, some people fight and struggle way longer, but those aren't the people that are asking for this, right? The people that are trying to um, really um, try experimental treatments that are trying to prolong their life at all costs. They're not the ones asking for this. These are the people that are realizing that at some point the doctors say, there's no, nothing more I can do for you. There's nothing more that is going to save this. And this happened with my own father, you know, viral pneumonia in both, in both um, and he couldn't have been qualified for this because it happened pretty quickly. Um, he had uh, multiple myeloma and was, um, uh, had viral pneumonia in both lungs that filled up very quickly and his organs shut down. Um, he wouldn't have qualified, but I'm just saying that if, if people know that this is uh, it getting, getting worse and there's a six month window, it gives people time to prepare, to have those conversations with their loved one and to have some autonomy and preparation over how and where and with whom they would like to enter this natural life cycle with. Thank you for that answer. I just, I know that there's often times where people are given um, the uh, prognosis that there's nothing more than they can do um, far longer than six months in advance. I was just curious. I know in my own nursing um, career, I was a hospice nurse at one time and I on um, many occasions experienced um, individuals who were given six months or less and actually went far longer than that. So I was just curious, but thank you so much for your testimony. And uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative. I don't see any more questions, Representative Hughes. So thank you so much for your time and testimony. Keep up. Have a great day. Um, thank you. Uh, next is Jill Hammerberg followed by Representative Cheeseman. Ms. Hammerberg, if you'll unmute yourself. You can turn on video if you'd like, but otherwise go right ahead. Oh, I'd like to, um, let's see, do I, I would like to um, speak in person. Uh, so, can you hear me? Okay, start my video. Here we go. Yep, we can hear you. Okay. Go right ahead. Thank you so much. Dear members of the Public Health Committee, my name is Jill Hammerberg, and I'm providing testimony in support of HB 6425, an act concerning aid in dying for terminally ill patients. It's a personal story. I broke a promise to my husband. After living with prostate cancer for 17 and a half years, enduring surgeries and treatments with matchless resilience, he succumbed to the wretched disease as his doctors shared the MRIs with us a week before Christmas. The cancer cells had finally migrated to his bones and liver, forming massive tumors. Well, guys, he said, it's been a great run. I have no regrets. He seemed at ease as he was finally given pain medication, a blood transfusion, and sent home with the offer of hospice care. 
We locked eyes, as I promised with such naivete that he would no longer have to endure his accelerating pain. For the next six weeks, our big old friendly house welcomed waves of extended family and close friends for conversation, stories, laughs, cries, music, favorite movies, and just plain quiet time. What a gift that was for all. On that last day, our hospice nurse, our good friend, checked us with, in with us in the morning and told me that my husband would begin breaking down any time now. She gently suggested keeping a pile of dark towels by the bed because he was likely to start bleeding through any or all orifices. Later that night, and it was that night, our brave hero woke up in excruciating pain. Those haunting sounds will be with me always. He became a drowning victim, fighting us, gasping for breath. The medication which had been given to us to administer in such circumstance provided little comfort for a seeming eternity. I'm sorry I broke my promise, I whispered. As I held him close, desperately trying to absorb some of the agony, I thought it would be enough. If my husband had had the prescription waiting on the table next to our bed, no doubt he would have used it on that last sunny day. Our remaining time together as a family could have been immeasurably better and we would not be carrying the heavy burden of sadness in our hearts because of the unnecessary prolonged suffering of our beloved. So now I ask you to support HB 6425, an act concerning aid in dying for terminally ill patients in Connecticut. It should be a choice for families and patients to make together. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for that very personal moving testimony. Uh, Representative D'Amico. Yeah, th 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 thank, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, um, I don't have any questions for, for Ms. Hammerberg. I, I just wanted the committee to know uh, that I, I had the pleasure and the honor of uh, serving on a municipal board with, with Ms. Hammerberg's uh, late husband. Uh, it was one of the uh, honors of my life. Uh, he was a fantastic uh, gentleman, uh, a great guy. And, and, and um, you know, I, 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 I share Ms. Hammerberg's, uh, you know, um, uh, pain uh, and, and, and her regret that she was not able to keep her promise uh, to, to, to relieve the pain uh, 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 and suffering of, of her late husband. And I think her testimony uh, says it all. So I just wanted I just wanted her to hear this, and I wanted the, my fellow committee members to hear um, uh, th that, uh, that he, he was a fantastic gentleman, and 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 shouldn't have had to endure what he had to endure at the end. Th thank you for your indulgence, Madam Chair. Th thanks, Jill. Thank you, Representative D'Amico. Thank you. Um, well, thank you so much for being here, and I appreciate your testimony today. Thank you, Ms. Hammer. Hammerberg. Excuse me. Um, next is Representative Cheeseman, followed by Gregory Schimmer. Thank you, Madam Representative Chair. Representative Cheeseman, go right ahead. Thank you. You are in position, uh, possession of my testimony. This is the third time I've testified before this committee. I want to thank you for your time, for everyone's passion. I want to thank Mrs. Hammerberg for her testimony. Um, I too had a husband with a chronic health condition and I watched him suffer, uh, but I have a slightly different tack on this and I'm, I'm not diminishing anyone's pain, what they have seen, nor what they may feel is the appropriate measure. And I just wanna to touch on a few points. First of all, I think the experience of the coronavirus has made us all realize one, just how precious life is, and two, how we should treasure those memories with our loved ones. We are facing huge problems in this state with regard to dealing with this pandemic. And it occurs to me from a personal point of view and from a legislative point of view that the time of the Public Health Committee is best spent addressing these issues, particularly those relating to the health disparities we face in Connecticut in terms of equity, in terms of vaccine access. We're on the verge of legalizing cannabis. 
where is the public health committee on addressing the issues? Because there are strict and strong public health issues we will face. But that, that you're the committee, you decide what you bring up and you're obviously within your rights to do this. So let's, let's look at the bill. I, I wanna thank Representative Hughes for her testimony. She indicated that doctors really have very little idea of how long someone has left to live. It could be three months, it could be six months, it could be a year. As the daughter of a physician, I'm only too aware that there is no absolutely strong, predictable way to foretell how long someone is going to live. That's one point. Uh, having read the legislation, I see that two witnesses are required to attest that the person has made this decision. They are in sound, sound mind. I'm failing to see in the legislation that those witnesses are, are absolutely required not to have a financial interest in that person's passing. I'd like to see stronger language in terms of that. As uh, the man, gentleman from Compassion and Choices, which of course was formerly called the Hemlock Society, I guess branding is everything, stated that there have been no complaints. There have been no allegations of people being coerced to die. In states where assisted suicide is legal, there are no means set up to investigate mistakes or abuse. There's not even a complaint mechanism. Doctors are required to list the underlying cause of death on the death certificate if we are being modeled on the Oregon uh, legislation. So if you see that, how can you then say, excuse me, I believe my father or whoever was coerced to die. And with regard to Representative Foster's uh, questioning of the first uh, Dr. Carmosi's testimony, uh, CDC itself between 1999 and 2010 saw a 49% increase in suicide in Oregon compared to a 28% increase nationwide. And the Oregon Health Department between 2000 and 2012 saw a 42% increase in suicide. And that excludes death and dying. So I, and, and again, if people are choosing to end their lives, not- oh, You have your three minute mark if you wouldn't mind concluding. All right. If they are choosing to end their lives because of pain in their souls, because they fear being a burden on us, isn't that it on us to assuage that pain, to make hospice, love, compassion available to them and to accompany them on their journey so they are not alone, so they are not afraid. And I thank you so much for hearing my testimony. Thank you, Representative Cheeseman. Um, I wanna assure you that many of the points that you brought up earlier, the Public Health Committee is addressing. So we can do many things on this committee. Um, Representative Dauphinay. Hi, thank you, Senator. And thank you, um, Representative, for your testimony. Um, my question is, um, there's been uh, much concern conveyed with regard to um, the slippery slope and where this bill may get broadened and go much further than the scope of what's written. Um, for example, two people have to sign and six months have to be, you know, the, the window of six months and on and on and on. And um, as a legislator, you and I both know that so many times there are promises or commitments made and things quickly morph and change. I, I know two days ago in session, we were already discussing concerns with a specific bill with regard to pilot and um, those uh, promises made with re regard to pilot funding and how they have failed. And um, so could you speak to that? I, I know that's been a concern of many that have testified. Well, th thank you, Representative. And I, I, although uh, some may decry the use of the slippery slope argument, it is not as though we were discussing this in a vacuum. We have seen assisted suicide legalized. And we have seen what has happened where you are going from these very specific guidelines to a point where children, as they mentioned, are being euthanized in the Netherlands. And we can say this can't happen here. Canada has already seen a case where a man with severe physiological difficulties rather than being supplied the 24 hour care he needed, was told to seek assisted suicide instead. 
And we can say this will never happen here, but we, we have this argument all the time. In the UK, which Dr. Comrosi cited as turning down assistant suicide, patients with disabilities who were admitted to hospitals during COVID were being asked to sign DNRs because it was felt their lives weren't, weren't worth protecting. And if we are making the argument that we must value life and protect life and help people reach the best decisions, how can we then say, oh, by the way, we're not gonna accompany you on that last mile? Thank you, thank you so much for your testimony and um, thank you, um, Madam Chair. Thank you. Seeing no other questions, I thank you for your time, Representative Cheeseman. Thank you. Um, next is Gregory Schimmer, followed by Representative Wood. Mr. Schimmer, go right ahead. Close enough. Hi, my name is Gregory Schimmer. Sorry, everybody. Oh, Schimmer, that. excuse nope. me. My apologies. Quite fine. No problem. Uh, I'd like to thank the committee. I'd like to uh, thank uh, Representative Gilcrest and Representative uh, Cabros de Gras for inviting me to testify here. Uh, and thank you for all your time. I am in full support of HB 6425. And the reason why quite simply is just in my opinion is aside from basic huna uh, humanity is twofold. I watched my mother, Susan Scheimer die slowly from lung cancer in 2015. And I had to watch my wife, Tracy Gamer Fanning die of her brain cancer in October of 2018. As a matter of fact, uh, today is the day, it's been exactly 28 months since she's passed and I still count every minute that she and I have been apart. In my mind, this is about dignity. This is about compassion, and ultimately it's about choice. Tracy was diagnosed with terminal brain cancer. She lasted over 12 years with painful surgeries, therapy, drugs, and the support of friends and family and the community around us. She thrived during all this time as my wife, as a mother, as stepmother, and also as co-founder of the Connecticut Brain Tumor Alliance. She also was the patient advocate for the American Board of Internal Medicine. So she really understood what th on both sides of the equation of both patient and caregivers and doctors. She tried to put more of a human face on patients more than just simply the statistics they're usually compiled in. And she made numbers human again to the people who give doctors their board certifications. This was a big deal. This amazing woman lived her life every 90 days with periodic MRIs and treatment and drugs. She was also a medical marijuana advocate and believed in compassion. As a matter of fact, we both believe in compassion. No matter how many people she helped, she knew the truth. She knew what was waiting for her at the end. That, in my opinion, is true courage. I'm speaking to you now as a private citizen only, a father, a stepfather, a cancer advocate, now a widower. Words such as compassion, choice, suffering, dignity, et cetera, should matter more than statistics and probabilities and likelihoods. As a matter of fact, I actually kind of take offense at the word statistics and death. From my own experience, I learned that palliative care is in fact the treatment of suffering. And that's what I saw. And I think that's what I know. I will say I am not a legislator. I'm not a doctor. I'll leave the finer details of the law to the professionals of the committee. But I do want to point out that my dog died last year, uh, sorry, last March, and she was suffering also. She had, I was allowed to alleviate her suffering legally, but I couldn't do it for my wife nor my mother. I find that odd. Near the end, Tracy's dignity was taken from her. She couldn't walk, she couldn't move, barely talk. She made a mess of the bed, she required extended care. The night before she died, she experienced what's known as a death throw. Her mother and I both got to see this. This is where the dying chokes on their own mucus because they cannot swallow anymore. She was in no pain, her body was already gone by that point, but we got to see it. So I asked the committee, where's the dignity in that? Where's the love? I would have preferred anything but that. I think anyone human would. So I implore you to give the choice to the people who don't have any more choices left. Give dignity to the dying and ease the suffering of those who will continue to live after watching our loved ones die. How you live your life matters, how you should die too. Thank you for listening and thank you for your consideration of this bill. Thank you, Mr. Scheimer. I'm very sorry for your loss. Thank you for being with us today. Representative Gilcrest, followed by Representative Dauphiné. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Greg, for being here today and continuing Tracy's legacy of advocacy um, and honoring her life by sharing her story. Um, there are few people you meet who love life as much as Tracy did. And over those 12 years, um, even on days I saw her where you could tell she was in pain, 
the show is just a joy and exuding life. So I truly appreciate you being here um, and advocating for this policy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Dawson. Thank you, Senator, and thank you for your testimony today. Um, my question I had asked um, previous uh, to another individual, at what point do you think the individual should be able to end their suffering? I don't know how long your wife uh, suffered and at what point she may have made that decision and or your mother, but could you just speak to that? I mean, we're talking about this, this um, particular bill says six months. Do you think that's limited or do you think that should be different or what are your well, thoughts? Again, let me clarify that, uh, that I'm not a legislator, I'm not a professional lawyer. And I did read that part of the bill. And I also noticed that the other part of the bill did say you can change your moment, you can change your mind at any time. Right. So, I mean, I, I had heard hospice, the hospice nurses uh, would say sometimes, yeah, people, they get better. Right. And so you're not in hospice anymore. You would just go back into regular treatment. Um, so I think it's important that the word choice is characterized here, right? So, you know, if you know, so in Tracy's case, uh, after her second surgery in January of 17, she was good for another year. And then around September of 18 is when we found out her tumor doubled. And we knew that was the end. We knew there was just no more treatment with this. Uh, her particular tumor was wrapped around her motor stem. So if they tried to get it all out, she would have been in a wheelchair for the rest of her life. Once again, a real dignified ending. Uh, that said, um, we knew at that point. Now let's just let's just assume for a moment some treatment uh, comes along and fixes everything. Okay, great. You pull out, and you're not uh, you're not going to uh, you're not going to have that choice anymore. You take that choice back. I think that's what's important here. Is is that fine? There has to be some line of demarcation saying X Y Z time. And again, it's not up to me to say, but I think if you have the choice to say you want it, or at least feel like you have it, that gives you the dignity back. Because the problem with people who are dying is I'm sure you've experienced representative uh, in your professional life, is that when you're dying, your choices are gone. You know, people are making choices for you, you're trying to participate, but you're just not there anymore. If you have that comfort of choice, then at least that gives you some dignity back, some security back, some I don't know, independence, I suppose. I think that's what's important. So I, to answer your question in a roundabout way, I can't say what specifically the time frame is, but I did notice that the bill does say you can change your mind at any time, paraphrasing, of course. So um, thank you for that answer. So you think that there should be a uh, regulation around when an individual would get that choice. Is that what you're saying? I don't think there should be a broad brush in respect to you know, if you think you're going to die in 10 years, you know, that's obviously not it. I think that's a decision and a personal choice that's between you and your physician. Um, if the line of demarcation is effectively six months, that sounds fine, you know, but again, I think that's a personal choice and it's an independent one. Okay, thank you for your answer and thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, Representative. Um, I just want to point out two things. One, um, six months is when Medicaid uh, gives hospice eligibility. So I think that there's some, you know, connection there. And also six months is when you begin this process. But for instance, that's when you can make the first oral request. You have to wait another, I believe it's 15 days to make the next one. That starts the process. It doesn't mean that um, it happens at six months. It's just the process can begin starting at six months of a diagnosis. Yeah. And there so, again, I honestly think that if you give that tool to somebody who really has lost pretty much everything, you are giving them some dignity back, regardless of, of the parameters or timelines right now. Thank you. Um, Representative uh, Cabros de Graaf. Hi, yes, hoping you can hear me, Madam Chair. Um, thank you so much, Greg, for being here today. Um, as, as we both knew Tracy, and as Jillian uh, spoke to so, I represent Gilchrist spoke to so effectively, you know, she was someone who was incredibly full of life, and I know how challenging it is to provide this testimony today. But as someone who was also there at the end of Tracy's life, um, I, I would ask, you know, was there a point when had this been legal, would she have taken advantage of this? And had, you know, obviously she was a proponent of it. Do you think that there was a moment when you guys would have made that decision together, so to speak? 
Yes, we talked about it extensively. Um, I don't remember the patient's name. I want to say she was in Colorado. Her name was Brittany. She had a brain tumor. It was it made big uh, headlines, and that started the conversation maybe two or three years before uh, things went downhill with Trey. So yes, uh, that was uh, a discussion on a regular basis. Frankly, I'd be shocked. I mean, my mom and dad probably had the same conversations many times because, you know, if she knew, and again, dealing with a lot of cancer patients, brain cancer patients, especially, um, she knew what was waiting for her. I mean, brain cancer specifically, and it's not to say that her circumstances are any worse than anyone else's, you know, anyone with uh, AIDS or pneumonia. I mean, it's all dying is awful. End of story. But brain cancer itself is the cancer of the CPU of your, of you, right? Anything else. If you have, if you have a problem with your arm, if you have a problem with your leg, if you, if you have lung cancer, like my mother did, you can have surgery, maybe taking it out. It's, it's a little bit, little bit, little bit, little bit easier, but brain cancer is cancer of your personality. It's cancer of your movement. It's cancer of your emotion. And it takes a toll in so many ways. And she knew that's what was waiting for her. So yes, we did decide that. We did discuss that, you know, and if she could have been given that choice, she would have taken it. Again, I, I thank you for being here today. I have sat at many a bedside of my own family members. Um, pancreatic cancer happens to run in my family. So it's in, in some ways it doesn't take the you out of you, but certainly, um, some of the most brutal deaths um, that I have ever witnessed in my life. Um, so I thank you again for being here today because your testimony is crucial to helping us all understand uh, this bill and, and the importance of it better. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Representative. I don't see any other questions, Mr. Scheimer. So thank you so much for your time and testimony today. Thank you very much for seeing me. Um, next is Representative Wood, followed by Sherman Gillums. Representative Wood. Representative Wood, are you there? Yeah, there you no, go. I'm, yes, I am. Just okay. <laughs> thank you there very you. much. Go right ahead. Um, Chairman Abrams, Chairman Steinberg, Rep Ranking Members Summers and Pettit, thank you for allowing me to testify in support of House Bill 6425. I will be submitting written testimony. I would like to highlight the testimonies of constituents and longtime friends, both Ann Mandel and Joe Pankowski, whom you heard from this morning. I believe this is a fundamental freedom. I think you have found the right balance between access and safeguards. And I, I hope we're able to get this out of committee this year. So I will keep my testimony brief because I know you've got so much ahead of you today, but I thank you very much for allowing this to be heard and for working through all the fine points of this very thoughtful process. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Wood. Um, Representative Dauphiné. Thank you, Senator, and thank you, Representative, for your testimony. I'm just, given that you support this bill and the freedom to choose. Representative, you went on mute. Hold on one moment, please. Start oh, again, I... if you would, please, Representative. I was, I was just saying that given that you support this bill and you believe in the freedom to choose, do you believe that individuals should have um, the opportunity to choose prior to six months if they were given a terminal diagnosis prior to that. I just wondered if you believe that freedom to choose should be restricted because you mentioned that you believed in the, in the freedom to choose. Very good question. I think the safeguards in this language of six months give it a probably a better shot of getting out of committee. So in that way, politically, as far as a process, I support that language, but obviously terminal is terminal. I, I don't know that we're getting into fine points that I'm not a doctor. I, I don't, I, I, nor am I, am, I, that's up for you all. I'm gonna punt that right back to you all. Okay, thank you, Representative, and thank you, Senator. Thank you. Um, Senator Haskell. So much, Madam Chair and Representative. Thank you for your, your testimony today. Um, I just wanted to chime in because in the first half of, to, not half, that's optimistic. In the first portion of today's hearing, we heard um, language like uh, people 
I, I heard some folks say killing themselves or uh, uh, committing suicide. And I just wanted to give you a moment uh, because I learned from you actually, it must have been a year and a half ago when there was a tragic incident and we were speaking about it involving a young person in Connecticut. I use language like that. And you taught me about how it can be triggering and upsetting for people to say commit suicide. And instead you sort of uh, let me know that the more PC term is uh, to, to die by suicide. I just wanted to give you an opportunity to talk a little bit about that because we have many hours ahead of us. And I think it's important that we're sensitive about the language that we use. Yeah, very good point. Thank you for that question. It is, it is someone, someone who chooses to die by suicide. They, it's not that they want to die, they want to stop the pain. And I've had a number of close friends or I've had a number of situations in my own life that that has happened. And you know that they've tried to do everything they possibly can. And it's not a crime. What they have done to end their lives is not, should not be seen as a crime or a moral violation of any form, I don't believe. Um, so thank you for bringing that up. And it is the correct, the more compassionate yeah. to die by suicide and not commit suicide. Commit infers a crime and it is no crime. They've tried, people that die by suicide have tried everything in the world to avoid that end. Well, thank and you, Reverend. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, oh, Senator, for the question. You gave me that some time ago. Madam Chair, thank you for the time. I recognize it's not directly related to this legislation, but I do want us to, because this is such an emotionally broad topic and surely folks at home are watching, I want, I hope that members of this committee will be especially sensitive to the language that we use. So thanks so much, Representative Wood. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Haskell. Representative Steinberg. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Representative, for testifying today. I just wanted to follow up on one thing you just said with in your conversation with Sen Senator Haskell. You may mention that they were just, frankly, couldn't stand the pain anymore. Yet right. we've heard testimony this morning that we can effectively anesthetize people to the point where they feel nothing. Uh, how does that square with your experience and, and your point of view? In the situations I know of, these fam people and families tried everything. And there is not a medication that could solve it and could help them. And they saw the only way out was to die by their own hand. Thank you for that. Uh, I know it's very hard. It, we've heard firsthand stories. I can see it's even hard for secondhand stories and the effect it has on all of us. So thank you for your testimony. I just wanted to mention too uh, on Representative Dauphiné asking about the six month. It certainly is, it's an important discussion point. Um, it, it requires a lot of thought. I mean, a fundamental freedom is a fundamental freedom and how do you put a time limit on it? So thank you. I understand again, I would just point out that um, it, there is a relationship between the, the six months required by Medicaid to get hospice eligibility that they look at it from that perspective. So um, just, it, it wasn't randomly chosen, just so you understand. Thank you, that helps. I did read through the language. I must've missed that part of it, so thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for being here and for your testimony. Um, next, we have Sherman Gillums followed by Representative Michelle. Mr. Gillums, please go ahead. Thank you, ma'am. Can you hear me? I can, and we okay. can see you as well. Thank you. Well, I'd start by saying happy Purim. Uh, I said on behalf of uh, not only my Jewish friends on this committee, but also uh, members of the Jewish faith that I serve with in the Marine Corps uh, honorably, uh, some who are not with us here, but uh, but I want to honor their memory by uh, issuing that uh, issuing that greeting. Um, but more importantly, I uh, my past work as the Executive Director of Paralyzed Veterans of America uh, allowed me to partner with the West Haven VA Medical Center and the Yale Medical School Center for Neurological and Regeneration Research uh, with a focus on ALS. And, and veterans are two times more likely to develop ALS, which is Lou Gehrig's disease. And, uh, and that's, that's really what brings me here as an advocate uh, in opposition to this bill. But uh, I came here with the, the thought of, of basically rolling through a lot of what's already been said here, but I want to react, uh, use a balance of my time to react to what I've heard, because I think that's better use of putting statements on the record. I want to separate the stories from what I think is important to place on the record, because I have compassion for 
example, Mr. Scheimer and Mr. Smith, that that hit me in the heart. Um, but I want to separate that from what I have to say. Um, Mr. Scheimer, uh, we talked a lot about the slippery slope. And what he did is he created that slippery slope with a comparison between his experience and with his wife and his and his, his dog that he lost, unfortunately. One obviously happened in the human sense, the other happened by euthanasia. The dog didn't choose. All right. And he concluded the point by saying his wife would have been in a wheelchair for the rest of her life. But you know what? I am in a wheelchair for the rest of my life. And it's a pretty dignified life that I live right now. And that's what I'm talking about when we talk about contextualizing this around perspective. Um, I heard the chairman with respect say several times that we need to contextualize this within the scope of the law. However, Mr. Smith's story about his aunt, uh, and I lost my grandfather back in November, his story didn't fall within the scope of the law. All right. Uh, there were other stories that didn't fall within the scope of the law. They, they were touching and, and heartfelt, but they weren't within the scope of the law. So I'd ask that there be consistency or at least for the record that that's expressed because that's that's important here. Uh, Mr. Pankowski, frankly, he's a member of the death industry. Uh, he's the person that when I was sick with COVID back in January, I said I needed to go see so that I can settle my affairs in case COVID took me away with my respiratory compromise. Uh, that I live with right now. So uh, I, I, you know, I, I, again, I offer that for the record, but I wanna go to Mr. Appleton's uh, uh, statements here because he said a lot of things. He, he invoked the, uh, the Oregon Department Health Study and it's not what the health study says or what he said is what he didn't say. Number one, there were two doctors who were referred for violating procedure uh, under DWDA requirements. There were two in that report. They weren't named, but there were two that were referred to the Oregon Medical Board for violating a uh, procedure. Um, I also wanna point out a few things. Um, one has to do with the fact that we, we talked about waiting, the reasons why people uh, decide, uh, made this choice in Oregon. Uh, it's interesting that feeling like a burden on family and friends almost doubled the number of those who based the decision on inadequate pain control. Uh, you and, hit yeah, the three a, mark if you wouldn't mind concluding. That, that's been three minutes already. Um, one individual got a ref, referred for a psychological evaluation. What really bothered me, though, and I'll conclude with this point, um, if you blink, you might miss the footnote where it says, Information about complications is reported only when a physician or another healthcare provider is present at, present at the time of death. Over two thirds of the death occurred with no provider present. So we don't know what complications occurred. And I wanna speak directly and conclude with the point that Representative uh, uh, Hughes made, uh, I'm sorry, the co-chair made, where, where he talks about the personal choice being the end, the end goal. It's not the end goal. The personal choice is the means to the end. The, the end is how it's practiced how the actual act is carried out. And we don't know in these cases whether complications occur because there were no doctors present. There are too many gaps in the statute itself as is presented in the bill itself. I addressed that in my written testimony. And I think that rather than throw it all out, I'm not here to make that case. I think that just wasn't enough due diligence done to ensure that those who are vulnerable are protected. And I pointed out in some ways how the Oregon report makes that clear. But I also want to point again to my written testimony where I point out specifically where things like coercion, where things like informed consent and other areas, sound mind, for example, there are too many gaps there. And, and, and if we're going to talk about uh, this being an individual, an individual choice, well, you don't resolve that with public policy. That's exactly what we're doing. I have a lot more to say, Thank but you. I feel like- the, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm gonna to have to stop you there. There are some questions for you, I, but I want to thank you for your service, first of all. And um, let's go to Representative Pettit. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Mr. Gillums, uh, for your testimony and thank you for your service. Uh, you raised the issue of uh, ALS, which is, wow, a, a difficult issue. I, I only, took care of a handful of people, but some of those people went on for a couple of years and some went on for many years. So there's a huge variation in the clinical presentation and the clinical progression in, in ALS. I wonder if you'd comment on, since you, you brought it up and know about it, whether the AL, ALS Society per se has a physician or whether they always leave it up to the physician 
patient or or if you give us some perspective on on that condition because it's it's a difficult condition in this respect uh this is easy for me because i can only speak within a context of veterans care and currently the federal government doesn't offer that as a choice so if a veteran presents with als uh within the scope of our advocacy a lot of it is with an eye toward extending life most of the time because als isn't necessarily a painful condition although it's terminal it doesn't hurt but it does shut your body down and your mind is lucid. You're not, your brain isn't gone, you're there. So that'd be probably a classic case of where you would think this would apply because those folks have sound mind uh, per se, they just don't have control of their body. Uh, but because it's in the VA and within the context of the VA, there's there's no option there. And, and many of those that I've had to hold the hand of at the bedside, uh, we're quite happy with the with the hospice and, and the, and the pain-free uh, dignified way that we're allowed to live out their existence uh, with, with us having an opportunity to honor them. Did it, did it create an issue for people who had, who had a re respiratory respiratory issues per se? Have you seen that or done enough experience yeah. with that? Well, I've, I've, I've advocated for percussion vests and, you know, whole house generators to make sure that when a power goes out, these, these men and women, mostly men don't die during an outage and things like that. But again, it's not pain that's driving them. A lot of times it's those factors that have to do a quality of life that would ultimately inform that decision. And I really wouldn't have a problem with it if I felt like they wanted that. But most, most veterans uh, uh, I've seen in this, in this downward spiral that ALS often is, um, I can't say happy, but, but seem satisfied because we can take care of a lot of things with the time they have with them knowing this is, this is going to be, you know, this is going to be it. And, uh, and, and to a man, I haven't, I haven't had anybody say to me, uh, they wish they could die faster. In fact, a lot of them wish they had more time. Um, and, and ALS is probably, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to, to, to take the pill yourself when your body won't function that way. So maybe that's a factor to think about. Uh, but, but that's been the, the breadth of my experience with the disease. Thank you. I think it w would be an issue because I think within the specific context of this bill, uh, the people with ALS are of sound mind, but would need to would need to self-administer, which becomes difficult. And I, I have a, my N is too small to know, but some of the people I followed in nursing homes for many years, their quality of life was very, very different and limited, but they were happy to see family members come and visit. It certainly is an incredibly different lifestyle, but I, I thank you for your perspective, perspective. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative. Representative Betts. Thank you, Madam Chair, and, and thank you, sir, not only for your service, but for your uh, your testimony and, frankly, giving hope to a lot of other people who might be in a wheelchair, because you certainly um, have shown you can live a very uh, important and productive life. You've certainly raised some issues I have never considered it before, and that has really kind of almost reinforced my original uh, thinking about legislation in this area. And it's very simply this, um, no matter how well intended this bill is and whether people are for or against it, do you believe it's the role of state government to pass a law in an arena like this? And do you think there ever is a possibility of developing something that's gonna meet the needs of uh, the people who we are talking about today? I just don't see how we can do that in a law, no matter how well intended. And I certainly don't think I'm qualified to be able to say, this is what we should do when I don't even know the people who are gonna be impacted by this law. So I wonder if you could comment on that, sir. I'll tell you why I don't believe the answer is for the state. Uh, because you've got another problem here, one is Suicide is the highest rate of, of uh, injurious death in Connecticut. It's, it's the leading cause of injurious death in Connecticut. And the message about life and, and, and the, the bias for life for people who come back from war, police officers who see trauma, firefighters, frontline workers, is constantly call that 1-800 number, call that 1-800 number, call, you know, get help, reach out for help. Now we're saying that there is a point, though, where your life uh, your, your pain outweighs the value of your life. And we're telling people that while there's a message, this affirmative message of choose life over escape from pain, now we're, we're 
clouding that message because now we're saying it's allowed in some circumstances. Now, within the scope of the law, it isn't meant to do that. But there is a contagion effect. There is a contagion phenomenon. And you see this when celebrity dies. You saw it in Oregon when, the, when, when the, uh, one of the first proponents of suicide laws, when she died, suicides didn't decrease. But you know what went up? The number of people seeking a way out. That didn't mean that you know, if they were legally allowed to do that by law, that's one thing. But, but the escape is what we're talking about. And we've heard stories all over the, all over the spectrum here a lot of stories, but none of those stories, most of these stories didn't fall within the spectrum of the law. So we're talking about people who probably felt like their life needed to end, but that wasn't within the scope of this law. Those stories don't help what we're talking about here. And so you've got a problem with communicating what's important. Does, does Connecticut care more about keeping people alive who feel suicidal or more about this idea that independence for somebody who suffers a brain injury or ALS is more important. And the final thing is, is, is this, you know, suicide being that leading cause of death, what happens when people die under this law? Are you gonna add those names to the suicide numbers? Because that's what's got to happen. You've got to add more names to the number of folks who die by suicide in Connecticut for this to be legitimate. It is suicide. I don't care how you clean it up or what term you use. It's a person choosing to accelerate death, even in the circumstance where death was imminent. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative. Representative Dauphiné. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for your testimony today. Um, <clears throat> you spoke, you used some words describing the bill before us. Um, you said uh, it didn't do its due diligence. You said it had gaps. Mm -hmm. You used the word coercion. Could you expand on, on those thoughts that you were, you were, um, had spoken about? I'll piece it together by talking about uh, what sound mind means, right? What sound mind doesn't mean is illiterate, lack of education, lack of wisdom, weakness of mind, forgetfulness, mental disability, or momentary lucidity. It doesn't mean that. And that's the problem. We're stopping short of really defining what sound mind means. We're, we're allowing a legal standard. That's a legal standard. That's not a medical standard we're talking about. We see this in the VA when veterans are unable to manage their finances. They're given a fiduciary, even though they can they can do other high functioning things. This is what happens when a government tries to play doctor, right? So that's what I mean by this, this and coercion itself. I'm gonna use a different term, undue influence. That's a very specific legal threshold. That's not the same as influence, period. Cognizable illegal influence, that's undue influence. But when you're talking about subtle manipulation and domination or having a patient run out of options. So rather than take the costly alternative to extend one's life, it has a course of effect. And I'm saying this as somebody who just recovered from COVID with a pre-existing condition where I felt like, boy, I don't have a lot of choices if I go on that vent. There is a coercive effect. There is this idea that while you're not being told you can't have this, the impact when you're vulnerable is much different. And that can't be measured. That can't be assured. And the government can't be there to ensure that that individual, even with a family member, is, is either acting in his or her own best interest or has, has some way of having somebody assure that. All we've done is empower a doctor or two doctors. We saw two cases in Oregon where they failed to follow procedure, notwithstanding what Mr. Appleton claimed, um, and the system breaks down. If they die at home, we don't know if that if that ingestion was successful because two thirds of them happened with no doctor present. So it's not tracked. We got to read the footnotes in those reports. It's not tracked. So where's the protection? If those two thirds were at home by themselves and it says with a volunteer or a loved one or a non-physician, who were those people? How do we know they weren't coerced? How do we know that pill wasn't put in their food? You know, we, we just don't know. There's no way to know. This isn't a public policy issue. This is a life issue. And if you're going to take position that life matters with these anti-suicide campaigns, you have to be consistent if you're the government and leave it to the doctors and families to figure that out. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony and your answers. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, thank you Representative. I don't see any other questions. So I, I thank you so much for your time, Mr. Gillum. And also, I'm so pleased that you recovered from COVID. Thank you. You're so strong and healthy today. Thank you. So Thank you very much. 
Um, next, we have Representative Michelle, followed by Stephen Mendelton. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Thank you, uh, Chair Steinberg, Vice Chairs, esteemed ranking members and committee members uh, for this opportunity to testify in favor of this bill. I would like to concede my time to Ms. Kim Callanan, who is the CEO of uh, Compassion and Choices. Thank you. Thank you um, so much, Representative Michelle and um, Chairman Steinberg, members of the committee. Um, I am here today on behalf of um, terminally ill Connecticut residents. And I um, wanted to address some of the questions that have been coming up. Um, first off, um, right now, the legislature is deciding how one dies. What we're actually trying to do with this law is remove the legislature from the dying process and return the decision about how much suffering is too much to the dying person in consultation with their loved ones, their doctor and their faith leader. Um, so that's really the role of government is to get um, the legislature out of um, the dying process. And that's what this bill does. Um, the second thing I wanted to address is there's been a lot of conversation about the six month prognosis. The six month prognosis is essential because it's, a it's tied to hospice care. We have an entire medical framework that is about um, where doctors understand what hospice care is and you want the two to be tied together because you wanna be sure that patients are able to get good care and as a part of hospice care, you get palliative care, you get that full wraparound care. So you're not making the choice to die versus making the choice to get care. So that is an essential component to this bill that six month prognosis and it works hand in hair with, hand with hospice hospice and palliative care. It is not an either or. There are patients who unfortunately are not able to get enough, um, are not, uh, there, there are patients who unfortunately, um, hospice care, pain management, it's just not enough. So that's um, important. Um, there's been a lot of talk about um, the data and the evidence. And I want to call out that just a few hours ago, the latest Oregon report came out. So we now have 23 years of data. What was amazing on that Oregon report is that 95% of the people who took medical aid and dying were already enrolled in hospice care. Again, this isn't an either or. Um, it's also um, important to know that um, there was a lot of conversation about earlier about ALS. Um, ALS um, is actually um, the second largest diagnosis of people who use this law. Um, and it's a very small percentage of people who have ALS. And the reason that so many people with ALS um, want this option and choose this option is because it is a while you have a good quality of life for a period of time, it can be a very difficult dying process where you suffer from respiratory failure. Um, that is why um, the uh, American Academy of, of uh, Neurology actually um, endorsed and supported this as an option um, that should be available um, to people across the country. Um, there's also you hit your three minute mark. Okay, thank you so much. Um, thank you very much, Representative Steinberg. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for testifying today. Uh, I'll, I'll admit that I, I found the hearing to this point to have been very interesting in that we spent, seem to have spent a lot of time with people testifying uh, and speculating about what's not in this bill but could be in this bill. Uh, and I, I'm particularly concerned about the issue of coercion and the uh, comments of the last speaker that because nobody else was in the room where it happened, so to speak, that there must be a lot of nefarious activity taking place that we don't know about. It, it, it's speculating about the absence of any uh, credible data to suggest there is a problem. Uh, again, you're obviously directly involved with this. You've been monitoring Oregon now for 23 years. How do you respond to that? So there's absolutely no evidence that there has been um, a single incidence of abuse or coercion across the country. It's actually very difficult for somebody to get through the dying process. Um, there's, it's about a 13 step process. 
Um, and there was uh, two year, three years ago, there was an, the National Academy of Sciences held a two day forum where they brought in doctors and nurses and healthcare professionals from across the authorized country. And they asked them about how the law was implemented. And the people that were there were um, not necessarily supporters of the law. Uh, many of the people that were there were opponents. Um, and many of the doctors that testified, testified originally saying, I didn't support this law originally, but now I do. And what they all said is, um, the problem with this law is there's no evidence of abuse or coercion, that it's actually very complicated to get through the dying process, um, and that it would be um, far easier. I mean, in our current standard medical of practice, people are getting all kinds of pain medication sent to their home and hospice. If somebody were to have uh, be nefarious in any way, there are other means that would be far easier um, that they could use than this legislation. Um, it is uh, puts a regulatory framework that protects patients while allowing the per small percentage of people who want this option to be able to get it. Thank you. Uh, one further question. I know we, we will hear from the disability community that this bill targets them effectively as euthanasia. Could you help me understand, is there a distinction between euthanasia as is typically understood and what aid and dying is about? Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you, Rep Steinberg. Um, and it is important to note that in the bill, um, it very specifically says that a person is not eligible for this option simply because they have a disability or because they are old. Um, so that is really important. Um, there is a big distinction between this bill um, and euthanasia and also what is being practiced in other countries that people have referred to. Um, with medical aid in dying, one of the core safeguards that is involved is that the person must take a deliberate act um, you know, and self-ingest the medication um, themselves. And that is a really critical safeguard that helps to ensure that the decision remains with the dying person from start to finish. They're making two requests, there's a written request, and then they have to be able to take the medication in some sense they're, um, themselves. Um, in Oregon, the Disability Rights Oregon, which is the organization that takes in complaints from the disability community, in the entire 23 years that they have had, um, Oregon has had this legislation, they have never gotten a single complaint from a person with disability about um, coercion or abuse. Um, so uh, there is a huge difference between euthanasia where a doctor or a third party is administering the medication and what we're practicing here where a patient has to be able to take some deliberate act on their own. Uh, just as a quick follow-up by bigger indulgence, Madam Chair, is it a disability by definition, a terminal illness? Uh, I, I, no, I mean, the legislation very clearly says a person has to be terminally ill with a prognosis of six months or less to live. So no, someone, lots of people have disabilities and they don't fit with terminal illness and a prognosis of six months or less to live. Um, so no, having a disability does not make you eligible for this law in any way. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Anwar. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Ms. Kellen, for your testimony. I wanted to um, uh, clarify and see what your thoughts are for the slippery slope argument that people make. Um, thank you, Senator Anwar. That's a, a great question. So um, the, a lot of the, or, or most of what you heard related to the slippery slope was related to laws that are taking place in other countries. They have absolutely nothing to do with the laws in the United States. Um, the other countries that we're talking about have entirely different um, political systems. They have entirely different healthcare systems. Most of them, if not all of them, have universal coverage. They have, you know, structures at the end of life. Uh, and what they do in those countries are not what we do here in the United States. So I think it's important that we look only at the evidence and the data here in the United States. Um, since the Oregon law passed 23 years ago, the same eligibility criteria have remained intact. A person has to be an adult who's terminally ill, 
mentally capable with a prognosis of six months or less to live. And that's very directly tied to hospice care. So the idea of the slippery slope has just not come to fruition here in the United States. Um, and that's what's important. What's important is lawmakers are struggling with how do we fashion a law where somebody who is already going to die is able to get the peace of mind with knowing that they can control how much suffering is too much? Um, and there's just no evidence of a slippery slope. Thank you. Um, another question I wanted to, this was a comment um, one, one of my colleagues had made at one point, a physician. Um, and um, I was having this discussion a few years ago with them. And, and, and made the argument that everybody is going to be a proponent uh, for aid in dying um, when they witness an ugly death. Um, can you explain to me, in, in other words, uh, I, I have uh, seen patients, for example, their pulmonary arteries opened up and they vomited blood and exsanguinated in a matter of a few minutes. It was preventable to have the family witness some of those things um, and in some respects. And, um, there are some challenges and people talk about some of those situations. Can you tell me how minds have changed with some of those situations for people? Uh, sure, that's a great question. Um, so uh, the reality is that, um, you know, when a person is at the end of their life um, and or when someone witnesses that end of life experience and they've got somebody that's there that's begging them to help support them um, and to re recognize and respect how much pain they can go through, um, that is makes a profound difference. And that is why this movement um, has um, gained so much traction over the past five or six years. Um, you're seeing the baby boomers begin to retire. They're taking care of their aging parents. They are experiencing um, death and the, both the importance of being able to say goodbye in a compassionate way. And they're experiencing the medical system failing to relieve unnecessary suffering. And that's not what basic humanity is all about. And I think you're seeing more and more people are beginning to realize that. And we see every day lawmakers changing their minds from no to yeses, um, people who previously were oppositional experiencing it themselves and coming forward and writing op-eds. Um, and that's why we've seen over the past six years, you've seen five states in Washington DC authorize this option. Um, you're seeing that increased momentum across the country Country, with people responding to their constituents' pleas for this as an option, um, because unfortunately, as medicine has evolved and we have become very successful at prolonging life, our policies have not caught up with that. And we, people are experiencing prolonged suffering. Um, in, in a lot of instances, it is actually the medication that you give to someone. It's their chemotherapy or their immunotherapy that causes the level of suffering that somebody goes through. And so we're treating people with amazing clinical trials that in some instances save their life, but in other instances result in them being having an excruciating amount of pain. And then we're, we're washing, wiping our hands off and saying, now you're on your own, suffer. And when people see that, they realize that cannot be what humanity is all about. Thank you, Madam Chair, last question. Uh, um, we were we are in the midst of a pandemic. A uh, few weeks ago, we were very close to being maxed out in our ICU capacity, and and one of the the fears we would have is that okay, when the supply demand equation is impacted negatively, where we don't have enough support systems, people, clinicians, healthcare providers will use this bill to not provide options. Um, does this bill talk about anything to that effect? Does this lead to any risk of that situation? Um, so it leads to zero risk of this. This bill is very clear um, that the dying person themselves has to make the request themselves multiple times, and they also have to be able to self-ingest the medication. The other thing that's really important is that um, patients who have COVID-19, it comes on very quickly. 
um, they would not actually be eligible under this bill um, to be able to get the option unless they were already terminally ill and were going through the process. So someone who has COVID-19, um, they're not eligible for this. So there's no chance that um, this bill could result in somebody with COVID-19 being denied the option. What could happen, denied the care that they want. What could happen though, is that we see that when this law is implemented, it results in better conversations between doctors and patients, better palliative care training for doctors, um, improved enrollment into hospice care, more people filling out advanced directives. Um, and so one possibility, um, and we've seen this happen in other states, there's data from the Journal of Palliative Medicine that supports this, um, is that when the bill is passed, you improve end of life care in general. And so hopefully you'll have more patients filling out advanced directives, making decisions about what it is that they want. So you'll have um, fewer instances of people coming to the emergency or in the hospital and not um, having thought in advance about what kind of treatments that they want. Thank, thank you so much for your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Armour. It's nice to see you. Um, Representative Pettit. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, uh, Mrs. Kellanen, for your testimony uh, and answers. Uh, I, I want to get your perspective on the specific issue of self-administration. Uh, I had some conversation with Representative Steinberg, Communication Representative Steinberg, on this yesterday because some constituents were asking about it. Uh, it would be a, a couple parts. One, is, is this the law in, in most other states that do this? And two, if you get in the clinical situation where someone's approved, has the medication, but then several days or a week goes by and they are no longer to self-administer, what, what happens? Uh, it seems to me it puts, puts families in a very difficult situation. We've heard a number of testimony from people today who would have done anything to help or keep promises to dying spouses, partners, et, et cetera. Um, but I assume that if someone deteriorated to the point where they couldn't self-administer, they'd no longer take advantage of. I'm just wondering if you'd comment on that and if that's been dealt with in other states with, with similar statutes. Yeah, that's a great question. So all of the um, states do have the requirement for self-administration. It's one of the most important safeguards. Um, self-administration means that a person has to be able to take a deliberate act. There are multiple different ways of self-administering. Um, so it can be um, sipping through a straw, could be a form of self-administration. Um, put, uh, put pushing a plunger on a feeding tube can be a form of self-administration. Um, so that is absolutely a, a critical and essential safeguard that's in the bill. Um, because the person is the one taking the act, um, a third party can't really do it. So if you've got medication there and someone doesn't want to take it, um, they have to be able to swallow that medication really, really quickly. Um, so uh, it is a, a really critical and important safeguard that helps to ensure that the decision is the dying person's from start to finish. But have there have been issues where in other states where someone has not been able to self-administer and it's created a legal issue with family members who have then administered when the, the patient was unable to do so? Or has, has that not been something that's been publicly yeah, no. condemned? That really has not been an issue. Um, I think that the doctors are really good about working with the patients and making sure that they understand that they have to be able to self-administer. Um, and if that is important to the patient, um, they're working with their doctor around what the time frame might look like. Um, but um, I have not heard of an, is, an instance where a patient um, was not able to self-administer and then the family members would go on their behalf. Um, it would be very hard for that to take place. Sure, and then I, then I assume it the, the physicians in position that if uh, they're not convinced that someone is able to self-administer, then they're, they're unable to, to, to write and release the prescription, I assume. That is true. And there definitely are situations um, where, um, you know, physicians can't write uh, prescriptions, but uh, because self-administration is allowed in multiple different ways, um, it actually does cover a, a broad group of people. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative. Representative Dauphine. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, um, Kim, for your testimony. 
Um, I just want a clarification on something. You mentioned that <clears throat> there's no evidence or data um, that other individuals are giving that medication at the time of death and dying at home. I think it was with regard to a testimony that came out before yours. Are you saying there's no evidence because there's been no reports of that? Or are you saying that there's been studies and it hasn't proven to be true? And then with regard to having another person give that person the medication, there's several ways in which someone could give that medication without the person either knowing or, um, for example, crushing pills. I mean, there's, there's different ways of administering that medication. Um, and I, I just wanted you to speak a little bit more to that because you were saying that that probably would be unlikely. And I'm just trying to get clarification on that. Thank you. Yeah, I think it's really pretty unlikely. So you can, you know, come up with um, a whole bunch of regulations. But if you think across all of the states that are out there, nine states in Washington, D.C., um, 23 years in Oregon, a combined 40 years across the other states, um, we have had 6,000 people request the medication and about 4,000 people choose the option. We're talking about a really small percentage of people. It, it is um, the process, the 13 step process that one must go through is um, extremely rigorous. You're going to two different doctors, you're filling out paperwork, you're making an oral request. The people that are going through this process are motivated. This option is really important to them. They want to have the option there. Doctors are there making sure that, you know, this is what the person wants. That's the whole regulatory framework that's put around medical aid in dying. And then at the end of that framework, they get a prescription um, and they're able to end their suffering. That's what's around medical aid in dying. Now let's co contrast that to what currently happens in hospice care or end of life care when where um, uh, patients are getting sent to them large volumes of morphine um, to their doorstep with no regulatory framework around it with you know loved ones that are there at their side or doctors have access to a whole host of prescription medications and have them hooked up to IVs and can insert you know medication in through the IV and use as somebody else said palliative sedation as an option so when you compare the practices in terms of safeguards in order to protect vulnerable populations it is impossible to come to the conclusion that there is a greater risk of vulnerability for the pra practice of medical aid in dying, that that could lead to a greater likelihood of course or abuse than somebody who is on an IV um, that has been hooked up with somebody sitting there with all kinds of medication that could result in palliative sedation or someone who's just getting all kinds of pain medication sent to their home. So, um, you know, you can certainly look at any situation. There is no law in the world that could ever be crafted around almost any public health issue that can guarantee 100% safety. But the likely, first of all, there's just nothing that has come forward that has shown that this is a concern. And this is a far safer practice than all the other end of life care options that are out there. Thank you for that answers. But, but you did confirm that there's been no studies done that have tracked individuals once they've been given the medication and taken at home. Is that correct? Sure. There's no studies that have been done around that. There's no studies that have been done around hospice care and, you know, how family members do that with hospice care. There's been no studies that have been done around palliative sedation when someone's hooked up to an IV and doctors are there and they can do that extra pushing of the plunge or a family member can do that. So yes, you're absolutely right. No studies have been done across the full breadth of end of life care. Um, there have not been studies done, but there have only been 4,000 people across nine states in Washington, D.C., and when the National Academy of Sciences brought together experts from across the country who are practicing this, what the doctors uniformly said is, this is too difficult for a dying process to get dying person to get through, and there is no issue of abuse or coercion that anybody should be concerned about. Okay, thank you so much for your answers. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative. Representative Berger Carvalho. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just have one uh, quick question. Uh, what is the average wait time between requesting and receiving medication? 
it's about three to four weeks. Um, that assumes though, that's from when the person starts the process in a supportive system. Um, so it takes about three to four weeks to get through the process. Unfortunately, many people do not start within a supportive system. And so if you start within um, a Catholic system that won't, or a religious system or even um, a secular system that doesn't have a supportive policy, you hit your first roadblock. And so then um, you've got to go out and find a doctor who is supportive um, and, and, and reestablish care. Um, so the minimum amount of time is three to four weeks. Thank you very much. That. Um, thank you. I have a couple of questions. One is, you know, you refer to the medication in the process and, and I know that I've, I've heard and read a lot of misinformation about that, you know, that you have to take 90 pills or so could you just be more specific about what that medication and process is? Absolutely. So, um, there's uh, there's sort of two steps to the process, um, and there, you're right. There's no 90 pills that are involved, but there's two steps to the process. Um, first, somebody um, takes medication that helps to ensure that they are not going to throw up, um, be, um, and that um, and so they take that about 45 minutes before the process starts, um, and um, because the medication itself could cause um, nausea. Um, so after that medication sets in, um, what the pharmacist typically do, does is they send in a powder in a little bottle, um, all of the pill capsules in a powder, and the person mixes it together um, with um, sometimes it's orange juice or water, um, and then they have to be able to drink that medication relatively quickly within a 10 minute period of time. Um, and then um, they will often follow it up with sorbet. Um, and so um, it's, a, it's a pretty peaceful process after they take the medication um, that has been prescribed, um, their heart starts to slow down. Typically within 10 minutes, they've fallen asleep. Um, and within about two hours, um, they have died. And when you say mix it with water, just give me an idea. Are they drinking a gallon of water? Um, Are they drinking? I'm sorry. Yeah, and it's often orange juice, and it's like you know, like I have six ounces. Okay, thank you. Um, the other thing I, I want to know if I understood you correctly because I found this interesting. I think you made a comment at the beginning that rather than um, putting more government into this process, that what we're actually doing is taking government out of the process and letting it be between a physician and, and the patient. Did I understand you correctly? And could you just speak to that for a second? Yeah, that's exactly what I mean. I mean, right now our laws very much are saying that government is making this decision um, for patients um, and their loved ones. And I absolutely agree with the representative who said, I don't um, feel like it's government's job um, to, to figure this out. I think he's absolutely right. It's not government's job to figure it out. The decision belongs with the dying person. Only they can decide how much suffering is too much. Um, working in consultation with their doctor um, and with their family members and their loved ones. And so what we're really asking the government to do is to return the decision back to the dying person. Thank you so much for that. Um, Representative Foster. Hi, thank you so much for being here today. And I, I imagine this is going to continue to be a really challenging day. So I appreciate my colleagues for showing compassion and for having this really challenging conversation. So uh, we've been hearing a lot and it seems to sort of align with the part of, you know, the part of the, the debate that you align on, but do you consider um, as your organization a set of compassion and choice or aid in dying, do you, is that the same thing as suicide? And as we have this conversation and sort of talk about it, because I feel like there's a lot of conflation happening, can you talk about like the criminalization of death by suicide um, and, and how that's sort of a problematic conflation that we're having, having here? Yeah, thank you so much for raising this. And I'm gonna, um... I'm going to apologize in advance if I get a little bit emotional, but um, medical aid and dying and suicide are two entirely different things. Um, my grandfather um, unfortunately committed suicide. Um, it was um, a really hard experience for the family. It tore the family apart. There was shame. There was grief. Um, it was um, 
it, there was embarrassment. Um, it was rough. And um, he was depressed. Um, it was a mental health disorder that was taking place. Um, medical aid and dying is the exact opposite. It brings families together. Um, it gives people the chance to acknowledge what is taking place. Um, a person who is using medical aid and dying is um, already going to die. And um, they, it really allows them um, to decide what that dying process looks like. And so the experiences are entirely different. And one of the things that um, is really important to understand is that the national organization, the American Association of Suicidology, so this is a national organization whose whole focus is on um, preventing suicide. They came out a few years ago um, with a statement that said, um, medical aid in dying is fundamentally distinct from suicide. And the term physician assisted suicide should not be used to describe it. Um, and, and in essence, the people who continue to conflate the two um, are really doing a disservice to the dying person. And they're also doing a disservice to people um, you know, to the to the suicide to the to people who are trying to prevent suicide, um, we really do need to keep those two things separate and distinct, um, and make sure that we realize it's not the same thing. Um, there are also a host of medical organizations who have rejected the use of physician-assisted suicide. The American Academy of Hospice and Palliative Medicine, the American Medical Women's Association, the American Medical Students Association, the American Public Health Association. They have have all adopted policies um, that have opposed the use of suicide when describing medical aid in dying. Um, and in addition, the most prominent professional society in the United States that addresses issues that arise at the interface between law and medicine, um, the American College of Legal Medicine, they also reject the term physician-assisted suicide um, and feel like it is very important that we do not conflate those two things. And I just want to be clear because I, I, I don't want it to have been misheard because I think I might have misheard you in the beginning of your statement, but then you clarified. They do not reject aid and dying. They reject the terminology physician-assisted suicide. Right. Correct. Yes, if yes. I okay. said that, then I misstated. They in the asked, beginning, I think you, you didn't say the terminology. I think. You oh, did. I yeah. see. Yeah. Yes. All of those organizations that I just mentioned, they all have supportive policies around medical aid and dying. They reject conflating physician-assisted suicide with medical aid and dying. And they are really, they would like to encourage that people use the proper terms um, when describing what medical aid and dying is really all about. Thank you. Sorry if I did that. No, 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 no. I think this is gonna, this day. I think there's going to be misspeaking. It's very, it's challenging. It's a really hard topic, so it's going to happen. But I just wanted to make sure for the to let the record show for the rest of the day, as I'm sure people will come back to those quotes. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for letting for letting me correct myself. Well, thank you so much for your time today and your testimony. I appreciate you being here. I don't thank see you. any other questions. Have a great day. Um, next is uh, Stephen Mendelson, followed by Representative Hennessy. Yes, uh, this is uh, Stephen Mendelson. I'm uh, I'm an autistic adult uh, and uh, one of the leaders of, of the disability rights organization Second Thoughts Connecticut, testifying in strong opposition to this bill. You have my credentials on my written testimony, along with links, and I hope you can uh, check check all that out. I'm here to, uh, and want to rebut a number of the things that the, uh, that uh, Ms. Callanan just said on behalf of Compassion and Choices. One is this is suicide. Merriam-Webster and other dictionaries define assisted suicide as the act of taking one's life intentionally. And if the bill works the way the proponents claim, there is no more intentional act of, of, of killing yourself intentionally than in that, dragging two witnesses, uh, two doctors, and a pharmacist in as, as, as partners in your suicide. The Connecticut State Suicide Prevention Plan 2025 calls it assisted suicide, says that it intersects in important ways with suicide prevention, is the only one in the nation that, that considers disabled people a high-risk population and uh, cites William Peace. Many assume that disability is a fate worse than death. So we admire people with a disability who want to die and we shake our heads and collect, collective heads in confusion when they want to live. And uh, by contrast, Oregon suicide prevention plan is only about youth. It doesn't mention 
uh, seniors or disabled people at all. And this is one, just one of many examples of how this bill promotes lethal and systemic ableism. Uh, as far as the claim that there have been no abuses in Oregon, uh, my testimony links to the, uh, the site of the Disability Rights Education and Defense Fund, which has a number of document links of a, of a whole bunch of different kinds of, of abuses, uh, including prolonged and agonizing deaths. And uh, I would point Ka Kathy Ludlam's testimony has a more recent one uh, w where they cite somebody in Oregon who took over four days to die. And uh, it says here, uh, he, the person drank the lethal cocktail. Within 20 minutes, he was asleep. 12 hours later, this woman saw a shadow out of the corner of the eye. He was sitting up and awake. Then he started vomiting profusely. Let me scroll down here. Oops. After he awoke, scared and confused, he was admitted to the hospital. Uh, was found in, nurses had given a mild tranquilizer with a nausea and vomiting. Over the next four days, he di declined rapidly. Was with, was with him when he died. As he lay flailing in his hospital bed, yanking at the sheets, he, she held his hand. He didn't die peacefully, she said, her voice almost breaking. It was a terrible death. So these newer drugs like DDMP2 actually cause increasingly prolonged and agonizing deaths. Don't believe the myth that this is about a peaceful death and don't believe the myth that it is about pain. The drugs cause more pain often than, than they relieve. As far as uh, uh, some other thing, as far as the bill itself, the bill itself guts many of the, safe, the so-called safeguards from previous bills. Heirs, and family members and caregivers, and even, and I believe even, even the attending doctor can be witnesses now, which is not the case in previous bills. Uh, doctor shopping is easier. What? Uh, you hit your three minute mark if you wouldn't mind. Okay, I'll try, I'll, try, I'll try to wrap up. Uh, doctor shopping is easier because both doctors can practice together. The death certificate, as the uh, Division of Criminal Justice has pointed out, and its testimony is falsified. And as far as CNC claiming, th uh, they are pushing, as I point out in my testimony, a whole bunch of expansion bills in other states. And once, once we pass this bill, it's out of your hands. The courts will expand it out of equal protection grounds. And that's how we get to where Canada is now, where disabled people are living in literal terror because where hospitals routinely deny deep treatment to disabled people and offer euthanasia instead. All the safeguards here, like six months, terminally ill, mentally competent, and self-administration are discriminatory, whichever side of this issue you're on. Please read the National Council of Disabilities report, The Danger of Assisted Suicide Laws, and reject codifying lethal and systemic disability discrimination into law. Thank you, Mr. Mendelson. I appreciate your testimony today. Um, if you have something that you think the committee should read, I hope you included it in your written testimony. But uh, the, I have a lot of links to it, and you can check out my sources. Okay, thank you so much. I appreciate you doing that. Um, thank you very much for your time today. You're welcome. Um, next, we have Representative Hennessy, followed by Kathy Ludlam. Representative Hennessy, go right ahead. Representative Hennessy, are you there? We can't hear you, so. Uh, still nothing, Representative. Let's get it one more minute. If you could get on, please. Okay, why don't we move on to Kathy Ludlam then? Ms. Ludlam, are you there? Could you go ahead? Go ahead. Oh, hello. Hi. Nice Can having you. Me? Go right ahead. Hi, thank you for this opportunity to meet with you. Um, I'm actually gonna defer a little from my remarks. I was taking some notes as people were talking. Savannah, can you just click on word there? I just want to make sure I don't overlook what was in my notes. Click there and then just pull that over to the end. So I'm not blocking everything right on the top. Yeah. Beautiful. Thank you. Great. Well, um, I so much appreciate this discussion today. No uh, to well, this. let me start at the beginning. Senator Abrams, Representative Steinberg, and members of the Public Health Committee. Um, my name is Kathy Ledlam, and I'm one of the leaders of Second Thoughts Connecticut. 
and I am opposed to HB 6425. Hi, I believe I'm next. I, I'm sorry, I'm on another meeting. My name is uh, Representative, uh, Representative Jack Hennessy. Hennessy. Representative Hennessy, wait a minute, please. You are uh, interrupting someone else's testifying now. You'll have to wait. Thank you. Please go on mute. Okay. I'm sorry. I'm very sorry, Ms. Ludlam. Please continue. Uh, oh, thank you. Things happen. Um, I'm opposed to HB 6425. I have a lot to say, so please do read my written testimony when you get the chance. But I appreciate this time to meet with all of you briefly here, and I so much appreciate the discussion. It's already been held. I know there are a lot of divergent opinions, but I think by talking things out, that's how we all learn. And I, I appreciate that opportunity and willingness. Um, I'm diverging from my written remarks because I want to say that the experience of living with a severe disability tends to make you a fighter. You know, and I'm here and a lot of us are here year after year causing problems and discord because we have to fight every day. We have to fight for the health care that we get. We have to fight for supports in our homes. We have to fight sometimes our school systems and other things. And sometimes we have to fight with our own bodies. Even though a lot of us are not terminally ill as defined, a lot of us do struggle to live every day because it's hard to do that sometimes. And bringing the language from the bill, I wanna say that terminal illness is defined in section one, number 20, as the final stage of an incurable and irreversible medical condition that an attending, attending physician anticipates within reasonable medical judgment will produce a patient's death within six months. And, um, you know, a lot of us have been on the other end of that. Even though we don't have a terminal condition per se, when things crop up, they do look at us and say, don't you think maybe this is the next step? Now I understand that assisted suicide, and I'm sorry, but that's what I call it, um, is supposed to be at the request of the individual. And a lot of things are supposed to be a certain way in life. And then there's the reality of life. And sometimes parameters change, circumstances change, and you can end up having control taken away from you. And so I think when people are talking about getting the government out or in, thank you, Lindsay, I'm wrapping up, getting the government out or in of this question, um, to me right now, there is government protection for vulnerable people like myself. And I am very reluctant to have a new program developed that um, is gonna take on the life of its own as all things do, not criticizing this in particular, but everything takes on the life of its own. And so that's one of the reasons why I'm fighting against this. And just in concluding, there have been remarks made about, well, you know, otherwise they live in a wheelchair or otherwise they would be dependent on others. You know what, there's worse things than that. And that does not to me justify this decision, not that you need to justify it with me, but creating a law, it needs to be justified to make such a big change in our healthcare system. And I thank you for your time and your attention. 
And I'd be glad to answer any questions. We do have some questions, so thank you very much, Ms. Ludlam. Wait one minute. Uh, Representative Steinberg. Thank you, Madam Chair. And, and Kathy, thank you for testifying again this year. Uh, we, we know how passionate you are on this subject and what a wonderful advocate you've been on behalf of the disability community over many, many years. Uh, I, I know that from a personal experience uh, in my time on the Long-Term Care Advisory Committee, uh, where you have represented the disability community as well as anybody in any state, and I thank you for that. Uh, I want to also thank you for having read the specific definition of terminal illness that's in this bill. Mm -hmm. And you made it very clear what the rules will be. I, I guess the question I have for you is the question I've had for you in the past. Mm -hmm. If this bill becomes law, that definition will become law. And yet you continue to assert that people will do something other than the law because of this. They will use terminal illness in some fashion that is not its legal definition if it becomes law, wouldn't that by definition mean that they are doing something illegal and should be prosecuted? Why is it that the disability community is concerned about somebody violating the law who would therefore be eligible for being prosecuted for having violated the law? I think that's an excellent question and I thank you for it. Um, I think what we're looking at is not you're gonna disagree with me and that's okay. But um, there are a lot of steps to this. The most immediate step to this for proponents is passing this particular law with its particular language. Once that happens, if it does, then there will be the regulatory um, process presumably through public health, that would implement the language of the law. And then there will be other intermediate steps and eventually where the rubber meets the road, you will have a patient and a physician talking to each other. It's not the first step. Well, I'm trying to stop the first step, but it's not the first step that's the concern to me. The concern is about four or five steps down the way when, and I'm not saying all doctors are bad either. There's lots of good doctors, but a lot of us have heard things like, you know, um, things are really deteriorating. What do you think you want to do? And the question really ought to be, things are really deteriorating. Here are the various options, including ventilators, including feeding tubes, of which I've got, um, and other things to make you more comfortable, functional, and hopefully live longer. Not, you know, doctors are human. They carry the same biases as every other human. And I think there will be, I know there will be, inevitably, some interactions between disabled individuals, disabled slash terminally ill, possibly, if they're on the edge a little bit, and providers where the provider is um, thinking, boy, I wouldn't want to live in your shoes. And that is my concern. You cannot regulate that. You cannot write a law to prevent that. That's, that's what I'm fighting about. Thank you for that response. Uh, uh, I, I can't possibly uh, imagine your lived experience. So it, it's hard for me to put myself in your shoes and understand exactly the concerns you have about the medical community uh, I'd like to believe that virtually all physicians take their Hippocratic Oath very seriously and are looking out for everyone's interests, whether they have a disability or not. Um, and uh, uh, I guess the confidence I have uh, that, that what you described will not happen is not only uh, the language of, of this bill, but the experience in other states. So, uh, you know, again, if, if 
uh, I, I found a, a pattern of abuse such as you described with the disability community, I would be equally concerned. So I appreciate your testimony. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, Ms. Ludlam, for your testimony today. And thank you for your service to our state and how well you represent uh, the people that you advocate for. So um, I thank you for that. And thank you for being here today. Thanks to you and thank you to everyone for your time. Um, next, we have Representative Hennessy, followed by Diana Bernard. Representative Hennessy, are you there? Representative Hennessy? Okay, I'm gonna to have to move ahead again. Um, Diana Bar Barnard or Bernard? Hello, I'm here. Great, go right ahead. Thank you. Um, my name is Diana Barnard and I'm a hospice and palliative physician from Vermont. Um, I have about 25 years of experience in, in medicine and the last 12 years of my life have been dedicated exclusively to caring for individuals living with serious illness. Oh, I see Representative Hennessy on, should I pause? Nope, that's, right. that's okay, go right ahead. You're okay, up. all right. So I was actively involved in the passage of the legislation here in Vermont and I continue to be involved in educational efforts and clinical support for medical aid in dying as well as other aspects of end of life care throughout the state. And I am a prescriber myself. Um, today, I want to tell you a, a story of Jerry and Jackie, who were a couple that I saw just this week, and they actually specifically asked me to share their story. I met the couple about 18 months ago um, after Jerry had been diagnosed with ALS and had lived with it already for many months. And as a palliative care physician, my job is to explore suffering. And I have learned over the years and through my training that suffering is deeply individual and that it comes in different forms. And as I spoke to Jerry, it was clear that he had very good knowledge about ALS and the treatment options. He had very good family support and that his worry, which is what translated into his suffering was all about what the end of his life was look, would look like. He was a very robust, physically active individual who used to hike and ski and do property management. And he had already had to let go of all of those things. And he was working really hard to adapting to his new different life, but the changes were so quick. And as soon as he learned to adapt, he would have new challenges and he deeply feared spending the last weeks of his life trapped in a body that had let him down and was dying. And he was so worried that he had even made passing comments about taking things into his own hands, um, which you can imagine was distressing for his wife. And so during our visit, I listened and we talked about various options for treating his ALS. And uh, over the last year and a half, I've been meeting with him period periodically to address his suffering. As his condition worsened and deteriorated, he became eligible for hospice and he is now enrolled in hospice. And Jerry continued to voice worry about the end of his life and wanted medical aid in dying as an option. So over the last few weeks, his primary care physician and myself have been going through the process of determining and helping him be eligible for medical aid in dying. This week, I went to see the couple for the first time since that process was completed and the change was profound. Their relief at knowing that they now had a plan B, that they had an emergency plan for if Jerry's suffering became unbearable was the very thing the law is intended to do, which is to allow them to set aside that fear. And Jerry is now focused on his life and living every day to the fullest. And he's seeing his family and he's participating in things he can do and he knows that he never used the medication if his suffering is bearable. And he also knows that if the time comes when it's unbearable, that with good coordination and hospice care, he can choose to ingest a small amount of powder mixed with a clear liquid in four to six ounces and self Excuse me, you hit your three minute mark if you would like to and face death on his own terms. And by the way, if he did so, his cause of death, the death certificate would be listed as ALS, just as if Jerry chose a different path, a highly aggressive path, including ventilatory support and had to be removed from the ventilator at the end of his life, the cause of death would still be his ALS. Thank you. 
Thank you for that. Um, I was saying, I, I just wanted you kind of rushed through the end there. Can you talk a little bit more about the death certificate and how that works? Yeah, the there are death people who have made some claims. I think you know in testimony earlier on. So I just want to be clear. I, I am I am not a medical examiner, but as a physician, I am well aware that death certificates are important because they allow us to track diseases and causes of death. We want to know what is causing death so that we can respond and prevent, not the manner of death. So um, the cause of death in Jerry's case will be ALS, as I said, despite the manner in which his life ends, whether it's naturally at home, whether it's by the use of medical aid in dying, medication that hastens his death, or whether he ended up in a hospital or on a ventilator and because of a choice to allow death, he would be removed from the ventilator to be allowed to die. We wouldn't put that cause of death as homicide by removing a ventilator. It's the cause, the underlying cause of death. And that's the most important thing on a death certificate. Okay, and I think someone had testified previously as well that when um, palliative care is given, um, and sometimes the level of medication that's given through the palliative care um, can hasten someone's death similarly. And, and in those cases, the death certificate would read the underlying cause such as cancer or whatever as well, correct? Correct. Okay. Um, there are some questions. Representative Dauphiné. Hi, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for your testimony. I just wanted you to speak to um, the likenesses and the differences from, um, I think it's Vermont you're from? Mm-hmm. Um, with regard to this bill and how that how what their process is and what their bill would say um the the you know most of the aid and dying legislation is all very similar and it's similar because it's been crafted to have very careful safeguards to be sure that the process is patient driven all along the way and to uh so the process about making one request and then needing to make a second request and then additionally making a written request and additionally, seeing a second physician who can confirm the terminal diagnosis and the prognosis, all of those elements are similar in all of the state's legislations because we have such good data from Oregon about how well the law is working there. Okay, thank you. I appreciate the um, answers and thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative. Representative Gilchrist. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Ms. Bernard, uh, for being here. Barnard, sorry about that. Um, <laughs> I'm used to it. <laughs> in your experience um, doing hospice, which thank you for doing that role, um, what happens with the medication if the person doesn't take it? How do we ensure it gets disposed of safely? Yeah, that's a great question. I think, you know, first of all, I do see the process as a type of procedure, and it is pretty standard practice in medicine, for example, with my patient Jerry, we completed the process and he is now eligible, but that doesn't necessarily mean I am writing the prescription or that the prescription is available. So many times we complete the process, somebody is eligible, but I encourage my patients not to have the medication in their home unless it's needed, same way that my typical hospice patients may not have morphine or Ativan in their home until they need it. Um, so a lot of this is just good medicine and not having more medications around than you need. But as I think Kim Kalman sort of reminded us that hospice is very familiar with having medications that can be potentially lethal in the home. And our hospice agencies have very good procedures for any medications that are left in the home after a patient dies, regardless of what they they are a way to help safely dispose of them. And our state has also made great efforts in making medication disposal available to um, uh, anonymously throughout the state. So I feel like we have good mechanisms for that in Vermont. Thank you so much for that answer. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. I think when you're talking, Doctor, that um, all the research that was done a while ago about patient comfort level and, man and ability to manage pain when they were in control of how much pain medication they were getting and how we've moved towards um, self-administering pumps in some cases um, with ho in hospitals um, so that it's that sense of control that really eases a lot of, um, a lot of the angst around uh, pain and suffering. And I, that's what I was reminded of when you were speaking about the couple that you were talking with. You know, just knowing that there's a level of control there. 
Yes, I think, you know, there are so many things about um, facing a terminal illness, in particular with ALS, but so many others, so much of the disease is out of your control. And I will tell you that after doing this work for so long, my patients want to live. They want to live as long as possible. Um, that is universal. But knowing they have a terminal illness, patients also have ideas about how they want to die. And there is great diversity. Diversity is a wonderful thing. I meet with some patients who choose life at all costs and I support that because that is their values. And I meet with other people more similar to Jerry who talk about if I can't do the things that have brought my life meaning, why in the last few weeks should I be forced to suffer? And having that control, having options and choices, this is a lot of and. We're gonna do the best possible palliative care, the best possible hospice care. We're gonna continually respond to suffering and we're gonna to try to give the patient just that little bit of choice and control about the end of their life, which is of course a deeply personal experience that I think many of us have to admit that we humbly cannot know how we will feel until our time comes. Good point. Um, Representative Tavra DeGroff. Yes, thank you so much for this testimony. Um, I'm finding it very helpful because as you've said, you are there doing it. Um, I can speak to, as I started to earlier, about the number of um, deaths that I have been privileged to um, be there at the very end. And I think specifically about my godfather who was dying from pancreatic cancer. And I will be honest, he had hospice. Um, it was a very brutal, brutal end. Um, I, I'm not sure for the rest of my life that I will ever get the death rattle sound out of my head. Um, and th these were, you know, th this was not an option. Uh, he was in Pennsylvania. It's, uh, this was 20 some years ago. It was not legal. So I guess my question to you is, are there cases where, you know, because this was somewhat my experience, but I'd like to hear from you who are in this field. Uh, are there cases where existing palliative care and hospice is not enough? Yeah, that's a really important question. I, I mean, I think first of all, we this is we have to acknowledge that we are still relatively a death defying, de defying society. We have have not really medicine has made so many great strides in preventing death and helping people live with differences and differing abilities and serious illness for many many years, and all of that is great. But it's sort of taken our attention away from acknowledging that we are still dealing with dying. And unfortunately for many physicians, there is this idea that, well, when it's time for hospice, we're gonna get you enrolled in hospice and it's the most beautiful, wonderful thing and everything will be perfect. And that's not fair either. I think we have to acknowledge that what we want to have are many tools in the toolbox. We wanna have options and we don't know what the experience is gonna be of the patient in a situation and we wanna have lots of things that help us think on our feet. Many times hospice care is lovely and people have the most wonderful experience and they die naturally and may not even need a lot of medication. Other people really struggle with symptoms that are difficult to manage. And yes, we have lots of tools and opioids and other medicines that can help a lot of physical pain be managed, but we also have to admit that sometimes those tools are not enough which is why we have things like, you know, I've heard referred to today, palliative sedation. That's another tool for a specific situation. And medical aid in dying really addresses a particular kind of suffering. As you've heard, it's less about physical suffering, no pain, not necessarily, or not shortness of breath, but existential suffering. The suffering that comes from what is the meaning of me living within this body that is dying when I cannot live. And that is why we need medical aid in dying as a tool. So, you know, it's, we hope that we can help most people live well and die well, but there are a number of challenges that can make people's end of life experiences traumatic. And unfortunately, and I'm so sorry for the, the situation you went through, having been through an experience like that, it affects you for the rest of your life. And it will affect you when your time comes. And when you or other family members are diagnosed with a, with a terminal illness, you're probably gonna be reminded of that experience and want reassurance that you can have something different. And you know, this is what we're learning. Medical aid in dying is not something that doctors are asking for. 
the population, people, patients, family members, people who are dying, people who have seen loved ones die, they are the people who want this as one option, not because it's right for everybody, not because there aren't other ways to manage suffering, but as one of those critical tools in the toolbox. I, I, I thank you for that. And, you know, as Representative Hughes had stated earlier, she's heard from a lot of people who would like this as an option. And I think that that is the key, that it is an option. It is not a mandate. It is not something that, uh, you know, anyone has to take up. The parameters are, are so very narrow. Um, and so I appreciate um, the, the ongoing education piece of this, because I think that, you know, to the extent that we can, I do worry about, you know, there are certain communities that may be more affected by this than others. And how does that, you know, we have to think and be very thoughtful in how we are crafting, frankly, any legislation, but specifically around this legislation. So I, I thank you so much for, for all of that today. I appreciate it. Yeah, you're welcome. The fact that it's patient driven and the patient initiates each request and each step and ultimately does the self-ingestion, those are safeguards to be sure that this is about the patient. Thank you, um, Representative Pettit. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Dr. B, thank you for your testimony. Uh, follow up to a question I, I asked previously, and it has to do with the self-administration and your illustrative case of somebody with ALS is, is right there. Have you been faced with the issue where someone has thought about doing this, has requested medication, and then later is not able to self-administer? Would you sort of walk me through your thought process on, process on that? Someone got to the point where they couldn't self-administer? That is actually a really important question because one theme when you're dealing with serious illness is you always have to have a plan B and C and D because you can never predict exactly how the course of an illness is going to go. So even when, you, when you're treating cancer, you might be using one chemotherapy, but you're hoping that your oncologist is already thinking about what's the next step if this one stops to work. When we're dealing specifically with medical aid and dying, from the very beginning, one of the most important things for me to do is to inform people of all of their options and to remind them that medical aid and dying is a process and that the patient has to continue to be in control and able to self-ingest right to the end. And part of my job is to make sure that we have good plans for what happens if someone starts the process but then loses eligibility. And, and the biggest things that can happen are they become cognitively unable to understand what they're asking for and do it. And they might lose the ability to self ingest. Um, you know, as you know, uh, you know, as an aside, ALS comes in, in sort of different subtypes. And for some people, swallowing is affected very early, but for other types of ALS, swallowing is not a difficulty. But it is important to always be talking to the patient about even as they're moving forward with the process, that two things could happen. One, they might decide to stop the process at any point along the way because they are in control and they might decide, I don't need to move forward. They also need to know that even if they wanted to move forward, that physical or cognitive circumstances might happen where they no longer become eligible. And that's where I pull up my palliative care toolkit and find other ways to address whatever suffering that patient is experiencing. Does, does that answer your question? Yeah, it, it, you're saying that it involves a uh educated, informed uh, provider who know, knows the patient well and what leads to a maybe a, a second quick, I don't know if it's quick, but a, should this be, given that construct, should this be limited to those who provide palliative care or people who are primary care providers, should they always consult with a palliative care provider in, in this instance, given the different nuances towards the end of life? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, I think, um, again, this is all about options and having things available. And some situations are pretty straightforward and it is well within the realm of primary care physicians to take care of people who are dying routinely. And so they have a lot of what we call primary palliative care skills themselves that they can use. And I think all of us in medicine learn to know what we know and to know when we need help. And so I really believe in having specialty available, specialty services for those that are having more difficult symptoms, whether they're physical or existential. And I personally believe that everybody who's dying 
deserves hospice care because it's currently the standard of care for the best possible way to live the final terminal phase of your illness. So I, I do believe that people should be well informed and that they should they should have options. And remember that in Vermont, which is very similar to other states, um, even people that get all the way through the process and are eligible to receive the prescription, you know, a good 25, 30% of people don't use it. It's all about having options and having a certain sense of control at a deeply personal time. Thank you, doctor. Appreciate your uh, passion and perspective. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Representative. Representative McCarty. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair, and please excuse me. I had to leave for a while, so if this question has been asked, I, I do apologize. And I just wanted to say, Doctor, uh, Doc Pettit actually asked my question. My father did have ALS, and it affected his swallowing to a great degree. So that same uh, question came to my mind. But I'm curious, could you just uh, quickly tell me why you could not put on the death certificate? Uh, how the patient used the assisted suicide uh, to expedite the ending. Why can't that be transparent and open? And why do you have to uh, list the actual underlying cause as the cause of death? Yeah, I'm happy to go, go over that briefly again. And just to say, I am not a medical examiner nor an expert in that field, but as a physician, I do death certificates routinely. And we do death certificates to track diseases and illnesses and the cause of death. That is really what the purpose of the death certificate is, to track the cause of death. And in, in Jerry's case, the cause of his dying is going to be ALS whether it's because he hastened his death with medicine or if he changes his mind and decides to pursue aggressive care and ends up on a ventilator. And then because his body is dying, he, his healthcare agent requests that the ventilator be removed so that he can die. In that case, we would list the cause of death as the underlying illness, not something like homicide by removing a breathing tube or turning off a ventilator. So it really comes down to the death certificate being about the cause of why somebody is dying, not the manner of how they die. And we all, as doctors, have all gotten calls from the medical examiner because we put the manner of how somebody died rather than the cause, and it's wrong, and it gets corrected. Does that make sense? Yes, but I, I still... I still see, I still have an issue with it myself because I think in, if we come away from this particular topic, many times you can see on the death certificate the cause and there could be additional causes. So I would think it would be appropriate to have uh, maybe on the death certificate the terminal illness, but also have somewhere that identified that it was also uh, you, uh, assisted suicide was used. So uh, I many cases, you know. Sorry. No, no, that's fine. Thank you. I, yeah, I just, I just, you know, that just reminds me again about like, thinking about that example of the ventilator, I could imagine if a family was holding up a death certificate and saw that the reason their father died was because the ventilator was removed, that would be emotionally very traumatic. And so we really have to think, what is the, the goal of a death certificate? What is, what is what we need to do from legal perspectives? And how do we respond to things like privacy and, and personal choice and preferences? And all of those things are important. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank, thank you very much. Thank you, Representative. Thank you, Doctor, for being with us today and, and giving us so much information. We appreciate your time. Yeah, good luck. Happy to take questions offline if anybody has. Okay, this is the third time's the charm, Representative Hennessy. Are you with oh, us? Thank you. Thank you, Representative uh, Senator Doherty. Representative Steinberg, my name is Jack Hennessy, representing the 127th District in Bridgeport. I would like to refer to the committee my written testimony that I have submitted, uh, but out of respect for time limitations, I would like to yield my time to Christopher Rossetti. Mr. Rossetti, go right ahead. You're muted, so if you want to unmute yourself, please. You're still muted, Mr. Rossetti. 
There you go. I think if you speak, you'll you'll be able to. Uh, dear members of the uh, Joint Public Health Committee, my name is Christopher J. Rossetti, and I'm testifying in support of raised bill six four two five. I was born in Bridgeport in 1953. I was raised in Stratford and Trumbull. I attended Fairfield Prep in Fairfield, Connecticut. Apart from my college years, I then attended graduate school at the University of Connecticut on the Storrs campus and then later the uh, School of Law in Hartford. And I've lived in Connecticut all my life. It's a wonderful place. It's my home. Most of my friends and family reside here. So unfortunately, uh, I was recently diagnosed with a rare form of eye cancer for which there's no treatment, uh, no effective treatment as of this point in time. And uh, I'm informed by my medical team that the outcome will probably be uh, liver failure. <clears throat> uh, I practice law in Metro Hartford, primarily in the probate field, and uh, I've had uh, ample opportunity to witness end of life situations of wards and clients. Uh, I'm no hero. <clears throat> it would be of great comfort to know that I might have some control over the last days of my life when that time comes. The legislation before you would provide some control and help alleviate the, the uh, unnecessary pain and suffering of the final few days of an individual's life. My view is partially informed by the death of my mother, uh, who died in Hartford Hospital and with the benefit of medical care. Unfortunately, uh, she had late stage ovarian cancer, chemotherapy, trials and uh, she had several several routines of chemotherapy that did prolong her life somewhat but her end came suddenly and uh, she was in considerable agony trying to live while children grandchildren nieces and siblings rushed to the hospital uh, had she been able to organize her passing, I think she would have done so. So uh, I very much would like to uh, have the opportunity to have medicine available, assistance of a, of a physician in the last extremes. I may not use it, but I would certainly be comforted by knowing that it's available. And I would very much ask the committee to uh, approve this legislation and send it to the floor for a vote. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Rossetti. And um, you say that you're not a hero, but I think that you've shown incredible courage today and strength. And I really appreciate that. And um, I appreciate you helping us understand this bill better through your personal experience. Um, Thank you. It's real, your testimony is really remarkable. Um, Senator Wong. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Rossetti, our, uh, our thoughts and prayers are with you every day. Thank you for your courage and in, in sharing your uh, viewpoints. Uh, having read the Hartford Current article, I, I wanted to ask you, um, you view this matter as, as a matter of civil liberties. Uh, can you elaborate a little bit more on that? Well, control over our bodies, uh, you know, our human form is probably uh, uh, the most fundamental right that we have. Um, 
to me, the right to have some control over your final days is very important. Uh, at present, you know, this, the unavailability of the benefit of medical science for those final days um, interferes with that liberty. Uh, I would like my passing to be in a controlled, pleasant situation with my friends and family gathered around me, not a chaotic, unpleasant, um, really just Thank unpleasant you. situation. And so, uh, yes, I think uh, uh, it is a fundamental liberty, the right to to die in peace in one's home. Mr. Rosetti, thank you for, for sharing um, your thoughts. Uh, I, I know it can't be easy. And um, my, my utmost respect to you for your courage. And I also want to compliment uh, Representative Hennessy for seeding his time and for his consistency in respecting uh, body choices and, and, uh, and throughout. <clears throat> and we don't pick and choose. Uh, so I greatly appreciate your insight and your legal interpretation, but also your personal perspective and reiterating that science doesn't have always the answer that you've got to trust people's instincts in some cases. So I want to thank you both, Senator Representative Hennessy and Mr. Rossetti and our thoughts and prayers are with you always. Thank, thank you, you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator. I don't see any other questions, Mr. Rossetti. So I'd just like to, again, say thank you so much for being here and for your incredible courage. And I wish you all the best. Thank you. Um, next, we have uh, James Young, followed by Representative Gresco. Mr. Young, go right ahead. Yes, good afternoon. I'm attorney Jim Young. I'm in Mystic, Connecticut. And I'm appearing here on behalf of the Elder Law Section of the Connecticut Bar Association and its roughly 500 members um, in conditional support of HB 6425. First, I want to say it's incredibly humbling to, to be present before you. I have been before you many times over the last seven or eight years. I think the testimony that's been offered by a number of these speakers before me is, is far more important than what I have to offer, but um, the Elder Law Section of the Bar Association uh, conditionally supports HB 6425. I would refer you to my written testimony. We believe that to garner our support, the legislation should be strengthened around the areas of the witnessing of the um, requests uh, for, for aid in dying, that the two doctors involved should be independent, that they should both be required to inform the patient of the availability of counseling, and that, um, and that the rights of, of disability rights organizations such as Disability Rights Connecticut should not be abrogated. Um, and those are important things, but Fundamentally, we're talking about the right of each of us to be able to uh, control uh, some things as the end of our life nears. And I think over the years, there's been a lot of questions raised about the bill. I think we see the answer to a lot of these questions in, the, in what's happened in Oregon. In 2019, 290 people got the prescription. So Oregon's very like Connecticut in many ways. I lived there for 10 years. Population is about the same. I think culturally we're very similar. 188 people took the prescription. 68% had cancer. I think very importantly, 94% died at home. 90% died in hospice. Other people have spoken about how medical aid in dying, in, in fact, increases the utilization of hospice and palliative care. Um, I think the legislature has not previously seen the right. It, it has frankly, denied Connecticut citizens these rights, I think in part out of a desire to protect a, a population that's perceived as vulnerable and at risk, even though from what we can tell, the actual risk that's there is, seems to be pretty much non-existent. I understand the fear, but the reality of continuing to, not, to deny us these rights is that you're sentencing the many people 
who could avoid the kind of agonizing and painful death you're hearing. You're sentencing those people to those painful deaths. That's a cost they're bearing to protect against these fears, which from what we're hearing seem to be fears, but it, it doesn't seem to be based in reality. So um, I thank you very much for the opportunity to address you here today on behalf of the elder law section. If you had any questions, I'd be happy to try to address them for you. Thank you very much, um, uh, Attorney Young. Uh, Representative Steinberg. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I'm gonna disagree with you, sir. I think that your testimony was actually quite important uh, because it seeks to improve upon this bill and make it uh, achieve its uh, original intent. So for that, I thank you. Could you just explain to me a little bit more about uh, how we can uh, address the concerns of the disability community through changes to the language? You know, I, I think that the bill is very clear about what's required. And I understand the fear. Back in 2013 and 2014, I was part of a multi-member working group on behalf of the elder law section of the bar. Four or five of my colleagues joined with me. We met with members of the disability community. In fact, I think we met with Kathy, who spoke here earlier. Um, I think the bill makes it pretty clear that uh, it's damned hard to get your way through this process and that simply being disabled doesn't get you there. And I think, I think that frankly, we, we need to have a little more faith and confidence in, in the medical community to do what they do every day and to not assume that they're gonna be rubber stamping and hastening people off to the graveyard. Uh, I think that that's not helpful in terms of trying to craft language, honestly, I'd have, I would have to think more about that, Representative Steinberg. I appreciate the, the, the offer. At the moment, I don't have anything in particular to add to that or to offer. Well, thank you. I, I'm sure you'll give a continued thought. Um, and, and you do raise an interesting point. Here we are, on one hand, uh, lauding our frontline healthcare workers, our physicians for all they've been doing during COVID. And yet there remains such distrust of authority figures, even in the medical community, that we think the worst of our physicians while we're, we're entrusting our lives to them during the pandemic. There, there's a pretty significant irony in all of that. Yeah, there is. Uh, thank you for your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative. I don't see any other questions, um, Attorney Young, so thank you so much for your time and testimony today. Thank you very much. Um, next, we have Representative Gresco followed by uh, Geraldine Sklars, Representative Gresco. I'm here, thank Go you. Go right ahead, thank you. Thank you, uh, the chairs of uh, public health and, and ranking members, uh, Representative Gresco, uh, state rep here in uh, Stratford, 121st district, uh, supporting uh, HB 6425. Out of respect for the committee's time, I won't reiterate uh, the points argued on this topic individuals with their own experiences, um, scientific experts, uh, uh, the medical communities, uh, neutrality, who it affects, who doesn't. Look, I want this option for me if and when the time came where I qualified. Not because I'm well, older than I am now, uh, not because I incur a disability, but if and when I receive a diagnosis of a disease that's incurable, and irrever irreversible with the prognosis of, of uh, six months and I'll, I'm gonna pass away anyway. Um, I don't plan on needing this, who does? But uh, however, I want this compassionate uh, practice alternative option. To me, it's not a matter of life and death. It's, it's a personal um, matter of death and uh, dying. And I don't see how authorization of this bill would harm um, uh, any of those who are strongly opposed for, uh, to it, uh, for obviously very passionate reasons, they simply don't have to choose to do it. But for terminally ill people in Connecticut who, who face uh, an option of unbearable suffering, uh, it should be, it should be uh, added to the uh, range of palliative and end of care uh, uh, medical aid and dying is another option in my opinion. And I'll stop there because um, I know you guys are gonna have a long day. So thank you. 
Thank you so much for being here today and for sharing uh, your thoughts. Representative Steinberg. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I just want to make the statement that I'm glad to hear you have no immediate plans. Uh, the people of the state of Connecticut still have plans for you. So uh, we're, we're counting on you in the near future. Thank you for testifying, Representative. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for being here, Representative. Appreciate it. Um, next, we have number 20, John Warburg, followed by 21, Joseph Marine. Mr. Warburg. Go Thank right you ahead. to the members of the Public Health Committee for hearing this bill. My name is John Warburg, and I am testifying in support of House Bill 6425. Uh, we've mostly heard from professional advocates of one kind or another so far today. As a private citizen, I feel as though I represent the silent majority of Americans who are in favor of some form of medical aid in dying. It seems inevitable that legislation will reflect this in more states over the coming years. However, I also understand that as legislators, you sometimes have to vote against the wishes of the majority in order to protect a vulnerable minority. But there is no such choice to be made here. This is not an either or issue. It's simply about giving terminally ill people more control over when and how they die without affecting the rights or obligations of others. People who do not like this law do not have to use it. They do not even have to opt out. They are protected by default. I just want to reiterate that this is ultimately an issue about personal choice. It saddens me that people want to limit this personal choice out of fear that it will somehow be forced upon others against their will. Multiple legal safeguards and over 20 years of experience with the law in 10 states have shown that this fear is completely unfounded. It can't be emphasized enough that this law would only impact those who choose to opt in. If we use the potential for abuse, no matter how remote in the case of medical aid and dying, as a reason not to pass this law, then we might as well reverse all laws that give people a right to make any kind of self-determination because there will always be the theoretical possibility of third-party coercion. But again, there are multiple safeguards against this. Our government needs to have more faith in people's ability to decide what's best for themselves and trust the medical and legal systems to prevent abuse of this freedom. Ultimately, I'm testifying today because I want to see the wishes of my 93-year-old father for, uh, fulfilled he is terrified of becoming disabled and being trapped in a hospital bed, living out his final days in extreme pain and no longer getting any joy or meaning from his life. If there is a chance of recovery, I know that he will fight to live. But if he is facing a terminal illness, it will be a huge comfort to him to know that he could take a medication to end his suffering should he choose to do so. I want my father to have this option and as fiercely as I value both his life and my own, I want to have this option for myself too. Thank you for listening to my testimony. Thank you for testifying today. And it sounds like testifying in some ways on behalf of your father as well. Uh, let me ask a question. Does your father have a living will, advanced directives? Uh, have you discussed with him his, his, yes. his desires? Yes, he's, he's covered all the bases. The one option he doesn't have is a medical aid and dying option. Well, again, thank you for your testimony today, for your patience waiting for us, and as you say, for providing the viewpoint of somebody who, who's not uh, uh, got a horse in this race, I suppose. Uh, though, I guess you would argue we all have a horse in this race in one yep. fashion or another. Any other questions? If not, again, thank you for your time today. Thank you. Uh, next up is... Uh, Joseph Marine, number 21, if I have that correct. Yes, thank you. Um, can you hear me? I can. Please proceed. Honored committee members, uh, good morning. My name is Joseph Marine. I'm a cardiologist practicing with Johns Hopkins Medicine in Baltimore, Maryland, with over 20 years of experience caring for thousands of patients. I'm also a member of the American Medical Association and American College of Physicians, both of which oppose legalization of assisted suicide. The views expressed here are my own. I ask you to oppose this bill because doctor-assisted suicide represents shockingly dangerous and misguided public policy, which violates many basic principles of patient safety and medical ethics, and which does not address the needs of patients with advanced illnesses and disabilities. Assisted suicide is not medical care. 
It has no basis in medical science, practice, or tradition. The lethal drugs used in assisted suicide have never been scientifically tested to cause death in humans, and the US FDA has never approved any drugs for this purpose. The drug recipes for assisted suicide have been invented by the euthanasia movement, not the health professions. Furthermore, we know that assisted suicide doctors in other states have been performing unscientific, unregulated, and unethical ad hoc experiments on sick patients using combinations of cheaper drugs. Tragically, these experiments have caused some patients to scream in pain and take over two days to die. The state of Oregon, which has assisted suicide for 24 years, admits that in 70 to 80% of cases with no witnesses, they have no idea if complications occurred or whether the drugs were self-administered. In states with assisted suicide, patients have lived up to three years after receiving a prescription in violation of the law, which requires a six month prognosis with no accountability for the physician. We know that patients who qualify for assisted suicide have a 50 to 75% incidence of clinical depression and that at least one patient received a prescription in Oregon despite a history of severe depression and suicidality. Yet in 2018, less than 2% of Oregon patients received a formal mental health evaluation, statistical proof that the law is not being followed. The law can be routinely violated because it relies entirely upon self-reporting with broad legal immunity given to physicians, no witnesses to consumption of drugs, falsification of death certificates, no routine audits, investigations, or supervision by an independent safety monitoring board. The bill provides a new license for doctors to violate basic, basic principles of medical ethics and to experiment upon and take the lives of vulnerable patients with broad legal immunity and no real accountability or oversight. It is a perversion of the prescribing power that society entrusts to the medical profession. It does not give any patients any new rights and it takes away many legal protections. With patients, what patients with advanced illnesses and disabilities need is more support and greater access to high quality palliative hospice care and pain management programs. We should better use these valuable medical tools and not undermine our healthcare system with assisted suicide. Thank you very much. I'll be happy to take your questions. Thank you, doctor, for your testimony. Uh, I assume you, you've had an opportunity to read the bill and perhaps even review the data from the other states. Um, it, you know, obviously we're all concerned about this use of the word experimentation on patients. Uh, that goes against all sorts of uh, both national and, and international norms. Um, what is it in this bill that you, makes you think that there would be the leeway for any physician to experiment with some drug other than the one that's stipulated or in some fashion other than that. And I guess the adjunct question to that is, is the fact that it has not been witnessed evidence of nefarious activity or are you simply suggesting it's possible? Well, to answer the first question, the bill does not stipulate any drug that can be used. So a doctor can literally use anything. Um, I think even the term using the term medication is very deceptive because using the term medication implies a medical purpose. These are really drugs that are being abused and used as poisons. The intention is to take the life of a patient to end life, not to medicate. Um, so there, there's, as I said, there's no FDA approved drug for this purpose. If you look at states that are using uh, assisted suicide, you can go to the Oregon report. It shows a marked change in the drugs that are used over the past five years. More than five years ago, the predominant drug used was, was uh, barbiturates, very powerful uh, sedative hypnotics. Because in the last few years, those drugs have almost vanished from the market due to high prices or lack of availability, doctors are literally experimenting with cocktails of other drugs um, to, to, to bring about death. Um, they call them DDMA and DDMP, but they're basically just cocktails of cardiac drugs and sedative hypnotics that produce death by a completely different way. They seem to be producing death now by cardiac arrhythmia rather than by uh, the sedative effect of, of barbiturates. There are no studies of these drug cocktails at all that you can find anywhere. They're not published in the medical literature. If you look on Medline, you go to any standard way that I, as a doctor, try to find out how to do the right thing for a patient in guidelines or in medical science, it just doesn't exist for this field at all. So they're, they're literally just making this stuff up. There's nothing in the bill that does not allow a doctor to prescribe anything, any cocktail of any kind in any quantity. Um, so that, that, that's, that's a, certainly a huge deficiency. Um, regarding your, the, the issue of witnesses, you know, it, it, again, it's a concern because if you don't have witnesses, how can you know what's taking place? That's, I think that's the, that's the point there. 
and even the you know the the Oregon uh, study, the report that they produce every year, they used to assume that if no complication was reported, then no complication occurred. But even they admit, starting about eight to ten years ago, that if there's no witness, they can't say whether a complication occurred or not. So they just say we have no idea in 70% of complications occurred. Thank you, doctor. Senator Summers. Yes, good afternoon, uh, Dr. Maureen. I had a couple questions. Um, the first question had to do with your comment that the drugs are used off label. So if a bill like this passes and, can, and Connecticut um, does not list the medications, any physician who would create this cocktail um, that is using medication off label, I'm wondering if they could be uh, sued because they are practicing, practicing outside of the indication for use for the medication. Is that something that <coughs> clinicians would be concern, concerned about for off label well, two use? Is, two issues there. One is that um, use of a medication off label is not necessarily wrong. But when we as physicians use a medication off label, it's because there is medical science and medical studies showing that it's safe and effective and or it's included in guidelines. So it, you're not having a labeled indication for use is not necessarily a prohibition to using it for a legitimate medical purpose when there's medical science evidence and the weight of opinion uh, behind the safety and efficacy of its use. Regarding uh, legality, um, you raise an important point because uh, this bill immunizes physicians uh, from uh, anything other than a good faith violation. Um, so there's a pretty broad immunity provision that protects uh, physicians from any accountability or consequence from their mistakes while they're um, you know, doing this practice. It's very troubling for me as a physician because you know, the, the, I'm a held accountable as a physician for everything that I do to try to help a patient to enhance their life, to prolong their life. But if I practice assisted suicide, I'm immunized. Right, and you know, this legislature and, and the governor provided immunity for physicians trying to treat and help and heal with COVID. Um, now we're pulling that immunity back when you're trying to save somebody from a disease. But in this case, you are actively participating in a death and you are immune, which seems a little contrary. So in your opinion, is there a legitimate medical use uh, for um, assisting in suicide with drugs? Is there any drug that would have a legitimate medical use for suicide? In my opinion, no. And I've asked this to a bioethicist this morning and I'm gonna ask it to every clinician, which is how, is how can you as a clinician and a doctor takes an oath advocate for both life and death? To me, it's a, it's, a, it's a problem that can't be solved. I just don't see how physicians can be healers and be killers at the same time. Uh, the the, the, the um, appeal to the Hippocratic Oath came up, I think, earlier in the discussion. And it's important to note that the Hippocratic Oath written 2,400 years ago explicitly prohibits participation in assisted suicide. Neither will I give a poison to any patient, nor will I counsel the same. So this has been widely understood for 2,400 years by physicians that if we practice this, Patients and families won't trust us with their lives. And just to follow up on a couple comments you made about um, it's something we talked about earlier that um, access to good palliative care is um, something that our country and our state could use more of. Uh, in your opinion, as a cardiologist, I'm sure you see people at you know at the end of their life at times um, with uh, you know chronic heart, heart failure or other issues that they may have. And um, as a clinician. Can you, do you feel comfortable that you can make people comfortable at the end of their life? I do feel comfortable. We have uh, wonderful hospice palliative care programs, pain care managements in Maryland. Um, you know, I, I've referred patients to them. I've accompanied them on this journey in some cases. Um, you know, it's, it's a hard thing to go through, but I feel very confident of what we can offer in Maryland. You know, there are barriers, there's insurance barriers, there's access barriers in some places, but it seems to me that this is where our focus should be. And then on the fact that um, in the, the Oregon case, 70% of the folks um, are supposedly not witnessed. I, I, I find that troubling because, you know, you write somebody a script for something, you don't know what the family, family dynamics are. How, if there's no witness, do you actually know that the person administered 
those drugs or that cocktail themselves. And, and that that's an issue. Can you, you know, and, there, and it's important no. to know that there can be months and, and sometimes there's been documented even years between writing the prescription and taking the prescription. Mm -hmm. And um, how do you feel about if this bill were to go pass, you know, and if a, a doctor um, decided to um, be someone who was going to write these scripts or these cocktails, I'm troubled by the fact that, as you said, there's no indication for use. So there could be um, complications that could be extremely detrimental that we will have no way of knowing without a, without a witness. But how, what do you feel should be um, on that death certificate? I mean, if we are allowing assisted suicide, we are in essence legalizing suicide. You point to another troubling problem, which is the bill specifically states that the physician signing the death certificate shall state that the cause of death is the underlying health condition. And that's basically ordering that's physicians to lie on the death certificate, which is a vital matter of public record. Um, it's, it's not clear to me why you can't just say patient died by assisted suicide or died by um, death with dignity or whatever you call it in the particular bill. And that way, at least everybody would know the immediate cause of death. And then as a secondary cause, you could list cancer or the neurologic disease. So it's troubling. And I think you should all ask yourselves, why is this in the bill? Why is that necessary? Right. That's troubling to me too, because you're, you are, whether you have an underlying disease or not, you could, you know, there are, have been stories where people live longer than expected or, you know, beat a, beat a t disease that was thought to be terminal, et cetera. So you know, if, if this is going to go forward, the cause of death should be written. It's, it's from the drugs that cause the death. It's, and, and I, I struggle with that too. If this is so straightforward, that's something that should absolutely, um, be listed. And, um, I guess my last question to you would be, um, you know, as somebody who sees folks in their later, later years with, with heart conditions, um, you know, have you ever had a patient ask you for this kind of help when they know they have, um, you know, I, I feel like we're all, we all have an expiration date. We just don't know when that's going to be. So have you had patients come to you and ask you for help saying for, for these reasons, I'm really concerned about what I've seen. If a bill like this passes, as I've said before, it opens the door and, um, you know, people don't want to talk about the slippery slope, but when you see what's happened in other countries, even if you put these guidelines in, um, it, it's, it's quite frightening. So could you speak to, have you ever had patients ask you for something like this that may be terminal? And, and if so, how do you respond to them? Or what, what do you say uh, when they say, doctor, you know, I don't want to live anymore. Can you just give me something? What's the response? I can think of only once or twice in my career when, everyone, when anyone has hinted um, that they wanted to go down that direction. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I can think of one recently, a, a woman who lost her husband and she was obviously in some despair. She had some serious heart conditions, but was not immediately, you know, terminally ill. And she, you know, expressed some, you know, basically despair. Why should I go on? And, you know, if things get worse, can you give me something? And, you know, I just talked to her. I just saw that as a cry for help, which is what she was really asking for. Um, so, but uh, to me, it's, it's, you know, patients... Uh, the desire for life is very strong, and I, I have not seen patients in my own personal practice ask for this. Thank you very much for your testimony today. Thank you, Senator. Representative Carpino. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Doctor, thank you for um, taking the time to testify. I have a few questions that haven't been covered, so I'm going to jump around a little bit. I struggle with a lot of this bill, um, but I, I just want to ask your quest a few questions on a couple of points. I struggle with the Hippocratic Oath. I can't understand how any physician who takes the Hippocratic Oath is not violating it by assisting in this process. Am I wrong? Well, uh, it gets to a technicality as to what is the Hippocratic Oath these days. So the Hippocratic Oath has largely been modernized in most medical schools these days. Um, so some references to some of the older things in the Hippocratic Oath are no longer present. But I think the principle that you get to is a very, very important one because the prescription against taking life has long been part of the culture and the ethos of medicine uh, for thousands and thousands of years. Whether you literally say the words in an oath or not, it's simply part of the DNA of medicine for a long time, which I, I think many physicians find um, very troubling. But I think it, it speaks to the larger question is, 
So why is this prescription in the Hippocratic Oath? I think it's there because physicians, and they figured out many, many years ago that if we do this, the public's not gonna be able to trust us. And trust, I know as a doctor, is the most important therapeutic uh, part of what I offer patients. Without trust, there's very little I can do. And I'm very worried about what the expansion of assisted suicide and euthanasia in America is gonna do to trust in the health professions. We heard this from some of the disability rights advocates about their concerns with trust that they already have. And weaving this into what we offer as quote unquote medical care, which it really is not, I think is gonna damage that trust even further. Thank you. I, I don't understand how uh, prematurely, and prematurely ending a life doesn't violate do, I, do no harm. Um, further on in the bill, and I appreciate you having looked at it before you, you joined us, it talks about being able to rule out depression in the patient um, before proceeding down this very scripted um, path in the bill. I'm not sure that every physician that treats someone at the end of life is going to be completely qualified to make a psychological analysis of the patients before them with, with no disrespect to you or any of your colleagues, but those who have chosen a different specialty are not those who are practicing primarily in behavioral health. Can you talk or speak to that at all as to how we might be putting physicians in a, a dangerous predicament by asking them to rule on the psychological state of their patients before proceeding down this path? I think you, you point to another very troubling and difficult aspect of the bill because um, any physician of any specialty and any training can participate this, in this process, whether or not they have any training or, or, or practice in mental health. Uh, as I pointed out in my testimony, we, we know that patients with terminal illnesses, with advanced illnesses, cancer, heart disease, neurologic disease, they're prone to depression. They're prone to hopelessness and despair, particularly when they're first given their diagnosis. And yet the referral to mental health specialists in Oregon is getting pretty close to zero. Um, you can't really square those two numbers. I mean, what the bill, the bill does not require a referral to a mental health professional. It only suggests that a mental health professional should be uh, consulted if there is suspicion of depression. Um, so the fact that this is not happening in states where the mental health evaluation is optional uh, suggests that it's just being ignored. Thank you. And, and I know we struggle, or at least I struggle in my community with the mental health needs of, of my constituents as well, which is, it troubles me that in the same committee, we're talking about preventing suicide amongst many of our constituents that were discussing this. You talked a little bit about the medication and I, I hesitate even asking this question. So I, I, I don't mean to be, um, to speak inappropriately, but we have the conversation in, in other committees about the inability of the correction system to find appropriate medications to end the life of um, those who have been sentenced to pass. So I, can you help me understand if there are no medications available to one branch or one segment of the Connecticut population uh, professionals, what could magically be available to physicians who then want to do essentially the same thing? Well, the, you know, the issue of drugs availability for, for, for death by lethal injection, um, I, I'm not too familiar with that issue, but my understanding is many companies just don't want to be involved with that. So they pull their drugs out of the market to not allow it to be used. The drugs that are currently being used in Oregon are combinations of generic drugs, diazepam, which is Valium, um, uh, digoxin, which is a very common cardiac drug, well known to be toxic at high doses. It's been around for 200 years. Uh, morphine, which is a common over-the-counter drug, and then either propranolol, which is a common beta blocker antihypertensive, or amitriptyline, which is a common antidepressant. Um, so those are the drugs that are currently used. I don't think that there's, you know, they're generically available. So I don't think that, and I think that that's why the, the movement has turned to these drugs, because they are generic, less expensive, and very commonly available, and not subject to the shortages and restrictions that barbiturates have been. Thank you. And I just, one last question and I'll, I'll move it along, Mr. Chairman. I, we had a little bit of a conversation earlier about um, misstating or perhaps um, glossing over the real cause of the, the most immediate cause of death on the death certificate. Do you see implications going forward with public health data and statistics and making um, intelligent and 
and fact-based decisions for our public health of, of our constituencies based on, on death and morbidity and um, disease statistics if we are changing the immediate cause of death on death certificates. Do you, do you see that in, in years future if this bill were to apply? Well, I think it, you know, it's troubling to me because I don't understand why you would ask uh, doctors to lie on a death certificate. I mean, that's, that's a moral injury to ask somebody to do something that they know that they shouldn't do. Um, and, it, and it does, it makes it impossible for researchers say to go back five years later and look at all the death certificates that listed X, Y, and Z as the cause of death. Um, I, I would add that you know, in Oregon, in addition, they shield all records from any ability to subpoena or discover them. So anybody who wants to you know, try to launch an investigation years in advance, it's impossible to do so. Um, so I think we, know, we don't know very much about what actually happens in large part because the, 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 the wording of the law protects uh, a lot of investigation from happening. Thank you. And, and, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's just a point I think is important as we move forward. I, I fear that we will lose sight and be unable to track the actual public health concern, concerns of our public if we are having um, alternative causes of death, and I'll use the word alternative to be respectful, put on the death certificates. We won't know if there is an uptick in cardiac issues, ca cancer, fill in the blank, serious concerns, and we're gonna miss them if something, as you and I'll use your words, if we're forcing our doctors to lie on death certificates. Thank you, sir, for your time and your expertise. Thank you for your indulgence, Mr. Chairman. There's that mute button. Thank you, Representative. Representative McCarty followed by Representative Cavaros de Gras. Yes, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and welcome, Doctor, and thank you for your testimony. Um, you did a lot of research, and um, in your testimony, you mentioned that in some of the other states with assisted suicide, that uh, in a good percentage of the patients that the uh, self-administration of the drug may take longer. In some instances, a couple of days later, the patient is still uh, suffering from ingestion of the medication. And if you go on further to your research, you say that most countries have abandoned this procedure for uh, intravenous uh, use of medication. And I'm wondering just from your professional opinion, do you think that that opens up another door? Now we're talking about self-administration, but if the other countries now are really involving the physicians uh, in the assisted suicide. So if you could just comment for uh, on those two pieces, thank you. Certainly. So, um, you know, good point. A, a lot has been discussed already about slippery slope, and I recognize that the bill does say self-administration, but you have to look at what's happened in every other country that's introduced assisted suicide. They go almost very quickly to intravenous injection and in euthanasia. And they do that because, first of all, you're, if, you, if you allow this process to only take place with ingesting pills, you're effectively discriminating against people who are not capable of swallowing six ounces of liquid or hundreds of pills. Uh, and so, you know, they're discriminated against and excluded uh, from the bill. Uh, the other pr problem is that other countries have found more problems with ingestion of pills to, to, uh, to, to execute this process. Uh, and so that's another reason why they've turned uh, more quickly to lethal injection, uh, which is faster and, and more reliable in the practitioners that use this. So it's, you know, again, we haven't gone down that slippery slope yet in the United States, but it's very hard to see how we will not, once this expands to a critical number of states. And, and if that uh, scenario were to be enacted, then it would involve, uh, it no longer would be self-administration, then it would involve the physician, correct? Well, unless, yes. uh, you know, I mean, you could argue if a physician puts in an IV line and hangs a bag and the patient releases the the drug into the patient's veins, is that self-administration? You know, some people might say that it is self-administration. I mean, that's what Jack Kevorkian did 30 years ago. That's what, his, that's what his machine did. He would hook up an IV and the patient would activate it. So it was self-administered. Okay, thank you, doctor. Thank you, representative. Representative Cavros de Gras. 
Um, I just wanted to go back to the piece about the um, medical organizations and their position on it and your position on it, you know, personally versus that of being a physician. So I, is there, I, I was under the impression that in 2019, there's a little bit more nuance to the position um, from the American Medical Association in terms of how they feel about it, that, they, that it's more about conscience versus the Hippocratic Oath and professional obligations. Can you speak to that a little bit? The, uh, so the, the American Medical Association went through a big debate on this. They recognized that it was being legalized in more states. They had a statement from 30 years ago around the time that Jack Kevorkian was on the scene. And a lot of the laws that we have, by the way, against assisted suicide and the statements that the AMA made in 1993 were reactions to the, to the actions of Jack Kevorkian. Uh, but in any event, that statement states that uh, physician-assisted suicide is uh, contrary to the physician's role as healer, um, would be difficult or impossible to control, and would ra raise serious societal risks. That was the statement that the AMA made in 1993. This was re-examined by the Council on Ethical and Judicial Affairs. They debated it, heard testimony from all sides of the, of the equation over a two-year period, and came to a determination that no change in the AMA's code of ethics was warranted. That was then debated at three different AMA House of Delegates meetings, and it was finally overwhelmingly approved that they would keep the same statement. So no, there's been no change in the AMA's position. They do point to a statement on physician conscience that allows physicians to practice according to their conscience in accordance with the laws of where they practice. So that was, I think, kind of um, um, something that the, that the um, that the proponents of assisted suicide could point to in the AMA code um, that um, you know allows them to practice according to the law in their state. So I think it was it was it was it was not really the, the nuance was pointing to the different elements of the code uh, rather than any change in the code. Okay, so I but there are there are medical associations that have withdrawn their opposition to medical aid in dying to be neutral, correct? That's correct. Okay. I don't know how many it is, but some states have gone to a neutral position, which I'm troubled that some may misinterpret as tacit support. So if a society is neutral, they should be, they have no position. It's not tacit support. And I think too much is made of moving to a neutral position as a silent support. So and just, do you have, do you work with physicians who do support this, even though they have also taken the same oath that, that you have? I'm sure I do. Um, I, I can't say that I've talked at length with somebody who strongly supports it. Most of the people that I know oppose it. Um, but I, I, I know that there is um, varied opinions in the medical community. My own experience is that you, many, phys many physicians are not well informed about what is actually happening in states that have. They're not aware of all the problems that I've pointed out and all of the, the risks uh, that assisted suicide poses. My own experience is that the more you talk to people about it and you point out all of these problems, um, the less that they're for it. Okay. Uh, I thank you so much. I do object to assisted, the, the term assisted suicide, but thank you so much for your testimony today. I appreciate it. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, I haven't referred to Madam Chair in a while. Uh, <laughs> before you go, doctor, uh, if you if you do this the benefit you you just interpreted uh what you described was the ruling the uh recommended approved decision uh by the ama last year that runs somewhat different to what submitted testimony we received was their uh their new position which says uh that these physicians can't provide medical aid in dying according to the dictates of their conscience without violating their professional obligations. So what we now have is some confusion in the record and I'd really appreciate it if you could submit to us or direct us at the very least uh, to the uh, references you mentioned so that we're clear on exactly what the AMA's position is. I'd be happy to do that. And, and one last comment, you know, I, I think you make a very interesting point about the, uh, how the Hippocratic Oath and its interpretation and use has evolved over the years as medicine has evolved. And I guess what I, I, I leave you with is that if somebody uh, is suffering terribly and uh, medicine cannot offer them not even a cure, but uh, a, a tolerable uh, continued uh, life, isn't that doing harm when there is an option where somebody could, uh, could end life on their own terms? 
which is the greater harm in this case? I am getting philosophical here, allowing somebody to suffer indefinitely or uh, assisting them to fulfill their own uh, personal wishes? You raise a very difficult question. I don't have all the answers to the problems of suffering and life and death. I just know what my role as a physician is, and that's to always stand with a patient, to be with a patient and not give up on them. Well, thank you, doctor, for your, your, your very sincere and, and uh, well-informed point of view. We really do appreciate it. Uh, I don't see any further questions, so we're going to move on. And all I gotta do is find who's next in the list. I believe it is Sean Crowley followed by John Pike. Public Health Committee co-chairs Abrams and Steinberg and other committee members, thank you for allowing me to testify today. <clears throat> My name is Sean Crowley. I'm the Senior National Media Relations Director for Compassion Choices in Washington, DC. I grew up as a Catholic in Connecticut and my mom and one of my sisters still live there. We often say that you're only one bad death from becoming a convert on this issue. I watched two excruciatingly painful deaths. My dad from repeated uncontrollable seizures caused by Parkinson's disease and my grandmother from pancreatic cancer. I will devote the balance of my time to providing facts. A 2014 Purple Insights poll in Connecticut showed 66% of state voters overall 65% of voters with disabilities, 61% of Catholic voters, and 59% uh, of Republican voters support medical aid in dying. Now, if you compare the suicide ranking of states between 20, 2005 and 2017, nearly every state that passed medical aid in dying laws dropped in the rankings after they passed them. The Oregon data about the reasons people want the option of medical aid in dying is contradicted by national studies showing that despite the wide availability of hospice, palliative care, and pain management, between 65% and 85% of patients with cancer, by far the most common disease among people who request medical aid dying, experience significant pain. The Journal of Medical Ethics has concluded rates of assisted dying in Oregon showed no evidence of heightened risk for the elderly, women, the uninsured, low educational status, the poor, the physically disabled, or chronically ill, minors, people with psychiatric illnesses, including depression, or racial or ethnic minorities compared with background populations. Doctors are much more likely to overestimate, not underestimate, how long a patient will live because they're reluctant to shatter hope for a last minute miracle cure. A British medical journal study found that doctors tend to overestimate how long patients will live by 500%. The Connecticut State Medical Society adopted a policy in 2019 of engaged neutrality that acknowledges the principle and ethical physicians hold a broad range of positions and opinions on this issue. We are committed to protecting our members' freedom to decide what medical aid and dying options to provide to patients. As the Oregon data shows, people who obtain medical aid and dying almost always wait weeks or months after they get the medication before they take it, if they take it. Brittany Menard, famously kept her medication in her purse for six months after she, before she took it. The Los Angeles Times and the Hawaii Tribune Herald have reported that medical aid and dying laws in those states have improved care for many terminally ill by spurring doctor-patient conversations about all end-of-life care options, like hospice and palliative care, and better utilization of them. Stephanie Packer admitted in an interview with NewJersey.com that her insurance company refused to cover her experimental unproven chemo medication five times prior to the passage of the California End of Life Option Act, and once afterwards. Finally, why would anyone risk coercing someone into using medical aid and dying who's going to die soon either way at the risk of criminal prosecution and imprisonment? Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Um, you, you've heard mention of uh, concern that there is no witness when it comes to uh, the final act, if you will, the act of self-administration. Um, obviously, we're making some assumptions about whether or not they're with family members or other people who care for them. Uh, how, how do you address the question that uh, the unobserved could be uh, at least the prospect for uh, untoward activity that we, we need to know about? Well, 
the reality is that you know over 90 percent of the people utilize medical aid and dying are in home hospice care and often the hospice worker is present and almost nobody does this alone i don't even i've never even heard of a case of someone doing it alone they usually have loved ones there people again who really have no incentive to risk criminal prosecution and imprisonment by causing the death of someone who's going to die in the very near future it just doesn't make sense Thank you for that. It's still something that uh, I'm thinking about. Are there any other questions? If not, thank you for your Can I just add one thing, Representative Steinberg, which is a lot of people want privacy. Some people do have their physician present if they want, but a lot of people really feel it's the most personal private time in their lives. And so, and they, and they get explicit instructions how to take the medication. They have to take an anti-nausea medication an hour before they take the aid and dying medication. It's really, it's not something that happens quickly or impulsively. These people talk and think about this for weeks, if not months, before they actually make their first request. Thank you for that. That, that you know, it, it, sort of piercing the veil of you will understand what really happens is a challenge. But I, I take your point that privacy uh, is, is particularly important at this stage, at this uh, event. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, seeing no other hands, thank you. Uh, we have John Pike who is good. up next, number 24, followed by 25, James McGaughy. Yeah, good afternoon, Representative Steinberg and members of the committee. My name is John Pike. I'm, I live in Middletown. I'm a licensed uh, physician assistant practicing in the state for the last 37 years, and I'm also Connecticut State Director for the American Academy of Medical Ethics. I'm testifying in opposition. Um, at the outset, I would say that, um, you know, in the midst of this pandemic, which has taken 7,500 deaths in Connecticut. I'm, I'm disappointed and offended that the legislature would take this up at this time and particularly not allow people to testify in person. Having said that, I very much uh, agree with the physician who spoke before me. And I do want to make a, a couple of points which have been made, but underscore them again. Um, year after year, we've had healthcare professionals who have a responsibility to sign death certificates who have testified that this would make them lie and commit fraud. And as you know, a few years ago, the, the justice, the, the Connecticut justice uh, spoke about um, and had concerns about, uh, about, about that as well. The other thing that has changed uh, in this bill, and it's very alarming to, uh, to me, is that previous bills that would not allow witnesses for the patient's application to be family members or people entitled to any portion of the estate or be part of a healthcare facility that might benefit from their death, that's gone. This is gone. And this really further opens the, the risk of a patient being coerced by parties with hidden motives. Again, much has been said, and I don't want to be overly redundant. Uh, some have talked about other countries, and while we can't totally compare ourselves with other countries, our country to the north, Canada, who's had the, the bill only for five years, and in five years they have widened, we're talking about slippery slope and mission creep, in five years they've widened that scope, and in five years 19,000 deaths have happened in Canada from physician-assisted suicide. So again, um, you know, I I'm again feel that, you know, we should provide adequate relief and they're dying. We've, we've said that before, but we should provide it instead of leading them to it. And um, so I'll, I'll stop there, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, because uh, again, you have my testimony and I don't wanna be super redundant. Thank you. Well, thank you for your testimony today and, and for pointing out that you submitted a written testimony. We appreciate that. And we appreciate anybody who doesn't need, feel the need to not only use this entire three minutes, but goes well over. So uh, thank you. I don't see any questions at this time, but we will take a look at your testimony. Thank you for staying Thank with you, us sir. today. Um, next up is James McGaughy, followed by number 27, Amanda Carrington. Uh, yes, good afternoon, Senator Abrams, Representative Steinberg and members of the committee. My name is Jim McGahey, and um, I also have submitted written testimony and actually Many of the points I made in that written testimony have already been addressed by other, uh, other witnesses that appeared before you. So uh, rather than redundantly rehash what you've already heard, uh, I just wanna make a few points. Um, my concerns about this bill um, 
grow out of my experience as an advocate for the civil rights of people with disabilities. Uh, for 20 years, I served as the executive director of the Connecticut office, what was then the Connecticut Office of Protection and Advocacy for Persons with Disabilities. And in that role, I got to know a number of people with significant disabilities uh, and uh, represented some of them in the context of healthcare um, environments where there were questions about whether they were, they were being afforded uh, appropriate medical care. Some of the individuals we represented relied on life-sustaining technologies to breathe and to eat. And some had also experienced progressive functional losses over a period of time. Um, and I wanna just say that however bright the line seems between the term terminal illness and disability when you are drafting legislation, that out there in the real world, that distinction can easily become blurred where perceptions of suffering and frustrations over incurability um, and assumptions that are made about the quality of the life of a person who lives with a long-term significant disability sometimes enter into the decisions or the thinking of practitioners who are, um, who are faced with a decision as to whether or not somebody should be, should be uh, determined to be terminally ill. And I'm in, I'm in mind of a case that uh, came, came about 10 years ago to my attention in my office of uh, a young woman who I, I wanna say she would, not qualify, she would not be considered a qualified patient under this proposal because she did not have, uh, she, she was a client of the Department of Developmental Services and she had a guardian, so she would not meet the test for competency that's present in this legislation. But she was somebody who had a significant disability and she was hospitalized um, because she'd had re uh, several recurrent aspiration pneumonias. And the question was whether she should have um, uh, a feeding tube inserted. And the doctors recommended that, the guardian didn't want it. The doctor said, okay, but we can't continue to feed her by mouth because she'll have more aspiration pneumonias and that will kill her. So therefore, um, let's not give, let's not feed her at all. Um, and um, by the way, uh, we should probably put a do not resuscitate order on her chart at the same time. Uh, the guard yeah, excuse me, you hit your three minute mark if you wouldn't mind concluding your remarks. Okay. The, the bottom line was that after we became involved in this situation, there, there had been two doctors who had signed papers for the Department of Developmental Services saying that this person was terminally ill. After we became involved, she did have the surgery. Sub subsequently, it was uh, she's she's living back in her group home now. Ten years later, she's happy. Um, and so this is the, it's it's not as much of a safeguard as you might think to uh, to have two doctors agree that somebody's terminally ill, uh, particularly when that person has a significant disability. The only other uh, point I would make is that uh, I'm sorry, sir. There's not time for one more point. Very good. Because you've gone well over your three minutes. But you have somebody who'd like to ask you a question. Maybe you can find a way to answer in that context. Representative Betts. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for your testimony. <clears throat> I'm kind of curious in the example that you cited, how the doctors were able to come up with a decision that she be term that she was terminally ill as opposed to a condition maybe uh may not be improved uh, or get better, but I, how do they reach that kind of a decision? And if they do that under this legislation, I wonder, I wonder how it would impact that individual. Well, I'm not sure what the rationale was other than that um, the, the Department of Developmental Services has a procedure that is actually required in statute before a do not resuscitate order is entered on the chart of somebody who is a client of that department, there has to be a review and the review requires that two physicians um, or now it's a physician or now they're, uh, they allow APRNs to do it as well, um, certify that the person is terminally ill and close to the end of their life. Um, I believe that the prediction was that if we don't feed her or give her any you know, hydration or nutrition, 
she will die soon. Um, and but I, I think that in the you know what was influencing their their perception was the fact that this was somebody who had a very significant disability, physical disability as well as cognitive disability. And so those, um, I, I think there were things that were unconsciously influencing the way they perceived her as an individual who was suffering. And that that, that um, made it easier for them to write those, write those opinions. But objectively in terms of the medical evidence, you're quite right. I don't think there was any, um, you know, it was just sort of like a self-fulfilling prophecy, if you will. Um, if we deny her treatment and we, and we, uh, um, you know, deny her hydration and nutrition, she will die. Uh, and that's, you know, that's, it's experiences like this, by the way, that lead people from the disability community to be very suspicious of how, how effective the safeguards are that are written into a statute. So. Okay, thank you for that. And uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Although I have one question for the chairman, if you would. I'm unclear and I just wanna make sure if I understand this correctly. Is an APRN considered to be one of the two physicians that could sign off on somebody's uh, health condition? or uh, desire to move forward with uh, ending their life? Uh, I'm gonna have to look again, but I'm pretty sure it has to be two physicians. I don't think APRNs are mentioned in our bill. Okay, That's thank correct. you. Uh, Representative Carpino. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. James, I just wanna say thank you for, for all of your work uh, for many years uh, advocating for those um, with disabilities. And I want you to know that I, I believe that those in the disability community that have concerns um, are justified in their concerns. And we've anecdotally heard uh, over the last few years about what if, what if, what if. And I think that the example you just gave can't be any more on point to some of the fears, at least I have personally, about my friends and family um, in the disability community that could inadvertently fall prey to what we routinely talk about in the General Assembly's unconscious bias. So I just wanted to say thank you for your work and thank you for bringing that very relevant point to all of us today. Thank you, Representative. Thank you, sir, for your testimony. We really appreciate it. Uh, next up is Amanda Carrington, followed by number 28, Paul Bluestein. Amanda. Hi, can everyone hear me? We certainly can. Okay, so hi, I'm Senator Abrams, Representative Steinberg and members of the Public Health Committee. My name is Amanda Carrington and I am providing testimony in support of House Bill 6425, an act concerning aid in dying for terminally ill patients. Um, my testimony does reiterate many comments already made, so I'll be very brief um, to save time. And I've also submitted written testimony, so you can read it in full there. Um, Connecticut residents deserve end of life options that reflect their values, priorities, and beliefs. As a social work student, I am bound to our professional code of ethics. This code calls for us to respect the dignity and self-worth of a person while promoting their right to self-determination. I believe that House Bill 6425 supports this right by providing autonomy around end of life decisions. More importantly, House Bill 6425 is personal to me. I have neurofibromatosis, a genetic condition that causes uncontrollable tumor growth throughout my body. NF causes me daily excruciating pain that is resistant to most medical interventions. As a progressive disorder, this pain is guaranteed to worsen with age. NF growth can also lead to the development of cancer and painful bone deformities. Should this be my future, I would want my life to end with as much comfort, dignity, and autonomy as possible. I believe that House Bill 6425 helps provide this option. As a pro-choice individual, my values extend to the end of life decisions as well. And as a result, I urge the Public Health Committee to vote in favor of this bill. Thank you for hearing me and I'm open to any questions that you may have. Well, thank you for your testimony. Uh, uh, I, I can't possibly imagine uh, what you must have to go through on a daily basis with this, this rare disease, but I'm even more impressed by your ability to not only uh, struggle through it, but uh, take on a career of helping others. Uh, so thank you for the work that you do on, on that score. Uh, and I can certainly understand how uh, this is very personal for you. And 
you know, here you are living living with something that you know uh, will take your life at some point, and I'm. Um, I, I can only imagine what the challenges are. So thank you for taking the time to testify today and for the work you do helping others. I don't see any questions, so thank you. Next thank up you. is Paul Bluestein, followed by Margaret Dore. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, my name is Paul Bluestein and I'm speaking in support of the medical aid and dying bill. I'm a retired physician and I'm 73 years old. So for me, this discussion becomes less academic with every year that passes. I've listened since nine this morning to very eloquent advocacy for medical aid and dying and some less eloquent discussion about the practice of medicine. I've heard it compared to serving fries and shakes at Burger King. Well, I've worked at McDonald's and I've practiced medicine and I can tell you they're nothing alike. I heard a state representative suggest that if someone wanted to die, they could just stop eating. I've listened to testimony about a patient in California who was denied experimental treatment for advanced cancer, but was offered coverage for medical aid in dying. I know something about this because I was the chief medical officer of a health plan for nearly 20 years. All insurers deny coverage for experimental treatments, which have not been proven effective, and all insurers are obligated to provide information and coverage for legal approved treatments. The only thing that I can add from a personal perspective is, if I were still practicing and this law had been passed, I would with a clear conscience rate the prescriptions necessary to help my patient die with dignity and not feel that I had violated any oath I took. When the time for healing and treatment has passed, the time for empathy and compassion needs to begin, and those discussions should rest with the doctor, the patient, and the family, but certainly not with the government. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, as a member of government, I'm not offended by that statement. Um, I would just ask that you've heard testimony that if physicians were to participate in helping patients and life on their own terms, that this would undermine faith in the medical community and physicians particularly. And uh, certainly, you know, in these times where belief in science and authorities are already challenged, uh, that's not something we would want to encourage. What would be your response? I would hope that my patients who would know me and I would know them and their families would have some measure of confidence that I had their best interests at heart and was not bound by antiquated, restrictive laws that provided lack of choice for patients at the time when they need it most. Thank you for that response, doctor. Uh, I don't see any other questions. Thank you for your time today and for your point of view. Next up is Margaret Dor or Dory, followed by Barbara Wilkov. Yeah. I see you're available, Margaret. Please go ahead. Hi, my name is Margaret Dorr, and this is my first time on uh, Zoom, so I'm a little awkward here. So I'm a lawyer in Washington, from Washington State. I'm licensed in Washington State, where assisted suicide and euthanasia are legal. These laws allow both practices. The law, the act before you is titled Aid in Dying. Aid in Dying is uh, a traditional euphemism for euthanasia, and I've got that in my materials. I submitted a formal memorandum as well as supporting documentation. So this does allow euthanasia 
This can also happen on a non-voluntary basis. What the easiest thing to see is that someone signs up for the lethal dose on a voluntary basis, just in case. The people I've talked to, I've never talked to someone who was sure they were going to use it. Uh, they sign up just in case things get bad. But after that, someone can do it to do it to them against their will. But the easiest thing to see is that there's a complete lack of oversight at the death. Uh, say the son. It's usually I've done a lot of I've done a lot of elder abuse. I've seen what could happen, and so sometimes, especially a son will want to want to inherit from his father and speed it up. And one way to do it would be if the dad started getting better and he's not going to take the lethal dose, is to say, well, let's have a drink to that and spike the drink. But anyway, I'm I'm sorry, I'm not as prepared as I would like to be. Uh, but. Anyway, and then the death certificate will be a natural death as a matter of law. And that's explained in my uh, submission. And therefore, even if you find out later, I mean, you can't do anything about it. It's murder, as a, it's, it's, it allows, it's a natural death as a matter of law. So even if someone was taken advantage of, the death certificate will say a natural death and you can't prosecute. So it creates somewhat, middle, the middle class and above are made uh, potential victims of their relatives and other predators, financial predators. So those, anyway, I'd like you to, do you have any questions? I'm sorry, I'm not smoother on this. Well, thank you for your testimony today. I don't see any questions. So again, thank you. Uh, moving along, we have Barbara Wilkoff followed by Angela Dunham. You thought I did great? I stumbled. You thought so? Okay, hi, uh, can everyone hear me okay? Yes, we can. Okay, um, members of the committee, my name is Barbara Wilkov and I'm testi testifying in memory and honor of my mother in support of HB 6425, an act concerning aid in dying for terminally ill patients. I have submitted my full written testimony before the committee and I would now like to share a bit of it with you. So my mother, Minnie Stein Wilkov died on July 2nd, 2019. She was a longtime supporter of Compassion and Choices and deeply desired the passage of medical aid and dying legislation in this, our home state of Connecticut. This desire became personal when my mom was diagnosed with ovarian cancer in 2017. She wanted to be a voice for this cause and even dictated a letter to me before she died in hopes that it could be read by many, specifically Connecticut lawmakers. This letter was her final wish, and so I'd like to read it to you now. She said, I am a political junkie, and this will be my last political letter since I'm in the process of dying a natural death from ovarian cancer at the age of 97. Despite all the painkillers and anti-nausea medicines, and even though I'm surrounded by all the love and care I could wish for, I am leaving this world in a torturous and miserable way that I would not wish on any caring human being. Please pass the death with dignity legislation here in Connecticut promoted by compassion and choices to deny people this choice is inhumane. I am dictating this because I am weak and cannot write the letter myself. I feel very strongly that I should have had the opportunity to choose when to say my final goodbyes. My suffering has caused undue and unnecessary suffering for my family. I wish I could have sp <clears throat> spared them the emotional pain associated with my terminal illness. Signed, Minnie Stein Wilkov, Stamford, Connecticut. Please take my mom's words and her final wish into consideration in passing this important bill. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, I appreciate the point that your mother made and via her letter that she had uh, all the options the medicine could offer and her loved ones present. And she still uh, preferred to, uh, would have preferred to end life on her own terms. So to my mind, this is the perfect example of who we're talking about, uh, not talking about people who are being starved to death or through any other purposes. Uh, I don't see any questions for you. So thank you for testifying today. Okay, thank you. Uh, I understand we're now up to number 32, Rebecca Gagne Henderson, followed by Peter Wolfgang. Hello, uh, my name is Rebecca Gagne Henderson. I'm an advanced practice nurse with 26 years of experience as a palliative and end of life clinician. I've been the director of two hospices and I've started two inpatient palliative care programs. 
I, antes I anticipate the awarding of my PhD in palliative care in May from the Observatory of End of Life Studies in Lancaster University in the UK. I have faculty appointments with the Yale School of Medicine program for bioethics and faculty of its end of life program. And I have taught prognostication to fellows at palliative care at Yale. I have also taught bioethics at the graduate level. And I'm here to ask you to vote no on House Bill 6425. And I'm also here to advocate for allowing natural deaths. Through my work with the dying, I know what dying well looks like, and I know what it looks like to die poorly. I was going to share a powerful story of how good palliative care allowed a person who was very young and very angry to come to peace and reconciliation and comfort before they died. This is healing. Healing is not always a cure. Rather, I have chosen to discuss dying as a natural stage of our lives. With all due respect, I disagree that we are all dying. Dying has its own signs, symptoms, and physiology. Allowing a natural death allows this process to occur. There are only two events that any one of us can say with certainty that we share, and those are birth and death. It is important to remember that dying is as natural as being born. Our bodies are prepared for this. Our bodies produce a hormone called oxytocin, and it is released during certain events in our lives, and there is a euphoria associated with this release. What I'm sharing with you now is not even taught in medical school. During birth and during breastfeeding, oxytocin is released, which makes the baby bond with her mother. Oxytocin is released after intimacy and it helps couples to bond. We also release oxytocin during a natural death. You may have heard of people having near death experiences and feeling an overwhelming sense of love. This is attributed to the release of oxytocin during the dying process. I've written a chapter for a book specifically about this physiology. During assisted suicide, the patient is quickly, hopefully rendered unconscious as they receive a lethal dose of medication which hinders these natural biological mechanisms as they are part of a process that requires time to unfold. Palliative sedation does allow this process to unfold and is compassionate and legally, ethically, and morally acceptable. When we have rapid respirations at the end of life, we build up CO2. At the time our blood pressure lowers. Okay, please, you know, I've heard you interrupt all the pro people. Between these two events, we release endorphins and we which cause respiratory arrest. When we die, we lose the reflexes of cough, swallowing, and gag, which causes, which allows the death rattle. And it does not bother the patient, it bothers the living. These are all. These are all natural events and we abhor them because it's not conducive with life. We do not die well in this country. And we believe we can predict every aspect of our lives and the lives of others. I will say that I feel that this is a, we have death anxiety and that's an actual condition that is in the literature. And I want, I want you to, to consider that the people who ask for this are wealthy, white, privileged people, and for the most part. And that we need to be concentrating on making access to basic health and how Have you been asked to conclude your remarks? People. You're probably now at about four minutes, if you wouldn't mind concluding. There is a question for you here. But if you can okay. your remarks, as everybody else has done. Well, I just want one more minutes. thing. I just wanted to say is that we, you need to take into you know uh, you were the one that said that we need to just pay attention to this bill as it is written. But that is the problem with government is that they do I'm not. I'm sorry, ma'am. Uh, we're going to ask Representative Belfonte to ask you a question now because uh, you've gone okay. well over the three minutes we've allotted to every individual, and virtually everybody else has tried to accommodate that so others may speak. Representative Dauphiné. 
Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. And I just um, thank you for your testimony and your comments. My question is specific to the palliative um, sedation. Can you just speak to that? And it sounds like you think that's a better option and maybe expand on that a little bit. I will. And, and I will I will expand on that by saying that in 26 years, I've only had to use palliative sedation five times. I have never seen a patient die in pain. And when they have needed palliative sedation, it was for existential angst. What happens when you give someone palliative sedation is that they become dehydrated, which is part of the mechanism that allows those endorphins to be released. Without those, when we just, when we just basically give someone a lethal dose of, of poison, those mechanisms are blocked and, um, and, and those, that mechanism is, is, is not, not experienced. Um, I think the, the real cure isn't palliative sedation, it's more, and it's, it, it's more, or assisted suicide, it's more palliative care and our culture needing to understand that you cannot control everything. To think that you can control everything is, is just coming from a place of poise, uh, of privilege and denial of death. Thank you for those answers. So would you say, you, you spoke about only five cases of needing to use that method and you said that you haven't seen anybody die I think what you said is in pain. So have you been able to control that with the palliative care? That Absolutely. You if you're doing it properly, yes. And I will talk to, I know someone mentioned pancreatic cancer. I have had probably minimum of 100 people with pancreatic cancer and their pain was controlled. It's, it's about teaching good pain management rather than dispatching people as if they are wounded animals. Thank you. And just one last question. Have you found that that, that palliative care has also um, put them at ease with their anxiety with the, you know, the pending um, ending of their life? And you have to remember that palliative care and hospice is not just medicine. It's a team of people. The young lady that I talked about was 23 years old. She was a gang member. She had um, cervical cancer that was metastatic. And we were able to get the clergy in. We were able to involve her entire estranged family. And she died at peace. And her last thing that she said to the nurse was she was able to die because she had facilitated that reconciliation. Healing occurs with palliative care. It's, it's, it, it's just, it's a shame that we think that our only option is to have people kill themselves. Thank you for your answers and uh, your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I apologize for my passion. <laughs> you never have to apologize for your passion. Going five minutes into your passion, maybe, but uh, we do appreciate the fact you wanted to get it all into the record. Uh, thank you. I see no further questions. We have Peter Wolfgang followed by number 34, Carolyn G Gabble Brett. Members of the Public Health Committee, good afternoon. My name is Peter Wolfgang. I am Executive Director of the Family Institute of Connecticut, and I am here to speak against House Bill 6425. Three points. It is an assisted suicide bill. Uh, this bill would legalize, it, it would make it legal for doctors to prescribe lethal drugs, suicide as a treatment and grant legal immunity to the people that help you kill yourself. And for that reason, we do oppose the bill. Second point, the slippery slope is real. Those who scoff at the slippery slope oftentimes are the ones uh, greasing the slope. You know, you keep approaching this bill. This bill has come up almost every year since 2013. And the striking thing is that this committee keeps approaching the assisted suicide bill as if it's still 2013. Well, this is just for people with six months or less to live who are of sound mind, but there have been scores of bills in the last uh, eight years or so to expand it. I made that point to you two years ago. And the response I got was, well, those are just proposals. Those haven't been enacted. 
That is no longer the case. We now have Oregon 579, which in 2019, this was enacted. It waived the 15 day waiting period to permit same day death. This was something that was actually enacted. Um, there was another one in 2020, Washington HB 2419. This bill to expand the Death with Dignity Act included expansion to euthanasia, elimination of waiting periods, and eliminating protections for objecting providers. Eliminating protections for objecting providers. This bill was only vetoed by the governor due to fiscal restraints of COVID-19 pandemic. That's how close we came to that radical bill passing in Washington. So you can say all you want that there's no slippery slope, no foot in the door, but as uh, Holly Cheeseman said, these things do not happen in a vacuum. Finally, your own bill is itself a slippery slope. This came up uh, briefly in passing with the attorney from the Elder Law Division, but your bill has actually been changed to make it worse. It reduces the required number of, of written requests for assisted suicide from two to one. It allows, this is how it's different from your, your own previous bills here in Connecticut. It allows family members, caregivers, and the individual's physician to act as a witness. In other words, it allows both witnesses to lethal prescription to be family members, heirs, or employees of the healthcare facility where the patient resides. And uh, you know, it allows consulting physician to work in the same facility or practice as the attending physician. So these are ways in which your own bill is actually a slippery slope when compared to previous bills. And I would just come back to the, the exchange earlier with the attorney from Elder Law, their, uh, their position on the bill switched to conditional support because the bill had actually been changed for the worse. And there was a polite discussion about, well, thank you for giving us advice on how to strengthen the bill, but it still, it begs the question, what happened there? Why was, why was the bill made even worse? And so I think the, the slippery slope is a real thing, not just in the Netherlands and Canada, as horrible as that is, but here in the United States of America, and even here in Connecticut, and even in the Public Health Committee. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Seeing no questions, thank you for your testimony. Next up is Carolyn Gabo-Brett, followed by Sister Catherine Mary Clark. Hello, good afternoon, Senator Representative Steinberg and uh, all the members of the Public Health Committee. I am Carolyn Gabo-Brett, uh, and I do support HB 6425. Um, I wanted to say that as a personal kind of thing, since there's been a variety of testimony, that during this past year, we have had three people in our family die. Uh, well, not in our family, but, uh, you know, one uh, was uh, Irene who died in the hospital as a result of COVID. Um, then Rosemary died from uh, breast cancer in a hospice facility. And then Kate, who was a very close friend, also died at home from ALS. So I just wanted to mention that those three, aside from, of course, um, since I'm older, my parents have both died. And one, my mom, I was with my mom in palliative care. But this is a very narrow bill that you have drafted. And I just wanted to say that um, many people that have uh, testified have also testified as if they themselves were going to be uh, impacted by this bill. But in fact, this bill is so narrow that it only uh, affects those who choose it for compassionate reasons about their own death. And I do believe strongly in uh, having that choice for a peaceful death. But I, uh, as the people before me and after me uh, will probably say is in opposition, they do not have to choose this bill or to choose this uh, form of death. It's for terminally ill, it's for six months, it's been very carefully drafted and it's for, for a very small part of our population. So I just want to, uh, I know there's been a lot of testimony that other people have said throughout uh, the day and I have listened <laughs> as all of you have been very respectfully listening uh, since 9 a.m. this morning. I do wanna say that uh, I am very much in support of people having the right to choose. 
And that's been a motto, uh, a motto that I've had for a long time. So when government in, is, uh, gets into the separation of church and state, which I believe strongly in as well, um, I think it's uh, pretty hard to draft a narrow piece of legislation like you have done. So I do respect you, uh, Representative Steinberg. You've done uh, a great job in hosting this along with your uh, Senator co-chair, Senator Abrams. And I wanna thank you both for this opportunity to express my uh, support for what you've done with HB 6425. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony and let us extend condolences uh, to your losses in, in, in recent times. Uh, I believe the pandemic has probably brought most of us closer to the experience of someone we know dying than we would ever have uh, expected or certainly uh, uh, wished. Um, uh, thank you for the points you make and for uh, your acknowledging we're trying to make this bill as clear and narrow as possible. I think we've gotten some good input today that uh, may lead to some further uh, changes to make sure that we honor that, that, that intention. Um, and uh, we are indeed trying to make sure that this has uh, a very clear opportunity for a very small group of people. I don't see any questions for you. So thank you for taking the time to, to uh, share with us today. Uh, next up, I understand we are now at 36. Dr. Michael Gray followed by number 37, Luther Weeks. Hello, uh, this is Dr. Gray. Can you, can you all hear me? We can't see you, but we can certainly hear you. Oh, okay. I'm not That's sure okay. why. I'm not sure why you can't see me. Um, and I, let me see if I can start my video. There you go. How's that? Okay. I know the time is short. I am speaking um, uh, really uh, on behalf of Attorney Health of New England, um, and I'm also would like to comment at the end uh, as a physician in practice uh, for 35 years uh, as a primary care doctor, um, many years on the faculty at the University of Connecticut. I've been involved with medical education most of my career. I think the position that Trinity Health of New England takes would not be of surprise to anybody on the call. Um, we hold uh, reverence for life to be one of the um, cardinal uh, components of our mission uh, and it abuse everything that we, we hold sacred at Trinity Health so that a public policy that legalizes something uh, like suicide would really, of course, uh, be uh, anathema uh, to my organization um, and on sort of core principles, if you will. Uh, that being said, uh, I think as, a, as speaking both with my Trinity hat on and also as a doctor, I believe that there are uh, considerably other options that uh, can and should and must be used uh, to their fullest before we think about uh, essentially legalizing suicide in this country or in this state. Um, others have spoken gracefully all morning long about palliative care. Uh, and so I'm not going to spend a lot of time extolling its virtues. I think uh, even uh, the chairman mentioned, or someone earlier said that 95, 97% of people are going to have the relief and respite they need with palliative care without using this particular option. So by definition, we're talking about a very small fraction uh, of individuals who, uh, in the words of one of the earlier speakers, have um, existential pain. Uh, now, the, um, the truth is that in, in 35 years of practicing, I, as a primary care doctor, I've had many patients who have died, many patients with, uh, with uh, oncologic and other uh, severe and painful conditions. And, and I'm saying this quite honestly, I've never been able uh, in conjunction with my palliative colleagues not to be able to manage people's control at the end of life. Uh, and in the final stages of life. Uh, of course, you're gonna have uh, uh, anecdotes, individuals, uh, word of mouth, people who feel that they have examples or have experienced it themselves. I'm giving you more of a broader picture over a lifetime of practicing medicine to say that 
uh, that has not been an experience that I've ever seen in, in a well run, uh, intimately involved with the care team palliative program uh, is the answer to situations that uh, this bill is attempting to address. Um, and so, uh, and I say that uh, because I see the uh, letters that families- uh, and, uh, You hit your three minute mark if you want okay. to find some questions. I, 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 will, I guess I should stop in case there are, are questions. I'm gonna make one quick final comment. I know it was somewhat touched on, but it is very problematic, I think, for physicians in the terms of the documentation on death certificates. I know it was, it was kind of glossed over a little bit, but, but uh, these desert data is really important data to be collecting uh, societally. And if we are going to be uh, assisting people uh, legally to uh, commit suicide, I think that is something that should be considered and addressed because if you're not putting down what actually happened, you're sort of falsifying the record. Uh, and in any case, at the very least, it's putting doctors in an awkward spot, which I don't think should be necessary. And I'll, I'll stop there and answer any questions if people have them. Thank you, doctor. Uh, and I appreciate your candor, admitting that the organization you represent would, would logically be in opposition. And uh, uh, I appreciate your confidence, as I think many of us share in the uh, palliative and hospice care services that we're able to provide. Uh, Representative Pettit. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Dr. Gray, for your testimony. I wonder from your personal vantage point as someone who's been involved in the teaching of medical students, residents, and fellows for your entire career, give us your position on whether, regardless of your institutional uh, position, whether physicians should be involved with this, how the, what the interplay of the Hippocratic Oath, as you probably heard Dr. Breen from uh, Johns Hopkins and his point of view, I wonder what your thoughts on it, given, given that you've been involved with teaching right from day one of your career. Uh, that's a great uh, question. And um, even though Bill and I have known each other a long time, we didn't collude on this. <laughs> um, I've wondered about uh, giving an anecdote uh, to this group because it's one of the more painful experiences of my own career. So I will speak to it by, by talking about a situation that I uh, was involved with as an intern, um, let's see, 1985, so 35 years ago, 35, 36 years ago, where I had an older patient was uh, on a breathing machine in the hospital. Uh, she had advanced uh, end-stage lung disease and was old um, and was never going to really come off the respirator. And so the attending doctor who I was working under in the ICU uh, gave me instructions to rapidly taper her off the ventilator, uh, move her out of the ICU, put her in a regular room, uh, not transfer her back to the ICU under any circumstances, and to administer morphine every couple of minutes as needed if she appeared to be in respiratory distress, which, as you know, is, you know, pretty much a given. And uh, I did as I was told. And uh, over a period of a couple hours, of course, naturally, she uh, relaxed, uh, calmed down in terms of her breathing. It was sedated and ultimately uh, drifted off into uh, her, you know, CO2 narcosis and, and eventually her heart stopped and she died. I can tell you that even though I was, I was, following directions from my attending, that experience as an intern has never left me. Um, and I always felt that I had done something um, that was moral, morally uh, questionable in regards to the oath that I took when I graduated medical school. And, um, and so it's, it's really, it's very personal in that way. I don't tell that story very often. Um, and, uh, and I, and I, but I do tell it to my learners, particularly students and residents, uh, because it's important to stick up for what your own principles are. So I do think it does raise very problematic, um, obligations for, uh, for doctors. I've heard a lot of people today say that it doesn't require anybody to do anything. It doesn't require the patient to do anything. It doesn't require the family to do anything. Uh, physicians can opt out of it. I think that's being really overly simplistic. 
I, I, when you care for someone for five, 10, 15, 20 years, Bill, as you know, you did this and you come to a crisis in their life. If they ask you to do something that you are, you feel is not uh, right uh, after all those years and you decline to do it because you don't feel it's something you should be involved with, it's, it, it causes ripples in that relationship with that family and with that patient if you would actually decline it. I know that people think that, you know, everybody's adults and we're going to make those decisions that way. But I, I would not underestimate the potential negative impact on the doctor patient relationship. And, and I'll, I'll make a note as an aside, I reread the, the, the uh, legislation. I don't, it does say that there has to be an attending physician, but it doesn't spell out exactly the nature of that relationship. I know what I think the, the framers intended it to be, but in a world where telehealth and virtual medicine is exploding, can you honestly say that this, uh, this particular legislation would not leave open the door to someone who would quote be an attending, have a, a, a state of Connecticut license, be able to prescribe, for example, opiates, uh, and could uh, become, if you will, the attending of record for someone in a situation like that, I think it's, I'm, I'm kind of exaggerating a little bit to make a point, but I do think we are in different times. And I worry that, that, that there will be physicians who kind of specialize in this area. And if families and patients need this, they can find what they want. And I think it's a, it, it, even though people have said it's not a slippery slope, it's narrowly drawn. I'm telling you in the real world, it is a slippery slope. And uh, it, it is not nearly as unambiguous and clear as you think when you're talking about literally life and death situations or hastening life and death situations. It's very, it's very, very difficult. If, if I had my druthers, I would tell you to stay out of it and, and let me and my patients and our families figure it out like I've done for 35 years. Thank you. And I wondered if you had a comment on, we had a previous, uh witness who, uh, a proponent for the disability community, uh, giving an anecdote about a patient who required a, a uh, feeding tube. And that's certainly a very common dilemma we face, especially with elderly patients. But in my mind, there's a difference between the with, withholding of a therapy when someone's at the, at, potentially at the end of, end of life. I'm thinking about, you know, a, a very elderly patient now, and they're no longer able to have good quality of life versus actively giving someone a therapy. I wonder if you had any thoughts, if you, if you heard that testimony earlier about the feeding tube. I, I, I did, and the, the sort of the, the, the double intention argument, I may be mistaken, but to relieve pain and suffering and have, un, if you will, intentional known consequences of that, such as deep sedation and ultimately, uh, you know, the CO2 levels rise and people fade off and their heart stops, to me, that is a very different situation than explicitly prescribing medications that are designed with the intent of ending life. I, I always think there's a role for relief of suffering, even to the point of overwhelming sedation. If, if people wanna use the term medically induced coma or palliative sedation, um, they're, they, they're not quite the same because the intention and purpose is different, but the drugs that are used are actually about the same. Uh, in some cases, and that does require a physician to be involved in it. So I think the, I, I, I would agree with you that it is, it, it remains problematic on that same level as well. Michael, th thank you. Thank you for your comments. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Representative. Representative Alfine. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Doctor, for your testimony. Um, did I hear you correctly that you said in all the years that you've treated individuals that are terminal that you've never had to see any of them suffer? You've been able to manage that pain? I, I've never reached a point with any patients that I could not get ahead of their pain to the point that they were not. Uh, I, I, like the, I like the terminology someone used earlier today, but I wouldn't agree with it. The existential pain, um, the pain that cannot be lived with. I've, I've never not been able to get to the point where people are able to tolerate the pain in order to, for them to get through what they had to get through. And occasionally that has required 
uh, sedation to the point of, you know, unconsciousness. But, and again, you know, I, I haven't, I haven't, you know, had a thousand people like this, but I've practiced a long career as an, a primary care internist. And I've never, I, I would have actually felt it was a, a loss of my obligation to the patient and their family if I couldn't get ahead of, of this. And so I, it, it actually brings a very important point, which is a lot of physicians are not trained to be nearly as aggressive and uh, as they need to be around these issues because it's out of our comfort zone, which is why palliative care is so wonderful as part of the medical team because the stuff that they recommend, even now I, I don't do palliative care, but I've had patients I've brought palliative care in and they'll come in and they make recommendations for doses. And I'm like, wow, that, <laughs> I wouldn't have thought of that dose in a million years. And they'll say, you're not gonna get anywhere near ahead of this pain unless you do this. So it, it, part of it is that, that doctors are trained to do a certain range of things within a, 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 a comfort zone. When you have people in this, you know, this part of the spectrum, if you will, it, it, the average physician is not going to be comfortable to do that. So they either have to be trained to be more comfortable or rely on colleagues like we do in other domains to help guide their patient management. So to me, the emphasis should be overwhelmingly on delivering uh, advanced uh, palliative care services in all of the acute care facilities and home-based services in the state. That would be something that would be well worth supporting and getting behind. And very, very, very few people would be left uh, behind on that. Even some of the numbers thrown around today, 230, 240 people in, in Oregon, which has been way out ahead of this over the years. Think about all the people in the state of Connecticut, and you're only looking at a couple of hundred to 300 people where this legislation is designed for. And yet, there are a lot of other problematic things that come as unintended, and I would say unintended consequences of the legislation that you need to think about. So I would rather go down the path of the palliative care and the training and expanding services. Most of the palliative care people at St. Francis, I have six APRNs that are incredible. And I get letters from patients and families about the care that they provide. And uh, it breaks your heart and, and they are all extraordinarily grateful. So to me, that's the direction to go, not, not a physician assisted um, suicide. Well, I thank you so much for sharing that. I know I, I, my um, nursing career includes being a hospice nurse. And um, I too share the same experience as you did. I worked with some wonderful physicians who um, together we were able to manage the um, pain and keep family, family members satisfied that their loved ones were comfortable and had a peaceful passing. So um, I can relate to your experiences with regard to my career and my um, profession. So thank you very much for your testimony and sharing that. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative. Representative Berger Travala. Doctor, you and many others before you have referenced sedation to unconsciousness. Um, would you allow, doctor, that many patients would not want to trade consciousness for pain control? Yes, that's true. I've certainly had patients who, you know, when offered, you know, the option of being basically uh, given enough pain medication uh, to obliterate the pain or break it down to a level that they could tolerate, but it would mean they couldn't communicate with their families and they would, they, they decline that option. So the conclusion that I would draw is that perhaps your approach is, is not for everyone. It wouldn't be for all of your patients then. I didn't catch the very end of what you said, representative. That your approach might not be for everyone might not even suit each of your patients. Well, my, my approach is a patient-centered approach. If, if, if pain, relief of pain was the primary goal and they're willing to um, accept that they might be so drowsy they couldn't recognize or talk to their family, that would be okay with me. And the converse would also be true, which is if, if they would rather um, have a tolerable level of pain but not be pain-free, in order to be able to recognize when someone comes into the room or to squeeze their hand or to talk to them, 
that would be okay too. And of course, it's not a fixed point in time. At one point, they might be on this side of it. And then a little bit later, they might be on another side of it. And uh, this is an old study, but I'll, you know, I can't help it being a former professor of medicine, but they've actually done studies where they've done end of life, you know, advanced care directives, end of life discussions with people in the ICU setting. And then a week later, they go back and they re-ask the very same questions and, and get their, their preferences. And they sometimes they just do these over time. And it turns out that people's um, feelings around these things are more fluid than you might think. And so uh, I, I do think you have to keep in mind that circumstances do change and how people might feel at, at the six month period, they may feel differently at the th three month period. Um, it's not often as neat and tidy and ir irrevocable. Thank you for that answer. Actually, in that answer, you, you said both uh, two times that would be okay with you. And I believe that we need to remember that this legislation is not about what is okay with you. It is what is okay with the patient who is making this choice. I would also just like to- uh, Representative, before you continue, we're having a real difficulty hearing you. If you could adjust your volume somewhat. Yes, thank you. It is adjusted. I'm going to get close and then I'm going to switch computers. Um, I just want to point out that 5% of patients do not respond to pain medication used at the end of life. So this is, again, not suited for all of your patients. Thank you very much. I'm going to go switch computers. Thank you, Representative. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, thank you, Dr. Gray. Uh, appreciate you taking time on your busy schedule. And, and I do want to extend to you and all of your colleagues the, the great work you're doing on the COVID front line. So thank you. Um, you we, we talked, we've heard from medical doctors that, that cite the Hippocratic Oath as a foundation in regards to the concept of, of, of this uh, proposed uh, idea and bill. Can you elaborate a little bit more uh, 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 from, a, from a kind of a educational basis, what their rationale would be from a Hippocratic, as you mentioned, you were a professor? Well, you know, the Hippocratic Oath goes back, you know, a long time to the time of Hippocrates, and, and there, are, there are admonitions in there uh, against the uh, taking of life uh, purposefully. Um, that being said, you know, it, it just so happens I'm also a, a historian of medicine. That's what, you know, a lot of my research and publications have been in that. So you may have opened up a can of worms, Senator, but um, <laughs> what... What I'd, what I'd like to say is there are other aspects of the oath, frankly, that, that, we, that, are, um, uh, that we ignore almost entirely in, in contemporary you know, secular world that we largely live in. Um, and so um, there are things like that are in the actual oath, uh, the original oath anyways, that you would read and say, well, we do that all the time. <laughs> Uh, and, and, and people don't pull out the oath and use it against it. So it, it is, I, I guess in some ways, it's not like the constitution, which, which some people consider to be, you know, uh, fixed and immutable, and, and we always have to, to reflect off of it. Um, it is a document that has changed. In fact, some medical schools have rewritten it in significant ways to allow things that when I was a medical student taking the oath, it wasn't even in there. So um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't go so much back onto the oath per se, except to the, to the point where patients are always the primary responsibility. Uh, that's, that is, that is a, a cardinal component of, of the oath. And it's just, a, I, I think it's a difference of opinion about how you can relieve pain and suffering. Um, and, and I believe you can do it medically without giving, uh, taking a positive action towards someone's death, because I think that comes with great uh, moral risk. Um, and I, I just think, you know, that it's, I just believe it's not necessary. And in my experience, it's, it's not been necessary. Thank you. Uh, another area is obviously the Trinity Health of New England is, is one of the major systems in our state. Uh, but it also encompasses a lot of our faith-based facilities, uh, medical facilities. And, and, but you also have, and I'm reading through it, acquired 
um, in your system, Johnson's Memorial, uh, uh, you know, which may not be faith based. But but my point would be, uh, and and down in my district we have uh, St. Vincent's, which was recently acquired uh, by Hartford Healthcare. Uh, but I, I've also seen the power of faith-based um, uh, as, as a part of the healing process. And you cite that in your testimony that, you know, one of the pa- alternatives is palliative care. And say palliative 10 times, I don't think I can. Uh, but you also cite the fact there is a, a, a spiritual aspect and, and a social aspect of, of palliative care that's critical can, can you elaborate a little bit more on that? Because I, I think we're talking so much about pain management and, and reducing of suffering, but th- th- there's, there's not always a scientific answer to spiritual and faith-based in, in regards to the, the process of, of end-of-life assessment and care. Um, and, am I opening up another can of worms in saying that? But, but it's important, isn't it? It, it, it very much is. And, and, to use a, a, a somewhat, it might even be considered a trite example of that. The experience of pain varies based on lots of different things. Obviously, individuals experience pain differently. Cultures experience pain differently. There, there, there are other, um, it's, it's not a sort of a uniform experience. You and I could have the exact same advanced cancer, God forbid, knock on wood. Um, and, and metastases in the same places. And you might ma- handle that way better than I do uh, and require different you know, treatment. So when I, when I think about where the spiritual aspect of this comes to bear um, or the social aspect comes to bear, who among us doesn't believe that um, having a strong social support system makes almost any condition in life easier to manage and do better with. I mean, if you're all alone in the world versus you have someone who has a loving family around, um, by and large, you can bet on the person with the, with the extended family that is supporting them. They're gonna do better than the person who's all by themselves. And I think it's also my experience, borne out by some empirical data actually, which my wife would be much better at quoting than I would, that um, people who have faith have better clinical outcomes as a general uh, rule of thumb uh, than people who are without faith. And so what palliative care does uh, in, in better than almost anybody except maybe the geriatricians is they, they wrap all of those components of a person's sense of well-being, health, and if you will, suffering and they attend to all of those components. So yes, they attend to the medical aspect of the pain, et cetera, but they also think about people's emotional state. They think about their spiritual state. They think about their sense of uh, isolation, fulfillment in their, what they've done and, and left in their life. And I think that it's the holistic approach to those patients that makes it such a powerful model of care. And I, I hope that attends somewhat to your question. No, I, I really appreciate that. And, and my final question, thank you, Madam Chair, for the indulgence is, um, what do you say to people that says about bodily choice and, 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 and their decision ultimately with what they do with, with their own uh, bodily decisions and choice and, and that being part of a civil liberty that was mentioned earlier by Mr. Rossetti? What do you say to that uh, argument and, and a, kind of a consistency of thought? Well, I, I, as someone who is a practicing Catholic, and by the way, I've, I've had an interesting journey in my career uh, in, in terms of um, my, my views socially and politically and economically, and also I'm not someone that would be that easy to characterize that way. But I can tell you where I sit right now as a 62-year-old uh, man is, is uh, that the the uh, I sort of lost my trend there in my my preamble. Um, remind me again the question, Senator. I apologize. No, no, it's it's not easy. Uh, it, it 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 creates such a a challenging thought that we have to kind of weigh is uh, the idea of civil liberties, the idea oh, of, 
of yes. independent body choice? Well, I think personally, I believe that um, there is a God. Uh, and I believe that when I shuffle off this mortal coil, I'm going to go, if God willing, to a better place. And so I'm, 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 I'm borrowing this life uh, from the person who gifted it to me. And so that's where the reverence for life comes in. I'm not that much of a theologian, but that's my crude understanding of it. Um, I don't fault people who believe that they should have uh, the, the right to make decisions about their life and their body. I think sometimes in the political sphere, some of those arguments are uh, ironic and, and uh, they are they, at, at the very least not always based in um, logic, but I don't want to go down that particular pathway. But I think for the purposes of what we're talking about here, I don't think I'm arguing that people should not have autonomy and choice. I'm arguing that, that the vast majority of situations that I've experienced and I think uh, occur are ones that can be anticipated and managed uh, totally consistent with the person's individual freedom to make decisions about how they want to live their life. What you're asking is for me to collude with someone on a decision to end their life. And that's where, and I know the bill allows people to beg off, but um, I, I, I would be a little bit careful about that because coercion comes in all sorts of directions. Uh, you know, uh, people get coerced at home, people get coerced at work, and they isn't, isn't an overt coercion. Like you'll either do, you know, give this person propofol, Dr. Gray, or you're gonna lose your job as chair. No one's gonna come right out and say that. But there are other ways that people feel pressure. And so I think this bill doesn't have protections for that. Uh, and is, is, a, is in some ways is a little bit too, um, I think a little bit, it, life is more ambiguous than, than this bill allows for. Uh, and I think that uh, even though there seems to be good protections in there, I'm not convinced that in the real world, when the rubber hits the road, they'll be as neat and tidy as everybody thinks. Thank you, Dr. Gray. And, and uh, I, I, I want to uh, finish by thanking you and all your uh, frontline medical workers for all the work you're doing and, and, and protecting people. And, and thank you, Madam uh, Chair. It also seems kind of interesting with the lottery and the independence after, you know, Dr. Gray's presentation about faith based uh, healing and all that. We have uh, Mr. Luther Weeks following up on secular America. So thank you, Madam <laughs> Chair. Thank you, Senator. Representative Cabos de Groff. So just before we get to Luther, um, I'll, I'll keep this brief. And, I, and I'll, Dr. I'll, I'll say I am a person of faith. I am a Greek Orthodox Christian. Um, and certainly I, I, pref I, I say that so that when I ask this question, you know that I, I mean no offense by this. But I guess, you know, as you've mentioned the higher power and you agree that God has put in place science and certainly our free will uh, to, but, but science in place for us to prolong life, do you then not agree that that same science could also be put into place to not prolong suffering? Yeah, I, I think I've argued that we have tools at our disposal, not only just medical and pharmacologic, but the, the empathy and knowledge of experts in the domain of palliative care to relieve people's suffering, which is always a responsibility of, of, a, of a physician. You know, the, I think people have mentioned this on more than one occasion today, but at the end of life, and when, when people are in pain and suffering, there are two things that I have always felt they are most worried about. One is to be abandoned. Uh, they, they, if, if things are hopeless, then they feel they just get, you know, wheeled off into a corner somewhere and nobody will pay attention. And, and by the way, those are not irrational thoughts. Uh, doctors really do have a lot of discomfort with, with death and dying. And so to be abandoned is, is, is terrible. Um, and the other thing is pain. Uh, they don't want to be in, in uh, intolerable pain. Doesn't mean they have to be pain. They want to be pain free and they don't want to be abandoned. Uh, and that's always been my, the, my teaching point with students and residents and fellows and the like is that, you know, it's, you have to work extra hard when someone is in a situation like that so they don't feel that you're giving them short shrift 
uh, and that you uh, and that you're doing everything you can to relieve their their suffering and pain. But I would also I would also say you know there are there is that five percent that doesn't respond to the palliative you know uh, medicines, um, and so how do we ease their suffering? Because just telling them and, and being there for them and, and hoping that they have a family that's there for them and hospice nurses, um, you know there is that five percent, and then. Additionally, you know, there does come a point in, in cancers like pancreatic cancer where you have to deliver the news perhaps that the, uh, the chemotherapy is no longer working, the radiation is no longer working, and that we've reached a point where your tumor markers are not shrinking. And so at that point, you know, that's, there, there's, there's that, it's not even that they feel a sense of abandonment, but now they've, they have, have lost that hope that perhaps that chemotherapy was giving to them even though they had this horrible diagnosis. And so at that point, you know, it does seem as if this would make sense for folks to have even perceived control of their situation. Well, I, I think that they do have control when you are engaged around the issues of end of life decision making, you know, um, having a discussion about what's okay, what's not okay, what would they like uh, be willing to take for a week, but maybe if it was going to be indefinite, they, they wouldn't want to deal with it. There's a lot of self-determination and autonomy in those conversations. Um, it's, it's, it's really not a, it, it's not a black or white uh, conversation. It's really a nuanced one. So I think that most of these things can be anticipated well in advance of hitting that crisis point. And that's what should happen so that you have the guidance that you need and you can anticipate that. The other thing I would keep in mind, just again, as someone who, who cares for patients a lot, is that how you frame things with patients and their families does have an impact on how they perceive how things are going. And so uh, I, I, I'll use an example that's not so extreme, but I do have patients who have you know, chronic low back pain, let's say. And they've had it for 10 years and they, they seek me out and they want a new doctor. And I tell them flat out, you've had low back pain for 10 years. A lot of people have looked at a lot of things have happened. I'm not going to be able to make you pain free. If that's your goal, it's not going to happen. But I can do this to help make that pain tolerable so that you can get through the day and do what you need to do. Now, that is a trite almost trivial example. And if you put that on steroids and, and, and bring it into a situation like we're discussing this to all day today, that's still framing things for people in a way that they can understand what is probable and likely to happen. And they can have input and guidance and to, to guide the team on what they want done. But you also have a chance to frame it and say, you know what, I could probably make all the pain go away at some point if it gets that bad, but this is what's going to happen when I do that. Is that okay? And if that's okay, then I'm good. But I don't think that's what this bill is offering. I, I do think it's incongruous to say, you know, the piece that we do have science for one thing, but not for the other. But I, I appreciate your testimony. And as uh, Senator Wong said, you know, we are so grateful to all of the frontline workers. So thank you so much for You're being well. here. Thank you very much. I think that's all the questions, doctor. Thank you for your time and testimony. Thanks everybody. Have a great day. Um, next we have Sister Catherine Mary Clark. Sister, are you there? I'm here. Great, thank you so much for joining us. Go right yes, ahead. Yes, thank you. Thank you for coming back to me. Yes, good afternoon. Um, so Madam Chair and members of the committee, I'm Sister Catherine Mary Clark, clinical social worker, spiritual care coordinator and bereavement coordinator for Franciscan Home Care and Hospice Care. Thank you for what you do, first of all, and thank you for the opportunity to speak in opposition to Bill 6425 regarding aid and dying. Um, and I really speak from the perspective as one who has been by the side of many hundreds of people of all walks of life in the final weeks days and hours of their natural dying process. And I urge you to vote no to Bill 6425. Um, experience both personal and professional has deeply ingrained in me the belief that each person who makes a choice or for whom the choice is made to control the time and means of death is deprived of a most extraordinary experience of life. 
While dying involves the suffering of loss of control on many levels, it simultaneously unfolds, heals, and releases the person in a way that only nature, only natural process with the proper care and support can do. Legalization of an action can suggest to some that action is acceptable and therefore good for the person in persist society. We all live through times of suffering, pain, fear, need of others, need of guidance and support. And it's through those times we tend to grow, move beyond the limits we thought we had and become stronger, more understanding, more compassionate persons because of the trials. And to suggest that taking away this final and most important opportunity is an act of kindness and compassion is really contrary to our human nature. We develop and process from conception, each day having significance, and dying is the culmination of that process, with each day, each hour, having a purpose which we cannot predict or prepare for. The process itself leads us where we need to go and when we need to get there. And even those who are fearful of facing the process or who prefer not to face the process, even they deserve an opportunity to be supported in the natural process by, with dignity, respect, comfort, and true compassion. And again, I emphasize with proper care and support. And again, I just urge you to vote no to this bill. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony, sister. I appreciate you being here. I don't see any questions at this time, but I will say as a Meriden resident, I thank you and your, uh, the other Franciscan nuns for all you do for our community. It's really such a blessing to have you. It's a privilege, thank you. Um, next, we have Mr. Luther Weeks. Mr. Weeks, are you there? Uh, you're on mute, Mr. Weeks. Yeah, I got it, okay. thank you. There you go. Go yeah. right ahead. Thank you. So, uh, chairs and the members of the committee, my name is Luther Weeks. As Senator Wong noted, I am testifying for Secular Connecticut. We represent the interests of the 42% of Connecticut voters that are non-religious. Our positions are based on the U.S. Constitution's guarantee of separation of church and state, along with humanist values guided by science and reason. I am familiar with the concept of pre-constitutional rights which form the basis of our government. Many are declared and recognized in the Declaration of Independence. The entire legitimacy of the United States and the Connecticut constitutions rests on its declarations that governments are der derive their just powers from the consent of the government, of the governed, sorry. There are other pre-constitutional rights. Among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It occurs to me that these certain unalienable rights apply today. Life, the precious life, the just one precious life, too precious for anyone else to choose how we live or to limit what the end will be. Liberty. We have a long tradition of avoiding limiting, limiting what others can do or can ingest as long as they do not directly harm others. The pursuit of happiness. The pursuit of happiness is perhaps the most obvious right that would be protected and provided by this bill. I was executor for the estate of my cousin who died of brain cancer seven and one half years ago. I sat with him in his last day of struggle in life. I did not know what his choice would have been, yet I would wish that he had that choice to end his life when he chose. Even after due consideration, he chose not to exercise it. Diagnosed just two months earlier, he chose wisely for no curative treatment. Conscious and able to make decisions in two day, till two days prior to his natural death. Unfortunately, he could not legally have chosen to end it before the final struggle and vast pain. He chose hospice and at least avoided something that could have been much, much worse and much, much longer. In his case, he was of sound mind and body until very near the end. Just a week before he died, knowing the end was approaching, he was active, feeding himself, shopping, yet arranging for meals on wheels, updating and signing his will. I understand that aid in dying is supported by an overwhelming majority of voters of Connecticut. If you agree only that it is justified by a single one of the rights of life, 
liberty or the pursuit of happiness, even if this right were only desired or supported by a small minority of residents, even if you personally would not make that choice, I urge you to support HB 6425 in the name of democracy, human rights, and the Declaration of Independence. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony, Mr. Weeks. I don't see any questions, so I'm going to just thank you for being here today. We appreciate it. You're welcome. Um, next is David Reynolds, followed by Kim Libera. Mr. Reynolds, go right ahead. Eva I'm on, okay. <laughs> um, yes, I, um, hold on, please. Okay, I'm having a little problem here. Okay. Yes, my name is David Reynolds. I'm an associate director of the Catholic Conference in Connecticut, and I'm here today to express the conference's opposition to uh, 6425 aid and dying bill. You've heard from many people today and some very touching stories and they touch us all. Nobody takes death. I, and, and I've experienced major deaths in, in my life in the last few years, many of us had. It's, it's not a comfortable thing to go through with your loved one at all. But I think we have to look at, is this really compassion? Is this, it's in a way some people have viewed it as truly true compassion, but in, many ways it should be questioned, is it, is it? And this is what we should be doing. But beyond that question, when you've had the ethicist talk that answer that more than I can, but I think we have to look at the harm we do sometimes when the state tries to decide who lives and who dies or how is it legally protected life and death. We had one experience in the state here nationally and that was with the death penalty, which the conference opposed. In a spite strict laws in Connecticut and other states, we still found people wrongly put to death um, beyond, you know, in their op op who they, um, who felt they were, people felt they were guilty, but they were wrongly put to death. And we put to death with medications that were supposed to be easy and, e and simple to apply. And then it ended up that those, so many of those um, medications gave the prisoners great pain. Now it's actually the opposite in the direction. Now you have people asking to die and the state is trying to again, set up safeguards and parameters for how this could be done safely. One of the big issues that concerns me, and I don't know if it's been brought up today, but it's the medications used in assisted dying. Those medications are neither approved by the FDA. They have gone, got, not gone through any ethical research standards that most medications do. They are a drug cocktail that is put together by the physician. And where does he get his information from other physicians? And that's why he puts these cocktails together. And that's why there've been accidents where people have burned their mouth, other types of accidents. The difference in, uh, um, dying times sure could be the weight of the person was the drug calculated wrong, but it also could be the new concoction that this, the doctor is trying to uh, to create. There's an excellent article in Atlantic magazine that was re written in 2019, very good expose on the development of these drugs and how open it was. And it was a meeting of uh, Seattle that started to uh, get together. They were all aid with dying doctors and said, oh, how can we do this better? So I guess the point here, and it's an ethical and moral point, is the patients become the test subjects. The doctors will see how that combination works by actually applying it to a human being. That's not ethical medicine, that's not ethical research. So that's why you know many physicians are opposed to it. I know the AMA is opposed to it, and still after last year, they still reject it as, as a method. They're, the national AMA is opposed. So I think we have to be very careful we have to believe that the but conference believes that in respecting the value of human life and showing true compassion for suffering patients is to vigorously improve, I, I hear you, yeah, palliative, palliative care and hospice care. We should not adopt laws that may lead to the unintentional taking of a human life or allow patients to be subjected to, as to testing of new drug cocktails. This is a big issue. Um, it's, and it's a moral and ethical issue. And, and this is one of the reasons the church stands opposed to this kind of legislation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Reynolds. I don't see any questions, so thank you for your time today and coming to testify for us. Okay, thank you. Um, next is Kim Labira, followed by Joel Estrada. Ms. Labira, go right Hi. ahead. Hi, Mary. Uh, I pose the bill um, based on the current language um, on moral grounds, because I fear the slippery slope. 
um, I possibly could be persuaded to accept the palliative sedation um, thing with a certain range of diseases. But what I am worried about is that our government is now devaluing life and this will become part of a cultural trend to devalue the life of the aged and disabled. And then this will extend to ethnicity, race, and probably political affiliation. I don't want a government sanctioned suicide movement. I do not want to be China. I do not want to be the Netherlands. Um, there are selfish entities out there that will abuse this, be they the insurance industry, overworked docs or social workers, the funeral home industry, or the organ harvesting industry. Let's not make law based on emotion. Let's use a moral compass. Part of the problems with the bill is it doesn't spell out penalties ahead of time for um, abuses that may happen so nobody would be prosecuted. I recently lost my sister-in-law after a three-year battle to ALS. And yes, it's an ugly disease. After the three years, she went into hospice on a Friday night. They ceased food treatment through her tube on Sunday. By Tuesday night, she was gone. Um, I believe they applied morphine and lorazepam um, to put her completely um, out of it on um, there. In addition, I have lost four friends over the past 15 years to ALS. And when I was at the state, I used to handle long-term care Medicaid um, in all the ALS cases end up at the hospital for special care in New Britain. And that was the facility that I handled there. I would like to see vast improvement in STEM technologies and palliative care and also strengthening the emotional side to this. We keep giving into this. And I think as a society, we all struggle with death in our society. And it's because it's not talked about. And I have to agree with the sister that spoke just a few moments ago. It is part of life. And we're trying to get the government to make it go away. Um, if, if we could do something about the pain, uh, more sedation, whatever needs to be in place, let's do something about it. And I want to see us tackle more diseases, just like we're tackling the COVIDs and Ebola to start curing some of these things. Um, but that's basically where I stand. I lost my mom two years ago. The last 15 minutes of her life, I held her hand. Her fingers were a deep navy blue. She went through 10 minutes of Shane Stokes breathing and five minutes of apnea. She got through it and I got through it. And I would not replace that experience in a million years. It it toughened me up. Um, and that was necessary Before, for my uh, own. You hit your three-minute mark, if you wouldn't mind concluding your remarks. Yes, that strengthened me spiritually. And that's what I'd like to say. Thank you so much for your testimony, Kim. I'm sorry to hear about your losses. Um, I don't see any questions at this time, so I'm just going to thank you for being with us today. Next, we have Al Smith, followed by Virginia Harder. Thank you. Smith, um, go right ahead. I'll, I'll be very brief. Uh, my name is Al Smith. I live in Brookfield, Connecticut. Um, over the past few years, I lost two very good friends through to pancreatic cancer. Both had uh, kind of terrible last two, three weeks. One in particular, uh, his wife told me that in the last month, every time he woke up, he woke up angry. He woke up frustrated. He just wanted to die. And he didn't die. He had to go through another day, went to sleep, hope he was going to die in his sleep, got up and again. He woke up angry, disappointed, frustrated. Um, I think there's got to be some choice here. I, to, to me, you know, it, uh, choice and options in life are, are a good thing in, in almost all cases. And we, we, we have choice in, 
if um, if if some abortions are legal, the 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 woman has the choice to have an abortion, whether you agree with abortions or not, it's legal in this country. I have to put two little cats down. They're I know that's an animal, but they're part. People know they're 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 part of of the family. And it was the humane thing to do, and it's legal. Yet, if I have a terminal disease and my last month I want to end my life, it's not legal. Something's wrong with that picture. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Mr. Smith. I appreciate your testimony today. I don't see any questions, so thank you for your time. Um, next, we have Virginia Harger. Virginia, I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing your last name. Go right ahead. You're on mute. Oh, there we go. Sorry. That's okay. Go right ahead. Good afternoon to the Public Health Committee co-chairs, vice chairs, ranking members, and remaining committee members for the opportunity to speak today. I am opposed to House Bill 6425, Aid in Dying, as well as any other effort by our state legislature to allow the proposed process in our state. I find some of the language in the bill to be lacking. In section three, there are very detailed requirements and a timeline for written requests. Prior to a written request, section three states, a patient wishing to receive aid in dying shall make two oral requests to his or her physician. What will be required to document these oral requests? Is a witness required who will testify under oath that a first and second oral request was made? To me, this creates a situation of it being one person's word against another's. I have the same concern reg regarding the language in section five, which states that an attending physician shall offer a qualified patient an opportunity to rescind his or her request for aid in dying at the time such patient makes a second oral request. Yes, House Bill 6425 focuses on a person making the decision and self-administering, but there is the potential in the future to others eventually deciding which kind of life is worth living and which life should be terminated. My mom passed three months short of her 102nd birthday. She had lived with us for almost five years and had been diagnosed previously by her physician with dementia. Most days she was cooperative with eat, dressing, eating and personal care, but some days she was not. While somewhat unsteady on her feet, she could still walk. So we use a wheelchair to transport her when outside our home. She was able to feed herself until shortly before her passing. Mom went grocery shopping to church services and to the movies with us. At age 101, she even went with us for a four day trip out of state, sightseeing with overnight stays in an RV park. Six months later, in late December 2017, after a five-day hospitalization for a bed sore that came out of nowhere, her doctors indicated she was beginning the end stage of her life here on Earth. She entered hospice care in our home, and we gradually witnessed what we were told to expect, refusal of food and more and more sleep. We were given morphine to administer to ease any discomfort she was in, and after about three weeks, she passed in her sleep. We have no say when we enter this Earth. And I believe we have no right to decide when to leave it. I feel House Bill 6425, Aid in Dying, goes against the natural inclination for a human to preserve life. Do not give people the means to artificially end their time here on earth. I respectfully ask that at the proper time, members of the Public Health Committee vote to reject House Bill 6425. Thank you for your time and attention to my concerns. Thank you very much for your testimony. I really appreciate you being here today. I don't see any questions at this time, so thank you. You're welcome. Um, next is Carrie Shaw, followed by Andre Sofair. Uh, Carrie Shaw, you are on mute. If you want to take yourself off mute, you're still on mute. So sorry. That's okay. Um, I just want uh, you to know in case you were speaking. Go right ahead. Thank you so much. And by the way, I want to thank you and the committee for drafting such an excellent, well-crafted bill. I read it over word for word, and I am extremely impressed. Thank you all. You did a great job. 
Uh, my name is Carrie Shaw. I'm testifying today representing humanists and free thinkers of Fairfield County. Uh, and we support the bill 6425 wholeheartedly. Now, my father was on hospice. He choked to death on his food. That's called aspiration. A common cause of death of people as their bodily functions down, shut down. And yes, he had palliative care. He had hospice. But he choked to death. That was a horrible experience for me just to hear about it. But for the people who actually were there and witnessed it, it was awful. And this is a, emotional for me. I decided not to be emotional, but it, it's terrible. Now, the situation with our pet dog and family was totally different. Now, we provided medicine care for over a, daily for over a year. But then finally, our dog was uh, skin and bones. Her eyes rolled back in her head. It was clear the end of need was near, so we called the vet to our house. We gathered as a family. We talked nicely to the dog. We petted the dog. We all had a wonderful time, but realizing that we didn't want this dog to be in a pain any longer, we had the vet terminate her life quickly. So what's the thing? My dog, my dad, my dog died like a human being. My dad died like a dog. We got to change this and please enact this bill as soon as possible. Now, there's been a lot of talk on this, uh, this hearing so far about suicide. On 9-11, countless people chose to kill themselves by jumping out of the windows in order to end their lives suddenly rather than to wait to be burned alive in the Twin Towers. Were they guilty of sin? I think not. Were they uh, 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 violating God's plan? No. Should their death certificates list suicide or assisted or not as cause of death? I think no. Should those who helped them to fulfill their wishes be held guilty? I think not. What we care about is common sense. And the Gallup poll, by the way, in Prater Arg, uh, finds that 42% of Connecticut residents identify as non-religious and the humanists from free thinkers of Fairfield County, of which I'm president, representing humanists throughout Fairfield County's 23 towns, which comprise one quarter of Connecticut's population, has adopted the policy position in favor of this bill. Now, we stand for compassion and reason. And what that means is using common sense to take care of ourselves and to take care of others. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for your time and testimony today. I don't see any questions, so um, I appreciate you sharing your experience. Thank you. Um, next is Andre Sofair and Kelly, followed by Kelly Moore. Oh, I guess not here, so we'll move on to Kelly Moore. Saw you there before. Don't see you there now, Ms. Moore. So let's move on to um, Bonnell Lombardi. Bonnell Lombardi, you're on mute if you take yourself off mute. You're still on mute. Go right ahead. All right, fine. Good afternoon. I'm Donald Lombardi from Washington, Connecticut, testifying in support of HB 6425. I'm testifying on behalf of my deceased wife, Rosemary Lombardi, who died an unspeakably horrible death from pancreatic cancer, desperately wanting medical aid in dying. I'm testifying today because I'm angry. I'm angry that year after year, Connecticut legislators have refused to carry out what poll after poll shows are the wishes of a large and ever increasing majority of Connecticut citizens for a law allowing competent, terminally ill persons the right to merciful medical aid in dying. I'm angry at the people who say that palliative care assures a peaceful end of life, making making 
medical assisted dying unnecessary. If I could play a video of Rosemary's uncontrollable pain and suffering that I watched day after day, there is no one in this hearing who could honestly say that palliative care, care provides a peaceful end in cases of extreme pain and suffering. And in Rosemary's case, at times during the later stages when nurses were able to mask her pain with morphine, she kept repeating over and over how horrible her drug stupor and accompanying hallucinations were. So much for palliative care. I'm angry that Connecticut legislators keep siding with opponents who are well organized, but have little or no stake in the matter. Instead of siding with the majority of Connecticut residents who want medical aid in dying, and with persons who have died unspeakably horrible deaths like my wife, desperately wanting medical aid in dying. Why do the opponents have little or no stake in this matter? Because there's nothing in HB 6425 that makes them do anything or not do anything or directly affects them. The bill makes sure that no one who does not wish to participate in medical aid in dying would ever have to abuse from the bill. There's no credible evidence of abuse from medical aid in dying in the nine states in the District of Columbia where such aid in dying is permitted, whether abuse is of the handicapped, of the elderly, abuse by insurance companies, none. In short, the opponents have little or no stake in this matter. I'm angry at the Public Health Committee that it has not at least sent a medical aid in dying bill to the full Connecticut General Assembly and let them decide the matter. When voting on HB 6425, I ask each committee, each committee member to think not about your office, not about the next election, but think about what is right, what the majority of Connecticut citizens want, and what you would want if you or your spouse or your parents, your children or your loved ones should be terminally ill and experiencing uncontrollable pain and suffering. Remember, the next time that terminally ill person suffering uncontrollable, unspeakable pain and suffering could be you or your loved one. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for your testimony, Mr. Lombardi, and I'm, I'm sorry for your loss. Um, I don't see any questions at this time, so thank you for taking the time to be here and sharing such a personal experience. Appreciate it. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Next is Kelly Moore. Kelly, are you with us now? Yes, Go right thank ahead. you. All right, Senator Doherty Abrams, Representative Steinberg, Ranking Members Wong, Summers, and Pettit, and distinguished members of the Public Health Committee. My name is Kelly McConney Moore. I'm the Policy Counsel for the American Civil Liberties Union of Connecticut. I'm here to testify in support of HB 6425. Decisions about end-of-life care are deeply personal. Each terminally ill person should have the right to make their own decisions about how to spend their final days and how to face death. This right to individual autonomy when making end-of-life decisions includes the decision to seek physician-assisted aid in dying, as well as the decision to continue living. The ACLU of Connecticut supports this bill because we believe all people should have the liberty to make personal, intimate decisions, not just about how to live, but about how to die. Currently, several other states in Washington, D.C. allow terminally ill residents to make their own determination at the end of their lives about how much suffering to endure and when to hasten a peaceful death. Those states honor, until the very end of life, the self-determination -determ that's so valued in America's culture and constitution. We encourage the legislature to tackle this issue, as other states have. However, it is important that there are safeguards in place. We recognize the importance of ensuring that each person's decision about end of life care is entirely voluntary. It isn't based on misinformation or pressure from others or discriminatory misconceptions about people with disabilities. We support the rights of people living with disabilities, including their right to live full lives and make their own determinations about their bodies and lives. It's critical that the legislature consult with disability rights groups and continue to do so to make sure that the bill allows people their individual right to determine when to end their life but also so that it closes any loopholes that could hurt vulnerable populations. We understand that some people will not ever contemplate the choice offered by uh, this aid and dying bill because of their religious beliefs or moral understandings. 
And no one, no doctor, hospital, institution, or individual should be compelled to participate in another person's choice about aid in dying. This bill protects that choice, but no person should be able to deny it to another. It, nobody should presume to dictate an agonizing death for another human being. The ACLU of Connecticut supports this bill and the safeguards it contains, and we can encourage this committee to do so as well. Thank you. Thank you very much for that testimony. I don't see any questions, so thank you for being here. Um, next, we have James Russell, followed by Barry Wu. James, thank you very much. Members, go right of, ahead. members of the Public uh, Health Committee, I thank you for uh, listening. My name is James Russell um, from Ridgefield, Connecticut. I'm testifying in favor of HB 6425. My testimony today is on behalf of and dedicated to my late sister Dee, who passed from cancer this past August. Dee was a strong person, a person who would, you would respect and honor, a person you would look up to. She had been president of her local church and also a treasurer. Dee was terminally ill from metastasized cancer, which had gone from her spine to her brain. She suffered through starvation because the doctors could no longer treat her illness. And if she were fed food or water, she would choke. This happened last August. Home hospice put her on a hospital bed. in the dining room of her house where the table had been. She was in constant pain and anxiety, often waking up in the middle of the night, screaming. There were many phone calls to the nurse at midnight, at 3 a.m., at 5 a.m. They put her on a morphine pump, a morphine pump. Think of it. She was dying and they gave her a morphine that did not eliminate her pain. She suffered a horribly painful, inhumane death for three more weeks because opponents of this bill mandated it. It's time that we improve not only the quality of life, of life but the quality of death. Should I need it and choose to use it, I would want to have this as an option. I hope it doesn't happen to that, but I want this as a possibility, as a choice. We are a compassionate state. We're compassionate, loving people. Our quality of life and our quality of death are in your hands. Please, please, please pass this bill. This is what this bill is about. It's not everything else people were talking about. This is what the bill is about. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Russell. I'm sorry about the loss of your sister. And uh, sounds like you had a wonderful relationship. You're a good brother. So thank you for being here. Um, Representative Berger Gravalo. I just want to say, uh, James, thank you. Not, not only as a constituent for um, for sharing your story, but as a human being, for sharing the story of what you went through with Dee and for yourself um, to share that pain and to be so raw and so vulnerable for the sake of moving this legislation forward. It says a tremendous amount about you and it says a tremendous amount about your relationship with your sister. And I very much appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. I don't see any other questions, Mr. Russell. So again, thank you so much for your time and for being here today. Um, next is Barry Wu, followed by Phyllis Roth. Senator Abrams and the Health Committee, thank you so much for the opportunity to share testimony. I want to thank everyone who's actually given their testimony today. Uh, my name is Barry Wu. I'm an attending physician on the front lines of caring for patients in the hospital, including patients with COVID-19. I came to New Haven in 1989 for residency training, and my plan was to be here three years. It's now been over 30 years. 
Uh, I really enjoy the place living here and the people here. I spend most of my time as a hospitalist and teaching Yale medical students and residents. From my own personal experience and with literature, it's clear that physicians do not know how long patients will live. I've had patients uh, with multiple medical problems go to the intensive care unit that are expected to die and then leave. Uh, surprisingly, they get up, walk, and leave. On the other hand, I've had younger patients who are otherwise healthy, hospitalized, yet die suddenly in the hospital. And most visitedly, I've sent terminally ill patients, less than six months prognosis. One woman with metastatic cancer with metastases to her brain that was attended to hospice to die, another one with end-stage kidney disease that decided to stop dialysis to go to hospice to die. And these patients went to hospice to die, yet walked out of hospice and lived several months. I believe in the sanctity of life and that a physician, uh, I've taken an oath as, that's been talked about not to actively end a life. It's contradictory to me to have it, the words physician and actively aid a patient to die. I believe that as physicians, we are to be present for our patients and their families and to provide comfort and care to the terminally ill. Furthermore, as a physician, I am not to act as God. I oppose HB 6425, the act of concern concerning aid and dying of terminally ill patients. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Wu. Glad that you've decided to make Connecticut your home. Um, Representative D'Amico. Yes. Th th thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, thank you, Dr. Wu, uh, for your testimony. And thank you for the, the good work that you do. So, so I, I have a question uh, for you. Um, so we, we've heard uh, testimony from yourself and, and, and from others uh, that, that, that indicates, as you say, that, that doctors can't necessarily determine how long a person is going to be able to live. Someone might have a diagnosis of, of six months and then they, they live for, you know, far beyond that. I, I, and I, I understand that. I get that. But, but is it, would, would you not agree that at some point um, it, it becomes obvious to, 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 to a physician such as yourself that someone is in the end stage of life, that, 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 that there's no debate about it, that there's no, that, you know, that, that there's, there's no ambiguity about it, that this person is in the end stage of their life at some point. That was, that was both my patients. The patient was in the intensive care unit with metastatic breast cancer, with metastases in her brain. She was unresponsive. She was not moving, she was not talking. She went to hospice to die. I visited in a hospice and I see her with her husband there sitting up talking. I cannot explain that to you. I thought, well, maybe just a coincidence. Then another patient with kidney disease, the kidneys aren't working on dialysis, stopped the dialysis and yet walked out. He wanted to die, walked out of the house. Both, both of those patients visited. One thing I think is very important as we have in this conversation is the doctor-patient relationship. I would be concerned in finding any kind of physician as we are practicing now, and someone mentioned telehealth and finding any type of physician. I think the long-term relationship that you have with the patient is so critical. I also thinking having a team approach, not just based on the physician. There is a whole healthcare team, behavioral people, pastoral care. I don't think it's one individual. I really think it's a team approach in taking a care of a patient who is terminally ill. Okay. Thank you, sir. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Oh, excuse me, Representative Kennedy. Thank you, Madam Chairman. And thank you, Dr. Wu, for being here. Um, I just want to follow up on something you had said. Um, more of a comment, um, if you will, Madam Chair. Um, a very dear friend of mine, um, her husband was diagnosed with stage four colon cancer. Uh, it was a very invasive cancer um, seven years ago. When he went into the hospital, she, he, she was told to bring his things with him because he would not be going home. Like I said, that was seven years ago. He did went, go into a remission. Um, unfortunately, the cancer came back and he was told again, maybe six months, but don't plan on seeing any holidays. Once again, he is still with us, thankfully. But I guess my point in just stating that is that 
even though you're given a terminal diagnosis, I just don't think any of us really knows what that is because I don't think, and you certainly know best more than I as just a lay person, but you as a physician, certainly, I don't think anyone knows what the body will do because I think you can just turn around and just either it's will or your body just changes. So I, I just wanted to make that point. Um, so I, I do appreciate your words, Dr. Wu, and, and thank you for being here today. Thank you, Madam Chairman. You're, you're, can I come to make, make a comment? Um, go may ahead, Dr. Wu. May I make a comment? Yeah, your, your experience is not unheard of. They did a study that was published in the British Medical Journal of 343 physicians that looked at 468 patients that were at hospice and asked them to kind of predict what they thought the prognosis was. And it was less than 20% actually could accurately predict the prognosis of those patients. Uh, so there's, you know, what our anecdotal experience is, is really borne out in the literature. One other thing that has been pointed out that I think is also critical is uh, my own fiance many years ago at the age of 37 was died of metastatic colon cancer. Uh, we had home hospice. And what I appreciated most as a family member is after she died, uh, hospice sent me uh, 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 letters, individual letters, there were support groups. And so I think supporting the family through this dying process is so critical. And it really improving our and, and integrating palliative care is really so important for care of not only the patient, but their families as well. Thank you, Dr. Wu. Um, Representative D'Amico, the second time, go ahead. Y yes, you uh, th thank you, Madam Chair. I, I appreciate your indulgence and I I'll be brief. Um, so, so, so Dr. Wu, uh, I don't know how long you've been here, if you've, if you've listened to all the testimony or just part have, of it. I have, here since 9 a.m. <laughs> oh, great, uh, thank you. I, you get a lot, of, you deserve a lot of credit for that. So, so thank you. So, so um, uh, we, we've heard uh, fr fr from several people telling us that, that uh, palliative care uh, in, in the number that has been given is around 5% of the people in palliative who do not respond to the palliative care. The, 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 these 5% are in terrible, agonizing pain. What, what, do you, what do you say to the families of those people would be my question. How, uh, how uh, are you, I'm sorry, how is it determined that the particular palliative, you know, it, also, it, it, it goes with just healthcare in general of who you, who's taking care of you. Sometimes you know, I would ha hate to generalize all palliative care that there's 5%. It was that particular individual de dealing with that particular patient. And sometimes it means finding some other alternative, pa alternative support group, whether it's palliative care or it's a, a clergy or something to support the patient and the family. So I would, I would be careful of generalizing 5% of palliative care is ineffective. I would be careful of saying that. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative. I don't see any other questions, Dr. Wu, so thank you very much for your time today. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you for being here. Um, next is Andre Sofair, followed by Phyllis Roth. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Chair, and I apologize I couldn't get in the first time. Um, my name is Andre Sofair. I'm a physician, and I'm from Bethany. I'm a general internist and I'm a professor of medicine at the Yale School of Medicine, and I'm speaking only on my own behalf and not as a representative of the school. Over my 35-year career, I've cared for tens of thousands of patients in both inpatient and outpatient settings, practicing in a wide variety of settings, both urban and rural, domestic and international. And although physician-assisted death is now legal in many states, the idea greatly concerns me. To be clear, so-called safeguards exist. I won't go through them. I've read the bill, and I know the safeguards in other states. But why am I concerned? In my entire career, I've only had one patient ask me to give them medications to help them take their own life. He was a gentleman in his mid-60s. He was a veteran at the West Haven VA Hospital. He had metastatic lung cancer and was concerned over having pain that he could not tolerate. The word compassion means to suffer with. When I sat with this gentleman and I assured him that I would be with him through the process and would help alleviate his pain, the request to end his life went away. Common reasons for a request to end of life, as you all know, include loss of dignity or self-control, 
or that the activities of daily living are not enjoyable, and for some concern regarding intractable pain. However, as Dr. Wu also mentioned, with advances in palliative, psychiatric, and hospice care, both in hospital and at home, I simply do not myself see patients who die under these circumstances. Empirically even, if you look at Oregon, in 46% of patients where palliative interventions were made, they rescind the request. And what about the aforementioned safeguards and how well they work? I realize that the committee wanted us to focus on the bill at hand, but we have empiric data from other states and countries to help guide us. If we look at the longstanding Dutch example, which of course allows both access to physician-assisted suicide and euthanasia, 60% of cases were not reported to authorities, 50% did not have required consultations, and 25% of patients who have given a lethal injection did not request euthanasia. The references are all in my submitted testimony. A paper this year entitled looking at uh, patients with elderly syndromes uh, described 53 cases in the Netherlands who were put to death for non-life-threatening conditions, including visual impairment, hearing loss, chronic fatigue, incontinence, or recurrent falls. And in our own Oregon, only 5% of patients who requested physician-assisted suicide had a documented psychiatric consultation. Why is all of this important? First, because I think it shows that safeguards do not work to encourage expert diagnoses and care in order to prevent more widespread medical assisted killing when good medical care could, be, could alleviate the suffering that the patients have. Secondly, because of the concern that patients who are not able to administer lethal medications would be treated differently than those who can. And hence, if physician assisted death were to become legal in our state, it might encourage the legalization of euthanasia to quote, protect those individuals who cannot take oral medications on their own. And lastly, because we do not consider the families and the impact on them. A Swiss study showed that 20% of relatives of patients who died following assisted suicide in that country demonstrated either full or partial post-traumatic stress disorder and 16% had symptoms of depression. This was higher than the rate in the general population who suffered a natural loss. And this works both ways. In Oregon, 30 patients requested physician-assisted death because they felt to be a burden on others. So legalizing physician-assisted death in our own state would be the wrong step in a perilous direction and would make patients suspicious of our intentions at the exact time that they need us most. So in closing, I would quote from Dr. Francis Peabody in 1927, a Boston physician who wrote, one of the most essential qualities of the clinician is interest in humanity and in caring for the patient. What our patients and families need, in the words of Dr. Diane Meyer, is a meaningful and connected human connection, not two grams of secobarbital. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Representative Clarity Dietria. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Doctor, for your testimony today. I just have one question. Do you feel that we have adequate palliative care here in the state of Connecticut? I would say that it really very much depends on who the physicians are. It's like the same thing, do you get an adequate diagnosis? It depends on whom you see. So I don't know the data on the state of Connecticut, but I would say probably palliative care is variable depending on what hospital you're in and where you are, who's taking care of you. So I think it's probably not adequate for, for a number of uh, patients that are being cared for. And okay, so and do you feel in your experience when people have palliative care, that they, are, that they can get to the point where they're completely pain-free and not suffering? A minute. All I can do is speak on my own behalf. You know, I had a conversation with a palliative care physician just this morning about that and asked her if she, and this is what she does for a living, has she seen patients that have requested physician-assisted death? And she said no. So I would say in my experience, patients can be made pain-free with the appropriate therapy. And of course, this may have been discussed earlier, I haven't listened to all the testimony, but there is the idea of, of double intent where you give patients adequate pain medication that may hasten their death, but the primary intent is not to kill them, the primary intent is to keep them comfortable. And so my experience has been that that kind of care works. Okay, thank you very much for your testimony. Thank you, Madam thank you. Chair. Thank you, Representative. Thank you very much, Doctor. I don't see any other questions. Thanks for being with us today. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Um, next is Phyllis Ross, followed by Jennifer Berludi. Ms. Ross, are you there? Go right ahead. 
you're on mute. Ms. Ross, you're on mute. All right, can you hear me now? I can hear you now, go right ahead. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon, members of the Public Health Committee. I'm Phyllis Ross of Lyme, and I'm here to speak in favor of HB 6425. I prepared a three minute statement, but I decided I'm not going to read it. I've been sitting here since nine o'clock. Uh, I have been moved by most of the testimony. <clears throat> Instead, I am going to address some of the comments that have been made, speaking from my heart. And um, I, I am speaking primarily to those of you who are undecided. As Representative Clarita Steve said, she's been struggling with this on a personal and professional level and I imagine others have as well. One of my heroes today is Representative Foster, and I don't know whether she's for the bill or not, but she really came up with some very insightful comments. She said that she has been at numerous hearings on this bill over the years, and she says that uh, in listening to the opposition, she has questioned some of the things that they said, and she has asked a number of them, quite a few of them, I gather from her comments, please send me the evidence, the information that your statements and opposition are based on. And she said none of them ever responded to her giving the information behind what they said. Um, I also want to point out that the previous speaker before me, um, gave empiric data and mentioned a lot of reasons why he thought you should not vote for this bill. But if you listen carefully, you would have realized that none of those things apply to this bill that we are looking at. Um, I want to deal a little bit more um, with the opponents and what they've said. As I pointed out so far, there's, there's been no evidence to support their negative comments about this. We have 23 years experience from Oregon. And if you look at the nine states and the District of Columbia, the number of years each of these states has had now with this bill, I added it up and it comes to 70 years of experience we have. And from this 70 years of experience, there have been no legal problems, no abuses, no successful challenges, and no instance of coercion found. This is the day that we have. This is the experience that you really must keep in mind when evaluating this. Um, I also want to underscore that a number of people today have referred to the Equidiac poll taken on um, medical aid and dying in 2015. And what they came up with was that you hit your three minute mark if you wouldn't mind oh, considering. I'm sorry, I, I can't continue. Um, on the written statements I made, you, you can find some of these things. Also the list of states that, are, that have legislation and the list of organizations that support it. I wish I had more time, but I urge you, please, you have the right to make a very important decision. Please vote in favor of HB 6425. Thank you very much, Ms. Ross. Thank you for taking your time to give us some testimony today. We appreciate it. I don't see any questions. Um, next is Ted Smithy, followed by Bill Brewer. Mr. Mr. Tamiki? Uh, yes, can you hear me? I can. Thank you so much for being here. Go right ahead. Uh, thank you. Good afternoon, Public Health Committee. I'm Father Ted Tamiki. I am a pastor, moral theologian, canon lawyer, and family member who did watch my parents decline and go through the dying process. I also serve on the ethics committee of Bacchus Hospital in Norwich. I live in Jewett City, Griswold, and I am speaking against House Bill 6425. I am representing myself and have submitted written testimony. Today, I am focusing on public policy and medical practice concerns. A few years ago, I said that you may not win me on this issue, but I want a good law, 
and that still holds true. This bill will not be good law, and actually I think this version is worse than previous ones. Owners of healthcare facilities and beneficiaries of imminent inheritances can be witnesses to requests for prescription drug overdoses, which can too easily lead to encouragement for the patient to die sooner and save money, or leave money and resources for the beneficiaries. In addition, leftover drugs could be sold and are used to create more potent versions of street drugs in the ongoing opioid and drug crisis. Why is there still no oversight for dispensing lethal, lethal dosages and collecting leftover amounts of deliberately lethal amounts of medication? The, bill the present bill requires that the death certificate be falsified. I note that the Connecticut Division of Criminal Justice expounds on this point. Proponents argue that this bill will be like the Oregon law. It will not be. One thing the Oregon law has that the Connecticut bill does not is a requirement for an annual report of what is going on. In other words, accountability, however minimal. Do you not want accountability? And now one of the, one of the medical practice concerns. COVID has changed everything and we will never be the same again. At the beginning of this pandemic, discussions were had in ethical circles and ethics committees of how to treat people with scarce resources and who gets those scarce resources? Who gets the ventilator? If this bill passes, do requests for aid in dying and subsequent possession of lethal medication become factors in determining whether or not the qualified patient receives scarce medical resources? Could such a qualified medical patient be denied scarce medical resources? Maybe. In light of this, this bill effectively creates two classes of people those who have lives worth living and thus are worth defending and treating, and those whose lives are no longer worth living and thus are not worth defending and treating. I ask you to please vote against this bill. Thank you, Father, for your testimony. Senator Summers. Yes, good afternoon, Father Tamiki. Nice to see you. I had a couple questions, seeing as you are in the Ethics Committee of Bacchus Hospital, as well as um, a canon lawyer. Do you, we heard earlier from some clinicians, one was actually a cardiologist, that he was very concerned on the Oregon law because there was no way to actually account for or to prove that there was a witness there at the time of taking these medications. And um, I'm concerned about that as far as Number one, you'd be having a clinician write a prescription that we've heard is off label and that is not indicated for suicide. And then you would have this um, cocktail of medications that may be taken then six months later, or sometimes we heard up to three years later and no witness to when and how it was taken, which could lead to all kinds of um, uncompromising situations. Could you speak to that at all? Um, I agree with that. As a matter of fact, you look in the Oregon uh, Death with Dignity reports uh, over the years, and they indicate that um, it's roughly a third of all the patients have not taken the medications. Um, so what happens with that medications? The other question that comes to mind more directly to your uh, point or your question is that is correct. It just dispenses the medication and you don't, they don't know what happens to it. They indicate in their report that they, for a lot of these instances, they don't have data as to what happened. Did someone give the patient the medications? Um, did, uh, were there complications? Um, what also is intriguing is that if there are complications and the patient comes, uh, resuscitates um, and then dies, um, they are not counted as a death with dignity death. So in other words, they're only counting successes, whatever that may be. Um, so if you're not counting your losses, then are we getting a real number? And I would ultimately say no. The other question, and it's one that concerns me because um, Kim Callan uh, of Compassion and Choice has pointed out that pushing a plunger on a feeding tube, that is a direct quote of what she said, pushing a plunger on a feeding tube is an act of self-determination. Well, who put the feed food in the feeding tube? Did the patient do that? Did somebody else do it? Did they put something else in the feeding tube? Did they add something to the food against the patient's will? We don't know. 
Yeah, and I'm glad that you brought up the COVID issue because that is really concerning to me. That's one of the first things that I thought of at this time um, to hear this bill when we have so so many that have um, you know passed away in our nursing homes, et cetera. And we talked about um, you know when resources become scarce, um, and and I am I am also really concerned about the fact we heard earlier from clinicians that um, you know some of these doctors that have decided to enter into this market are creating cocktails that are not approved. So sometimes they work and sometimes they don't. Um, and I'm also concerned, we heard these medications are sedatives and um, medications that cause arrhythmia and make your heart stop. What happens to those medications if they are not accounted for and they're out in the community um, you know, people could be inadvertently receiving these without us having any idea what's going on. And, um, and that is, is also very concerning. And as somebody who's on the ethics committee of Bacchus Hospital and clearly a, um, a person of faith, have you experienced um, people at their end stage, whether they can be kept comfortable and how they feel about the control they have over their own um, you know, life's end. Can you speak to that for us? Um, I have um, certainly encountered people who are at the end stage of life. Um, some who were, most of whom were very comfortable. Um, I have seen some that were unconscious at the end stage of life and some and their family members just insist on using every means possible to keep them alive and at that point i try to coax them to say look the body is shutting down let it follow its natural process um in terms of end of life in terms of if i look at my own mother where her when her when she was in the dying process um she was very lucky in the sense that um she had enough pain medication. Um, as a matter of fact, my mother always had a high threshold of pain. And um, even after surgery, if they gave her 40 pain pills, she took one, maybe two. At the end of her life, it was the same way. The week before she passed, my brother said, by the way, they just increased mom's morphine dosage and she's now up to a regular dose. And I kind of uh, chuckled at that and said, even when she's dying, she's that way. Um, one of the things which I have noticed, though, with uh, people um, at the end stage is that sometimes we actually make the process of dying worse in the sense that as the body is shutting down, we keep insisting on doing everything possible, not everything morally possible, but everything possible in a futile attempt to keep the person going. Uh, for example, if, the, if there was one instance that I was aware of where um, the body was shutting down, the feeding tube popped out, they held it in with tape, but then they, when it popped out again, they put it back in. And of course, the skin had come off the first time, so now they're taping it to muscle or tissue underneath. At that point, it's like, let's look at the signs, let's let the patient go. Um, also, when you had mentioned COVID, if I might, unless you have another question. No, I, 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 was, I do, but go ahead. Um, with COVID, here is what happened. And I never thought that in the United States of America, we would ever face shortages of medical supplies. We were discussing what would we do, because we were hearing situations in Italy where they didn't have enough equipment. What do we do? And one of the things is if you have two COVID patients, who gets, when you have one ventilator, who gets it? There was another possibility and it was definitely something that could happen as it was happening elsewhere. Thankfully, not to my knowledge in Bacchus Hospital in Connecticut, but you could end up having to take a ventilator off of a patient to give to a patient with a better prognosis. And it's not just a COVID patient, it could be a patient without COVID who's do you take the ventilator off that patient to give to a coded patient with better uh, prognosis. That created a pit in my stomach because you've created an impossible choice between it for a physician or, or healthcare people deciding between those two people. My concern in light of this bill, and I really put this in there, 
is that could the request and um, a request for aid in dying and subsequent possession of lethal medication become a factor in determining whether or not the qualified patient, the term in the law, receives scarce medical resources? And could such a qualified patient be denied scarce medical uh, resources based on the reception and the possession of the lethal medication? And I can't say, no, we can't do that, or no, we would not do that. Uh, the best I can say is maybe that would be a consideration. This is something none of us ever saw because, and this is something that's effective COVID and proponents, opponents, none of us saw the COVID coming, but it effectively has turned everything upside down, thrown everything off kilter. And now that's another added thing. Are we down, are we getting to the point and starting on a slippery slope at that point of denying care towards those who have, who are dying simply because they've chosen this medication. Mm -hmm. And I can't, I can't give a definitive answer either way. Um, my follow-up question would be as somebody who's on the uh, board of ethics for a hospital, you know, part of Hartford Healthcare, um, how do you feel about what's in this bill where the death, the death certificate would not really reflect the cause of death? that is concerning to me. And secondly, with the clinicians that you've dealt with, how do you ask them to advocate for life and then advocate for death? Um, okay, the first part of that was uh, falsification of the death certificate. When I actually brought this up at an ethics committee meeting after the last public hearing on this, they were appalled. They couldn't believe that they would be required to falsify a death certificate. And so that they were appalled. Um, that is a huge concern for me because you're going out and saying, okay, it's not a death by suicide, even though in the consent form, in the form, it says I expect to die as a result of taking the medication. It doesn't say I expect to take the medication and die as a result of the underlying illness. Instead, it's a very clear um, falsification of uh, death, records, death certificates. How are you ever going to investigate if there's an abuse or a murder when the record is fraudulent, purposely so. And that's something that uh, the Connecticut Division of the Criminal Justice points out in their testimony, their written testimony. How on earth can you do this? You're impeding an investigation at that point. Um, it also provides cover, as I pointed out in previous testimony and also in my written testimony, it provides a cover to give the patient the medication against their will. They may have the medication, decide not to, but some, not to take it and choose to die a natural death, but somebody else could uh, speed up the process, give them the medication, especially if they have a feeding tube from based upon what I was hearing. Um, so that's, that's, so it could cover for that. The other thing is, is that we look back in history, there have been other instances in other countries earlier in time where the cause of death was purposely uh, falsified. And as a result, that country today still does not want to go down the part, the, the course of euthanasia and physician-assisted suicide. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. I think my last question was how, how on, on your board of ethics can you ask your physicians to both advocate for life and then advocate for death in this case? Um, in terms of that you're prescribing this personally, I can't. <laughs> um, I don't know how others could because again, the problem is, is that um, you're saying that you're caring for the patient and yet even in the bill it says, no, you're gonna give medication so the patient can die by their own hand. So how can you say, yes, we want you to care for this patient. We want to encourage you to do care for this patient, to do everything you can to help this patient. Oh, but by the way, give them a lethal dosage so they can commit suicide. I don't see how you could do that. Thank you very much for your testimony. I know others have questions. Uh, Representative Kennedy. Thank you, Madam Chair. 
and I will be quick because they're going to run a microgrid test in my office. So I'm going to lose all kinds of power here. <laughs> so um, Father Tamiki, thank you so much for being with us. Uh, following up just really quickly on um, something uh, Summer, Senator Summers had test, uh, touched on and that also that you had testified in 2018 that there were um, 2018 prescriptions that were prescribed and 21 of those prescriptions, they still don't know what happened to those. So accountability and an annual report is very concerning and I hope we can put some type of language into the bill if this moves forward. Um, my, my other question was, um, do you foresee in a real life situation in which um, aid in dying or assisted suicide would be a factor in determining the process of medical care in general? I can't say a definitive yes, but I can't say no either. Okay. Because uh, in light of this COVID situation, if you're talking about a shortage of medical resources, then it can happen. Okay. And here's the other thing too, is that even now as we're dealing with COVID and the last uptick of cases, um, you had hospitals in this country that were being overwhelmed, but others that were not. So you could say it's a general practice here that, okay, we're still caring for everybody, but at a hospital where there's a shortage, it may be very different. And I think, and I will say, I'll also add, the fact that I cannot issue a definitive answer either way is, is something I'm struggling with. Because I want to say, sure, there'll be no problem. But I, and based upon experience, I cannot rule it out. I, I and at this point, I would say, where our, our frontline healthcare workers are going through so much now with COVID, to add this factor on top of it by legalizing this bill, this is not, no, not, not now, definitely. I'd hope not never, but especially now. And actually, you just raised, that's a very good point, because our frontline uh, workers are struggling very much so. Um, with the number of deaths they've, and so to put um, this bill, which, you know, whether you agree with it or not at this point, I just think it's, it, the timing isn't very good. I just have one last question, Madam Chair, um, through you to uh, Doc, um, Father Tamiki. Do you think that the passage in just of this aid in dying assisted suicide, would it make it harder to persuade teens not to commit suicide? We're really seeing a lot with teen suicide right now. And so, I, I just find that concerning. I wondered if you could just comment on that. Um, I think it would. If you have a teenager who has lost two very close grandparents in the midst of COVID, lost a pet that they had from being a toddler, and then lost a second pet, they're struggling with tremendous amounts of loss. And yes, they could even say and write things such as I questioned everything because why do anything when the people you love and care about are just going to die anyway, what is the point? Yeah. And in some ways, isn't that what we're saying with people at the end of life seeking uh, aid in dying? Isn't that what they're saying? What's the point with prolonging the suffering? Well, you have teenagers feeling that way. And you're gonna say, well, you're not at the end of your life. Well, the problem is, is try to break through that when they automatically see, they're not going to, they're not going to understand that it's okay, it's aid and dying and all of this, whatever right. we call it, they're still going to see it as assisted suicide, whatever anybody calls it, they're still going to see that. Yeah. And so how do they break through that? And as people have pointed out that in um, Oregon, that we're seeing what a 40%, 42% increase in suicides rates since they've legalized this. The problem is, is that yeah, is that, well, there's lots of problems with this, but I don't see it getting easier to try to, to encourage somebody to look beyond the loss, look beyond it, ending the pain. And that's what other people have said today. They want to, they will choose suicide to, or death by suicide. I'll stand corrected on that. They choose death by suicide to end the pain. And yet that's what we're being told is the reason for having aid and dying is to end the pain. So I would say it's gonna make it more difficult Thank you so much for your um, very candid answers. Uh, Father Tamiki, I wish you well. Thank you again for being here and thank you, Madam Chair.
Thank you, Representative. Representative Domingo. Th thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Father Ted. It's good to see you again. Um, you, you, uh, you always give us something to think about and, and, and th th today is no exception. So thank you. Um, so so I, I, uh, and I, I probably should know better than to ask questions of someone who's an expert in canon law such as yourself, but I'm gonna take a chance anyhow. So I'm gonna ask you the same question that I asked a previous testifier much earlier today. Um, uh, several people have, have, you know, including yourself, uh, uh, have used the phrase choosing death or choosing death by suicide. Wouldn't it be more accurate to say in the case of someone who has a terminal diagnosis and is at the end stage of their life, wouldn't it be more accurate to say that, that mother nature has chosen death? Not that this patient has chosen death. Mother nature has made that choice already. And, and the, this individual is just uh, trying to trying to um, um, uh, uh, massage the timing or m massage the 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 circumstances, but that choice of death uh, that's already been made. I'm curious to hear your your reaction to that. Um, well, first of all, Avery, it's nice to see you as well. Um, and uh, yes, we always have a good conversation on this. Um, the terminology. Um, you do have a dying process. And yes, when we look through the dying process, there are things that uh, we can see that there are signs, the various organs and systems start to shut down. The challenge though, is that I go back to what we're actually describing here. And that is you're not, the natural process is going on. But I also go back to the, the root of the word suicide which is that it's self-murder, self-kill, suicide, homicide, fratricide, whichever. The point is it's the person killing themselves. It's the person dying by their own hand. And that's where it even says, and um, let me see if I can pull this out, um, but um, I have my notes all over the place here. Um, but it is one of the questions um, where it says that I understand, and this is in the bill, it says, I understand the full import of this request and I expect to die if and when I take the medication to be dispensed or prescribed. You're, ex you're not saying you expect to die of the underlying Ill illness and that wouldn't help matters anyway. The fact of the matter is, is that it's the medication that's causing the death. It's the drug overdose that's causing the death. As much as you could say you're trying to hasten this, the problem is, is that it's not the underlying, that, that's not the underlying cause of death. The problem with the challenge or what's happening is that it's the medication, it's the overdose. And the other reason is, is because, and I would add to that, is simply that as people have indicated, when people undergo this process, that they have to take a medication that suppresses the urge to uh, throw up or vomit. And the, that's a natural reaction. Now, why would the stomach suddenly say, let's throw up everything? It's because the body's natural response is that it's responding to this large amount of poison effectively because it's a drug overdose. It's too much. It's overwhelming the system. And so we want to get rid of the natural response is to get rid of it. So I would say, again, yeah, I mean, it's, I would say, no, I think that's, um, that um, listing the underlying, uh, excuse me, that um, no, it's the medication that's causing this. And so to say that it's well, nature taking its course, I would disagree with that. Okay, I, I, I appreciate that. I don't know that I agree with it, but I, I appreciate your explanation. Uh -huh. <laughs> and, and, and of course you anticipated my next question, which will be my final question. Um, um, uh, so, so we heard testimony from, from a, a physician earlier uh, today uh, on, on just that issue about the underlying cause of death. And, 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 and uh, she testified that, that, that the death certificate, rather than, rather than um, characterizing the rather than characterizing it as the falsification of the death certificate, that, that what, what, you, what the death certificate is, is really, tr the information that, that, that really rightly should be on there is the underlying cause of, of, of the death rather than the manner or the details of the death. Would, mm -hmm. would, would you say, would, would you give any credence to that? Um, 
I mean, I, I again, I would say that I don't think it's the, the, the illness is not the underlying cause of death. The other reason that it is a huge cause of concern for this is if you're going to be determining whether or not this is successful by what's on the death certificate, how are you going to know which deaths are which to investigate to verify that this is supposedly safe if you don't know which ones are assisted suicides and which ones are not because you don't have the true cause of death? And somebody else had said, well, why not put something else added to it so it's like death by suicide or Aiden dying or whatever. The question is, how can we say that there's no abuse if you're taking away the very means by which you would investigate any possible abuse and hold people accountable? So I'm saying, no, this is this, that whole thing, it's fraught with a lot of um, issues and problems. Okay, thank you again. You <laughs> always give us food for thought. I appreciate it, Father Ted. And thank you. And I, I also reiterate what I said to you a few years ago. It's like, look, you may not win me on this issue, but I still want good law. Whatever that law is, I want it to be a good law and a solid and, law and well-written. As, as do we all. As do we all. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Madam You're Chair. Well. Thank you very much, Representative. And thank you, Father, for your testimony. I don't see any other questions. Thank okay. you for being here. Um, next, we have... Reverend Douglas Perry, followed by Jason Smith, I believe, but Reverend Perry, go right ahead. Chairs and uh, members of the committee, I'm Reverend Douglas Kenneth Perry, humanist celebrant and minister, age 78. When I was a kid, I was raised as a conservative Protestant Christian, and uh, they would not have approved of this. And uh, they, I'm here in support of House Bill 6425. I've been a humanist and a uh, Unitarian. For Sorry, Reverend Douglas, you're muted. Somebody who spoke up in yep. 1974, I observed my father, Kenneth, die slowly in great pain and usually drugged to oblivion from prostate cancer spread to his bones. He looked like a concentration camp victim. I have worked as a chaplain in hospitals, been with dying patients and watched my father, my wife, my two sisters and other family members die of cancer. I do not want to force anyone to die who doesn't want to die. I only want the best for all humanity. I don't want to influence anyone to die, but I want the dying, including myself in the future, to have the right to shorten the dying period to avoid pain and lingering distress and vegetating. I respect everyone's right not to choose to die. I respect those who fear being killed, but I know no one who fights for the right to die who want to kill people. Everyone has a right to choose what they want, and the dying need to have that choice. Please vote for House Bill 6425. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony and for being here with us tonight. I don't see any questions, so have a good evening. Um, next is Jason Smith, followed by Megan Schrader. Uh, maybe Mr. Smith is not with us, so we'll go to Megan Schrader. Schrader. Go ahead, Ms. Schrader, you're on mute. Can you hear me now and can you see yep. me? We can hear All you, right. yep, and see you, go right ahead. How are you doing? Good, thank you. Thank you, okay. Um, I'm reading this testimony I'm going to put my headphones back in because it's easier for me to hear you. All right. I, I think I'm ready now. Is that all right? All right. I am testifying in opposition to HB 6425 because my experience as a mentally ill person has shown me that the assisted suicide aid and dying movement 
is an instrument of both suicide contagion and trauma for the disabled community. Hence, after observing news of this hearing on Facebook, I consulted with my psychiatrist and got his go ahead to testify today. The practice of assisted suicide is increasingly visible to people who live with suicidal ideation. As a disabled person who is often isolated, I use social media for socialization, professional connections, and activism that is totally unrelated to this issue. Even though concerns about my mental health caused me to step away from this issue in 2016 and I stopped following Twitter accounts that addressed it specifically, the issue of assisted suicide has remained a part of my world. A Twitter account I previously followed for socialization once retweeted in an article arguing, arguing for assisted suicide for mentally ill people on Suicide Prevention Day. In 2017, I was out eating at a restaurant and the people behind me were assisted suicide proponents discussing strategy. That's their right, but they are poisoning our culture. My interactions on Twitter have also made me aware of the imminent passage, sorry. I, okay, of Bill C-7, a bill in Canada that would legalize assisted suicide for people with severe mental illnesses and intractable disabilities. Canadian disability rights activists who are fighting that legislation have compared the experience to being raped. Canada is our cultural cousin and the expansion of assisted suicide in that country will inevitably impact its application here. I am aware of the American Association of Suicidality's position on this issue. Nevertheless, as a mentally ill person who has lost family members to violent suicides and terminal illness, that distinction does not match my reality. During a hospitalization in 2015, a mental health counselor told me that people with intractable mental illnesses like mine should have the right to assisted suicide. Later in 2016, I exhausted several treatments geared toward alleviating severe depression and one of them scrambled my brain. I lost all cognitive capacities and screamed animalistically for several months while a voice described my eventual torments in hell. It was my psychiatric 9-11 and as far as anyone knew, conventional psychiatry would never make me any better. I begged God to, end, to let me die and a family member who was caring for me vomited. If a dog were behaving as I were, one would indeed end its life out of compassion. Hence, on behalf of other people living with severe psychiatric disabilities, I feel obligated to highlight the fact that since 2014, articles positing that mentally ill people who are not dying should have the right to commit assisted suicide have appeared in the Washington Post, BBC, PBS, the New York Times, and several other highly visible news forums. For instance, one article from the Washington Post in 2015 posited, should people with acute mental suffering have the right to die? All of these pieces were published within days of terminally ill cancer patient Brittany Menard's death, indicating that cultural enthusiasm for what proponents call aid in dying for terminally ill patients is a conduit of ex expansion. Even the satire website, The Onion, published Sorry, a piece uh, for me. You, you hit your three-minute mark, if you wouldn't mind concluding your remarks. Okay. Um, yes, uh, I only have... Yeah, I have like one more paragraph. Should I just finish it up that way? Go right ahead. Okay. Even the satire website, The Onion, published a piece framing assisted suicide in respect to chronic illness. And the assisted suicide movement's rhetoric is responsible for this, no matter what they intend. The consequences of assisted suicide are not comparable to those of abortion, gay marriage, or contraception. In the context of assisted suicide's role uh, in impacting our cultural climate, limiting this bill to people with terminal illnesses is a moot point. Regardless of what country or state we live in, we are all part of one human community in which individual actions have a butterfly effect. I have one more paragraph. Nope, okay. Uh, you okay, got it? Go ahead, can you wrap it up? Yes, absolutely. Okay. I Thank sympathize you. with suffering people who want to pass HB 6425 and support their unfettered access to any other intervention that would manage their pain. Nevertheless, inevitably putting disabled people in a position of second-class citizenship in respect to suicide prevention is the ultimate act of subjugation. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony, Megan. Really appreciate it. Um, I just want to be clear. I understand uh, your arguments, but I want to be clear that this particular bill is very narrowly focused on people who have a six-month terminal illness prognosis. So I'm I just want to assure you of that. So thank you. Um, I don't see any other questions, so thank you so much for being here and giving us much to think about. Oh, excuse Madam, me, one Madam minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait one minute, Megan. Uh, sure. Representative yeah. Best, go ahead. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair and, and Megan. Uh, 
I am really impressed that you were able to share your personal experiences with us and tell us how much this impacts you. And where is the bill, in theory, is supposed to be dealing with terminal illness? One of the reasons why people are concerned about this is it may affect other people who are disabled, including the mentally disabled. And I can assure you, for one, uh, that is neither the intention nor is it something that uh, I would hope none of us would ever support. I, if anything, I totally I, I get would that. Rather, if anything, I would rather, Megan, work on the uh, mental health system and try and help people help themselves. But for sure, uh, this is something that we're keenly aware of, and I'm really glad you brought it to our attention. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you so much for your testimony today and for taking You're the welcome. time here with us. Thank you. Um, next is John Kelly, followed by John Levin. Yes, hi. Uh, my name is John Kelly. I'm the director of Second Thoughts Massachusetts, Disability Rights Advocates Against Assisted Suicide. We are disabled progressives united in defense of our lives from assisted suicide bills like HB 6425. We support our sister group, Second Thoughts Connecticut, in stressing the dangers of codifying in law the prejudice that some disabled people are better off dead. Today is my birthday. I am turning 63, and it's been 37 years since an accident left me paralyzed below the shoulders. I love my life. It is full of meaning and connection and I am privileged to be able to work part-time as a disability rights advocate. And yet I have seen over the years that basic aspects of my life, such as depending on people who care for me and my body, according to my direction, cause some people to shrink in horror at a life they imagine to be worse than death. The problem is that people holding this prejudice generally recognized as the predominantly white, wealthier educated classes are, are powerful opinion makers who dominate the professions, including journalism and the media, social workers, legislatures, the judiciary, and increasingly medicine. Assisted suicide proponents insist that the program is for people dying in excruciating pain but even a superficial look shows something very different. As the bioethicist said early, earlier, the top five reasons all have to do with the disabling aspects of people's serious illness. And the, the proponents say that people should have the autonomy to decide when their suffering is too much. But when all the suffering is about people becoming dependent on others, on losing so-called autonomy. I feel like I have all the autonomy in the world. I live independently. And yes, I direct people to take care of me, but it's only this one group of people, the, these upper classes that want to have the state intervene and say that feeling like a burden, depending on others for care, needing help toileting are acceptable reasons to die. And we cannot ignore the massive societal prejudice against people with disabilities. I can't count the number of movies I've seen that create me as a poster boy for a life that would be better off dead, such as the movie Me Before You, Million Dollar Baby, um, Whose Life Is It Anyway? the sea inside, and the, uh, the prejudice of, um, you know, many people proposing this is that um, so, it's no sorry, longer yeah. living. You hit your three minute mark if you wouldn't mind concluding your remarks. Okay, I would just say that under this bill, innocent people would lose their lives through misdiagnosis, insurance company denial, untreated depression, uh, systemic racism and ableism, and there's no safeguard that can be enacted or even proposed 
that would um, solve this problem. As Second Thoughts Connecticut leader Kathy Ludlam said, there is no safeguard for the crushing prejudice against people living with disabilities. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, Mr. Kelly, and happy birthday. Thank you for joining us on your birthday. Thank you. Um, seeing no questions, thank you for your testimony. Um, next is John Levin. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, go right ahead. Great. Hi, my name is John Levin and I live in Norwalk. Thank you for this opportunity today. I know my time is short, so I will just tell you the story of my dad because I think it will help you understand why this legislation is needed and wanted by so many people in our state. My mom and dad lived together as a married couple in their home in Los Angeles. My dad was a retired pediatrician who practiced medicine for over 40 years. In his 80s, he had a series of strokes that led to a very significant decline in the quality of his life. Combined with type two diabetes, renal failure, heart disease, obesity, and many functional declines, which I will not describe here, but which I think you can reasonably guess are part of the panoply of afflictions that come with advanced age and declining health. His life was very challenging. He was bedridden and he required nearly 24 hour care. My dad was the same person, however. He loved watching movies on TV and he loved watching baseball. He also knew what was happening to his body and he knew things only would get worse. He also is a person that suffered from anxiety all his life and he was deeply fearful of experiencing an extended painful and horrific death. He wanted to have the ability to take medicine that would end his life quickly and painlessly if he felt he needed to. This was before California's End of Option Life Act, a law very similar to HB 6425 before the committee now. As a doctor, he knew this medicine existed. He had been, it had been used by others and was effective. And he felt strongly that he should have it in case he decided that he needed to use it. My dad begged his doctors, as well as his still practicing physician friends to provide him with a prescription or alternatively to give him any other way the drugs, um, to give him any other way the drugs that he could use to keep for himself and use if he felt he needed. Barred by law, they all refused. He grew frustrated and more anxious. In every conversation with my sister and me, dad demanded that we do what his doctors and friends would not, get him drugs that we knew would end his anxiety about controlling his end of life, and it, even if he never chose to use them. This persisted and persisted. During one visit, as the same conversation continued, dad begged me to drive to Tijuana, across the border in Mexico, to go to the dog track there, find the veterinarian, and offer to pay him cash for some of the medicine used to euthanize injured dogs. I was astounded our family had come to this point, but I wanted to be a dutiful son, ease his anxiety, and help him. I made that trip. When I finally got to the dog track and sought out the veterinarian, I explained to him my dad's situation and the purpose of my visit. He was the warmest, kindest man, and he was very sympathetic to our plight and to my request, but he refused to do so, both for legal reasons <clears throat> and because he insisted that was the role for my dad's doctors, and they should be willing to help him. I thanked him, and I returned home unsuccessful and empty-handed. My dad was disappointed and continued to ask me and my sister to plead with his doctors for the medicine he was asking for. Eventually, California passed its law in 2015, which became effective the very next year. For my dad, the problem was solved. His anxiety, at least over this issue, vanished after he spoke to his doctors and he knew that he would have the option available to him. You hit your three minute mark if you would mind concluding your remarks. Okay, let me, let me wrap it up. Um, you know, uh, his anxiety vanished. My dad's physical condition did continue to get worse. My sister and I were amazed, uh, but he lived on for years after that. Uh, eventually he went into hospice. He lived to see his beloved uh, Cubs win the, um, the World Series for the first time in his life. And he was very old. Uh, he lived to see the Los Angeles Dodgers win the World Series. Um, but uh, he lived at peace knowing that the option was available to him. So my point really is this law is, is not just for the benefit of the terminally ill that are enduring excruciating pain, but it's also for the living who like my dad want, want to live, but just don't want to be forced to endure protracted, protracted pain and suffering at the end. 
Now I ask the members of this committee to grant to me and to every other adult resident of our state the same kind of peace of mind and respect that comes with the rights granted to terminally ill patients under this bill. Please advance HB 6425 to the legislature and let the people's elected representatives decide if it will pass. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Levin. Thank you for coming today. I don't see any questions. Thank you for your testimony. Um, next, we will hear from Tali Miller, followed by Tessa Marquis. Tali, I know I saw you. You just need to unmute, Tali. One, one second, I think we have a duplicate computer going here. We can hear you. So, so, I'm here, this may be it. Can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you, go right ahead. Okay. Um, Yes. Okay. Um, and can you see me? Cannot see you. Okay. Well, I guess I'm just going to have to let that go because I don't want to take any more time. Oh, do you think it would show in this? How? I'm sorry for this. Hold on just a second. Okay. Okay, here we go. Sorry for the confusion. Um, Members of the committee, my name is Tolly Miller and I am testifying in support of HB 6425. This is my fifth time testifying for this legislation. I will um, share two personal stories for my support. First, some years ago, I attended the death of a dear African-American friend, Erlene. Erlene's death taught me that even the best palliative care is not always effective no matter what your race or class. After her diagnosis of kidney cancer, Arlene courageously lived her life as fully as possible, continuing her teaching and community work for as long as she could. As a primary caretaker in her last few months, I watched her pain increase to excruciating levels. A fine hospice program was involved and everything possible was done to alleviate her pain. However, once the cancer had spread to her bones, the pain simply could not be controlled. I held her hand often as she screamed in agony as her porous bones began to break when she moved in bed. She was taken to a hospital and given a direct line to bring pain meds to her as powerfully as possible. Still, she screamed and moaned through her last 48 excruciating hours of life. The experience was shattering. Even the hospice personnel acknowledge that there are cases where pain control is not possible. Her family and friends were distraught to watch Arlene succumb in such a horrific fashion. While I have tremendous respect for the hospice programs and palliative care staff I've worked with, I know that sometimes palliative care is not able to control the worst pain. We need this option of aid in dying as well as palliative care. And secondly, my beloved sister, Kate, recently succumbed to ALS. When she first got her diagnosis, we talked about what she would need to do to have some control over her own dying. We talked about moving to Vermont, but that's simply not a reasonable option when one's family, friends, and doctors are all close to home. She was tremendously courageous through her illness, even taking part in a cutting edge drug trial at Mass General but I know that she would have had much less stress and fear about her own dying process if Connecticut had had this legislation in place. I never want any of my loved ones or myself to face a painful terminal illness without autonomy in deciding when and how we want to die. We need options that include aid in dying when facing a painful end to life. Research shows that just having this option available reduces fear and anxiety for all patients, even those who choose in the end not to use it. More than seven in 10 Americans want this option. And by more than two to one, my fellow Connecticut citizens believe this choice should be in our own hands. 
I urge you to support this critical legislation in Connecticut. Thank you for your attention. And I, the only thing I would add is that I believe that um, ending prolonged suffering is also included in the Hippocratic Oath, and that should be included by the doctors who talked. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Miller, for your testimony. I do see a hand raised. Representative Betts. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Tali, for your testimony. And uh, I certainly understand your position and why you're supporting this. What I would be interested to hear is your response to all the people who, have, or to some of the people who have spoken to you before that are worried because they have disabilities or are mentally impaired. What would you say to them and the concerns they've raised if this bill is moved forward? What assurance or what, would you, what is your reaction to what they are uh, passionately opposing for this, with the same sincerity that you are using to uh, support the bill? Well, I really believe that this bill has adequate safeguards and it's really directed at certain people in the last six months of terminal illness. And it's not a slippery slope. It's a very specific bill. And I also believe that 20 years of experience of other states should be taken really seriously and not create, um, I guess, anxiety and concern where there really isn't a concern for it. Okay, um, I, I don't want to get into a prolonged debate, but do you see that they, if they were disabled, that they would have reason to be anxious, concerned about uh, their welfare uh, moving forward? If their parents, for example, both died and they were left in charge, uh, their care was left in charge of one of their siblings who had a family, a full-time you know, uh, load of responsibilities, could you not understand the stress that that would bring to that family and the fear it would bring to the person who's disabled? Yes, and actually over the five years that I've come to give testimony, I've had conversations with people in the dis disability community about this. I believe that, that the law has been changed over the years to add more safeguards to make it really clear that it would not affect disability community folks in the way that they're afraid of but I understand the concern for sure and respect it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Betts. Uh, Representative Steinberg. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you for your testimony today. I just wanna make sure I heard you correctly. Uh, a couple of hours ago, we heard from Dr. Gray. He spoke with great confidence that palliative care could deal with any pain situation that comes down the pike. And yet you described from your experiences that there was pain that could not be adequately managed even with our most modern uh, palliative care technologies today? Yes, and I believe other people have said this, but I believe at least 5% of cases, the pain is not able to be impacted even by the medications and methods that we have now. Um, and there may be more than 5%, but I've actually been there and witnessed that with the, one of the best hospice programs in Massachusetts, an excellent hospital, and they could not get her pain under control. And they acknowledged, we met with the staff after her death with the family, all the staff were there. We assured them that no one was interested in a lawsuit. We just wanted to talk because we were all so upset. And they were great. And they said, we have to acknowledge that this happens. This happens sometimes that we can't control pain. And we are really sorry that it happened to Arlene. Well, thank you for that. Uh, obviously, uh, not everybody's willing to acknowledge that. And even with our wonderful hospice and palliative care resources in the state, it's clear that we're leaving some people out in the, of that equation and not affording them of an option. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you, Ms. Miller. I see no more hands. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Tessa Marquis, followed by Barbara Jacobs. Okay, I'm just going to check. Can you hear me? Yes, go right ahead. Um, my name is Tessa Marquis. I'm a resident of Milford. Uh, I'm submitting testimony in favor of HB 6425, uh, Act Concerning Aid in Dying for Terminally, terminally Ill Patients. Uh, I wanted to start by saying good health to all of you, <laughs> to Senator Abrams and Representative Steinberg and all the members of the committee and those serving in the legislature. In addition, I'd like to express my appreciation to 
the representatives who co-sponsored this bill, Representative Elliott, Hennessy, Michelle, uh, Hughes, and Fresco. Um, I appreciate them uh, joining in. Um, I've, been, I've sent this uh, testimony by email to all of the committee members, as well as to the committee clerk. And the written testimony contains links to my testimony in previous years. So I'm going to try to summarize as best I can. I've been rewriting to try to shorten it, I assure you. So <laughs> um, overall, over all these years of attending these hearings, and especially today as well, um, I've learned that the disabled people in our community are very fearful of having their lives ended by their doctors, caregivers, and family without protection or personal choice. And I have to say that these are very strong people. I've met them and spoken to them and they don't retreat from a fight. They are activists, they have vulnerabilities others may not face. They have my respect and concern and it is tragic that they express distrust of their doctors, caregivers and family and feel so let down by those who should provide assistance and understanding. I'd like to assure these people they have nothing to fear from this bill, but I know my sympathy is neither trusted nor wanted. I understand why, but I'd like to break down the barrier by allowing safe, legal, cautious, reliable assistance for those of us who want to choose when and how to cease our suffering and pain. This is where we need to work together to get decent health care for all residents, to increase the, the training for compassionate care for our medical staff and for our professionals. To those with loved ones who are less able, I'm putting all this in quotes, I think you'll find we have more in common than shows on the surface. Let's work together today, offer relief from suffering when the end is inevitable and near and not before. Uh, as a small gesture of peace, between us, I offer some information on my brother who you can read about in my written testimony. He, um, he worked very closely with um, both autistic children and young adults who were physically incapacitated or in other ways in, not mainstreamed. So I believe strongly in conclusion that everyone must have equal access to the full range of end of life care options. Residents of Connecticut must be permitted to make end of life care decisions based on their own belief systems, on their culture and on their personal choice. We must all be allowed to pass from this existence without stress, pain, anger and any other harm Please do everything you can to pass an act concerning Aiden dying for turning it ill before the end of the 2021 legislative session. We owe this small thing to our terminally ill friends, family, and neighbors. And I want to thank you for your time. And I cut out a lot, but I'm ready to respond to any questions you might have. Thank you, Tessa. It's good to see you. you. Um, I do have a hand raised, Representative Betts. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. And Tessa, that was very impressive testimony and particularly your approach to trying to find common ground and, and fully understanding the fear that many people are worried about if this, if this bill passes. Um, do you happen to think that it's possible to write a law that will actually um, successfully address those fears and protect the people who are quite vulnerable. Do you think it's possible to do that? Or is this one of these challenges where, you know, there's no, no law that can be written that's going to satisfy everybody or deal with any kind of complex situation that arises? And the reason why I say that is I think the proponents and opponents should talk together with each other, but I'm just not convinced that laws are the way to be able to solve the problem. Do you agree with that? I like to think that laws solve the problem. Otherwise, why do we have a legislature? Um, in terms of the bill itself, I think that the bill does what it can do. In fact, I think for me, there's too many restrictions on it already. As we go through these 
this year and on and last year and possibly onward through the COVID pandemic and other pandemics, it's quite clear that we don't know what's going to happen. We don't have those kind of controls. When you travel to another state or when you travel even in the state, I don't carry my, my DNR with me. I have to assume that if someone runs me over with their car, I'll still have enough going on that I can say, do not resuscitate me. But there's no guarantee on that. And I know I have had close friends, in-laws, lots of people who died and people panicked and they called, they called 911 and the EMTs came and revived them after they'd already been dead for an hour and kept them on ice and other horrible, it, it's just terrible. And I'm afraid of being resuscitated and being any number of things that I don't wanna be and barely living and not living the life I wanna live. Now I've taken a protection by having a DNR myself, my own choice. I have a living will, I have a will, I have all those things. And I'm incredibly privileged. I have, a, I have a fantastic doctor. But other people are not as protected as I've been. And if, you, if, if I'm not there to help my friends when the EMTs come and bring them back after they're already dead, then I can't advocate for them. And these are people that wanted to die. And for what it, for, I mean, it's a longer story, but um, I like to think that the law is what protects us. I think this law has been uh, worked on for so many years. It really is probably the, the most comprehensive we're going to get. I think it goes a little too far, but yes, I think the law should be passed. And I think it's up to us to make people who feel insecure more secure. And that's up to those doctors and healthcare providers and people who run assisted living and people who run um, the so-called nursing homes to have those conversations with the residents so that they can comfortably make their choices. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Betts. And thank you so much, Tessa. I don't see any other hands. Thank you for your time. <laughs> 6 a.m. here. <laughs> I've been on since 6 a.m. <laughs> thank you for hanging in with us. <laughs> yeah, well, my mother's here. I'll talk to you later. Thanks a lot, everybody. Thank you. Uh, next up is Barbara Jacobs. Yes, good evening. Uh, Senator Abrams, Representative Steinberg, and members of the Public Health Council. I am Dr. Barbara Bennett Jacobs, a nurse for years and a certified health bioethicist for 20 years, having cared for thousands of patients and currently chair the Ethics Council representing seven acute care hospitals in Connecticut, although today I'm re representing myself. And I have submitted written testimony. In response to Representative Elliott's hypothetical question about whether someone who has been predicted to die within three months and who does not experience relief of pain can choose to take drugs to die, the answer is yes assuming this person has the autonomy to choose and the capacity to make his own decisions. But this bill is not about making a choice to die or having the right to die. This bill is about providing immunity to, phys to physicians who prescribe lethal drugs knowing the intention is death. So I cannot support 6425. There is a reason why 41 out of 50 states in America do not have an aid in dying bill. And there are five re major reasons not to support this bill. First, the effects of COVID-19 tragedy on health is the primary concern on every public health agenda across this country, as it is here in Connecticut. Not only a concern for those infected and those who have died, but for those frontline healthcare workers who are painfully stressed. Second, this bill threatens the patient-physician relationship built on trust, fidelity, and a promise to heal. The executive of Compassion and Choice has said in this very hearing that physicians, quote, give an extra push of the plunger at the end of life of people in hospitals. In my over 40 years in major medical centers in Boston and Hartford, I have never heard of this experience. This represents misguiding prejudice of this particular organization. 
Third, physicians are being used as instruments for their prescriptive authority and then ordered to abandon the principle of veracity and lie on the certificate. The disease did not end the patient's life. The effects of the lethal drugs are the primary cause. One could always put the disease as the secondary, secondary contributing cause of death. Fourth, we have evidence that the slippery slope is real. In Canada, over 14,000 have died since 2016, accessing the medical aid and dying law, which includes active euthanasia. The United Nations just this month from Geneva issued a report citing that Canada's parliament will hear a bill to change Canada's law, the slippery slope in action, whereby suffering, not a terminal disease, would make one eligible. The UN opines that this slide down the slope would continue the ableism assumptions, assumptions that have plagued the disability community for decades. Fifth, today in Connecticut, our home health care agency is providing comfort and benevolent care to approximately 300 palliative and hospital patients, and this happens every single day. Advo advocating for patients during the dying process, not advocating for their death. You cannot build pyramids on an ocean. Options for care of the dying are available in Connecticut, but you can build compassionate end of life care on hospice and palliative medicine to provide comprehensive symptom management. Hospice care has advanced even over the last few years. I cared for my brother at home where he died from pancreatic cancer just a couple of years ago. The hospice care he received did relieve his suffering and was greatly appreciated by and brought comfort to him and to our entire family. Dying from cancer at home can be eased with compassion and expert professional attention. And please call me if you need help getting such care. And I will conclude. In 70 acute hospitals in Connecticut two days ago, there were 131 COVID patients hospitalized, 28 in the ICU, most lying uncomfortably and unaccessibly prone on their stomachs, struggling to breathe, struggling to live with our dedicated and committed ICU staff working tirelessly to care for them. As the Public Health Council, you are arbitrators of equitable, fair, and just legislation that will promote the safety and well-being of Connecticut residents. And my last sentence, please hear the clarion call. Please consider not moving this bill along. And please don't untie the Guardian knot on this unstable, untested, unethical, and rare practice. If you are on the fence or not sure, I request, please, that you think about tabling this bill and coming up with options for, free, for improving overall end of life care for the 31,000 people who die in Connecticut every year, not necessarily a privilege less than 200. This is a public health mandate. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Jacobs. I'm sorry for your loss. Uh, we do have a few hands. Senator Haskell followed by Representative Scanlon. Ms. Jacobs, thank you for your testimony and the, the breadth of knowledge that you bring to this issue. Thank you too for your patience. I know it's been a long day. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> It's well, worth it. I wanted to follow up on one element of your testimony. You, you called into question a 2014 poll uh, that I understand was completed by Quinnipiac that found 61% of Connecticut residents supported the proposed aid and die-in bill. And you say yet only 33% of those polled said that they would request aid and die-in for themselves. And I, in your testimony, you seem to point that, that out as a, a weakness of the poll. I view it as exactly in line with with the, the spirit of this legislation, which is not to force anyone in or pressure anyone into making this decision, but instead to provide the option. So it, it seems to me perfectly reasonable uh, that 61% would support the option, but only 33% might pursue that option themselves. I wanted to better understand why you feel as though that result invalidates the, the public opinion piece here. Well, I, I think it's sort of like Wallace Stevens, 13 ways of looking at a blackbird, right? The poem that lines Asylum Avenue here in Hartford is that if you look at something and you see it and you perceive it for what it's worth, Senator Haskell might see it differently than I see it. How I see it is that 66% of those queried in the poll were saying whether they would support the, the bill, correct? For, for anyone or anybody. But when it came to them, only 33% did. So I think it's only fair and just and reasonable to include both of those statistics from the poll. And I think what, what it says about 33 is that 61, 66% would not. Sure, so I don't, I don't I think- I find that relevant. <laughs> 
Sure. I don't find it irrelevant. I, I, I think it's an interesting comparison to show the numbers. I just don't think that it fundamentally undermines the mission of this bill, which is to provide every family and every patient with that individual autonomy with, with that choice. So I, I have more questions, but I, I will leave it there. Thank you for your testimony today. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator. Uh, Representative Scanlon. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, good evening, Ms. Jacobs. Um, I see that in your testimony that you're the associate ethicist at Hartford Hospital. Is that is that accurate? That is correct. That's where I am employed, but I'm representing myself and I want to make that clear. No, totally understand. Um, <laughs> but, but I'm going to ask you about medical ethics, and this is certainly not a leading question. It's not something I have an answer to. I'm genuinely asking you here. Um, in my personal experience uh, with people who have been at the end of their life in a hospital situation, when it is clear that they are going to die, um, there is conversations that happen between doctors, nurses, loved ones, in which um, it is implied that there are things that they can do to facilitate or speed up that process. Um, and I'm wondering from your perspective, what the difference really is from a medical ethics standpoint in your mind, speaking again for yourself, not Hartford Hospital, mm -hmm. between those two situations? I think I heard you use words that might be similar to hastening. The, did you say hastening the process? Hastening? Yeah, sure. We do not hasten the process of dying, ever, with the intention of death and hastening death. What we do do with palliative care and hospice care, if it were to be given in an acute care hospital, which is kind of rare, is that we would try to comfort the patient, symptom manage every single symptom that the patient is experiencing to the point of alleviating that symptom. And the difference is, the reason I say we don't hasten the death is that we don't intend to hasten death. And any moral act that is being performed by our physicians or our nurses or in my counsel about ethics, it's all about the action itself, the intention of the action, the consequences, and the character of the person performing the action. So the intention of giving end-of-life medications, not drugs, end-of-life medications is to relieve a symptom. Now that symptom could be physical suffering. I'm hearing this wonderful conversation about the philosophical idea of existential suffering, but existential suffering is really when the patient feels that the meaning of their life has lost perspective for them. Whatever that suffering is, we will try to alleviate that suffering, but we won't do it with the intention of hastening one's death. But if, but I guess what I'm saying to you respectfully, uh, again, genuinely asking here, is where, where do you draw a line from a medical ethics perspective between what could be perceived as hastening uh, and what you are defining it as, as no longer treating a symptom is what I'm hearing you say. And I, I think for some individuals, it's a genuine question uh, between what really is the difference between those two things? Hastening death, that's, that's an intention. That would be a motive, a motive or an intention to do something like they do in Canada, to put a needle in somebody's arm and inject a medication with the intention of death. What I'm saying is the line in medical ethics is to find moral, just what I call justificatory power for the intention to be a good moral intention. So the, in, the intention is not to hasten death. That would not be a good moral intention. So that is where I would draw the line. So when I get the ethics consults that I get for patients who are at the end of their life, I have to be sure that the practice of medicine and nursing that is being given to that patient that I'm consulting on is that their in intentions are morally justified. And in my practice over all these years that I've been doing this, I have really not come across the circumstance in which the intention would be to hasten someone's death. That is not within the purview of the practice of medicine, nursing, palliative medicine, or medical ethics. Okay, thank you very much. The, can I just finish by saying the intention is to alleviate the pain and the suffering. 
That would be the primary intention, the foreseen expected effect, although there may be some unforeseen effects, but those are not intended. And that's the doctrine of double effect in a nutshell. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Representative Scanlon. Uh, Representative Dauphiné. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you, um, Barbara, for your testimony. You're um, welcome. I have um, experience being a hospice nurse. So thank you for your good explanation of intention versus outcome, because we certainly, um, through my practice and what I've experienced, I've never intended to take anybody's life. We've worked very hard to keep them comfortable and um, make the family comfortable with the process, but never intended to do that. But what I wanted to speak to a little bit was earlier, you mentioned your concern with this bill with regard to physicians. Is Are you saying that um, you're concerned that we're actually authorizing and legalizing doctors to assist in taking someone's life is that how you would portray your definition of that i mean in this bill we're actually making it legal for a doctor to participate in taking someone's life by uh by the by this bill so can maybe you can elaborate on that i was trying well to I, I equate it to um, chapter 368w here in the state of connecticut which is the removal of life support or the withdrawal of life support law although they're totally different um but in that law, it's very clear that when Judge Killian formed that law and wrote that law and it got passed, it was designed to be an immunity law for physicians not to have any civ civic liability for removing life support. I mm -hmm. see this law as the same kind of an immunity law. So that's why I'm saying, I don't think this is about choice. I don't think this bill is about choice. Who, we believe in choice. I can't be an ethicist and not have respect for personal autonomy, but I don't see that that's what this law is about. I see that this law is about being sure we have immunity for physicians, don't write something on the death certificate that said you did it, and that it, it, it gives them immunity from being, I suppose, having a civil liability later. Um, but I just don't see that that's what this law is. And it, it, I didn't mean to give uh, not the right impression, um, but my impression is, is that it is an immunity law. It's designed for physicians. If it didn't say physicians in this bill, I would probably wouldn't be sitting in front of you today. So providing physicians with immunity for participating and assisting in, the, in, in this process. Yes, but giving them the immunity does not make the idea of their um, instrumental value of writing a lethal dose of medicine on a prescription pad. Those, those, those don't coincide for me in a moral realm. Understood. Thank you so much for your testimony. Oh, and thank, thank you, you for listening. Thank you for the questions. Thank you, Representative. Next is Senator Huang. You still got thank more. Thank you, Madam. Madam Chair, and uh, welcome, Dr. Jacobs. I, I have to tell you, we're, we're almost hitting the uh, the six o'clock hour, and you have uh, awoken a lot of us from the uh, from your passionate testimony and insightful testimony. I, I, I think the first thing I want to address is reading your testimony uh, in talking about uh, that that quoting me actually that we ought to be spending the issue addressing COVID, and I do want to recognize that we are going to address. Uh, proposals and, and, and uh, future dates related to telehealth and many other issues as the chair cited earlier. But I wish we had the opportunity to spend that time right now in focusing on these issues such as, uh, you know, the, 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 the eligibility for people with uh, comorbidities to be able to get shots. I, I wish we had that opportunity right now to talk about that on the forefront, but uh, be it that as may. I, I do want to ask you to kind of elaborate a little bit more uh, about your statement about the myth of doctor-assisted suicides were demystified by Dr. Ezekiel Manuel. Can you talk a little bit more about that? I, I don't know if any of my colleagues raised that point of question. Uh, you, you, you pose some very interesting um, uh, statements and as well as facts that, that's been cited. Well, thank you. Um, 
Thank you, Senator Wang. I mean, I, I did have that in my written testimony. I took it out of this oral testimony because I went over seven minutes. Um, so I did take that out. But Ezekiel Manuel is a colleague of mine when I was down at um, Georgetown in Washington. And um, he clearly is a leader in bioethics in this country so and around the world. So I, I quoted him and I um, gave you the reference for his piece in the New York Times. But he basically went over some things that we've already covered. Um, he talked about uh, inadequate pain control is uh, not the driver for to request physician assisted suicide. Um, he also went over the high tech nature of our culture. Um, but I worked with the public health committee. I was on the committee to for DPH to develop most to develop the standards for use during public health emergencies. Um, so we have most it's kind of no pun intended, but it kind of died. Um, and we need to br bring that back um, because people have the right to fill out a most um, with less restrictions than completing their living will. Um, and if somebody comes to the hospital with a living will, a DNR, as, as my previous um, speakers said, um, we will re respect a DNR order that has been written in the community. And we will not first force medical um, technology onto persons. And the third thing he said um, was that it will improve the end of life of everyone. And that's what I think is most compelling. In Oregon, which is very much close in population to us here in Connecticut, it's 0.2% of the population or the deaths who die from access to physician assisted suicide, 0.2%. That's 188 people in the most current version of Oregon's um, data set, 188 people in one year. In 11 months in Connecticut, 7,000 have died from COVID, 7,000. Also, Ezekiel Emanuel talked about being at being it a respect for an autonomous choice. Um, and um, I just believe that uh, autonomy is not really the question here. It's about whether a physician is gonna be complicit in that autonomous choice with another person in the world. Well, thank you very, very much. Thank you for your service. Uh, as I've said, for many other doctors that have appeared on this, uh, thank you for your, all your work uh, on the front line of healthcare during this crisis. Uh, and pandemic. And uh, thank you very much for your insightful and, and eloquent and passionate testimony. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator. I see no more hands. Thank you for your time um, and your testimony. Thank you. Next up is Jennifer Barahona, followed by Judy Principi. Hi, good evening, um, committee. Thank you for having me and really appreciate. It's been a long day for all of us and for all of you who've been on since 9 a.m. I appreciate you sticking with us because those of us who are online like I am for number 67 have a compelling story too. So I appreciate you sticking it out. Um, I am part of the 5% and I'm here in support of HB 6425. I have submitted my testimony in writing and we'll try to summarize quickly. I appreciated Representative Hughes' testimony earlier this morning. I too am a social worker, but I'm here to Today for very personal reasons. When my dad passed away in 2006 from an aggressive form of cancer, the end came relatively quickly and peacefully. He was comfortable. He drew his last breath while I held his hand with my mom, his wife of 49 years, and two of my siblings with him. And it was the most important moment um, of my life. To that point, I was grateful I could be with him at the end. And my mother was the pillar of strength after that and gave the toast even at my wedding just 12 weeks after he died. Um, difficult for all of us, of course, but then in 2008, her words started slurring and her devastating diagnosis of ALS came a few months later. Uh, and she declined at an astonishing rate. And she wanted the same kind of peaceful end that had happened to my, uh, for my father. And she asked and wrote to me that I hoped the end would come quickly and it did not. And I've sat here listening to people say, well, when I had an ALS patient who said they were done uh, having feeding tubes and they died too late, two days later, my mother died two and a half weeks after we pulled her last hydration and food from her feeding tube. It was the last act that she could consent to in a span of seven months ALS robbed her of every voluntary movement, including her ability to blink yes or no responses, and her mind was yet totally intact. 
and uh, she had zero means to communicate. To, and to me, to this day, this many years later, I'm haunted by her pleading eyes, her groans, her limbs that were black um, two weeks later, and uh, the inability for any person medically or otherwise to know what was causing her pain or distress. She had asked me, uh, I was her healthcare proxy, and the baby is six. Um, she wanted to remain lucid until the end. And as someone else said earlier, I wasn't able to keep that promise to her. And what choice did I have? I pushed her morphine pump as often as I could, but it restricts you from doing it too much. I didn't know what else we could do. We had no way to access what she was feeling. Two and a half weeks of that, uh, we gathered family, my brother living in England to be with her. We thought every moment was her last. Um, and. Uh, I wanted to be there for the end like I had been with my dad. But of course, I had a newborn at home at the time. I couldn't be there around the clock. The night of September 17th was my brother's turn. And when he woke, she was dead in the bed. And there was no one to hold her hand as she had done with the six of us through our entire lives. There was no one there to whisper the loving words that she had whispered to us in our hardest moments. Uh, in her final moments, she died alone in a strange bed after unimaginable suffering. Um, and the fact that we allow that inhumane suffering is shameful. My mother was a staunch Catholic. She worked for the Catholic Church for 30 years. And while she may not have exercised the option this bill would have provided her, I can say with absolute certainty that she would want others to have this right to choose. And we should not be legislating based on the faith of the few. My father died. I took comfort in the words that someone said that the only thing harder than losing someone you love is watching them suffer. And I have never forgotten that because it's so devastatingly true. So I take issue with some of the legislators that say it's prematurely ending life. I want my mother here more than ever. I have never needed her more now than I did when I was younger. I'm a mother and I miss her every day and I wish I could have her with me. This bill does not end uh, life, it ends suffering. Three minute mark if you wouldn't mind concluding. Yeah, I'm on my last sentence, which is we each deserve if we choose to have a humane, dignified and well-planned transition from this life with final moments surrounded, not by pain and fear, but for love and comfort. And I believe this bill does that for the five percent or the point two as the previous speaker said the point two matter thank you thank you Ms. barahona um thank you for sharing your testimony and i'm sorry for what you experienced with your mom um senator haskell followed by senator huang jennifer thank you so much for your testimony i just wanted to say that i was so moved by your story and, and i'm so grateful that you waited to uh, all these hours to to share um uh, your family's experience with members of this committee. I did want to give you an opportunity to expand upon one element of your testimony that I noticed when I was reading through uh, what you submitted to the committee, which is that of those who request information about the option of dignity and death, less than 1% decide to actually pursue that option. And it seems from your comments today, you're not necessarily convinced that your mother would have chosen that path, but rather it would have been comforting to have that option. Do you want to say a few more words about that? Yeah, I mean, the last thing that she was physically able to write to me, um, you know, she lost her ability to do everything, as I said, and she wrote on a slip of paper, which I still have. Um, she used the words, I'm not suicidal, but I hope the end comes quickly. Um, and it, like I said, it did not. I don't, she probably would not have chosen this, but I think the research that shows it um, permits patients to have conversations with family members that they might not otherwise have. When, with my dad, he was at Sloan Kettering and um, they, I, I was, I think I was a social worker. No, I had already graduated, but they were doing a research study and they asked if we could participate in it together. And my dad was a very Irish, you know, stoic man and he didn't open up that much about stuff and be even participating in that study together about kind of end of life care brought conversations between he and I um, that we wouldn't have had otherwise. And um, so I do, the research does show that it prompts families to have, you know, palliative care conversations. And I, other speakers have said, and I know personally, I, there's a small genetic component to ALS and knowing what she went through, um, and that terrifies me that that could be my fate or that my children would, you know, witness and be traumatized um, like my family and I were that, you know, I would like the comfort of having that even if I don't ultimately choose it. 
Well, thank you so much for that answer. And it, it cannot be easy to relive that experience each time you come and testify. But as a new member of the committee, I'm so grateful that you did make your voice heard in this process. So thank you, Jennifer. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Senator Huang. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Jennifer, it's good to see you. Um, we've known each other for many years and, and I wanna thank you for your work um, on behalf of the Sandy Hook uh, funds, as well as your work now in workplace uh, workforce development. But I have to say, in all my interactions with you, I, I have never seen such um, emotion and um, and and expressions of 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 impact uh, from you. Um, I, I'm so sorry that you've had the losses as you've gone through them in your in your lifetime. Um, what comes out of it is the fact that you, you mentioned a couple things. One, that it is an option, right? It, it, it does not force anybody to do it. Can you elaborate a little bit more about that and, and, and also the sense of, of control and, and, and choice? I, I think you articulated both of those viewpoints. Can you just kind of expound on that a little bit more? Well, yeah, and, and again, the research that shows that there are a lot of patients that, you know, fill it and don't ultimately use use the option afforded to them but the peace of mind that it brings that if it would get to a point that's unbearable that they they could do that so um and previous speakers i think it was you know john from norwalk saying how his father the, the sense of relief that he felt that he had the option to do it um and i remember the first time I came up to testify around this, a, a representative said, well, if you're in that state, you should just move to you pack your bags and your kids for the weekend and go go into a hotel in Oregon. And I was, you know, it was such an astonishing <laughs> statement as if it could be so cavalier that we'll just, you know, cross the border and, you know, take care of things in a hotel room and not be surrounded by kind of, um, you know, family and, and loved ones. And I am passionate about it because, you know, it's, it is so personal. There was a line in there that I almost didn't say because I said I might not make it through. And, you know, my husband said, it is what it is. Keep it in there. Um, it is hard to relive even 12 years later. But I just think, again, to what Senator Haskell asked me, it provides an option for people to talk with their families and, and kind of forces a conversation that's really difficult. We don't do death well in this country at all. Um, it's, it's terrible how quickly we move on. Certainly you mentioned my work in Sandy Hook for five and a half years with that recovery and um, people forget so quickly. I, my Both of my parents died at Rosenthal Hospice in Stanford actually and I lobbied really hard for the prevention of closing of that hospice. It was a beautiful 12 bedroom facility. Um, my mother moved there because she had an abusive caregiver. She had no way to communicate as I mentioned. Um, and we found out that her a caregiver was abusing her um, after we left at night. So when we finally found a caregiver that could be with her 24 seven and she wanted a break and went on vacation, she, uh, my mother said, take me to Rosenthal for a, ro a rest because it's, you know, I feel safe there. I don't feel safe in my home with another caregiver. Um, so we took her there as just a respite, but she declined so much on the ambulance ride over. And that's when we made the decision to, uh, she made the decision um, with these yes and no responses that eventually a couple of days later, she couldn't even do that to withdraw, withdraw the feeding um, too. But you can imagine, I don't know if two days later, she regretted that and wanted to start the feeds again. I wouldn't, I have, none of us had any way to know. We just prayed that it would come quickly uh, and it did not. What was the line that you said that you were going to take out? Um, you make me repeat it again, Tony. Uh, well, you know, she was an amazing mom. There's six of us. There's, you know, there's 14 grandchildren. She only met 10 of them. She didn't meet my son. His name is my Jen, dad. We, we, we don't hear your voice. No? Now we can hear it. Oh, sorry. Maybe my internet. I was just saying that she was a wonderful mother. So, you know, the fact that she cared and comforted for all six of us in our lives and we couldn't do the same for her at her final moments was extremely painful. You know, she was with us, you know, through all the heartbreaks. My brother was, sir, was a veteran of two wars and, you know, uh, just all that she saw each of us through divorce and deaths and all sorts of things. Our father's death being the one to give the toast at my wedding 12 weeks after he died, stood up there brave. You know, she was a pillar of strength and it just, 
crushed me that she, you know, every day I left hospice for two and a half weeks. Is that it? Is she going to be here when I return in the morning? And I had an infant at home who, you know, I was still breastfeeding. I was, still, you know, so going back and forth and just thinking of her dying without any of us by her side, holding her hand, whispering, you know, the supportive, loving messages to her um, still breaks my heart. And, and, and for the experience you described earlier about a colleague that said move to Oregon, I, I, would, I would apologize for that. It was not necessary. No one should ever um, demean the, the personal and emotional experiences any family goes through. Uh, I, your, your mother succumbed to ALS and, and we've heard some examples of that. And, and you know, Obviously, there is no known cure for ALS, despite our best efforts to raise money to, to, to find research. But where a lot of people, and, and I had a very good dear friend who went through the process, and, and the, 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 the rapid uh, decline and, and the failure of the body uh, for those that are caregivers are, are just viscerally difficult experiences and, and painful to, to support and, and to, to, to comfort. Um, I, I can't imagine what it must have been like to not have any choices, to, to, to just watch her decline and, and have no sense of ability. I know we talked a lot about palliative care to, to ease the comfort, but ALS is a unique illness that, that breaks down body functions, breathing, swallowing. Um, what can we do to, to kind of carve out or, or create that kind of uh, opportunity for people not to struggle like that? It, 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 it's, it's, it's traumatizing to even remember to talk about it. Well, and I, you know, if I'm being totally honest and vulnerable, and I maybe shouldn't say this, I had moments in those two and a half weeks where I thought the best thing I could do for my mother would be to put a pillow over her head. And God help me for thinking that, but I did. And I thought I could risk going to jail and leaving my infant daughter, right? Um, I, I expressed that to the doctor, the physician, and she said, I, I've been in your shoes as a physician. I watched my own mother die and there was nothing I could do. Um, you know, I, I, so I had those thoughts. So, you know, I think passing this, you know, kind of legislation would, you know, knowing what I know now, I knew nothing about ALS. I knew, you know, it, it, it's, a, it's just the most horrific thing I can possibly imagine, especially, you know, she was a award-winning bridge player up until six weeks before she would have someone come and hold her cards and use her Dynavox thing to, to play her card. She was a champion bridge player. She was a, she got her master's in voice in the fifties before she got married. She was going to be an opera singer. She was the director of music at a Catholic church. She was, you know, full of life. Um, so for her, ironically, for her to lose her voice first as the first thing to go um, and then communicate through devices, but then she lost all her motor function. I mean, if, if we knew what was ahead, um, if I knew if this was to be me and I followed in her footsteps, knowing what's ahead, I would want to, um, make a different choice um, and go out on my own terms. Well, Jennifer, thank you. And, and uh, perhaps we can leave on a positive note to know that obviously you're extremely proud of your mom, just as you described it. But, but I could pretty much safely say that uh, in, in uh, rest in peace to your, both of your parents, they're very, very proud of you for your efforts and, and your contributions to help making a positive difference for other people. So uh, again, thank you for sharing this, and um, um, I, 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 I appreciate it. So, uh, thank you, Senator. I appreciate you. You bet. Thanks, Jen. Thank, thank you, you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator. We have another hand, uh, Representative Cabros de Graw. Thank you so much, and I, I know we've all had a long day, and so I will keep it short, Jennifer, but I wanted to thank you for telling this story because I know I've shared some of uh, my own personal stories, and I, I understand how hard this is and continues to be hard. Um, I, I would say that it's obvious what a woman your mother was by the woman that you are. And so I would I would go back to one piece of your testimony. I, I, it will stay with me for a long time, but the, the, the part when your mother said, I'm not suicidal, but basically I hope it goes quickly. 
I think that that is a critical point to the discussion today, because there has been a lot of talk about suicide and about assisted suicide. And uh, personally for me, as someone who uh, went through two years with my eldest child of um, a severe mental health crisis in which she was trying to take her life, um, I think it's important that at the end, your mother expressed she was not suicidal, but that she wished it was going quickly. Wasn't specifically about pain, wasn't specifically about anything other than that release, right? And so I would just ask, you know, it, because you, you've said a little bit about if it were you and, and you know, the genetic component, you know, the, the importance of passing this is that it sounds, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, is it so that no one else has to go through both what you witnessed or what your mother felt? Yeah, I don't think, you know, with anything you, you know, there's a reason why certain causes get donations because, you know, I, you know, I started donating to Sloan Kettering after my dad died. I started donating to the ALS Association after my mom died. Like, if you haven't been there and had that experience, um, you, you know, it's easy to say, well, we can control pain or, you know, a number of other things. Um, I think people's tunes change when they've experienced it um, themselves. And I, yeah, I take issue and I compliment Senator Haskell for his remarks earlier in the hearing today about the more flippant use of suicide. I'm a licensed clinical social worker. I have had dear friends um, lost to suicide and that's not what this is. This is, And as I shared earlier, it's not uh, ending life, it's ending suffering. Her, her uh, fate was sealed with that diagnosis. Um, and, you know, she, she did only last seven months from diagnosis to death, which was a relatively short time, but um, those last few weeks were just excruciating. Again, I, I thank you for the testimony. I, I know it can't be easy and uh, it means a lot to have to have your words in the record today. So thank you and thank you, Madam Chair. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you for your time today and your testimony. Have a great night. You too. Um, next up is Judy Principi. Nope, I said that wrong. But I don't know. I don't know. That's okay, it's Principi, thank you. Um, good evening. E Members of the Public Health Committee, uh, my name is Judy Principe. I live in Burlington and I am here tonight in support of HB 6425. Um, I'd like to tell you a little bit about my personal story. Um, this is my brother, Danny, and at 57 years of age, he was diagnosed with ALS. Um, the previous testimony before me was like living my, hearing my life again. My mom had pancreatic cancer and she died from that and she had hospice and she was so weak and frail that she, she just faded away and it was peaceful. Um, my brother, however, from the time of diagnosis to his death lasted um, six months and the last month was just awful. Um, I'm not gonna ever forget the pain in his eyes when I saw him, when he was dying, the fear in his eyes <clears throat> or his voice on the phone calling for help, help me, help me. Um, and he had hospice as well. And it wasn't a peaceful death for him at all. Um, ALS is very different, like was brought up already because you lose your ability to speak, you lose all your functions, you can't move and you lose everything. Um, I can't help but wonder what his outcome would have been and how he would have met his end if this bill had been passed into law um, years ago. This is my second time testifying here. Um, this is my son with his uncle Danny and he testified with me um, a few years back also in favor of the bill. I'm very, I was also listening since nine o'clock this morning and I was very discouraged by some of the comments I heard as well. So I wanted to just touch base on that. It was very offensive to hear one of the senators say, um, if you want to maintain your autonomy over your death, you can just stop eating. Well, my brother didn't want to just stop eating. He wanted to eat. The Apple Harvest Festival came around and he wanted those um, apple fritters, you know, he wanted all of that and he fought to the very, very end and tried everything that he could to, to live. But th 
it's inevitable you're going to die from ALS. And it's not a peaceful death. It's not a, a happy death. And it's not um, something that anybody should have to live through. So I'm here tonight um, in support of this bill. And I'm hoping that you will vote in favor of it as well. Um, if it came down to me needing it, and I would definitely choose this option for myself. And um, I'm a strong advocate for it. So I just want to say that hospice, again, is not one size fits all. Not everybody's pain can be controlled, no matter how many times people say, I never had a patient complain in pain. It was always controlled. That, that, that just not, it is not true. It's not true. Um, and I just hope that you'll vote in favor of this bill. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Principi. Um, thank you for sharing your testimony. I'm sorry for your loss. And I think we can all agree that we'd all love those apple fritters. So thank you for sharing that about your, your brother. Um, I don't see any hands. Have a wonderful night. Thank you, you too. Um, next, we'll hear from Susanna Bennett. Thank you. Members of the Public Health Committee, good evening. My name is Susanna Bennett, and I am here to encourage you to oppose HB 6425. I have read this bill in its entirety, and I truly appreciate how stringent the language and the guidelines are. My main concerns are twofold. First, along with its narrow controlled provisions, the bill by its nature approves the decision to end one's own life. So even within these confines, the approval is being given. It's not only a matter of making a treatment option available, but we are approving a treatment option that fundamentally changes how we think about ending our lives. It's, it's hard to separate these specific goals of the bill from the societal precedent that they set in our state. Secondly, I won't speculate about the possibilities of expansion, but I will simply say that ultimately, this legislation cannot achieve its own goals and stay limited. It can do that for a while, but eventually we'll have to make the option available to more people with a broader range of diagnoses and diseases in order to be consistent with the reasons being given for this legislation. And we've even heard comments about um, everyone should have the power to choose how and when they die. So the limits of this bill would not um, give that power to everyone. It, will, it would have to expand um, to, to accommodate everyone. So I do appreciate the limitations set forth in this bill, but they will still stand as obstacles for some people. They will have to be adjusted. And so that is the expansion that, that I foresee, which um, causes concern. For these reasons, I ask you to consider voting no on this bill. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bennett. I don't see any hands. Thank you for your time and your testimony. Next, we'll hear from James Naughton. Good evening. Um, two years ago, I testified before your committee uh, relating my wife Pam's agonies with pancreatic cancer. Over a period of four years after her diagnosis, she and I did everything that we could to try to beat it, including for eight months, commuting to San Antonio, Texas every week so that she could participate in a new clinical trial. But in the end, after four years of trying, uh, cancer prevailed as we had always known that it would. I told you then that when she couldn't endure it any longer uh, and was finally at the end of her life, one day she said to me, Jimmy, I don't wanna wake up anymore. And it took me by surprise because we'd been going forward for so long and that was my job to help her go forward. And then she said to me, well, we've always known that this was a fatal disease. Later that night, when I slipped into bed with her around 11 o'clock that she woke up and she peered at me and she said to me, oh, I thought I wasn't gonna have to wake up anymore. I, I can't begin to tell you uh, what the feeling of disappointment was that I had because I wasn't able to help her any further. It was a feeling of real of failure on my part. And that feeling haunts me still. And it's the reason that I've been in support of this law for the last several years. Uh, because she wanted me to help her finally to die. 
Now, we're all going to die, painlessly, we hope, surrounded by our loved ones in our storybook mind's eye. But there are those among us who are not so lucky, and it is for those people that this law is necessary, the folks who don't go gently. I recognize that there are several groups that are interested in trying to prevent this bill from becoming law. People with disabilities have told us that they are afraid of being coerced into ending their lives prematurely, but that would be a felony. And there is a paper trail going back to when Oregon passed this law for the first time in 1997 that says that there has been no such problem. Every year, that state mandates that there's a report if there were such a, an incident, and there hasn't been any. Another group that's not been sympathetic to this legislation is the religious community. Now, I certainly don't believe that I or anyone else should be able to tell them what to believe or how to live their lives or how to end them. Former Governor Mario Cuomo, a very thoughtful man and a public servant, in a speech at the University of Notre Dame in the 1980s, spoke eloquently about how he addressed these problems of public morality, being both a governor and a Catholic. He said that in our pluralistic society, we must create public morality through consensus. He said the arguments start when religious values are used to support positions which would impose on other people restrictions that they find unacceptable. When should I argue to make my religious value your morality, he said, my rule of conduct your limitation. Another Catholic Governor Jerry Brown from California. Jerry Brown from California said in 2015, I do not know what I would do if I were dying in prolonged or an excruciating pain. I am certain, however, he said, that it would be a comfort to be able to consider the options afforded by this bill. And so I wouldn't deny that right to others. We know even if they don't exercise it, the people just knowing it's there, knowing that if they need it, if the suffering becomes too much to bear, it will be available to them, releases them from spending their final weeks in fear. I wish my wife, Pam, had had this chance. And I wish that another lady who will be testifying before you today, Sharon Hines, had it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Naughton. Thank you for sharing the story of your wife, Pam, and what you went through with us. Um, Representative Steinberg, followed by Senator Huang. Jim, thank you for coming to testify again. Uh, we have a number of new members in our committee who are not privy to your testimony from a couple of years ago. And we've heard quite a bit about ALS as a particularly debilitating disease. Uh, but I, 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 we are aware of the fact that pancreatic cancer is a particularly tough one to, to get through in, in the final months. As hard as it is, can I ask you to share a little bit more about your experience with pancreatic cancer and why it is such a challenge for those in end of life circumstances? Well, it's the, it's the kind of diagnosis that when you hear it come out of the doctor's mouth, it's a stab in the heart because you know what that means. And it's been a long time. There has been not much uh, movement in the research. There's a lot of money being spent, but they're chasing a drug uh, as I said, we went to San Antonio, Texas every week. We flew down together on Tuesday. She was treated on Wednesday for this new clinical trial for a new drug. And we came home on Thursday morning. And we did that for eight months. And it looked good. And what happens is the tumor, the cancer that they can see, um, is growing. And they hit it with a chemo. And it stops growing. And the doctor says, oh, it's good. I see necrotic tissue in the center of this, of this cell, of this cancer cell. And it continues to shrink and everybody gets excited. And then the cancer figures out a way to cope with it, to change it. And then the, the cell begins to grow again. And so that chemo is gone. We went through every different kind of chemo that they had. And I'm sorry to say that they're still throwing the same chemo. This is eight years later at people with pancreatic cancer today that they were, Pam died eight years ago this next month. Uh, so it hasn't changed very much. Um, I, I, I can't begin to tell you, really, at the, t at the end of her life, and she went along like a, like a hero. You wouldn't have known for the first couple of years that she was sick. But at the end, she lost weight. She lost strength. She lost muscle. 
Uh, she was on a pain pump, uh, oxygen tanks. She had a bile duct blockage that developed. And so she had to have an external drain that we had to catch in a bag, which of course would leak in the middle of the night on her side. And I was managing all of those things with her. Um, that's what it is to deal with something like that. And having been there, having seen what she coped with and how heroically she coped with it, um, that's what's motivated me, um, Representative Steinberg, to, to come back again and again and say this is something that needs to be done for the few people who are going to need it. And I think Governor Brown said it awfully well. He said, you know, I, would not, uh, I wouldn't deny that right to others. I want to say something else, um, if I may. It, it has to do with the uh, contrast between what people call passive youth, euthanasia and what we're talking about, medical aid and dying. What passive means, and it's okay with a lot of people and with doctors, it's called starving people to death. You stop feeding them, you take them off the feeding tube, you, you, you don't give them water anymore. And the story about that, starving people to death, is kind of brutal because for the first week, it's not supposed to be terribly painful. But after that, it can be really, really a torture. Um, now, Medical aid in dying does it with uh, a, a medical cocktail, which people like to say because it's a euphemism. And, and the, uh, uh, what I wanna point out is both of those methods are, are, caused, are causes for death. So if you're, if you're gonna use a passive euthanasia, let people starve to death and that's okay, you're making a decision to cause death. There's not much difference except medical aid in dying, I think, is a lot more humane. Well, thank you for that. Uh, and I also want to uh, thank you for the work you've been doing to uh, early identify uh, markers for pancreatic cancer uh, to make sure that uh, the research we do going forward is more productive. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Senator Hong, followed by Senator Haskell. Thank you, Madam Chair. And um, uh, Jim, good to see you, and uh, it is uh, not a small uh, point to say that uh, you have been uh, engaged, uh, informative, and passionate about it, not only educating uh, Representative Steinberg, but myself, and uh, it's good to, to be able to talk to you. Um, being a new member of this committee, it, it's been a, a, a very emotional experience. Uh, and I've read your testimony. Um, perhaps what most struck me beyond the quotes that you use on Governor Cuomo and Governor, Tom, uh, Governor Brown is um, you talked about your, your dear friend, Rene Aubergine. I don't know if I said that correct. Aubergineois. Aubergineois. So I'm going to just go to, um, and, and I, I, I was touched by that, that your statements on that. Could you just share a little bit of, of that experience? And uh, uh, because I know you didn't say that in your testimony. Uh, Rene was a wonderful actor with whom I worked uh, 30 years ago. Um, he lived in LA. He had stage four metastatic lung cancer. He dealt with it very well up to the end. And finally he said uh, he didn't want to get to the point because of what happens when you get to that stage, you, you have, um, and neurological problems. He's, I didn't want my grandchildren to walk in and not recognize them. And so he would, and, he, and the last thing he said, and he dictated this, and um, he said, I'm proud to say that I live in a state that recognizes a person's right to die with dignity. And uh, a friend of mine, another actor named Mike Tucker, is coming on later on tonight, if you guys are still around. He's slated. We will uh, be. And he's, and he's going to talk some more about Rene because he was very close to Rene as well. So I, I don't want to say any more about that. Well, I, I think you talked about the, 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 the theme is personal choice um, and, and that sense of decision making. Um, can you kind of elaborate a little bit more of how powerful that is and, 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 and how important of a concept that is? Well, you know, there's a, there's a Baptist minister in Bridgeport named Anthony Bennett, mm -hmm. uh, whom I heard on the radio, and he's very, very eloquent on this. He says, um, he said, uh, God gives us free will. We have the ability to choose. He said, the spirit 
is he said the way he looks looks at this issue is he said the spirit is our life now if the body is deteriorated he said the body is not the residence of who i am so he he finds a way to uh think of this choice as a in a positive way making it possible and, and reconciling it with uh his religious beliefs which i think is uh pretty wonderful. And, I, and the reason I cited Mario Cuomo and Governor Brown and uh, Reverend Bennett is because these are people who are very thoughtful. They have public roles to play and they've given this a lot of thought. And I thought that they've eloquently stated this. And I wanted to, for whatever it's worth, if, I, if we could help thread the needles to help people who are hung up uh, because of their religious beliefs, find a way to be yes votes on this. I think that's my objective. Well, Jim, you're, you're equally eloquent as well. Now, what do you say to people that said, you cited earlier, some religious uh, differences and, and maybe in some cases, socioeconomic differences? What do you say to people who say it, 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 it is a, 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 a small percentage and, 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 and that it, it, it just reflects such a small basis of population for this bill to be passed? What do you say to the religious as well as socioeconomic differences that may guide us in our decision-making process? I've, I've been sitting here watching this testimony since early today. And I know that there are people who have really great intentions. They use words like slippery slope. But it seems to me that we're talking about trying to create a law here, one that we can all live by. And we'd like to say that we are a country of laws. So it seems to me that if you look at the paper trail from Oregon, for example, and there, aren't, there, there isn't much of a slippery slope here that we have to worry about. There was a very, uh, a lady named Kathy uh, who, who testified hours and hours ago uh, for about disability, the disability community. And one of the first things she said was, you know, oh, we are a very tough group, the people who are, who are disabled and we, we know how to fight. And I thought, yeah, that's wonderful. But I think she's fighting the wrong issue. Uh, I don't have a fight with her about this. I don't think she, we need to fight about this. I think that we can create laws and live by them and, and enforce them so that there won't be a slippery slope. Um, I sure hope so. Um, you know, one of the interesting things about, I, I read the article that comes, or the, the paper that comes out at the end of every year from Oregon saying whether or not anybody has been coerced. And th what the person who wrote the article said, what said was, in fact, they're getting complaints from the disability community because th they think that they're being discriminated against because some of their group cannot self-administer. So in fact, th they, that's their objection. <laughs> that's the objection of people who are disabled in, in Oregon. They want access to this law. Isn't that interesting? It is interesting. And, and what do you say to those people that said, Jim, it, it, it's just 0.2% that, that may utilize it or not, uh, that we're making a law that um, poses a potential health risk and hazard to other people. That's why you, you know, you, you, you're, you're, you're doing this. No, I, I don't think that that makes any sense at all. It doesn't, it doesn't create a hazard for anyone. This is something that's there for those few people who are not so lucky. We all think we're gonna die, we're gonna, we're gonna die after, our, uh, we're gonna die before our children. That doesn't happen. Um, we all think that we're gonna die in bed with our loved ones around us. Well, actually with medical aid and dying, that is possible. And Mike Tucker will talk about that with Rene Auberginois uh, because he happened to live in a state that allowed that. Uh, but I don't think it's, this impinges on anybody else's rights. It's really for those poor, unfortunate people, among whom was my wife of 46 years. Uh, that's what we're trying to do, to, to try to ease their pain. That's all this is about. And as Jerry Brown says, I wouldn't deny that right to others. And, and I'm deeply sorry for your loss. Even to this day, I, I, I know it impacts you. Um, what it comes down to, Jim, is, is individual and personal choice and that the government shouldn't deny that choice to you and your loved ones. Would that be correct? That's, what, that's my argument. That's my argument, 
Senator. And yeah. there should be a consistency, of course. Um, and 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 the last thing I'll leave is is the effectiveness of what you said, um, that it gave Renee a peace of mind. And that uh, even if they don't exercise it, just knowing that it's there gave him a degree of control and comfort. And and I, I, I appreciate you sharing those words because um, in those critical moments and vulnerable moments, giving any degree of comfort to loved ones and their family is truly most important. So Jim, thank you very, very much. And uh, I, I appreciate your passionate diligence. And um, I look forward to talking to you more about this issue. Thanks, Senator Wong. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator. Senator Haskell. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. And Jim, it's great to see you. Uh, thank you for, for educating me about this issue over the last few years. I think you were the very first person to speak with me about dignity and death. And uh, I've learned, learned a lot today in listening to testimony. In fact, uh, I wanted to follow up with you about one thing that we've been hearing uh, from those who are opposed to this bill. And just to get your reaction, um, I, this is a, a nuance that is new to me, but there are some who oppose the notion that the reason for a individual passing away uh, will not be listed as assisted suicide, but instead be the underlying health condition. And I just wanted to find out if, if you had any reaction to that, if you had heard that testimony, if, if you or, or perhaps if you think Pam would have had a preference if this option had been available to her as to what the cause of death that would have been listed on the certificate. I have heard that mentioned several times, uh, yes. Uh, and uh, it strikes me as, uh, as a, a spurious um, ar argument. Um, I, I, the way I think of it, Pam, the, the thing that killed Pam was pancreatic cancer. Now, if I'd have been able to give her, if we had a medical aid and dying thing, and I could have released her a, a, a 24 hours or 36 or 40 or 72 hours earlier, it still would have been pancreatic cancer that killed her in my mind. Um, but if you wanted to write it down and say pancreatic cancer was the cause of death accelerated by medical aid and dying for the records, that wouldn't bother me at all. What's the, what's the objection to this? And I think that it, we're getting stuck in, in those kinds of, with those kinds of arguments. That shouldn't stop us from enacting something. And we have to try to remember what we're doing it for. We're trying to save people from suffering at the end of at, at the terminal end of their lives. That's all. And I have no problem with that. That's really I mean, helpful. To I, 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 you know, I'll, I'll tell you a little story. Chris Reeve was a dear friend of mine. And, you know, he spent nine years after his accident. And he, he used to say, all the quadriplegics used to say to each other, yeah, well, the guys they who have ALS, they got it much worse than we have. Everything is relative. But when you're dealing with that day in and day out, and he did for nine years, um, and I lost a couple of friends recently, actually, to ALS. Uh, it's just, it's a, it's a terrible situation. And if we can do anything, if we are humane at all, as citizens of the state of Connecticut, let's help the, those people out who need it and figure out a way to write the law so that it doesn't get abused. That's hey, all I hey. Amen. Thank you so much, Jim, for putting it into perspective. Thank you for sharing your story. And of thank course, you, Pam, thank, it's, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Naughton. Um, as a newer member of this committee, I just want to thank you. Uh, your testimony was incredibly moving and, and very, just very helpful for me. So I appreciate you being here tonight. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Um, next, we'll hear from Jean Rexford, followed by Caroline Bowes. Sorry, That's okay. good evening. Um, I'm Jean Rexford and I live in Reading and uh, such powerful testimony. Um, I th I'm, a, I'm here tonight in support of House Bill 6425. I think this might be the seventh year, if possible, that I have submitted testimony. And if anything is true, it is that I feel more strongly I am 75, I now have more experience. I have experience with friends and family who've died. And I was thinking of all the illnesses that are so awful. Um, a sister a who is a physician nationally, internationally known 
um, had every directive she could advance Parkinson. She was ready to end her life and instead she fell and then got sucked into a system. And I can remember that she was taking a nap and she woke up and she said, Jean, I know I'm dying. I don't know how to do that. Can you help me? And of course I couldn't. So for me, it is about that personal choice. It is about dying the way I've lived, which is surrounded by wonderful family and grandchildren and sons and daughters-in-law. Um, I want that right. Um, I, I don't want that advanced medicine with the ventilators and the dialysis and the defibrillators and the feeding tubes. Um, I don't think that's for me. The quality of my life is not about living it longer, but living it well. If I am unable to participate and I have a terminal illness, I would like to die before my family has to suffer through those final days and weeks. And I was thinking about, I will end just talking a little bit about COVID and it struck me when they had that amazing ceremony in Washington. And I'm sure that many of you got emails from friends that had to drop off someone at a hospital that they couldn't visit. The person entered and died alone. And I don't think that's what any of us want. I don't think, um, so this isn't just for me, but it's also because I have been able to be a part of family deaths. That has been important for me too. And that can happen at home. So this has been a long day of, um, of amazing testimony and heartfelt testimony. So I thank you all for doing all this work. And just interestingly, you all seem to be very young, but if you talk to people my age, we want to die at home. And I cannot believe the number of people who want this bill to be passed. They're not used to participating, but we did some minor outreach in Reading and had a really amazing response. So thank you for considering it. I hope this seventh year is the year that it happens. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Rexford. Thank you for coming back and continuing to advocate. <laughs> I don't see any hands. Thank you for your time tonight. Um, Caroline Bowes, followed by Barbara Mancini. Hello, say Senator Abrams and, and uh, Representative Steinberg and the members of the committee. Can you hear me okay? Um, I've been living in Connecticut for about three years now. And I work in hospice care presently as an advanced practice nurse. And I became aware of the bill through my participation with the Connecticut Association for um, Healthcare at Home. Um, I think it's important for you to also know that I moved to Connecticut from California, and I was very involved in the rollout of the uh, California End of Life Options Act um, back in uh, 2016 and in the, um, in the year and two afterwards when I was uh, helping them educate the public and uh, physicians and nurses and that. So I just want to let you know that I had that experience as well, which is part of the reason I'm so interested in this. Um, I have read the bill. It reads very much like the California bill. They're very, very similar. Uh, one thing I would like to say that I saw missing from this particular bill, if I may comment on certain um, particulars of it, uh, I didn't see any reference to the uh, role that the pharmacists would play and uh, what protection, protections would be in place for pharmacists. Um, so I want to make sure that that actually gets addressed uh, when the bill move, if the bill moves forward, um, including delivery. Um, can it go? Do people have to go to a pharmacy? Uh, do they? Uh, can a delivery service deliver the medications? Uh, can it be sent through the postal service? Those types of things need to be addressed. Uh, another thing is the rules for physicians reporting um, on prescriptions written, filled, tracking of patients that took life-ending medications. I didn't see um, particulars about that. I think it's very important that we collect that data. Um, should we uh, pass this into law. Um, also, it would be informative to define hospice care in the document. There, uh, line 52 has a really solid definition of palliative care. However, hospice care is not really defined. And uh, since the criteria for qualifying for medical aid in dying is that there's a prognosis of six months or less, many of these people will be on hospice care and if the, or um, you know, certainly would qualify for it. So I think a definition would um, be helpful there. Um, in line 76, section 19, they talk about self-administering the medication. 
And um, it's mentioned as the only legal means of ingesting the medicine. Uh, I think questions might arise whether another adult may mix the mixture of people. Uh, can they hold the cup for somebody who's very weak while they sip the straw? You can get into some really big details here. And I, and I, and I don't want to get too tight into the details on, on the law, um, but I, I think that um, it will become important when hospice agencies and um, other health agencies get involved in the actual participation. So um, we have to be careful not to get too caught up in the detail because then it makes it all prohibitive for people. And I, I think the laws it's written uh, as you have it right now in the bill is, is already pretty prohibitive, which is one of the issues we found in California that people found it almost too hard to access. Um, and uh, I also mentioned that I'm, I am working in hospice care currently. Um, one thing I want to mention that um, current laws, when a patient takes their own life while they're on hospice care, it, it's really called an adverse or a sentinel event. Oh, and sorry, you, hit your, you hit your three minute mark if you wouldn't mind, you, if you wouldn't mind concluding your remarks. Okay. So what I would just like to say is, you know, I, I have all this experience and I would love to carry it forward. And if I can be of any assistance moving forward based on what I've, my professional role or my experience with the End of Life Options Act in California, I, I offer that freely and I'd love to be involved. Thank you, Ms. Bose. I see mm -hmm. two hands, uh, Representative Steinberg followed by Representative Carpina. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you for your testimony today. I particularly mm -hmm. appreciate your constructive suggestions. Uh, you know, virtually none of our bills are, are ever perfect, but we aspire. Mm -hmm. And uh, your experience in California could be very valuable to us. Uh, we let California be the beta tester for almost everything <laughs> we learned from it. Uh, mm -hmm. But you were trying to complete a thought on a sentinel event. If you could just complete that thought for us. Yes. So in hospice, if somebody dies uh, on service at their uh, own doing, um, so, uh, you know, if they die by suicide, it is called a sentinel event. It does have to be reported to the state. Um, and some people might feel it's, it's too risky to let their nurses participate in any way with these families. Um, if, if somebody's going to take advantage of this law, um, what position does that put a hospice in? And, and I really think there needs to be very careful legislation around the protection of hospices so that they feel like they can continue to participate in the lives of their patients. Because if, if you have a patient uh, that decides to um, take advantage of this law and then the hospice says, oh, you know what, we can't, we can't be a part of your life anymore, then you're abandoning your patient. Somebody who you've maybe taken care of for months and uh, you've been there for them and uh, all of a sudden you have to step away because your, your agency's at too much risk. So I think we have to be careful that we um, legislate such that hospices do feel safe in still serving their patients. Um, should they choose this? Well, I thank you for your testimony. I want to take you up on your offer to uh, help us refine this bill. You were very specific, mm -hmm. and I imagine your written testimony speaks to that as well. But, uh, you know, in that you've heard a lot of the conversation today, if you have any additional thoughts that would improve the bill, we'd much appreciate it. Sure. Thank, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative. Uh, Representative Carpino. Thank you, Madam. Um, thank you for your testimony. Thank you for offering your assistance. Um, I, like many others who have come before me, don't always agree with the bill, mm -hmm. but always want the bill to be accurate and detailed so that we don't have unintended consequences. Um, to that point, I asked someone probably a few hours ago by now about the medications that um, might be relied on should this bill proceed. And I suspect you can probably add a bit of a window into that having come from California because you brought mm -hmm. up um, potentially protecting pharmacists, but the earlier speaker indicated that uh, to the best of his knowledge, these were commonplace, I think he said generics that might have been off label. I don't wanna misconstrue, but that's what I, I believe he said. Is, mm -hmm. Can you maybe uh, share some of your experience with the medications that are used and why or why not we may need to protect pharmacists if these are standard meds? Well, one of the medications they um, have used with this is it's called secobarbital. And it's, it's such a quantity. That's the thing that's sort of different about it. It's, it's a quantity that you wouldn't normally, uh, you wouldn't normally open many capsules of secobarbital, put them into a, a jar, and then hand them to a patient and say, hey, take this all at once. I could see that a pharmacist might 
might worry about their licensure on that, knowing that somebody's going to take this medication to end their life. So just that there's protections in place that the pharmacist feels um, safe in, in handing over, um, you know, such a quantity of a medication that they know what the intention is for use of it. No, and I appreciate the, <laughs> the clarification that is helpful to me. Have you ever had an experience where a, a patient obtained the prescription of this significant quantity of what is now a dangerous and life-ending uh, medication, opted not to use it? How has California, or do you have any suggestions for Connecticut? How do we make sure that this medication then doesn't fall into the wrong hands? Well, the same as we do, like some of the people have mentioned, you know, we have hospice patients have huge quantities of morphine and other medications that certainly into the wrong hands would, could uh, end anybody's life. Um, so yes, we'll need uh, definitely a sy system. And I don't know exactly what's in place in, in Connecticut right now, but a place where you can return the drug perhaps back to the pharmacy or I know in California, we had um, police stations that had drug drop-off sites where you could actually, once a person didn't need the medication or, or died, you could take a medication and safely just deposit it, you know, at, at a specific drop spot. No, and I appreciate that. And we, we have, we've done a good job in Connecticut of making sure that those um, locations are available, local mm -hmm. places, et cetera. My, my question was more specific is, is there any additional safeguards we need to put in place for what we would know is a prescription that is out there for six months. And then we would mm -hmm. know um, that it hadn't been utilized. If somebody's in hospice, you routinely have professionals in the home mm -hmm. or them, um, who routinely would know what medications are on hand or available right. based on my local knowledge and speaking with constituents, then have some additional follow-up with hospice and, and assistance in making sure that that medication gets disposed of and doesn't fall into the wrong hands. So mm -hmm. my question, and if you don't know, that's fair. Mm -hmm. Just like if there's additional safeguards that we would need to put in place. Yeah, not that I'm thinking of right now. I, I really don't think this, you know, we, we hold it differently in our mind, but it's really no different than what people probably already have in their medicine cabinets. If they were to put it together, could create quite the cocktail. So, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank You're you, welcome. madam. I'm all set. Thank you, Representative. We have one more hand. Uh, Representative Kavrister Graw. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. Um, and thanks for being here tonight. I really appreciate it. Um, I, I thought I had heard earlier today there was some question as to whether or not these medications that are used for aid in dying, are they approved FDA drugs? Mm -hmm. They are. Okay. And, and is it because they're being used sort of for an off-label purpose that some people have sort of intimated that maybe they weren't being used in the right way? I think they're still used for uh, um, in the right way. It's just that they're used at a quantity that you wouldn't normally give except to end of life. So, um, you know, if you're using a sedating uh, medication, it is to sedate and certainly this does sedate, but it's given at such a dose that it sedates to the point of stopping your breathing. So it's, the drug's not used inappropriately. It's just used for a different purpose because of the quantity. Okay. And so then that's part of your reasoning behind adding the, the, the uh, pharmacist language to make sure that that aspect of it was covered. Yes, so that they feel safe dispensing it. Okay, thank you so much. Sure. Thank you, Representative. I don't see any more hands. Thank you so much for your time and your testimony. Thank you. Um, next, we will hear from Barbara Mancini. Hi, can you see me? We can't see you, but we can hear you. Okay. Now we can okay. see. You. Okay, great. <laughs> okay. Members of the committee, my name is Barbara Mancini. I've submitted my written testimony and I'll summarize now. I support HB 6425 concerning aid in dying for the terminally ill in Connecticut. I speak from the unique but unfortunate perspective of a person who was prosecuted and then exonerated of the felony charge of aiding and attempted suicide. In 2013 in Pennsylvania, my 93 year old father knew that his end was near and he had carefully planned so that he would have a peaceful and dignified death. He completed an advanced directive, appointed me as his healthcare proxy and enrolled in home hospice care. He made it clear that he wanted to die at home in comfort and with dignity and not at a hospital, but it was not to be. 
a simple act of compassion on my part, handing my father his legally prescribed morphine, led my father to a medically intensive, horribly painful death in the hospital. And it left me an accused felon facing 10 years in prison. I was wrongly charged with trying to assist my father in a su supposed suicide attempt. I fought back in a case that consumed a year of my life, cost me more than $100,000 in legal fees and drew national media attention. I detail my experience in the memoir, Cruel Death, Heartless Aftermath, published in 2019, which I urge all of you to read. There were tragic cases similar to mine in Connecticut, the cases of Bill Meyer, Thomas Meyer, Hunt Williams, Kevin Connors. I have a painful understanding of them. If Pennsylvania had an aid in dying law when my father reached the end of his life, he would have had the option to utilize it. And my dying father, my family, and I could have avoided this horrific experience. I am confident that none of your constituents want to find themselves in a similar situation. I don't want anyone to suffer as my family and I did. So I am working to pass aid and dying legislation in Pennsylvania. And I implore you to embrace this opportunity to do so here in Connecticut. I thank you for allowing me to testify today and I welcome any questions that you may have. Thank you, Ms. Mancini for sharing your story. I don't see any hands. Thank you for your time and your testimony. Thank you. Um, next, we will hear from Karen Schwanbeck. Karen, we need you to unmute. You're unmuted. There we go. There go. All right, go ahead. We can see and Alrighty. hear you. Yes, we're ready to rock. Um, so thank you. I'm Karen Schwanbeck and I support HB 6425, the bill for medical aid and dying. The, um, this is important to me because I saw my 91 year old father suffer while on hospice care at the end of his life. He had many ailments, but the most painful one was spinal stenosis. His doctor instructed him to get morphine as needed, but at his assisted living facility, some CNAs refused to give it to him because they said it hastened death. He was 91, he was dying. He asked me three times to help him die. And I couldn't help. This was in Georgia. So because of what I went through with my father, I was prompted to do a documentary looking at options at the end of life. It's called Prescription for Peace of Mind, an Option for the Terminally Ill. If you wanna see it, you could Google Prescription for Peace of Mind and Vimeo. From people in the medical community I interviewed, palliative care is great when it works. It is just during the rare instances when it doesn't work, that patients should have an option. The key, as we've heard throughout the day, is option. Medical aid in dying can be the last resort to end suffering when nothing else can. This is for terminally ill people. Again, it's an option, it's not mandatory. If someone who is terminally ill wants a prescription to end his or her life in case palliative care does not work, then why shouldn't we give him or her that peace of mind? My father did not have that option. As Dr. Barnard said earlier today, we found when we went to Vermont for our documentary, um, they've had the bill since 2013, one in three people who got a prescription did not use it. So a total of 87 prescriptions have been written from 2013 to 2019, that's six years. That's not a mad dash to end lives in my opinion. Earlier today, someone asked how does someone self-administer the medication if they are incapacitated? One woman we interviewed whose husband, Eric Stevens, took the medication, second all, um, back in 2016. Um, his wife, Peggy, and daughter 
mixed the um, powder in maple syrup because it's Vermont. And um, because he had a disease that was very similar to ALS, she held the cup to his mouth and then he took his hand to push it up so that he could self-administer. Friends and family were with him and there was also a nurse uh, witnessing this. We also, while we're talking about Vermont here, is that we also found in uh, the research and visiting Vermont is that not all doctors will write the script. So doctors have an option too. Finally, we interviewed four religious leaders because I am religious. And I found that there is no one size fits all answer. When I talked to Mike Mazzone for our documentary who had ALS and whose wife, Jen, will be testifying later tonight. We were just chatting off camera that he told me that as a Catholic, he believed that God is a forgiving God. I myself am Lutheran and I agree with him. If you, have, you, hit your, you hit your three minute mark if you wouldn't mind concluding. Yes, thank you. If you have faith and pray for discernment, that is you ask for guidance and understanding, then I believe God will guide you and show you mercy. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Um, this is Senator Kushner. I'm sharing the uh, hearing right now, and I see a hand, uh, Representative Travis DeGroff. I'll be brief, um, but thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I have a question. When you talked about your father's experience with the uh, palliative care, the morphine being withheld, was that something that you saw in um, your documentary research in terms of either family members or other medical professionals, um, as you said, preventing what they saw as hastening a patient's death? So I did not include that part in the documentary. I kept it really short um, at the beginning just to explain the reason why I was exploring end of life issues. It was because of my father's suffering that I decided to do this documentary. So no, we did not delve into that. The only reason I asked, we'd heard about the 5% that the you know palliative care doesn't work for, but then I, I wonder if we're missing out on a, a different percentage of folks who are outside that 5% who maybe didn't receive the care because of either a family member or a medical professional who may have felt the way. Yeah. They I mean, we talk so much about um, the medication itself not always working, um, but I haven't heard today how perhaps people who are supposed to help with hospice care um, are not always well-trained and know what to do. So I think well, that and, and if you're, I mean, like in my family, if you're the type of, you know, if you're in a family that people want to die at home, as one of a previous testifier had said, you know, sometimes there are family members who don't necessarily want to, um, you know, provide, I guess the best way to put it would be too much morphine to, you know, hasten that process. So thank you very much. I appreciate your testimony. Thank you. And I, I don't see any more hands. So thank you, Karen, for your testimony and for being here today. Thank you. Next, we have uh, Daniel Diaz. Daniel, can you help? Hello, <clears throat> can you hear me? Yes, we can, go ahead. Great. <clears throat> so my name, <clears throat> my name is Dan Diaz and I am Brittany Menard's husband. <clears throat> Brittany died on November 1st, 2014. Um, she was only 29 years old. Brittany experienced the gentle dying process only because of the option of medical aid in dying. <clears throat> so yes, um, my wife utilized the very program that we are discussing here today. Uh, her name's been mentioned already a few times. It often is pertaining to this legislation. Um, her case received significant media attention because we had to move from our home in California to Portland, Oregon, so that she could access Oregon's law. Had we stayed in California, the brain tumor would have continued to torture her to death. Brittany was determined to live as long as possible. She endured an eight hour brain surgery and we researched every treatment option that was available. Unfortunately, the tumor continued growing aggressively. To be clear, a terminally ill individual that applies for this option is not deciding between living and dying. The option of living is no longer on the table. Brittany's only option is between two different methods of dying. One is gentle, the other is terrifying and filled with unrelenting suffering. 
<clears throat> as far as the symptoms, Brittany was experiencing pain that not even morphine could, Dilaudid is four times stronger than morphine, and she was already on some pretty hefty doses of Dilaudid. There was the nausea, the vomiting, the inability to sleep for days on end. The, the seizures are what terrified her the most. The small seizures would leave her unable to speak, typically for 20 to 30 minutes. The full grandma seizures, as she's coming out of those, <clears throat> blood's coming out of her mouth because she's bitten through part of her tongue. That's just the reality of what Brittany was tolerating. What's coming next? <clears throat> As the tumor grows and puts pressure on different parts of the brain, uh, blindness. If she suffers a stroke, that could mean paralysis. Basically, that she would die trapped in her own body as a suffering mass in bed with tubes coming out of her. Brittany said, I will not die that way. Why should I be forced to? Um, I'd like to settle something that's been brought up a few times now. The advances of modern medicine are truly remarkable. And Brittany and I are so grateful to all the expert care that she received, both in California and in Oregon. However, modern medicine cannot control an individual's pain and suffering at end of life in 100% of the cases, period. Any assertion by any physician or anyone that they can control suffering in all cases, that is simply not true. That is irresponsible. I will line up physicians, nurses, hospice care workers that will refute such an arrogant claim. Um, Mr. Diaz, if you want to just go ahead and wrap up, you've reached your three-minute mark. Thank you. Sure. That paternalistic view of a doctor telling the patient when you've suffered enough and then hooking you up to a morphine drip, Brittany refused to accept that. Ask me about palliative sedation because I've seen that play out uh, firsthand as well. <clears throat> so in conclusion, I'm in support of this legislation. I held Brittany in my arms as she died gently. I know how this program works firsthand, which is significantly different than any of the testifiers that have come before. They speak in hypotheticals. I know what this program is all about. <clears throat> Thank you so much uh, for allowing me to share Brittany's story, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Dan, and um, thank you for sharing that emotional testimony with us. I, I am sorry to have to do this, but I want to ask you if you will stay with us for a minute. Um, because Absolutely. of the technology that we're using, we do have to take a one-minute break while we switch over. And so I know Beverly Henry is here. She's gonna manage that. I see that there is a question for you. So if everyone will just stay on pause for one minute, um, we will come back. Senator, can you just finish with the speaker and then I'll do it? Oh, that's fine. I, I wasn't aware we could do that, but I'm happy to do that. And I see Representative Lenahan. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Hi, Mr. Diaz, how are you? I, I know that this is um, difficult testimony, uh, but you always, you know, make your points so well and with such passion. So thank you for being here tonight. Absolutely. Thank you. I, I do have a question. And, um, for those who aren't aware, um, you were very kind enough to do an interview with me about your wife and about, um, what you went through. And you had a slideshow that included some really um, smart points about the difference between medical aid in dying and suicide. And I'm wondering if you could take a moment or two to explain that for the benefit of the committee. Absolutely. Um, and this is something that I not, not only work on legislation. When Brittany died, there were only four states that allowed a terminally ill individual this option. There are now 10 states. Um, but in addition to working on this legislation, I also speak at palliative care conferences. I spoke at a bioethics conference at Yale, one at Harvard, the Cleveland Clinic. Um, and the terminology, and as far as the labels that are used on this, uh, is very important. So in the case of a person, I'm going to contrast the two. In the case of medical aid and dying, these patients, by definition, they are dying. They are terminally ill. In the case of a person who is contemplating suicide, these persons are not necessarily terminally ill. In the case of medical aid and dying, mental capacity, it's one of the safeguards, a very important, one of the key important uh, or, or, uh, safeguard of this legislation. They have to be mentally competent, make, mentally capable. In the case of somebody who is thinking about suicide, well, as a society, we would say that they're mentally impaired, they're depressed, despondent, making irrational decisions. 
because they're looking to harm themselves where they otherwise would be able to continue living. In the case of medical aid and dying, a person wants to live. In the case of a suicide, that person wants to die or they think they want to die. In the case of medical aid and dying, the ending is planned. Brittany had her parents, I was there in the bed next to her, um, three of her friends and my younger brother. In the case of a suicide, the ending is often very impulsive. In the case of medical aid and dying, the death is gentle. Within five minutes of taking the medication, Brittany fell asleep very peacefully. Within 30 minutes, her breathing slowed to the point where she passed away. In the case of a suicide, the death is often violent, typically with the, or, or many times with the use of a firearm. Um, and finally, in the case of medical aid and dying, the patient is connected to their family and friends. They can have these conversations. They say that sunlight is the best disinfectant. And that's what this does. This brings it into the light of day so that you can have these conversations openly. What are your goals for the time that you have left? These are the conversations that Brittany had with her physicians. These are the conversations that are required as part of this to make sure that that patient knows all of the different options that are available. Medical aid and dying might be one of them, but as far as hospice, palliative care, clinical trials, in the case of a person who um, is thinking of suicide, that person is isolated. They have to act alone because if they tell anybody about this, well then, as in the case of a person just before me, Barbara Mancini, they run the risk of being prosecuted because they knew of what the person was going to do. That was different than Barbara Mancini's case, but that, that peril is there. And then finally, as far as the grieving process, for me, I'm extremely proud of the, um, the impact that Brittany had in her message on this end of life, end of life care, this option. Um, I miss her every day, um, but the grieving process that I feel for her knowing that she navigated the final few days and weeks of her life in accordance to what she wanted to do, what was important for her, what she wanted to achieve. In the case of somebody who does die by suicide, for the family, there's, there's and, and by the way, this needs to change. We as a society need to do better, but there's often this this shame and grief and guilt that society kind of cast upon the individual or that family. And that shouldn't be that way either. Um, so that's, yeah, the, that, that terminology and, and the way that we frame this very important. Thank you for that question. Uh, thank you very much for sharing that. And um, I, I'm sure there are others that would like to ask you questions, but I want to end with this. Um, we had a really, lovely conversation about an hour long and just as you did just now you spoke about bringing it out into the light and having the conversation with your loved ones and <clears throat> after um i hung up the phone with you i had that discussion with my husband and my husband and i have both agreed that this is something that there that would be an option for us um, and that it, 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 I heard another person saying um, that someone was very proud to live in a state where they were free to make that choice. And uh, I hope I can say that about Connecticut. I, you know, watching my mother pass away from a very long illness um, and was suffering a great, great deal. This has come to mean more to me than I think I recognized that it would. Um, and so your story really cemented the importance of that conversation with your loved ones. Um, and so I want you to know that regardless of what happens here today, you, you did succeed in bringing that into the light for at least one family here. And I'm sure as others are listening to your testimony, these conversations are happening all over the state. Um, but with that said, um, you and I did have a wonderful conversation for close to an hour, and uh, if the good chair would allow, I'd like to send the link to that conversation to be shared with the other members of my committee so that they can hear you and Brittany's story um, in its uh, entirety from start to finish as much as you were able to tell me the other night. So I thank you so very much for that. I will be passing that along to the good chair, um, and I'm sure others want to ask you 
questions, but thank you so much for your passion, your compassion, um, and thank you for um, sharing Brittany's story. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Lenahan, and uh, I do see another hand. Next is Representative Berger Girolo. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Daniel, thank you, first of all, for sharing. I, I won't take as much time as, as I probably could, um, but your story has touched me very deeply, and I know it has touched many others. And um, you did mention uh, palliative care and that you would be interested in elaborating on that. You just did to some extent. Um, I just want to bring back a comment uh, or a term that's been used by a number of my colleagues which usually follows a long discussion in palliative care, uh, they transitioned to a term that I had really never heard until today, which was sedation to unconsciousness. Yeah. Can you tell me what that means to you? What, what that might have meant to Brittany? Palliative, <clears throat> palliative or terminal sedation is a medical procedure by which when modern medicine is not able to keep a person comfortable at end of life. And, and I'm careful, I'm not being critical of it because if, if you look at the history of the, uh, the, the ability for the medical community to use palliative sedation, that was a whole battle, you know, rewind about 30 years ago, maybe a little longer when, when that was a topic that was being discussed. So palliative sedation is a medical practice of placing a person into a coma and then withholding food and water until that person essentially dies of dehydration, starvation, whatever that disease is doing to that person. It's dehydration that typically leads to the shutting down of you know, the different bodily functions, the organs, et cetera. Um, Brittany was otherwise healthy. I mean, other than that enormous brain tumor in her skull, um, she was a very active, uh, you know, for me to keep up with her when we would go, go on hikes for our honeymoon. Most people go to warm, sunny destinations. We went to Patagonia and were hiking glaciers. Our longest day was, I think, 13 miles of a hike. That was just her idea of, Dan, that's what we're doing. Um, so there she is now facing this tumor. And if we stay in California, by the way, terminal sedation is um, allowed in all 50 states. Um, but if we stayed in California, then the option for her is that she is placed in this coma. Um, and she had questions about that. So she very, again, for Brittany, honesty was, was paramount. Um, any physician that attempted to sugarcoat <clears throat> or blow sunshine huh, was, <clears throat> ah, the emotion just comes sometimes, was met with a, with a swift rebuke. Um, so to contrast the two, I have a good friend. Her name was Jennifer Glass. Jennifer Glass had lung cancer that had spread and to her spine, her pelvis, and also her brain. Jennifer Glass endured palliative sedation. Uh, she was still here in California, and this was before we passed the legislation. So for Jennifer Glass, again, she has to agree to this um, with her medical team. She lived in San Mateo, California. So we're talking about Stanford University and UCSF. So this was not one of these rural locations where there's a lack of access to top-notch um, healthcare. Jennifer Glass had world-class healthcare, just like Brittany did. Um, but it got to the point where they were unable to keep her comfortable, so palliative sedation was the only option. They placed her in palliative sedation. I saw Jennifer, it, it was five days later, she actually died that day. It was August 11th, 2015. And when I went to visit her and her husband, Harlan, what I found was Jennifer in bed with tubes coming out of her because, of course, the body's still draining things. Um, and the family is essentially holding vigil over their loved one. Essentially, they're waiting for her to die, waiting for her to take her last breath. Um, on two occasions, she starts coming out of that terminal sedation. It's a little more of an, uh, of an art than a science. They know that the patient weighs so many kilograms, so they're going to administer this protocol of meds on a given schedule to keep her sedated. On two occasions, she starts coming out of that um, sedation, eyes wide open, arms flailing, clearly in pain, disoriented, 
they rush to get her sedated again. So the promise of a gentle dying process was a promise that was not kept in the case of Jennifer Glass. And after experiencing that, after seeing that, what Jennifer endured, I think Harlan, her husband, summarized it uh, the best, where he said, Dan, um, palliative sedation is the exact same thing as medical aid and dying, but just in slow motion. The end result is death. The end result in either case for Jennifer Glass, they're not going to stop giving her those medications to keep her sedated. They will continue to give her those medications until she is dead. So on the day that Jennifer Glass decided, agreed, that she would be placed in terminal sedation, that was, for all intent and purpose, the last day of her conscious life. But her dying process took five days. Whereas for Brittany, again, she's the one making that decision. And her last day, which was on November 1st of 2014, within five minutes of taking that medication, as I explained, she fell asleep. And within 30 minutes, she passed away. So the question, why did Jennifer have to endure those five days? Why would any of us, if we were in that predicament, be forced to have to endure that extended dying process that was not gentle as it was promised to her? Uh, so again, while I absolutely appreciate that that is an option in the toolbox, as was talked about by other uh, test, um, in other testimony, that is an option that people have uh, or that the medical community can utilize. Um, that simply should be one of the many options uh, and medical aid and dying should be one uh, that is available to a terminally ill patient. Thank you. I, I appreciate you distinguishing those two and for sharing yet another story in Jennifer. And um, I, I really appreciate all of the, um, the deeply felt um, testimony that you've shared with all of us. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, next, I see Representative Gilchrist. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I stepped away for a minute, so I apologize if what I asked was asked, but um, I am just so pleasantly surprised and moved to see you here today. Um, Mr. Diaz, I was watching um, your story from afar. My dear friend, um, Shannon, uh, was diagnosed with anaplastic astrocytoma phase three at the age of 25 um, and passed away at age 28 in the spring of 2013. And so as you were saying dates, I was trying to figure it out, but it seems as though it was about a year or a little bit more after she passed away that I learned of uh, Brittany and followed the story very closely. Um, my friend Shannon was a a fighter too, and I, I knew she would have loved Brittany and see and and seeing what Brittany was doing. So thank you um, for continuing to share her story and her advocacy. Um, can you explain what the process of applying for the medical program was like for Brittany and yourself? Sure. So similar to the legislation that's now being proposed in Connecticut, mo most of these laws are are, are based off of. Um, Oregon's law, just because it is the oldest. And, and, and as was mentioned, it, it works as intended. The safeguards or protections are there. Um, so two physicians, independent of one another, have to agree that this person is terminally ill with six months or less to live. That person has to be mentally competent. They make the request both verbally and in writing. There's a 15-day waiting period. The biggest safeguard is that Brittany has to consume that medication on her own. It's also only the terminally ill individual that can have these conversations with their physician. It cannot be done by proxy. It cannot be done by power of attorney. I, as Brittany's husband, cannot say, hey, doc, you know, she's applying for this. She doesn't know it, but this is what she needs. No, that right there in the language of this legislation, it states any attempt to coerce or per push a person into pursuing medical aid and dying is punishable as a felony. And the reason I mention this is because and, and this is heartbreaking for me as well, but, and, and I can speak to this, members of what we consider the most vulnerable in our society, the elderly, the disabled, we've heard a lot of conversations about that today, a bunch of points brought up regarding that. And this legislation for the first time 
protects the most vulnerable in our society. Because as I mentioned, it forces these conversations. <clears throat> this is what currently happens <clears throat> in Connecticut, in any state where we do not have this legislation. So for a second, please, if you're opposed or supportive of this, open your minds just to allow the, just the recognition that nothing happens in a vacuum. This is the dilaudid that I mentioned. This is hydromorphone. So 50 of these would be 200 milligrams of dilaudid. That's the equivalent of 800 milligrams of morphine. I'm 190 pounds. That's enough to put me to sleep for good tonight. But why stop there? There's 240 pills in here. So I can take out a few other people along with me. In order for Brittany, in order for a terminally ill individual to get this, you just have to be in pain. These are sitting on the nightstand. So my point is this, all that's concern, all of this outrage about once we pass this legislation that all of a sudden abuses will begin to happen. No, 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 they're happening now. This legislation for the first time would protect an individual because again, as I mentioned, it would force those conversations. In order for Brittany to get, and in her case, it was sequel barbital, and I can talk about that process, but in order for her to get that, she had to go through that process where every step along the way, if, and again, I'll use me as the example, if her husband was trying to do something nefarious, I run the risk of getting caught. Why would I do that? I'm just gonna use these meds that are already on the nightstand. So again, this legislation, the passage of it, it does not create a scenario where somebody was, is potentially going to be abused. It's the opposite. It creates a scenario where it's going to protect the most vulnerable. I have several friends. One, his name was Jan Bissinger that I've known since I was a kid. He had multiple sclerosis. It's weird how things kind of, the cycle of just the way things play out. But who knew that as an adult, this guy that I knew as a kid, he was a couple years older than me, lived around uh around the corner, but we all played together as kids that he ended up utilizing medical aid and dying. Uh, quadriplegic, had no ability. He lived in a wheelchair, fiercely independent individual, but he was one who said, no, this is not about his disability. This is about being terminally ill. And when he, when he reaches that point where his death is coming, it's evident. And, and that's a tough uh, diagnosis when it comes to MS. That's not one that is easy to determine, but he wanted to make sure that he would not be discriminated against for being able to utilize that. So he did apply for, qualify for, and receive that medication because his option, and this is what I mentioned before, he told me, he said, Danny, my option is, he, he's in that wheelchair, he's strapped into it. He had one of those, those crane systems um, in his house where they would, he always wore this Velcro vest that they could pick him up and wench him into the chair or into the bed or into the shower. There was no doorways, door jams. His whole house had been retrofitted, retrofitted for years. He said, Danny, my option is that I can drive my wheelchair into the community swimming pool. That's not healthcare. That is an individual who has gotten to a point where he is so despondent that that's what he's thinking about. And similar to Brittany, and it's been talked about, just receiving the medication, just having it, that provided him with so much relief because he had taken back just a little bit of control from the disease he was suffering from. And so again, I, I pose the question to all of you. If any of you were to find yourself in Brittany's predicament, whether you use it or not, would you at least want to know that that option belongs to you? Not to a judge, a legislator, or a leader of a religious institution. And by the way, I say this as a Catholic. I went to Catholic school. I was an altar boy, confirmation, the whole nine yards. Uh, but very proudly, I shared that 70% of Catholics nationwide also agree that a terminally ill individual should have this option. So if you're opposed for religious reasons, I fully respect that. Um, but you simply would never avail yourself or pursue this for yourself. Thank you so much, Mr. Diaz. Thank you, Madam Chair.
Thank you, Dan. Uh, I do not see any other hands. I just want to say that um, I really appreciate you being here and sharing uh, your experience with us and the experience of your wife. I think it has been you know, really uh, well informed us and uh, I, I hope you will continue to to take this measure on to to pursue this the way you have. It's it's a great tribute to your wife. So thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Is, 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 could I make just one comment about something that was brought up. Sure. Um, there was something that was brought up by uh, a legislator and, and the statement was, well, technically we're all terminal, we're all dying. Um, Brittany would disagree with that. She would say that we're all living. Um, it was only after we discovered that enormous brain tumor and that she endured the eight hour brain surgery and that the cancer continued to progress aggressively that's when it became unfortunately painfully evident that she was in her dying process. We are lucky. We are in our living process. I know, and, and I, I understand where, you know, that, that, that phrase that, okay, once we're born technically, uh, that, you know, we're all, we, we're starting that, that dying process, but no, um, you know, we're, we're here living. And, and, and the last thing, because I think it, it was Senator Summers who mentioned how does a physician advocate for both life and for death? The idea that Brittany's physicians are advocating for death, that is completely inaccurate. They are not advocating for death. Brittany's physicians are simply recognizing the limits of modern medicine. And they are not going to abandon her to say, well, you're going to suffer horrifically. You're just going to have to tolerate that. So th that, that question, and this is the thing, I, 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 the questions I got and I appreciated them, it seems like it came from the legislators and I've seen this pattern. I mean, I've been to 14 different state capitals. I've talked to over 850 legislators. So I see these patterns that I got the questions today from individuals who might be more supportive of this. I want the hard questions. Give me the hard questions from the people who are opponents, please. You're not gonna offend me. I held Brittany in my arms as she died. You mean to tell me that you think your question is going to somehow rattle my cage? It won't. My purpose is to share the truth. Because while you may agree or disagree, I'll be damned if I'll let some pre or, or some false narrative that's out there dictate how a legislator then votes. So again, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me. Um, I was unable to, but I'll submit my written testimony. It'll have my contact information uh, and I can answer all the hard questions. I lived this. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Diaz. So, um, Beverly, are we able to continue? I am going to switch right now and you'll okay. be back shortly. Thank you. So we'll take a short pause uh,